Hi guys, I want to invite you to join the Patreon where you will get some benefits as well as audiobooks that will not be uploaded on YouTube. Chapter 1 I lay in the hospital bed, acutely aware of the ebbing tide of life, as my senses gradually dulled. So, this is what dying feels like. Before everything faded away, I wondered if I would pass as they do in the TV dramas, with a gentle tilt of the head and then. Gone. But I couldn't find out because consciousness had already begun to slip away from me. I awoke in darkness after what seemed both like an eternity and an instant. What was happening? I heard a woman crying. Don't take my child away. A peculiar, high-pitched voice responded, Miss Sia, this is the only way for the young mistress to survive. The master won't even spare you. If he finds this place. Oh the voice quivered, as though remembering something dreadful. The woman's voice grew weaker, murmuring something incoherent. Miss Sia, this is the last thing Tito can do for you. Tito will ensure the young mistress is taken somewhere safe, at least in the muggle world, she will be safe. Were they speaking English? My mind, sluggish and foggy, couldn't fully comprehend. I tried to open my eyes to understand what was being said, but exhaustion overwhelmed me, pulling me back into the darkness. When I awoke again, I stared at my tiny hands in bewilderment. It seemed I had crossed over to another life. Was this fortune? I had retained my memories. Was it misfortune? I had to grow up all over again. I recalled the brief conversation I'd overheard during my first moment of clarity. The crying woman must have been my mother. Judging by the current surroundings, which resembled an orphanage, it appeared I had been abandoned. The cacophony of crying babies was maddening. I was always so quiet, I thought disdainfully. Life as an infant was dreadfully dull. Eat, sleep, wake to the sound of wailing, think, eat, sleep, think again. Once I had grasped my situation, I assessed my physical condition. Limbs intact, sensations normal, no apparent anomalies it seemed safe to conclude I was healthy. My previous life, brief and plagued by illness, ended peacefully as I ceased breathing in front of my parents. Though we had prepared for it, my departure surely brought them pain. If loss was inevitable, perhaps it was better they forgot me completely. At least they wouldn't endure the agony of burying a child. Now, I could only hope my younger brother would soothe the sorrow my absence had caused. I didn't stay in the orphanage long, as a young couple soon took me home. They must have adopted me. From now on, these are my parents, I told myself. The Hill couple was ordinary. The husband, Hughes, had a stable job, while the wife, Isaiah, was a stay-at-home mother. Not wealthy, but not poor. They treated me well. For whatever reason, they had no biological children, so I became the Hill's only daughter, Sawyer Hill. Hughes was a tall, lean man with a lively disposition, black hair, and warm brown eyes that were always smiling. He loved coming home from work and lifting me into the air, spinning me around until I giggled with delight. Isaiah was a gentle woman with long, flaxen hair and deep brown eyes. Her voice was soft, and her demeanor endearing. Despite her complaints about housework, she always took it upon herself to do it. Besides housework, she spent her time teaching me to speak, engaging me in conversation even when all I could manage were incoherent babbles. My hair was black, my eyes deep brown a perfect blend of my parents. No wonder they chose to adopt me. With a family like this, I couldn't help but feel extraordinarily lucky. Learning to speak again, and in English no less, was a painful process but ultimately rewarding. I practiced diligently, crawling before walking, striving to read early. As a result, I learned to read and exhibited athletic prowess sooner than most children. In my past life, a severe congenital heart condition had plagued my childhood, preventing me from running freely. I had been a quiet, well-behaved child, never joining my peers in play or sports. In this new life, with a healthy body, I could relish all the joys of childhood without restraint. I kept my black hair short, preferred trousers to pretty dresses, and had an unusual fondness for physical activity which, at five years old, mostly meant running and jumping around. Hughes and Isaiah would often smile wryly and say, you're just like a little boy. 
I integrated well with the neighborhood children, despite feeling somewhat sheepish about playing with a bunch of toddlers. But now, I was just a toddler myself, at least outwardly. I had to fit in, didn't I? Chapter 2 It was a particularly hot summer. One afternoon, I darted out of the house, ready to join in a childish water balloon fight. As I passed a low wall near the small park, I spotted an odd-looking boy. He was about my age, wearing a long-sleeved pullover that seemed too big for him, making him appear even skinnier. The shirt's hem hung down to his thighs. His hair was uneven, as if it hadn't been properly cut and fell to his shoulders. He watched the children playing nearby with a look of longing in his eyes. Want to join us? I asked, stepping in front of him and brushing the hair out of his eyes. I'm not. He seemed startled and hesitant yet eager. Without another word, I grabbed his arm and ran towards the other kids. We've got another player. I shouted to them. They turned to look, first at me, then at him. A boy named John stepped forward. He's a freak. He can't join us. I glanced at the so-called freak, whose eyes now held a hint of hurt, quickly replaced by a guarded look. I don't think he's weird. If you don't let him play, I won't either. And don't expect me to help any team that needs an extra player in the future, I said. It was a small trade, just a bunch of kids after all. In the end, I dragged the boy into the game. As the game progressed, I finally understood why they called him a freak. About ten minutes in, a water balloon aimed at him suddenly changed direction mid-air and splashed onto a boy who had been laughing at him. The boy looked at him in terror. Monster! He cried, and ran away, dripping wet. The other kids saw the strange incident too. Before scattering in fear, they pelted him with their water balloons, not sparing me either. He stood there with his head down, body tense, ready to flee. I wiped the water from my face. Refreshing. He looked up sharply. How did you do that? It was amazing. I asked, curiosity and excitement in my voice. He looked confused. That thing with the balloon. How did you make it dodge you? It just dodged he stammered. Can you teach me? I pressed. It's a power I was born with. A superpower? What's a superpower? Uh, never mind. I quickly changed the subject. I'm Sawyer Hill. You can call me Sawyer. I extended my hand. He seemed a bit nervous but took my hand. Severus. Severus Snape. Shaking his hand, I smiled. Nice to meet you, Severus. I live at 23 Spinner's End. Is your house far from here? I live at the last house on Spinner's End, he said, still a bit tense. I grinned. Then let's walk together. We can play together more often. Severus walked beside me, his head down, lost in thought. Then he asked, aren't you afraid of me? I have strange powers. I shook my head nonchalantly. What's there to be afraid of? You won't use them to hurt me, right? He shook his head firmly. Never. See? You were born with this amazing power. That's incredible. Severus looked at me, then lowered his head again, silent. We walked along a winding path by a river, past a tall chimney of a mill. The narrow cobblestone lane led to rows of ordinary brick houses. Spinner's End was just beyond. Can you do other amazing things with your power? I asked curiously. Severus paused, then answered, there are many things. I'm a wizard. A wizard? I asked, eyes wide. He seemed to brace for my disbelief. You don't believe me? Do you think I'm a freak too? No, maybe just very special, I said. I've never heard of or seen anything like it, except in fairy tales. He seemed surprised by my reaction. Before he could say more, I asked, tell me about it. About being a wizard. Severus hesitated, then began to describe a magical world, one hidden among ordinary people. I learned that this world was different from the one I knew. There was a hidden magical realm. Maybe it existed in my previous life too, but I had never encountered it. 
Although Severus was only five, his words were convincing. I had seen the mysterious powers with my own eyes. Later, at my insistence, Severus demonstrated more. These were truly supernatural abilities. Magic explained them perfectly. After experiencing reincarnation, accepting the unexplainable came naturally. We reached my house. I'm home. I'll come to see you tomorrow. Tell me more about magic, okay? It's fascinating. Severus nodded, and we bid each other farewell. Inside, I told my mom about my new friend, Severus Snape, who lived at the end of the lane. Mom thought for a moment. The Snape family, I know them. His father is a drunk, and the household isn't peaceful. Is the boy all right? That explains it, I said. He doesn't look well. No wonder he's so thin and pale. And he seems lonely. He doesn't have any other friends. Mom, can I invite him over often? Such a household wasn't good for a child's growth. Coupled with being ostracized for his peculiarities, he'd likely grow up cold and solitary. Poor kid. Of course, Mom said, gently patting my short hair. Dinner is a while off. Why don't you go through those books and pick some to recommend to him when he comes over? Okay, Mom. The next morning, I went to Severus's house and knocked. A gaunt, sallow woman with a gloomy expression opened the door. Yes. She asked. Good morning, ma'am. Is Severus home? She scrutinized me for a moment, then stepped aside. I thanked her and entered. The house was dim, poorly lit, with heavy curtains drawn tight. The dining table held used plates, and the whole place felt dreary. Severus came down the creaky stairs, looking surprised to see me. He approached, his eyes questioning why I was there. I told you yesterday, I'd come to see you today, didn't I? I said, turning to the woman. Mrs. Snape, can Severus come out to play with me? I promise to bring him back by lunch. Mrs. Snape looked at Severus. I felt his arm tense. All right. Be back before your father returns, she said. Severus seemed surprised but nodded obediently. I will, mum. Thanking her, I led Severus out and headed towards my house. As we walked, I talked about our plans for the day chatting about the magical world, reading books, and playing in the park after lunch. Suddenly, he interrupted, why? Why are you doing this chatting, lunch all of it? Because we're friends, right? I asked. Isn't that what friends do? He looked at me with a mix of hope and confusion. Friends I guess so. I've never had a friend before. I suppressed my sympathy. Kids like him were sensitive. Pity would only push him away. Then I'm your first friend. I declared, beaming. Isn't that special? Severus's face softened into a small smile, touched by my cheerfulness. Making friends with kids required being childlike. Exaggerated words, lively actions these suited a cheerful, positive child. No one could guess my six-year-old facade hit a twenty-one-year-old mind. Adapting wasn't childish, it was survival. And so, I made a friend, a five-year-old boy, who became my best friend. Chapter 3 My friendship with Severus didn't change the other children's disdain and isolation towards him. Despite my support, no one openly called him a freak anymore, but their faces clearly showed they didn't want to be near him. Older kids made their hostility more obvious, using their height advantage to block his path with menacing expressions that barely concealed their fear. Perhaps, in the eyes of other children, these older ones were heroes bravely driving away the monster. I found it all rather ridiculous. Since my popularity wasn't enough to protect him, I decided to leave with Severus. I pulled Severus away from them. Once we were out of sight, he stopped and looked down. You don't have to walk with me. I'm not that kind of person. We're friends. I rolled my eyes, pulling him along. They're just cowards, really. Severus looked up at me, a smile lighting up his eyes. Forget them. Let's go to my house. My mom made some delicious snacks this morning. Do you like books? I never went to kindergarten my parents taught me to read at home. 
I love reading, and I have lots of picture books you might like. I'll be six in September and start school next year. What about you? I babbled on, as Severus was too quiet and someone had to keep the conversation going. He seemed puzzled by my chatter. I might not go to a muggle school. Muggle? People without magic. My mother is a witch, and she teaches me at home. When I turn eleven, I'll go to Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry to learn magic. A magic school? Can muggles go there? He looked at me nervously. No, they can't. I felt a pang of disappointment. A world I couldn't enter. But I quickly smiled. That's a shame. I'm really interested. You'll have to tell me all about it since I can't see it myself. He nodded firmly. I will. Seeing his serious expression, my mood lifted. Even if I couldn't access the magical world, having a wizard friend was pretty cool. From then on, we became inseparable friends. I often invited Severus to my house. My parents were very kind to him, and mom always prepared extra portions of the nutritious meals she made for me when he visited. Over time, Severus looked healthier than when we first met, though he remained quite thin. Since we no longer played with other kids, I developed a habit of morning runs and dragged Severus along. He initially protested, having never exercised before, but I'd put on a world-weary face and say, a healthy body is the most important thing. You can't understand what it's like to be bedridden for years. He'd look at me skeptically, as if to say, do you know what that's like? Before I forcibly dragged him outside. The daily run wasn't long, and he got used to it over time. Occasionally, I'd visit his house and see his mother, Mrs. Snape, who remained somewhat gloomy but was friendly towards me and didn't oppose our friendship. One evening, I went to his house and met his father. He was drunk. I couldn't talk to Severus that evening. Before he went inside, I asked him to come to my house the next day. He didn't respond and went in. He didn't come the next day, which worried me. I told Isaiah, who came with me to check on him. We found Severus and his mother bearing signs of domestic violence. Isaiah was furious and discussed it with Hughes for a long time. Eventually, they talked to Mrs. Snape and Severus about their situation. Finally, Severus's mother, Eileen Prince, divorced his father, Tobias Snape. When I later mentioned the divorce to Severus, he said grimly, I've wanted to get rid of that monster for a long time. I was speechless. It seemed my parents' persuasion for Mrs. Prince to divorce was the right decision. When I asked about their livelihood, Severus proudly said his mother's family was renowned for their potion-making skills. She could make potions at home and sell them in the magical world, enough to support them. This outcome was indeed positive. Our families grew closer, and since they stayed in their house on Spinner's End, visiting each other was convenient. Time flew by, and I was nine. One day after school, while reading in my room, Severus came to find me. He was excited, pulling me outside without explaining where we were going. On the way, he whispered mysteriously, I've found someone. She's a witch. I've been watching her for a while. I'm sure of it. My curiosity was piqued. Following him to a nearby playground, we hid in the bushes. The playground was empty, but soon two girls arrived. They went to the swings. The smaller girl swung higher and higher until she let go, soaring through the air with a joyous laugh. Her beautiful deep red hair flamed as it flew. She didn't crash onto the asphalt but glided gracefully, like an acrobat, before lightly landing on the ground. Wow! I was stunned and a bit envious. I glanced at Severus, who wore a look of excitement and longing. The older girl started arguing with her, and Severus seemed ready to rush out. I quickly held him back. You'll scare them if you just show up. I whispered. He snapped back to reality, looking embarrassed. I quietly led him out of the bushes, away from the girl's sight and hearing. Do they come here often? Yes, every day around this time except weekends. I teased him, you've been observing closely, haven't you? She is quite pretty. Such a precocious boy. Severus blushed. She's a witch the first one I've seen besides my mother. His blush amused me. 
Let's meet her tomorrow. Dress nicely. Wear the outfit we gave you for your birthday this year it looks great. It was a simple child's outfit, a knitted pullover, black jacket, and jeans. Simple and suitable for Severus. He blushed even more and muttered an agreement, suddenly quickening his pace. Watching him flee, I laughed and ran to catch up. Teasing him was too fun. The next day, he arrived in the outfit I suggested, and we set off to meet the little witch. Aren't you going to change? He asked, raising an eyebrow at my boyish attire. She'll think you're a boy. Everyone does at first. I was taken aback. I suppose I do look like a boy okay, more than a bit. Seeing his raised eyebrow, I quickly amended. With my short hair, androgynous features, and boyish clothes, I was a tomboy. Even Severus didn't realize I was a girl until the second year we knew each other when our families celebrated Christmas together and I wore a dress. My family teased me for ages. That innocent dress became a symbol of my refusal to wear it. Isaiah persistently bought me more girl clothes, determined to turn me into a normal girl. Reluctantly, I compromised, wearing more girly clothes and occasionally dresses, as long as they weren't pink or lacy. After changing into something more acceptable, Severus and I headed out. He looked presentable, healthy, and though still thin, he seemed more robust. His short black hair was cut at my insistence. Walking together, we looked like siblings. I was three months older and a bit taller. At the playground, the girls hadn't arrived yet. We sat on the grass, and I gave Severus some pointers. We were deep in discussion when the girls arrived and headed for the swings. Our plan began. Pointing to a large rock under a tree, I loudly asked, Sev, can you move that big rock? Severus played along, evaluating the rock. Hmm, I think so. Let me try. I glanced at the girls. They were watching us, curious. The rock slowly floated towards us. I stopped him. Not now, people might see. Severus pretended to be startled, the rock dropping with a thud and raising dust. The younger girl, excited, ran towards us, ignoring her sister's protests. Excuse me, did you just can you do that too? She asked. Two. Severus caught the keyword. Yes, sometimes I do strange things, like making things float. Can you do that too? Severus couldn't hide his excitement. Yes, it seems we're the same. The same how? We're wizards, Severus said matter-of-factly. That's magic. We have magical powers. Watching them chat, I was pleased. I turned to the older girl, who was watching with envy. You don't need to envy them. We non-magical people have our own world. We live just fine without magic. Comforting her, I shrugged, though I do envy them a bit. She smiled. She told me only Lily, the younger girl, had such powers in their family. I was curious if muggle families could have magical children. Lily, the little witch, introduced herself and her special friend to her sister. Up close, I noticed her beautiful green eyes. Severus responded coolly. Besides me and my family, he was aloof and even hostile to others. He hadn't made any other friends over the years. Lily was the first stranger he showed interest in. After introducing Lily to me, it was nearly dark. We arranged to meet again and went our separate ways. On the way home, despite Severus's efforts to stay calm, I could see the excitement in his flushed cheeks. I found it amusing and had a strange feeling of pride, like a parent watching their child grow. Shaking my head, I dismissed the thought. Chapter 4 The four of us often gathered together to read and chat. Sometimes it was at one of our houses, other times by the riverbank on the grassy fields. Severus brought books from the wizarding world that Eileen had bought him. Titles like One Thousand Magical Herbs and Fungi and Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them fascinated us. Were those bizarre creatures real? He also had a very thick book, The Compendium of Potions, which was Eileen's. Severus mentioned he could now help her make some simple potions, his tone carrying a hint of pride. I flipped through the potions book, noting the peculiar ingredients, toad eyes, horn slugs, 
crushed snake fangs, leech juice. Could such things really be consumed? And would they have miraculous effects? Drinking such concoctions required a lot of courage. Severus, can Muggleborns also be wizards, like Lily? Yes, some children from Muggle families exhibit magical abilities as they grow. Similarly, wizarding families can sometimes have children with no or very weak magic, called squibs. So, when I turn eleven, I'll really receive an acceptance letter to Hogwarts. I can go to a magic school. You will. We'll go to Hogwarts together. Lily and I will go to the same secondary school. You'll have to write to us about all the fun things at your school. Oh, definitely. We'll write to you. Severus, does the school have a post office? Wizards use owls to send letters. The school has communal owls, and students can have their own pet owls. Owls? That's such a strange way. I often wondered if I might be a wizard too. But I never showed any special abilities, so probably not. Out of billions of people, the ratio was still small. But even in that small ratio, I had met two young wizards and Eileen. That was quite something. Thinking this, I felt content. One weekend in July, Eileen and Severus came over to spend the weekend with us. After lunch, a simple spell from Eileen saved Isaiah from the chore of washing dishes. We sat in the living room, sipping tea and chatting. Hughes was recounting a mix-up at the office when we heard a tapping sound at the window. Everyone turned to see a grey owl fluttering its wings and pecking at the glass. Ah, that must be Severus's acceptance letter. Eileen exclaimed with delight. I walked over and opened the window. The owl flew in, dropped a letter onto the living room carpet, then perched on the windowsill, watching us. Severus picked up the letter, and I peered over curiously. It was a thick envelope, the address written in emerald green ink on the yellowish parchment, 23 Spinner's End, without a recipient's name. Turning it over, there was a wax seal, a shield with a large H surrounded by a lion, an eagle, a badger, and a serpent. I urged Severus to open the envelope. He tried to remain calm as he broke the seal. Inside were two separately sealed letters. The top one was addressed to Mr. Severus Snape. Why are there two letters? I wondered, reaching for the one beneath. It read Miss Sawyer Hill. A surge of excitement hit me. This one's for me. Everyone looked at the letter in my hand in astonishment. But I quickly calmed down. It could be a mistake. I've never shown any magical talent. Hogwarts doesn't make mistakes, Eileen said softly. Every magical child is recorded at birth. Open it and see. Severus nodded, encouraging me. I slowly opened the envelope and pulled out several pieces of parchment. It read. Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Headmaster, Albus Dumbledore. Order of Merlin, First Class, Grand Source. CHF. Warlock, Supreme Mugwump, International Confeed. Of Wizards. Dear Miss Hill. We are pleased to inform you that you have been accepted at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Please find enclosed a list of all necessary books and equipment. Term begins on September 1st. We await your owl by no later than July 31st. Yours sincerely. Minerva McDonagall. Deputy Headmistress. Due to Miss Hill's special circumstances, an adult wizard will accompany her to purchase the necessary books and items. Please include a convenient time in your reply. I checked several times, the wave of joy hit me squarely. Suppressing the urge to shout with joy, I hugged Severus, laughing. A strange sensation spread through me, as if something had awakened. Suddenly, many objects in the room floated into the air, and the owl on the windowsill flapped its wings. Eileen rushed over, placing her hands on my shoulders. Calm down, Sawyer. Startled by the floating objects, I slowly calmed down, and they gently settled back in place. Once I was calm, Eileen soothed the owl with a piece of cake and sat beside me. It seems your magic was just dormant. Many children have their powers awakened during strong emotional moments. Hogwarts didn't make a mistake. You're a witch. Eileen teased. 
I blushed slightly. Since my rebirth, it had been hard to get emotionally worked up. Twenty-one years of life experience had given me a calm and steady childhood. I looked at Hughes and Isaiah, who were gazing at me with pride and joy. I smiled back at them. Severus waved his acceptance letter, his usual reserve replaced by a rare smile. Sawyer, we can go to Hogwarts together. What a delightful surprise. Write the reply first, Sawyer, Eileen suggested, pointing to the waiting owl. And if you don't mind, you can join us for the shopping trip, so the school doesn't need to send an adult wizard. Of course, I don't mind. I'll write the reply now. On a sunny day, Severus and I sat by the riverbank. I never imagined you'd be a wizard too. Neither did I. It's wonderful, isn't it? It really is. We smiled at each other. You mentioned Hogwarts has houses. I wonder if we'll be in the same one. I want to be in Slytherin. My mom and her family were all in Slytherin. But I'm a half-blood, and they value pure blood and power. Then Lily and I, being muggle-born, probably won't end up in Slytherin. Well. Ravenclaw is good too, if you're smart and love learning. And Gryffindor, though brave, can be impulsive and reckless, my mom says. Sev, what if we're not in the same house? It doesn't matter. We can still see each other often. That's good. And Lily too, we can still meet up regularly. But I wonder how the sorting is done. My mom wouldn't tell me. I bet it's something special. Life needs a bit of mystery. Severus. Sawyer. I got my acceptance letter. Lily came running with Petunia, breathless. Severus showed his letter. I got mine too. And me. I pulled mine from behind, waiting for Lily's surprised reaction. Oh my, Sawyer, you're a wizard too. That's wonderful. Her joyful tone quickly fell. But Petunia didn't get one. She's twelve now, so she probably won't. Petunia stood stiffly, trying to look happy for me. I sat beside her. I never thought I'd be a wizard. I was planning to go to the same secondary school as you. But I truly believe being a regular person is just as great, like my parents and yours. It's really a pity we won't be at the same school, but we'll write to you. Yes, we'll write to you, I promise. Lily sat on her other side, trying to comfort her sister. Petunia sighed, shrugging. What else can I do? But like you said, Sawyer, knowing three wizard friends is quite special, isn't it? We all laughed. The laughter echoed over the grassy fields. I set my book aside, walking to the sofa where Hughes and Isaiah sat, and kissed their cheeks. I'm off to bed. Good night. Wait, Sawyer, dear. Isaiah pulled me between her and Hughes. We think it's time you knew something. Hughes's expression was serious. About your background eerie not our biological child. We adopted you from an orphanage. They told us you were found at the orphanage's doorstep on September 22nd, which we've used as your birthday. We planned to tell you when you were older, but since you're a wizard and will be away at school for long periods. We think one of your biological parents might be a wizard, which is why you have magic. Of course, they could be like the Evanses, ordinary people. But there's a good chance they're from the wizarding world. You might find your real parents there. No need. I interrupted Hughes. I mean, there's no need to search for my biological parents. In eleven years, no one has come to claim me. I don't need to search for parents who abandoned me. You are my parents, always. Sawyer. I sigh aside, hugging me, stroking my hair. Hughes grinned, pulling a funny face. I knew our dear Sawyer was our wonderful daughter. All right, off to bed now. I sigh released me, ruffling my hair. Tomorrow, you're shopping with Eileen and Severus for school supplies. Yes, good night, Mom, Dad. Good night. Chapter 5 a wand, a large cauldron, note, pewter, standard size 2, a set of glass or crystal files, a telescope, a set of brass scales. Students may bring an owl or a cat or a toad. 
I read the list of required items aloud. I'm pretty sure we don't have any of these things on our local high street. So, are we going to the wizard's shopping district? Oh, maybe that's what it's called. Eileen said, waiting for us at the door. But you're right, we're heading to the wizard's marketplace. You'll definitely be able to get all these things there. It would be great if Lily and the others could come with us, right, Sev? But they've already agreed to have a teacher from the school guide them. I think it's better they wait for the teacher, Severus replied. I shrugged, turning to Hurry Hughes and Isaiah. We got off the car on a street in London, and Eileen led us into a nondescript, grimy little pub. Without Eileen leading us, we wouldn't have noticed it at all as we walked past. After moving through the noisy bar, Eileen took us to a small courtyard with walls on all sides, a single trash can, and some weeds. Before we could ask any questions, Eileen pulled out her small wand and counted bricks on the wall above the trash can, three up and two across. She tapped the brick three times. To our amazement, the brick started to tremble and move, forming a small hole that grew larger and larger until a wide archway appeared, revealing a winding cobblestone street. Wow. I couldn't think of anything else to say. A whole new world appeared before us, full of wonders I couldn't possibly list. I was reminded of a phrase from a past life, like Granny Lou visiting the Grand View Garden. I think I understood how Granny Lou felt. Glancing at my parents, who seemed a bit more composed than I was, I adjusted my mood. Stay calm. Eileen first took us to Gringotts, the wizarding bank, to exchange wizarding money. The goblins there made me frown they were quite a sight. We went from shop to shop, robe shop, bookstore, cauldron shop, and bought all the school supplies. Finally, we stopped in front of a small, shabby shop. Ollivanders, makers of fine wands since 382 BC. I read the sign aloud. That's right, you still need wands. This is the only place to get them. Let's go in. Eileen pushed the door open. Ding, the bell rang as we entered the wand shop. Inside were rows of narrow boxes stacked almost to the ceiling. Good afternoon, an old man appeared seemingly out of nowhere, his pale eyes observing us. Hello, Mr. Ollivander. We have two new students in need of wands, Eileen indicated us. Oh, of course. Who's first? I'll go first, I stepped forward. He asked which hand I used, then a tape measure began to automatically measure my hand, shoulder, and other dimensions, recording data. He handed me a wand to try. I waved it, but nothing happened. He gave me another, which emitted a faint light from its tip, but before I could say anything, he took it back. Not this one. The third wand I picked up felt different. A wave of pleasure surged through me, like it was radiating from my bones, wanting to surround me. I couldn't help but sigh in satisfaction. Outwardly, it looked just like the first one. Looks like it's this one. Vine wood, unicorn hair, eleven inches long. Remember, it's the wand that chooses the wizard. Severus had a much harder time. The unsuitable wands caused quite a bit of damage. After trying more than ten wands, he found his match, birch wood, dragon heartstring, thirteen and a half inches. After buying our wands, our day in Diagon Alley ended. Back home, I held my wand, tracing the patterns on it. The handle was intricately wrapped with vine-like patterns that extended a finger's width onto the wand's shaft. Holding the handle felt familiar, comfortable, like it was a part of me. I recalled Mr. Ollivander's description of my wand, vine wood, symbolizing rebirth and new beginnings. New beginnings, just like my new life in this world, leaving the past behind. I raised my wand to my chest and waved it forward. The magical world, here I come. The night before our departure, we had a farewell dinner at my house for Severus and me. As dinner time approached, Eileen arrived with a large birdcage containing a beautiful owl. Its black feathers were sleek and shiny, perfectly groomed a cleanly owl. The shopkeeper said it likes to keep itself clean and is very obedient. We didn't visit the pet shop that day, so I thought this would make a practical birthday gift for you, Sawyer. An early present, Eileen handed me the cage. So, it's my pet. Thank you, Eileen. 
It's beautiful. I placed the cage on the low table and opened it. The owl flew out and perched on top of the cage. I guess it's a he. You guessed right, you can name him. Hmm, how about James? How do you like that? I stroked his feathers, and he lifted his head and hooted. We talked for a while about caring for owls. Severus didn't join us he thought pets were a hassle. He was absorbed in his textbooks. As dinner began, we all raised our glasses, to our little wizards embarking on their journey, cheers. Cheers. On September 1st, at 10.30 a.m. At King's Cross Station, Eileen, Severus, my parents, and I, along with the Evans family, stood with our luggage. We didn't question the strange address of Platform 9 and 3 quarters. Following Eileen, we walked between Platforms 9 and 10, where nothing seemed unusual. You just have to walk straight towards the barrier between Platforms 9 and 10. Severus, you go first. Severus pushed his trolley towards the barrier, and just as he seemed about to crash, he vanished. Wow. With Diagon Alley's experience, I was less surprised by such things. Without waiting for Eileen, I followed suit, pushing my trolley. As I passed through the wall, I opened my eyes wide, like passing through an invisible barrier, and found myself on the other side. Severus was waiting, observing the surroundings. A deep red steam engine stood at the platform. The sign on the train read, Hogwarts Express, 11 o'clock. Looking back at the barrier, it was now a wrought iron archway with platform nine and three quarters written on it. The others soon joined us. It was still early, and the platform wasn't very crowded yet. I saw parents saying goodbye to their children. My parents and the Evanses were happily chatting about something, and Lily and I said goodbye to Petunia. Petunia, we'll write to you as soon as we get to school. You have to write back. Lily held Petunia's hand reluctantly. Yeah, Eileen said we'll have a holiday for Christmas. We can come home then, I said, holding on to both of them. All right, kids, it's getting late. You need to get on the train and find a compartment. It's starting to get busy, Eileen reminded us. After a few final hugs, I turned to Hughes and Isaiah. They kissed my cheeks and hugged me, we'll miss you. Write to us. I will, I promised. Finally, we boarded the train. We found an empty compartment at the back, stowed our luggage, and placed the owls me James and Lily's suit inside their cages on top of the luggage. Lily and I sat on one side, Severus on the other. We exchanged glances and suddenly burst into laughter. We're off to Hogwarts. Lily cheered. Yeah, the three of us, off to Hogwarts, I said, unable to suppress my smile. Severus was also smiling, albeit more controlled. Looking out at the platform where parents and children were saying goodbye, the compartment door slid open. Two boys stood there, are these seats taken? The boy with glasses asked nonchalantly. No, I replied. They brought their luggage in. The boy with glasses sat opposite Severus, and the other sat next to me. Their attire was elegant, not flashy, but clearly well made. They seemed like well pampered children. They started talking about Quidditch, a term we'd seen in Diagon Alley. Eileen had said it was a flying sport. The train started moving. Severus took out a book and began reading quietly, while Lily watched the scenery fly by outside the window. James, my owl, was restless in his cage. James, calm down. I can't let you out here, I soothed him softly. The boy opposite, James, gave me a strange look. It's called James. Lily and Severus's attention turned to us. Yes. He's quite the handsome fellow, isn't he? I smiled. Yes, but my name is James. James Potter, the boy responded, and my James hooted as if in reply. I saw the other James's mouth twitch. Oh well, you're also a handsome fellow, James Potter, I said, trying to stifle laughter. Lily and Severus were trying hard not to laugh as well. The other James's face turned a bit red, possibly from embarrassment or anger. I really didn't mean it, just an instinctive reaction, I thought. Hello, I'm Sawyer Hill. You can call me Sawyer. Hello, Sawyer. 
Could you maybe change your owl's name? Oh, I'll try. I took the cage down and placed it on the small table by the window. James, hmm, how about Daniel? That's a good name, Daniel. No response. Oh, you don't like that. How about something cute, Garfield? He preened his feathers. Not that one either. Then, how about King? Such a cool name, King. He turned his head away, impatient. Defeated, I turned back, sorry, James. My owl hooted in response. Oh, I think he's already accepted this name. At least he's handsome enough for a cough, I think you'll get used to it. I tried to suppress a laugh. Ignoring the other James's frustrated expression, I turned to the boy next to me, who was laughing uncontrollably. You should probably hold back a bit. I guess he's your friend. He tried to compose himself. Of course. Hi, I'm Sirius Black. Can I call you Sawyer? Sure, Sirius. This is Lily Evans and Severus Snape, my friends. I indicated them, and they nodded at each other. James the Owl flapped his wings again, expressing his displeasure at being ignored. We all looked at him and burst into laughter, even the other James, though it seemed a bit forced. Oh, I should put him back up. Ha! Huh. After the laughter, we felt much closer. Do you know which house you'll be sorted into? James asked. I think I might be in Slytherin. My whole family has been in Slytherin, Sirius said, sounding a bit defeated. Don't you want to go there? Severus asked. Of course not, it's boring there, Sirius replied grumpily. Yeah, Slytherins aren't very nice. Oh, Sirius, I didn't mean your family. Don't worry about them, a bunch of stubborn old folks, Sirius interrupted James. My mom was in Slytherin, and she's great, Severus said defensively. Oh, come on, Slytherins are all evil, sneaky. Lily interrupted him, enough. We know Severus's mom, and she's wonderful. How can you judge someone you've never even met? James wanted to argue back, but they're all evil. All right, that's enough. No matter what, we shouldn't generalize. Maybe some Slytherins are as you say, but not all of them. Severus's mom is a great witch, I interjected. As the tension hung in the air, a woman with a cheerful smile and dimples opened our compartment door and asked, Would you like to buy some snacks, dears? I broke the silence first, getting up to look at the snacks on her trolley. There were many strange treats I'd never seen before. I randomly picked some and paid, then shared them with Lily and Severus. James and Sirius bought some as well and returned to their seats, closing the compartment door. For a moment, it was quiet as we all ate. Severus went back to his book, clearly not wanting to interact with the two boys who had insulted his mother. I opened a packet of snacks and casually asked, earlier, I heard you mention Quidditch. Is that a sport? The boys perked up at the mention of the sport. You don't know Quidditch. It's the wizard's ultimate sport. We grew up in muggle families. Oh, that explains it. Quidditch is a game where wizards fly on broomsticks and compete. The compartment's atmosphere relaxed again. The rest of the journey passed uneventfully. Chapter 6 A voice echoed through the compartment. We will be arriving at Hogwarts in five minutes. Please leave your luggage on the train it will be taken to the school separately. Oh no, we haven't changed into our robes yet. Hurry up! Lily exclaimed. We all jumped up, scrambling to find our trunks and dig out our school robes. There was no time to change properly, so we had to hurriedly pull the robes over our clothes. The train began to slow down and finally came to a halt. We joined the throng of students disembarking onto a small, dark platform. It's so cold. Lily shivered, clutching my arm tightly. I grabbed Severus's hand, making sure not to lose him in the crowd. First years. First years, over here. Mind your step, now. Follow me. A voice called out. We followed the mass of students, stumbling slightly as we turned a corner. A collective gasp rose from the crowd. Oh. Before us lay a vast, black lake, and across it stood a towering castle. 
It reminded me of the majestic medieval castles from the movies I had seen in my past life, and I couldn't help but marvel at it. Soon, we were ushered into small boats that ferried us across the lake toward the castle. In no time, we found ourselves standing before a gigantic oak door. A stern-looking witch in emerald green robes was there to greet us. She reminds me of our headmistress back home, I whispered to Lily. She has the same aura Lily whispered back, even more quietly. The stern witch led us into an empty chamber and gave a brief speech. Her tone is quite similar to, Lily observed seriously, making me stifle a laugh. In a few moments, you will be sorted into your houses in front of the entire school. I suggest you take this time to compose yourselves, she finished before leaving the room. The room buzzed with whispered conversations about the sorting process. Everyone seemed anxious, including Lily, whose face had turned slightly pale. I was curious about the sorting method and began speculating with Severus about the nature of the surprise. Maybe there's a tough test, I suggested seriously, enjoying the nervous looks from the other kids. Severus gave me a look that said he was used to my antics and their effects. Before I could continue my intimidation, the stern witch returned and led us through the hall and into a grand dining hall. The lavish surroundings immediately captured everyone's attention. I observed the high table where the teacher sat. In the center was a white-bearded old man with a twinkling eye clearly, the headmaster. Then, the star of the evening made its appearance a tattered, pointy wizard's hat. It twitched and started singing, the rip near its brim opening and closing like a mouth. Ignoring the odd tune, I listened carefully to the lyrics. You might think I'm not so pretty. But don't judge on what you see. If you can find a smarter hat than me. I can eat myself to glee. There's nothing hidden in your head. The sorting hat can't see. So try me on and I will tell you. Where you ought to be. Perhaps in Gryffindor. Where dwell the brave at heart. Their daring, nerve, and chivalry. Set Griffinders apart. You might belong in Hufflepuff. Where they are just and loyal. Those patient Hufflepuffs are true. And unafraid of toil. Or yet in wise old Ravenclaw. If you've a ready mind. Where those of wit and learning. Will always find their kind. Or perhaps in Slytherin. You'll make your real friends. Those cunning folk use any means. To achieve their ends. Can it see thoughts? Thoughts, not memories. My past life memories should stay hidden, as long as I don't think about them, I mused silently. Gryffindor for bravery, Hufflepuff for loyalty, Ravenclaw for wisdom, Slytherin. I frowned slightly. The sorting commenced, and I noticed Sirius being sorted into Gryffindor. It seems family traditions can be broken. Lily's name was called next. She clutched my hand, gave me a brave look, then walked up to the hat. Gryffindor. The hat shouted almost immediately. I watched her take off the hat and head towards the Gryffindor table, turning back to look at me in Severus. I gave her a reassuring smile. Beside me, Severus sighed softly. It's all right, even if we're in different houses, it won't change our friendship, I whispered. He looked at me, relieved, and we exchanged a smile. The sorting continued. James was unsurprisingly placed in Gryffindor. Finally, it was Severus's turn. He was sorted into Slytherin, as expected. He glanced back at me as he walked towards the Slytherin table. I gave him a bright smile and a thumbs up. He chuckled at my antics. When all the other students had been sorted, my name was called last. I sat on the stool and the hat was placed over my eyes. Let's see, oh, Interesting. Clever, talented. Ah, a strong desire to protect someone. Not a bad heart. What's this? You like my song? Yes, Mr. Hat. The lyrics were great. And my singing? Ah. Quite memorable. Ha, huh, diplomatic. All right, let's see. Mr. Hat, I must say, your lyrics are excellent but you seem a bit biased against Slytherin. Words like those don't give a good impression of them. Is that fair? It only deepens the divide between houses. Shouldn't you, of all, wish for unity among the houses? 
you're quite partial, aren't you? Well, you are a fair-minded child. Very well, I shall think about the lyrics. Let's continue. Gryffindor. Thank you, maestro. The hat was removed, and I walked towards the cheering Gryffindor table, glancing at Severus with a mischievous smile. He shivered theatrically. I sat next to Lily, who immediately asked what took so long. Sirius and James across the table were equally curious. Trying not to laugh, I said, we had a delightful discussion about the art of lyrics. Ignoring their puzzled looks, I noticed the headmaster was concluding his speech with a thank you all, and the tables suddenly filled with food. Let's enjoy the feast, I said, helping myself to a bowl of soup. It tasted excellent. The children's attention shifted to the food. The feast was a spread of various meats, potatoes in different styles, and an assortment of vegetables. It was abundant, though there was no rice. Despite living in Britain for over a decade, my southern Chinese palate still craved rice. Isaiah would often prepare it for me at home, catering to my preferences. It wasn't authentic Chinese cuisine, but it sufficed. As everyone finished their meals, the remaining food and even the dirty dishes vanished. Shortly after, desserts appeared. I stared at my plate the Hogwarts emblem seemed to have rotated. It must have been replaced entirely. Magic is so handy. After dessert, the tables were cleared again. The headmaster rose to address a few final points, and we experienced a hilariously chaotic school song before the first years followed the prefects to our common room. Finally reaching the dormitory, I found the bed with my name on it and collapsed onto it. Lily was in the same room, along with two other girls, Mary MacDonald and Rebecca Green. The girls began chatting excitedly about the day's events. I got up, opened my owl's cage, and let James the owl out. He immediately flew to a perch, preening his feathers. I fed him some treats and sat down to write a letter home. Dear Isaiah and Hughes. Everything is fine here. Today was full of surprises, and I wish you could experience it all firsthand. It's been a long day, and sleep is calling me. I miss you both, and the rice. Yours, Sawyer. Chapter 7 In a bright room, a pale and frail girl sat slumped in an armchair by the large floor-to-ceiling window, clutching a thick book. A young boy, around four or five, sat obediently on the carpet beside her, playing with building blocks. Little Fay, if you want to go outside and play, you can. The girl said gently. No, the boy replied firmly, shaking his head. I want to stay home with you. The surgery wasn't very successful. The patient is experiencing severe rejection. Sweetheart, how are you feeling today? Little Fay has come to see you. Mom, I feel so tired. Continuing treatment is just prolonging the inevitable. I want to stop. Mom, I'll feel at ease knowing you have little Faye with you. Let's just let things take their course. Mummy, is sister going to leave us? Where is she going? Will she come back? Little Faye, she's going to a faraway place where she'll be happier. I opened my eyes, the room's still dark. Listening to the steady breathing of the other girls, I closed my eyes again. This was my first night at Hogwarts. I hadn't dreamt of my past since I was six. Was it the new bed? I turned over and fell back asleep. Sawyer, Lily, we're heading out, someone called. All right, see you. Lily and I called back, packing our bags as we waited for Severus outside the potions classroom. Ignoring the curious stares from students of both houses, we walked to the library with Severus, chatting and laughing. Two weeks into the term, people still weren't used to our trio, which I found rather amusing. I mentally rolled my eyes at their lack of composure. Some classes were shared between Gryffindor and Slytherin, and we always sat together. After classes, we would head to the library to study and do homework together. It was perfectly normal for us, though some people couldn't stand it. One evening, as we were heading to the Great Hall for dinner, we ran into the Gryffindor boys, James, Sirius, Remus Lupin, and Peter Pettigrew. Lily. Fancy seeing you here. James greeted Lily enthusiastically. Can you only see Lily? I teased. Oh, Sawyer, great to see you, 
he corrected himself, before turning to Severus. And you, Snape. I don't get why you two hang out with this greasy git, he sneered, directing his last comment to us with a look of disgust. Take that back, Potter. Lily snapped before I could say anything. He's our friend, and you have no right to insult him. James flushed at Lily's reprimand, glaring daggers at Severus, who returned the glare coldly. Ignoring everyone else, I dragged a fuming Lily and a sullen Severus away. Leaving them to wait outside the hall, I fetched some food and rejoined them. Let's go sit by the lake. We sat under a large tree by the lake, eating in silence. He's such an obnoxious, rude, and arrogant person. Lily fumed. Just ignore him. It's not worth getting upset over, I advised, knowing that such childish rivalries were common but hard to reconcile. Severus, don't let them get to you. Our friendship isn't going to change because of some baseless insults. Severus's mood improved slightly. We chatted about the essays we had to write for Professor Slughorn. As the sky darkened, we headed back to our respective common rooms. In the common room, as I pulled out my transfiguration homework, I said to Lily, next time they start on Severus, don't jump to scold them. Why not? Should we just let them say those awful things? Lily retorted, holding up her parchment indignantly. I'm just saying, don't scold them right away. It'll only make them dislike Severus more. We're two Griffinders defending a Slytherin. Those lions who already have a prejudice against Slytherin will just take it out on Severus, I explained, pulling out a pen from home those quills were still a struggle for me. So, what should we do? I hate the way they treat Severus because of some ridiculous prejudice. Lily protested. We'll do something, of course. That's where you come in. I winked at her. Next time there's a conflict, distract them. Talk about anything else, but don't mention Severus or Slytherin. I looked at the essay topic, the theory behind transfiguring matches into needles. Not too difficult. Why me? She asked, eyes wide with confusion. Because you're prettier, I replied with a straight face. Ha. She was taken aback. Yes, pretty girls have more sway with boys. Only you can make Potter back off. Once we handle him, the rest will follow. You always have such strange reasons. One afternoon, after lunch, we were on our way to the library with Severus. The Gryffindor boys had just finished eating and ran into us in the entrance hall. Another enthusiastic greeting from James. That boy was persistent. The mood was good until Severus arrived, and James immediately squared up like a rooster in a fight. Severus glared at him with equal intensity. I gave Lily a meaningful look. She nodded. Aren't we going to the library? Let's go. What about you, Potter? I need to check my potions essay for this afternoon, Lily said, acting nonchalant. Ah, potions this afternoon. I'm sure to mess up. Severus, can you help me prepare for the potion? I asked, giving Severus a pleading look. Severus glanced at Lily, then at me, suspicion in his eyes but he said nothing. He nodded in agreement. Ignoring how Lily would handle James and his friends, I quickly led Severus downstairs. We walked in silence until we reached the potions classroom. I headed to the student supplies cabinet to gather ingredients. What are you up to? Severus asked as he watched me. Nothing much. This way, Lily can handle them easily, and we avoid conflicts with our housemates, I said, carefully preparing the potion ingredients as per the textbook's instructions. You're cutting that too finely, Severus pointed out. Cut swiftly to get clean slices. Severus was a natural at potions. With talent and passion, I was sure he'd achieve great things in the field. During the potions class, I didn't ask about the earlier encounter. Later that evening, back in the common room, I asked Lily how it went. It was unbearable. Their stubborn prejudice is beyond understanding. They mentioned evil Slytherin eight times and various derogatory terms for Severus eleven times. I can't believe I didn't argue with them, Lily said, exasperated. Wise, smart, and beautiful Lily, 
welcome officially to the conflict resolution team, I said, extending my hand for a handshake. Who's the leader? She asked, shaking my hand. Me, of course. And the other members? You and me. Seriously, you did great. Next time they badmouth Slytherin, respond objectively. Don't defend Severus in a way that sounds personal. That way, they can't argue, I advised as we headed to our dormitory. Hmm. That makes sense. Severus isn't upset, is he? We're not ignoring him, Lily said worriedly. Of course not. I explained it to him. We just want to avoid conflicts with our housemates. Things began to settle down. The tension between James and Severus eased a bit, and soon, the Christmas holidays arrived. We all boarded the Hogwarts Express for the journey home. Chapter 8 The Christmas holidays had been delightful, if I could overlook the gift from Aunt Eileen. She gave me a book titled How to Manage Your Hair. It featured various hair care spells, potions, and animated demonstrations comprehensive indeed. But was Aunt Eileen hinting that I should grow out my hair? The book was all about maintaining long, beautiful locks. I ran a hand through my short hair, thinking it was just fine. However, short hair seemed to be out of fashion, and I hadn't seen any other girls at school with a hairstyle like mine. Maybe I could give it a try someday. I casually placed the book on my shelf. The holiday ended, and once back at school, I soon forgot all about it. Less than a month into the new term, I found myself lying dejectedly in the hospital wing. The reason for my unprecedented misery. House rivalries. During a heated clash between Gryffindor and Slytherin, I had become an unfortunate bystander, ending up in the hospital wing while the culprits remained unscathed. Two third-year boys had apologized while still exchanging hostile glares. Their eyes practically sparked with electricity truly a special kind of animosity. Madame Pomfrey promptly shooed them out when she brought me my potion. She assured me that after a good sleep, I'd be well enough to leave magic really is wonderful, I mused again. When I awoke, it was pitch dark. On my bedside table, I found a note from Lily saying she and Severus had visited while I was asleep. Leaving the hospital wing, I realized it was nearly curfew. Not in any hurry to return to the tower, I strolled leisurely through the castle. The silence was soothing, and Hogwarts at night exuded a mysterious charm that awakened my Gryffindor spirit. I wandered the deserted corridors, exploring less frequented areas, carefully avoiding the patrolling caretaker and the occasional mischievous ghost-like peeves. The sleeping portraits and hidden passageways piqued my curiosity. As I passed a seemingly ordinary landscape painting, I thought I heard something from within. Keeping my footsteps silent, I approached the painting and pressed my ear close, straining to listen. Time seemed to stretch as I held my breath, waiting. Has she gone? A cautious voice asked. Probably. No more sounds, replied a familiar voice. Close call. Almost. The painting shifted, slowly swinging open to the left. I quickly moved to the right, watching a face peek out right in front of me. Hi there, Black, I said with a broad grin. Fancy meeting you here. Footsteps echoed faintly from the end of the corridor. I pushed the startled Black back through the painting and slipped in behind him, closing it quietly. Shoo! The footsteps faded away. I turned to face the wary quartet Sirius, James, Remus Lupin, and Peter Pettigrew. Well, well, look who I've found. Playing adventure games, are we? Cut it out. You're the one sneaking around at night. Always hanging out with that Slytherin scum James began. James. Hill is our classmate, Remus interrupted, giving me an apologetic look. Sorry, Hill. James is just. You know, sensitive about some things. It's all right. But remember, just as you think all Slytherins are evil and cunning, they think all Griffinders are foolish and reckless. Don't give them reasons to believe those stereotypes. It's for the good of Gryffindor, I said coolly. And you, Black, I understand you have issues with your Slytherin family, but they raised you. You can choose your path, but don't forget your roots. Abandoning your family earns disdain. James glared at me furiously, while Sirius looked dejected, 
caught in the crossfire. You can choose to yell at me, Mr. Potter. I'll show you that Griffinders can be calm and rational, I continued. Ignoring him, I turned to Remus. Mr. Lupin, could you escort me back to the tower? I just left the hospital wing. I was a victim of one of those pointless Gryffindor Slytherin skirmishes you know so well, I said, casting a disdainful glance at James. Of course, Remus agreed, opening the painting. James, Sirius, Peter, I'll be back soon. We walked silently through the corridor, and I sighed. I didn't really need an escort. I just wanted to talk. You lot make me feel so frustrated. Severus is my best friend we've known each other since we were five. He's not the evil, sneaky person you think he is. Being stuck between you, Gryffindor and Slytherin, house loyalty and friendship it's a mess. Sometimes I wonder if things would have been easier if I were in Slytherin, I vented, knowing Remus understood I wasn't seeking answers. Thanks for listening, Remus. You're a good person, diligent in your studies. Despite hanging out with them, you've never been the one to provoke. We'd get along well if we were friends. We can be friends. Call me Remus. Next time, let's discuss homework together, Sawyer, he said with a kind smile. Of course, that'd be great, I replied, smiling back. A loud rumbling interrupted our conversation. Uh, that might be my stomach, I admitted, scratching my head sheepishly. I missed dinner while sleeping in the hospital wing. Want to grab something from the kitchen? Remus asked, stopping to look at me. The kitchen? You know where it is? Can students just go in? I asked, astonished. I'll take you. We found it during a nighttime excursion, thanks to a helpful Ravenclaw prefect, Remus explained, leading me downstairs. So it's not just Griffinders who enjoy midnight adventures I mused. Ha, huh, of course not. Especially the kitchen it's a vital spot. Students from every house come here if they miss a meal, he laughed. We soon reached the basement, stopping in front of a painting. Another painting? Is there a password, Remus? I asked, intrigued by the fruit painting. How could fruit respond to a password? You just need to tickle the pear. Like this. Remus reached out and tickled the pear, which squirmed before the painting swung open. Chapter 9 Behind the open portrait was a large hall, lined with four long tables set up exactly like the house tables in the great hall upstairs. There was also a fifth table running perpendicular to the others, reminiscent of the staff table. This must be directly below the great hall, I realized, piecing it together. Seems so. And those are house elves, Remus pointed out. Only then did I notice the other inhabitants of the hall. They were short, with large ears and eyes like tennis balls, dressed in white tea towels emblazoned with the Hogwarts crest. House elves. I'd read about them but had never seen one before. Uh, hello, I greeted uncertainly. Good evening, miss. Delighted to serve you. What can I get for you? The house elf squeaked, clearly thrilled. Oh, I just need something to eat. Anything will do, just to fill my stomach. But no pumpkin juice, please. Of course, right away. The little figure bustled off. Uh, do these house elves make all the food we usually eat? I asked Remus. Technically, yes, but it's not just one of them. More than one. Then where are the others? The other house elves are resting now. Tonight it's just me and Tito on duty, miss. My name is Bobo. The house elf, Bobo, quickly returned with a tray of food, including a steaming bowl of soup, a glass of pumpkin juice, and some pies. Thank you, Bobo. You can call me Sawyer. I took the tray, inhaling the delicious aroma of the soup. So, why are you the only one here? Where's Tito? She's in the back, Miss Sawyer. She's very sad today because it's the anniversary of her old master's death, and it's also the day she was thrown out twelve years ago. Bobo's large head drooped sorrowfully. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, Bobo. You can go comfort her. We don't need anything else, and you've already helped us. I spoke gently. Oh, thank you, kind miss. 
Just call my name if you need me. With a nod from me, Bobo disappeared. Remus, are there many house elves at Hogwarts? I asked as we munched on pies. Yes, quite a few, though I don't know the exact number. Do they all come from wizarding families? Most of them do. Many wizard families have house elves, and they rarely release one. For a house elf, being released is a disgrace, and they find it hard to get work elsewhere. Not having work is very distressing for them. They're incredibly hard-working creatures, Remus explained. I heard that Professor Dumbledore hired many freed house elves, giving them jobs. He's a kind and great wizard. Remus's eyes shone with admiration. Griffinders seem to idolize Dumbledore. I sighed internally. Dumbledore always struck me as a cunning, calculating figure beneath his kindly facade. Those twinkling blue eyes behind his half-moon spectacles seemed to harbor secrets. He might be a Gryffindor alumnus, but he had a touch of Slytherin about him. Perhaps that's why he was so successful. Nonetheless, he was undeniably a great wizard. Sawyer, are you tired? Remus's voice brought me back to the present. He smiled, repeating, Are you tired? You seem to drift off. If you're done eating, let's head back. Ah, sorry, yes, I'm a bit tired. Let's go. I placed the tray down and followed Remus out of the kitchen. Back in the dormitory, I quietly climbed into bed. Lily and the other girls were sound asleep. I lay there, staring at the moonlight spilling onto the foot of my bed through the curtains. Thinking of that irritating potter filled me with a sense of helplessness. The enmity between Gryffindor and Slytherin was as old as Hogwarts itself, a proud tradition of sorts, with both sides relishing the rivalry. It was tiresome. They could battle all they wanted, as long as they didn't target Severus and me. Severus was like family to me. If they hurt him, there would be hell to pay, I thought as sleep finally claimed me. The next morning, I woke up late. After a rushed start, I barely made it to history of magic class on time. Sitting in my seat, still yawning, I managed to fall asleep ten minutes into the lesson. When I woke up, the class was over. Feeling refreshed, I went to find Severus, who had just finished herbology. Catching him on the way back to the castle, I dragged him to the library. It was a good place to study mostly quiet and free from troublemakers with Madame Pants around. We settled down to read. I was skimming through a book about magical trace detection. Ever since learning about the restriction on underage magic outside school, I'd been curious about how the ministry monitored us. They couldn't possibly have surveillance devices on each of us. There had to be a way to circumvent it. The ban on magic during holidays was frustrating I wasn't some irresponsible child who couldn't control their actions. Stretching and moving closer to Severus, I saw he was engrossed in a thick book on advanced potion theory, the diagrams resembling complex chemistry. Ugh, this looks complicated, I murmured. This isn't first year material, is it? No, it's for third or fourth years, Severus replied without looking up. Wow, you're a potions genius, I said, clicking my tongue. Severus finally looked up, snorted, and buried his head back in the book. His slight smile showed he was pleased. I chuckled quietly. Kids always liked being praised, no matter how prickly they seemed. Not long after, Lily joined us. She had gone back to the dormitory with Mary after history of magic. Excitedly, she pulled out a letter. Petunia's letter arrived. She's been chosen to represent her class in the end-of-term essay competition. She's so brilliant, she'll do great. She was so thrilled that she forgot to lower her voice, earning a stern look from Madam Pants. Lily ducked her head, sticking her tongue out. Her face was flushed with excitement, breathing heavily from running all the way. Looks like we'll have to prepare a celebration for her during the summer holidays, right, Severus? I patted Lily's back. Severus looked at us, not answering, but his eyes were warm with a soft smile. Chapter 10 In the blink of an eye, Exams were approaching, and the school was engulfed in a frenzied atmosphere of last-minute revision. It was normal for a group of half-grown children to fear exams. Considering China's exam-oriented education system, 
students are accustomed to exams from elementary school onward, with midterms, finals, and regular classroom tests. During the high school entrance exams, there's a test every three days and a major exam every five days. After so many exams, you get used to it or burnt out. Oops, I mean, you get used to it. Despite the intensity, everyone still feels nervous before the high school entrance exams. I remember taking mine in a special care room due to my health. It was hard to stay calm in that atmosphere, and I almost missed the exams due to a health flare-up. Compared to that, these semester finals, which happen just once a year, hardly phase me. Lily, however, was very anxious. Despite being a bright and diligent girl, she found this stressful. I always tried to reassure her, dragging her out of the library to rest on the grassy lakeside when her head was about to explode from studying. Severus wasn't doing much better. His situation at the academy was tough without a prestigious family background, not even being a pure blood, and with a gloomy, somewhat withdrawn personality. Severus was not an easy person to get along with. The shadows of his childhood still lingered in his heart, the disdainful and fearful looks from children and adults, and the domestic violence. I can imagine what kind of damage that must have done, especially to a child. I still remember the image of that five-year-old boy, frail and lonely, like a wounded young beast that tugs at your heartstrings. At Hogwarts, not to mention the other Griffinders, the taunts from Potter's gang alone were enough. The Ravenclaws were busy with their studies, and the Hufflepuffs were absorbed in their own little world, not inclined to bother others. Slytherin House, which valued pure blood status and power, made life particularly difficult for a newcomer like Severus. He had only Lily and me as friends, and being close to us Griffinders made his situation in Slytherin even harder. I couldn't help but frown at the thought. Sawyer, are you finally starting to worry about the exams? Lily teased when she saw me frowning and lost in thought. I'm worried about more than just exams I'm worried about life. I intoned dramatically. This little lion would be indignant if she knew about these matters, and Severus certainly wouldn't want us worrying about him. I turned to Severus, who was leaning against a tree with a book. Severus, how's your studying going? When you're taking a break, you shouldn't be reading. You need to relax. It's all right. I could study a bit more, he replied without looking up. He probably wanted to earn Slytherin's recognition through his excellence. I sighed, oh, fine. But you must ensure you get enough sleep. I emphasized. Promise us you'll get enough sleep. Lily nodded in agreement. Seeing our insistence, Severus reluctantly nodded. Yes, I promise to get enough sleep. His expression made Lily and me exchange a smile. A week of exams passed. Our last exam was on Friday morning. Lily and I walked out of the classroom and ran into Severus, who had also just finished, and we all headed to the Great Hall together. Passing by the house points hourglasses, Lily's low exclamation drew our attention. She pointed at our house points Gryffindor's rubies were significantly fewer than the gems in the other house's hourglasses. There were a lot more yesterday. How could we lose so many points in one day? Lily fumed. We were at least in second place, but now we're last. Gryffindor was in second place, Miss Evans, until Mr. Potter and his friends decided to be in the Forbidden Forest at midnight, Professor McGonagall, the stern witch from the sorting ceremony in our head of house, approached from behind. I had no choice but to deduct 120 points from our house 30 points each. I'm very disappointed, she said, her severe expression tinged with clear disappointment. They've gone too far. Lily raged, waiting until McGonagall's back was turned before erupting. Indeed. Getting caught was pathetic, I muttered. I didn't think I'd care about house points, but at that moment, I was genuinely upset. No surprise there. Given the inverse ratio of their brain capacity to their muscular strength, it's to be expected, Severus sneered. He restrained himself from saying something harsher in front of us. When confronting Potter's gang, he didn't hold back his cutting remarks. Watching their verbal sparring could be quite entertaining, as Severus never lost in a war of words. I just hoped it wouldn't come to physical fights I feared the four might seriously hurt Severus. Sawyer, the Forbidden Forest is dangerous. 
This isn't just sneaking around the castle, it's a serious rule violation. What were they thinking? Do they think they're invincible? Lily started her lecture. This term, she had grown somewhat closer to the four than I had. When it didn't involve Severus, Lily still cared for her Gryffindor peers. Severus, if it were for some rare potion ingredients, you'd risk the Forbidden Forest too, wouldn't you? I whispered to Severus. He gave me a, of course, look, whispering back, I certainly wouldn't be stupid enough to get caught and lose points. A week later, the exam results were out. As expected, Lily did exceptionally well, and so did Severus. Remus also scored well. Surprisingly, Potter and Black didn't do badly either. Compared to them, my grades were quite average, which wasn't a surprise I hadn't put much effort into studying. Doing well in class didn't necessarily mean high exam scores. On the last day of term, Dumbledore announced the House Cup winners for the year, unsurprisingly, Slytherin. Regarding Gryffindor's pitifully few rubies, the other lions collectively scorned the quartet's point-deducting antics. Some upperclassmen even earnestly advised them on how to break rules without getting caught. The dinner in the green and silver decorated Great Hall ended on a relatively pleasant note. The next day, we all boarded the Hogwarts Express with our luggage. In our compartment, Severus, Lily, and I discussed our summer plans. I'm planning to visit Diagon Alley in a few days. What about you? Will you join me? I asked, catching a chocolate frog attempting to escape. I want to go too. I'd like to visit my mom's apothecary in Diagon Alley. I haven't been there yet, Severus said, eyeing me as I took a big bite of the frog. I'll go too. Let's bring Petunia along. Lily said, grabbing the card from my hand. This one's Dumbledore. You already have one can I have this one? Sure, I don't plan on collecting the cards, especially since the characters like to run away. Haha <laughs> but you're still collecting them. Chapter 11 During the first week of vacation, I mostly stayed at home, busy with my holiday homework. Lily and Severus visited me a few times, but they were persuaded by my theory that finishing homework early would allow us to enjoy the rest of the holiday stress-free. So, they went home to do their homework as well. The assignments, mostly theoretical essays, were manageable with some flipping through books and notes. I was also excited about my anti-underage magic restriction plan, which I'd start testing in a few days. Having completed all my homework, I finally breathed a sigh of relief. We had planned a celebration for Petunia tonight, and with my assignments out of the way, I could start my real vacation. That evening, our little celebration took place in Lily's room at the Evans house. We had prepared food and drinks, including some snacks from the wizarding world. We chatted all evening about Petunia's school life and our time at Hogwarts. Most of the conversation was lively among us three girls, while Severus mostly listened, occasionally smiling or raising an eyebrow, sometimes adding a sharp comment. I revealed the foolish antics of one of Lily's admirers, earning a disdainful snort from Severus. Lily dug up some embarrassing moments from Petunia's essay competition, leaving poor Petunia blushing, unsure if it was from anger or embarrassment. The wizarding snacks surprised Petunia, and she shared my love for chocolate frogs. The next day, Sunday, Eileen took Severus and me to Diagon Alley. Sundays were family days for Lily, so she didn't join us. This trip to Diagon Alley lacked the novelty of the first visit, so we headed straight to Eileen's apothecary. The shop was small, not in a prominent location, just a little storefront on a street corner, simply named the apothecary. Inside, there were no employees, only a house elf named Kaka. Eileen explained that Kaka was a house elf from the prince family. After the family's decline and her divorce, she had visited their old estate, finding only an abandoned manor and this loyal house elf. She had converted the manor into a potion base, where she produced most of the shop's potions and conducted her experimental research. The manor also housed a large collection of potion books, accessible only to Severus once he reached fourth-year potion proficiency. Severus's eyes lit up with determination at this prospect. Eileen's shop primarily stocked common potions, with higher-level potions available by order. Each potion sold was marked Prince on the bottom, ensuring high quality and building a strong brand. 
Eileen truly demonstrated her talents and capabilities after breaking free from the constraints of a troubled romance. I asked why she didn't name the shop Prince Apothecary. She pulled a potion bottle from a shelf, showing us the bottom labeled S. This potion was made by Severus. It's his personal creation, not the Prince family's, Eileen explained, turning to Severus. Even though it's just some basic potions now, as long as you can produce high-quality potions, there will be a place for your work here. She pointed to a row of shelves. There are also contributions from others here, as long as they pass quality checks. Sawyer, you could try making some extra money too, she winked at me. Severus, the Gringotts key I gave you is for a vault I opened for you, containing the money earned from your potion sales, Eileen added, looking pleased at Severus's rare stunned expression. It's not much yet but you can use your own money for things you like. Severus's joy turned him momentarily childlike, I can buy ingredients to make advanced potions from the books now. I patted his shoulder, smiling, I knew your potions were the best. We'll need to find a suitable place at school for your potions work, though. Always using the potions classroom isn't ideal. Severus returned to his composed demeanor, though a faint blush colored his cheeks. Eileen ruffled his hair affectionately, amused by his bashfulness. After leaving the apothecary, we wandered around on our own, visiting a second-hand store. Severus picked out some old books, and I bought a second-hand wand that felt quite good in my hand. Testing a few simple spells, it worked reasonably well. Severus looked puzzled by my purchase. Once we left the store, before he could ask, I explained, I researched the restrictions on underage magic use. The ministry monitors our magic usage partly through our wands, which are registered with them. Using magic during holidays would trigger their sensors. I twirled the new wand, made of elm with a unicorn hair core, ten and a half inches long. They also monitor magical activity in our living areas. However, in wizarding households, because there are adults, they can't pinpoint who cast the spell. For muggle-borns, they rely on parental supervision. So, you can't use magic at home? Severus frowned, considering the plausibility of this explanation. But wouldn't my mom's magic be counted against you? Exactly, if that's how it works, I said, transforming a small roadside stone into a chubby white mug with a transfiguration spell. But since Eileen has frequently used magic at my house since I was six, our home might be assumed to be a wizarding residence. I'll test it out at home. Want to buy a spare one too? I put away my new wand. No, I don't need one at home, Severus said. It seemed he was more interested in potions than practicing spells. Back home, I immediately locked myself in my room to experiment. Starting with small spells, I began with Lumos. I tried several classroom spells, all working fine without receiving any ministry warning letters. Next, I tested some household spells I had learned from books, like basic cleaning and organizing spells, which also worked perfectly. Conclusion, the anti-underage magic restriction plan was a success. Feeling a bit smug, I went downstairs. Isaiah was humming while cleaning the living room. I cleared my throat, and under her watchful eyes, I waved my wand over the furniture she was dusting, casting a cleaning spell. The thin layer of dust vanished, leaving the surfaces gleaming. Isaiah's astonished look made me laugh out loud. Sawyer, you really are a witch. Isaiah exclaimed, making me wince slightly. Did she think I was faking it all this time? Oh, Sawyer, it's not that I didn't believe you. It's just the first time I've seen you do real magic not just making things float, Isaiah clarified, still looking thrilled. You're amazing. From now on, you can handle all the cleaning when you're home. No problem. I muttered, realizing her impression of wizards was that they made excellent housekeepers. Looks like I'd have to research more household magic. Chapter 12 I first met Sawyer when I was five years old. The summer sun was dazzling, but not as bright as Sawyer's smile. With short black hair, eyes that curved when smiling, and a hearty laugh, he declared himself my first friend. I always thought Sawyer was the coolest person I'd ever met. Even when I later discovered that he was actually she, it didn't change my opinion she was still the coolest. 
Sawyer was the first muggle I met who wasn't afraid of me. She was curious, asking all sorts of questions, and her admiration was clear. I immediately decided she was the best person to me, besides my mother. Later, I found out she was a witch too, but that didn't change the fact that she remained the best person to me, even till the end. After my mother divorced my father, with the help of Sawyer's parents, he left, and we stayed in our house on Spinner's End. The Hills were wonderful people, and our families grew closer. My mother started to pick herself up. No longer wearing a perpetually somber face, she began teaching me how to brew potions and started working on opening her apothecary. Life at home improved without the drunken, raging man around, and both mom and I were much happier. I loved my father, but that didn't mean I wanted him to ruin our lives. Apart from the Hill family, my mother and I rarely interacted with other muggles. I still had to endure the looks people gave me, like I was a monster sneers, insults, disdain. But it didn't matter as long as I had Sawyer, my only friend and my family. Meeting Lily was a delightful surprise. She was a pretty little witch, and unlike others my age, she understood me. Naturally, the four of us Sawyer, Lily, Petunia, and I became friends. Though Petunia eventually warmed up to us, my first impression of her would have been better if she hadn't looked at me like that when we first met. Later, when Sawyer turned out to be a witch too, the three of us went to Hogwarts together. It felt like a dream come true, even though the fact that they were sorted into impulsive Gryffindor somewhat marred that perfection. Life in Slytherin was as challenging as I had imagined. I understood my position clearly in power-centric Slytherin, I needed to prove my strength. That foolish Potter constantly provoked me with pathetic excuses. As if I didn't notice that he always did so when Lily was around, looking at her eagerly whenever she spoke. It was as if he was seeking her reprimands, like a masochist. If he truly liked Lily, he should pursue her boldly instead of using me as a ploy. His obsession with calling Slytherins evil made me want to show him real evil, rather than engaging in these tedious arguments. Sawyer often pulled me away from these confrontations, saying she didn't want to clash with our housemates. Was she protecting me? Such verbal attacks didn't really hurt me, but did she think helping me wouldn't anger the Griffinders? I noticed how some Griffinders looked at Sawyer, nearly calling her a traitor. Sawyer letting Lily get closer to Potter and his friends was probably to protect her. Those foolish Griffinders oh, because of Sawyer and Lily, I had to be mindful of my words when cursing Griffinders. What I could do now was to strengthen myself. I would become powerful, gaining the strength to protect the me Gryffindor family and friends. Chapter 13 When the holiday ended, even Isaiah didn't want me to leave. I had grown quite familiar with my elm wand, diligently practicing household spells from a book I'd specifically purchased for that purpose. The summer provided plenty of opportunities to practice, and I became rather proficient. Practicing household spells at home was convenient, though it did cause some minor chaos, which I managed to resolve. The spells I mastered most were Reparo and various cleaning charms. I even enchanted a broom to clean automatically and kept it locked in a cupboard when not in use, repeatedly stressing that it must not be discovered, as it is illegal to modify muggle objects. After receiving the book list for the second year, the three of us went to Diagon Alley. At Flourish and Blots, I bought the complete set of standard book of spells. Last year was the beginner's level, and this year was the second level, so it seemed we needed a new one each year. I decided to buy the entire set at once to study at home. Most of them were everyday spells, which were quite fun. Transfiguration was another interesting subject there were only three textbooks, but they exceeded my budget. Lily, after visiting the apothecary, had been enthusiastic about making high-quality potions to sell. She excelled in potions, and Professor Slughorn, who appreciated her despite her muggle-born status, frequently praised her. In potions class, I usually paired with Lily, handling preparations and minor tasks. Even spending so much time with Severus didn't enhance my potion-making skills. So, I could only watch enviously as the two potion prodigies discussed earning extra money with their skills. When the school term started, I finally had my vine wood wand back in hand. No matter how comfortable the elm wand was, it was still just a spare. Testing the spells I had learned over the summer with my vine wand, I found they worked even better. 
I had just sent a letter home with my owl, James. I rarely kept him in his cage, so he was often out of sight, only returning at night to see if I had any tasks for him. Lying on my bed, my thoughts wandered, and I recalled this year's sorting hat song. Gryffindor values the bravest. Ravenclaw prizes the cleverest minds. Hufflepuff esteems the most diligent. And Slytherin admires those with ambition. This seemed like another version of the hat song. I didn't think the sorting hat would write new lyrics just because of my comments. It had supposedly existed for over a thousand years, observing countless minds, and likely many have complained about perceived unfairness towards Slytherin. Perhaps I was one of the few Gryffinders who thought this way. Quite possible. Why was I sorted into Gryffindor? It was a bit of a headache. I initially had no preference the courses and professors are the same in every house. Although Ravenclaw supposedly has its own library, I was not particularly passionate about books and research. I preferred the thrill of wielding my wand and feeling the magic flow through me. To me, Slytherin was elegant, Ravenclaw was scholarly, Hufflepuff was pure, and Gryffindor was lively though I'd come to realize they could be excessively so. I was glad Severus had been sorted into his desired Slytherin, and Lily fitted well in Gryffindor. It was nice to be in the same house as Lily. But why must these two houses be such bitter rivals? It was a persistent problem for me, making it difficult to navigate Gryffindor. Our friendship had drawn criticism from both houses. I was less worried about Severus Slytherin valued strength, and I had confidence in his abilities. He was not one to be trifled with. Lily, being pretty, charming, and academically successful, with Potter looking out for her, seemed in a fairly good position. The problem laid with Meverage in studies, looks, and popularity, and with a tomboyish demeanor. Gryffinders thought I fraternized with the evil Slytherins, while others saw me as betraying my house. Oh, how unpopular I was. This couldn't continue. With six years left, I needed a plan. I had to find a way to gain Gryffindor's approval without compromising my friendship with Severus. Sigh, one step at a time. As the second year classes commenced, I focused on earning points for Gryffindor. Except for potions, where no amount of preparation seemed to help, I excelled in other subjects, especially charms and transfiguration, thanks to my summer practice. This diligent effort to earn points yielded good results, though the four members of Potter's group, minus the inconspicuous Pettigrew, often earned points as well, they lost just as many for their nighttime escapades. My relentless efforts showed in the rising number of house points, with gratifying results. Gryffinder's attitude toward me finally softened no one could accuse me of betraying the house now. The two fifth-year prefects even encouraged me to continue striving for Gryffinder's honor. I breathed a sigh of relief. Gryffinders were easy to please. After all, I was still a Gryffinder and had never done anything to tarnish its honor. Now, they had no reason to deny my contributions to the house. I started doing my homework in the common room at night, bringing along some reference books I had studied in the library earlier. Among the second years struggling with their essays, I quickly finished mine, exceeding the required length. Padding the reference books, I gave a naive, innocent smile, these books were really helpful. I've bookmarked the sections that can aid understanding. I hope they help you too. Then, pretending to be shy, I left. As expected, some second years began to treat me more kindly. I almost wanted to laugh out loud with triumph. One afternoon after lunch, the three of us gathered at our usual spot by the lake. I was practicing the Aguamenti charm, which we would learn in the afternoon charms class. I had already mastered it during the summer. Sawyer, you learn spells so quickly. You're always the first to finish in charms class, earning us many points. That's amazing. Lily praised, holding a book and watching as I successfully filled a cup with water. That's because I enjoy practical magic. My theory isn't as good as yours. I shrugged, emptying the cup into the lake and continuing to practice. Aguamenti. And potions, I've tried hard, but it's clear my talents don't lie there. That's where you and Severus excel. I shrugged again. But at least I can earn points in charms for Gryffindor. As a Gryffindor, I have to strive for Gryffindor's honor, right? I made a funny face. 
Severus looked up from his book and gave me a deep look. I think he understood that I was trying to gain acceptance from my house. He seemed to know my situation in Gryffindor quite well. So perceptive. Chapter 14 After finishing my homework early, I left the common room and headed towards the potions classroom in the dungeons. Severus was usually there brewing his potions at this time. The dungeons were perpetually cool, making them ideal for preserving potion ingredients. The potions classroom, located there, benefited from this environment. Severus had mentioned that the Slytherin dormitories were situated underwater, beneath the lake. Such a cold and damp environment seemed unsuitable for student living, especially for seven years. Not every Slytherin must have liked this tradition. Sometimes I thought Hogwarts was too old-fashioned and stubborn. Or perhaps it was the entire wizarding world clinging to their antiquated ways. I gently pushed open the door to the potions classroom and, sure enough, there was Severus. His potion was bubbling in the cauldron as he stirred it methodically. Noticing my arrival, Severus didn't get distracted or greet me. I closed the door quietly and tiptoed to a table by the wall, sitting down with my book. The classroom was serene, filled only with the bubbling of the potion and the occasional rustling of my pages. This was my favorite time of day peaceful, with no laughter, no conversations, just the sound of breathing bringing a sense of calm. I was reading a muggle novel. I often read muggle books during this time sometimes literature, sometimes books from other fields like science, finance, psychology, or even hypnosis. I also read Chinese books, all relatively simple, making them easy to read. Despite wizards' disdain for muggle things, they had achieved remarkable accomplishments. I wanted to maintain some connection with the muggle world through these books. After finishing a chapter, I marked my place with a magical bookmark and closed the book. Rubbing my tired eyes, I stretched lazily and lay my head on the desk, glancing at Severus through a tilted perspective. He was still focused, calculating time and heat, his dark eyes fixed on the potion. His hair, now long enough to touch his ears, looked a bit greasy and clumped in strands. Hmm, Severus needs to wash his hair, I thought as sleepiness crept over me. Severus finally finished, carefully transferring the potion into a vial. Looking over, he couldn't help but chuckle at the sight of Sawyer asleep on the desk. After cleaning up, Severus approached and sat down beside her, quietly reading his book. A hit so late. We've missed curfew for quite a while now. Severus, why didn't you wake me? I whispered, running my hands through my hair in distress. I saw you were asleep, Severus replied, closing his book and starting to pack his bag. Oh, Severus. Did you sit here reading the whole time? I asked, gathering my books from the desk, feeling guilty. I'm sorry, Severus. You could have woken me up so you could get back to your dorm earlier. It's so late now. I shouldn't have fallen asleep here. It's fine. I'll walk you back to the tower, Severus said, closing the potions classroom door quietly. Shoo. We'll go this way. Slughorn's quarters are nearby, and we need to be quiet. At the staircase, I stopped him. You don't need to escort me. Your dorm is in the dungeons, and it's a long way to Gryffindor Tower. Plus, we have Filch and patrolling professors. That's why I'm insisting. Let's go, Severus interrupted, leaving no room for argument as he started up the stairs. I pouted but followed. But two of us together are more likely to be caught, I muttered internally. Does he have more experience with sneaking around than I do? Hogwarts is full of secrets, and every night journey feels like a new adventure. To avoid being caught by patrolling staff or other night owls, like Potter's group, you need some skills. Can't you use a disillusionment charm now? Severus asked, waiting for me to catch up. I was surprised. How did you know? I had only learned it last week and hadn't shown it off yet. I noticed you were looking for books on disillusionment charms in the library for some time. Given your abilities, I figured you would have mastered it by now, Severus said naturally. Was I that obvious? I muttered, feeling exposed. Standing in the corridor, I cast a disillusionment charm on both of us, making Severus vanish. I added a silencing charm around us to muffle our footsteps and voices. 
Severus? Unable to see him, I reached out and grabbed his arm. All right, let's go. Walking through the empty hallways, a thought crossed my mind. Severus, are you planning to keep using the potions classroom for brewing? It's not ideal. I can only brew certain potions there with the professor's permission. Slughorn has allowed me to make some advanced potions, but the school only provides basic ingredients. For more experiments, I need a private workspace. I was thinking of finding an unused, hidden classroom. Maybe I can keep an eye out during my night wanderings, I offered. Perhaps I could ask the house elves in the kitchen. They know many places we don't, besides preparing food and cleaning the castle. Thanks. We reached the portrait of the fat lady outside the Gryffindor common room. After giving the password, the sleepy fat lady swung open the frame. You've arrived. I'll head back, Severus said, preparing to leave. Severus, be careful. You can end the disillusionment charm with, finite incantatum, when you get back. Good night. I released his arm. Good night. Hearing his reply, I turned and entered the common room, the portrait closing behind me. The common room was empty, with only the dying embers in the fireplace flickering. I dispelled the disillusionment charm and slipped back into my dormitory. Chapter 15 By the time I climbed into bed, I wasn't sleepy at all. Lying on my back with my hands behind my head, I thought about what I had mentioned to Severus. I decided to act on it immediately. I sat up abruptly, drew the heavy bed curtains, and cast a silencing charm. I called out softly, Bobo. The book on house elves mentioned that they could respond to their master's call. Bobo belonged to Hogwarts, so I wasn't sure if it would respond to a student summons. I waited quietly for a moment, but nothing happened. Disappointed, I sighed. It seemed that only the headmaster could summon them. Just as I was about to lie back down, a small figure appeared at the foot of my bed with a pop. Miss Sawyer called for Bobo. A high-pitched voice said excitedly, and a pair of large eyes gleamed in the darkness before me. Hi, Bobo, I greeted it, swallowing the scream that had nearly escaped my throat. I was glad I hadn't lifted the silencing charm. I lit my wand with a soft lumos. I did call for you. I didn't think students could summon you, though, since I'm not your master. The weak blue light from my wand illuminated the small space, and Bobo stood up straight, retreating to the foot of the bed. Of course. Our master is Hogwarts, and only the headmaster can directly command us. But we can hear your summons and respond if we choose to. Bobo is happy to answer Miss Sawyer's call. Bobo finished his tasks quickly to come here. Its voice rose even higher, its bat-like ears perking up. House elves are indeed enthusiastic creatures. I sat cross-legged. Thank you, Bobo. I need your help with something. Bobo leaned forward slightly, ready to listen intently. Well, I need a place to conduct independent potion experiments. It should be secret, where no one else can find it. Does Hogwarts have such a place? I asked tentatively. Of course, Miss Sawyer. Hogwarts secrets are never fully discovered, but Bobo knows a place. It's called the Room of Requirement, also known as the Come and Go Room. Why? How does it work? My curiosity was piqued. It only appears when you truly need it, and when it appears, it is arranged to meet your needs. So, it fulfills your requirements. Oh, except for food. I didn't ask why it couldn't provide food I was too fascinated by its capabilities. So, if I need a place only I can access, no one else can find it. Yes, absolutely, Miss Sawyer. Then why doesn't everyone know about it? I was puzzled. All Hogwarts house elves know. Sometimes we find new recipes in there when professors or students want to change their diet, we can find enough variations to meet their demands. Some students have found the room of requirement before, but they can't find it again because they don't know the secret. Bobo explained mysteriously. I was thrilled this didn't feel like cheating. Can you tell me, Bobo? Can you take me there? Bobo eagerly bowed. I would be delighted to serve you. How about tomorrow? Is that all right? Where should I meet you? 
After lunch tomorrow, come to the eighth floor. Bobo will wait for you there. That sounds perfect. Thank you, Bobo. I was genuinely grateful to this eager little creature. My pleasure. Bobo bowed excitedly again, ready to disappear. Oh, by the way, do you know how to cook Chinese food? I asked hopefully. Bobo's ears drooped. Miss Sawyer wants to eat Chinese food. Bobo cannot cook it. But Bobo will ask the other elves, and if no one knows, Bobo will find a recipe. There's no rush, and it's okay if you don't know. I quickly reassured him. You've already been a great help. Thank you so much, Bobo. Bobo, once again excited, bowed and disappeared. The information I learned tonight made me so excited that it took a long time to fall asleep. Thankfully, the next day was Saturday, so I slept in. Having missed breakfast, I had a chocolate frog to tide me over and headed to the common room to read. After lunch, I told Lily I was heading out and made my way to the eighth floor alone. The eighth floor was close to the entrance to the Gryffindor common room. Finding no one around, I wandered the eighth floor corridor. After a few steps, I heard a familiar sharp voice. Miss Sawyer, this way. Bobo called me from near a tapestry. The strange tapestry depicted a troll in a tutu trying to teach ballet to a group of bewildered students. Bobo instructed me to concentrate on what I needed while walking past the blank wall opposite the tapestry three times. I had to try it. I need a place to practice spells, I need a place to practice spells, I need a place to practice spells. A door appeared in the blank wall, looking like the entrance to a normal classroom. I approached and opened it. Inside, it resembled a charms classroom, with one desk, a sofa along the wall, and a row of bookshelves. Various spell practice tools were scattered around. Wow, perfect, I marveled. This is such a great place. Thank you, Bobo. I think I know how to use it now. Bobo's eyes shone with happiness as he bowed and disappeared. I spent the entire afternoon immersed in this practice room. The bookshelves were filled with a wide range of books, from basic spell books to advanced ones. Some had warnings that they shouldn't be practiced alone. I practiced all the spells I had learned and started studying a book on healing spells. When I finally checked the time, it was already dinner. Rushing to the great hall, I joined the Gryffindor table just as dinner was ending. I quickly grabbed some food. Lily saw me and immediately asked, where have you been? You left in such a hurry after lunch, and we couldn't find you all afternoon. Severus and I were worried. Mouth full, I mumbled, I'll explain everything in a bit, promise. Once I finished eating, I pulled Lily along and found Severus, leading them to the eighth floor. This is going to be a surprise. Follow me. Sitting in the room I had requested for secret conversations, I began explaining the room of requirements existence and how to use it to an astonished Lily and Severus. So, this is the room of requirement. It really provides whatever we need? Lily asked, both surprised and excited. Severus's eyes also sparkled with interest. I'm sure. I spent the entire afternoon in the practice room I created. I lost track of time. I admitted, blushing a bit. Can I try it? Severus asked urgently, standing up. Of course, but we need to step outside first. It can't create another room while someone is inside. We stepped out, and Severus and Lily each took turns. Severus conjured a perfect potions lab, while Lily recreated her room at home down to the smallest details, including the muggle trinkets on her desk. I was amazed at how quickly she had mastered using the room of requirement. After much discussion, we created a room for all three of us, accessible only to those who knew to ask for S. L's base. Inside, it had a potions lab, a practice room, and a lounge. It became our sanctuary. Chapter 16 With our new base established, I spent most of my free time there. The various spell books in the practice room fascinated me, especially those on healing magic. The last time I was injured and went to the hospital wing, Madame Pomfrey had me back on my feet with just a few wand flicks and a potion. I was amazed by the wonders of healing magic. 
Unfortunately, the school didn't offer a dedicated course on it, and while the library had comprehensive books, they weren't very in-depth. Once I began studying healing magic, the Room of Requirement provided more resources tailored to my needs. I absolutely adored this thoughtful and versatile room. Healing spells, however, were challenging to practice. For now, I focused on learning the theory, memorizing incantations, and mastering wand movements. Perhaps one day, I would find a way to practice safely, since healing magic should only be used on actual injuries. Lily enjoyed reading and writing essays in the living room. Unlike the noisy common room, our base was a perfect place for studying. Lily was very smart and diligent, excelling in all her subjects, including history of magic. Sometimes we practiced defense against the dark arts spells together in the practice room. Lily was adept at the disarming charm and reacted quickly, often sending my wand flying. I preferred using the shield charm, which, though not effective against powerful spells, was quite practical. Severus often stayed in the potions lab, even skipping meals in the great hall. Despite my efforts to persuade him otherwise, he continued this routine, so I resorted to fetching food from the kitchen and bringing it to our base. Luckily, he still returned to the dormitory before curfew each night. His relentless focus in the lab made him look perpetually greasy, with his hair clumping in strands and his face shining with oil. Consequently, Potter had more ammunition for his usual taunts, now frequently calling Severus greasy. Severus, when was the last time you showered? I asked hesitantly. Cleaning charms work well and save time, Severus replied, taking a break with a book titled Advanced Potion Making. But cleaning charms don't work on skin oils. You can't just rely on them to save time. A hot shower would help you relax more effectively. Besides, hearing Potter call you a greasy little bat is really irritating. Finally, I managed to convince Severus to shower daily, which helped him feel refreshed and relaxed. Soon, the Christmas holidays of our second year arrived, and we all went home for the break. Severus's hard work in the lab paid off, as he had brewed several fourth-year-level potions and even one fifth-year potion. This meant he met Eileen's standards to access the Prince Manor's potions lab. He was spending the holiday with Eileen at the Prince Manor, and I was sure he'd benefit greatly from it. On Christmas morning, I sat under the tree in the living room, unwrapping presents. Isaiah and Hughes had given me a set of Chopin piano records. I mentioned the magical room in my letter, and it might even provide an old-fashioned record player. Lily sent me a jar of her homemade cookies, my favorite kind, almost burnt. These were the kind of cookies you couldn't find in any bakery, only made at home. Severus gave me a book titled Identification and Uses of Common Potions, perfect for me since, even if I couldn't brew potions myself, I could learn how to use them properly. Oh, here it comes again. Eileen's Gift, Another Book, Secrets of Beauty. Without a word, I placed the book on my shelf next to last year's Christmas gift, How to Manage Your Hair, deciding to read it when I returned for the summer. On the Hogwarts Express back to school, we asked Severus about Prince Manor. His eyes lit up as he described the vast collection of potion books and ancestral research notes. It was his treasure trove. Severus also mentioned that Eileen planned to travel abroad. We were surprised by this sudden idea. Severus glanced at the compartment door and cast a silencing charm. Lily and I exchanged glances, waiting quietly for Severus to speak. He didn't keep us waiting long. Do you know about the Dark Lord? Of course, I replied, wondering why Severus brought him up. The Dark Lord's Death Eaters often seek out and recruit talented individuals to join their cause, Severus explained. You mean they've approached Eileen? I frowned. Not yet, but my mother doesn't want to wait until they do, risking a conflict by refusing. As a Slytherin, she understands their tactics, even if marrying a muggle might tarnish her image with them. Eventually, they'll come for her. Don't you want to join them? I asked Severus. Sawyer, Voldemort is truly an evil dark wizard. Lily interjected passionately. The Death Eaters love dark magic. Of course, Severus and Eileen don't want to join. But Voldemort is powerful. I don't like him, but he is strong, I said seriously. Severus, what do you think? He is a powerful wizard, 
and I respect that. But he's too violent, and I can't agree with his methods. My mother dislikes his extreme ways and fears the potential for war. Avoiding them seems the best option. Besides, Severus's expression softened, my mother wants to travel and see the world, so she plans to do so once she settles things here. I nodded. That sounds wise. But if Eileen leaves, you'll be on your own. It's not a big deal, Severus shrugged. I spend most of my time at school anyway. My mother will make arrangements. What about the apothecary? Will you close it? Lily asked. I don't think so. My mother plans to hire someone to manage it. I'll continue brewing potions, and the employee will handle the shop. Why don't we take over the apothecary ourselves, I mean, with you? I suggested. With the house elf Kaka, we can maintain the shop's basic functions. We can still accept orders for advanced potions and use owl delivery. It would be great to work together. Lily looked interested. I could help with basic potions. They might not be as good as yours, Severus, but I can make decent ones. Lily, your potions are excellent. Professor Slughorn would definitely agree, Severus said, warming up to the idea. It sounds promising. Exactly. We could have James and Sugar deliver the orders. My owl, James, seems too idle, always disappearing for long periods, I suggested, thinking of giving my owl more to do. Lily laughed, it sounds like having Potter do our deliveries. I snickered, that would be amusing having Potter run errands for us. My James is much more likable than him. Severus smiled too, the tension from discussing the Dark Lord dissipating. But, Severus hesitated, what about customers who need to sell potions? That's an essential part of the apothecary. It requires face-to-face -face quality checks, which we can't handle by owl. Lily frowned, you're right. That's a crucial issue. House elves can't manage that, and it needs personal attention. This was a problem. I had no immediate solution. We'll figure it out. We're not taking over the apothecary tomorrow. Severus, you can discuss our idea with Eileen. She might have a better plan. Severus nodded. We looked at each other, excitement visible in our eyes. The idea of running an apothecary together, relying on our skills, was incredibly appealing. Chapter 17 After returning to school, we made our way to the Great Hall for dinner. It struck me suddenly how long it had been since I last dined at the house tables. I wasn't alone in this realization. Sitting diagonally across from me, Lupin was casually chatting while grabbing the jug of pumpkin juice. I haven't seen you at mealtime for ages, he remarked. You missed a few weeks in the Great Hall before Christmas break. I bet you know the way to the kitchen by heart now. Swallowing a bite of lamb chop, I laughed. I know it like the back of my hand. Really, thanks for showing me the way, Remus. I'm always happy to share such conveniences with friends. Hogwarts is full of secrets waiting for us to discover. Lupin smiled warmly, though he always looked a bit frail. Absolutely. I agreed wholeheartedly. Spending seven years at Hogwarts, we could probably only scratch the surface of its mysteries. I bet even Headmaster Dumbledore didn't know all of Hogwarts' secrets. Eating in the Great Hall felt wonderful. The atmosphere at the Gryffindor table was lively, with everyone chatting and laughing. Here, there was no need to constantly mind one's manners it was relaxed and informal. Though some people were a bit too careless with their manners, making their eating habits quite unpleasant to watch, it didn't bother me much. I glanced over at the Slytherin table, just two rows away one word, elegance. No one spoke loudly or laughed boisterously, and their table manners were impeccable. Each person looked like nobility. Of course, many Slytherins came from true pure-blood aristocratic families, exuding a noble air. Other houses had some students from old pure-blood families too, like Potter and Black. Though they were a bit arrogant and conceited, they were never vulgar. My gaze found Severus at the Slytherin table. He fit naturally into his surroundings. Lady Eileen must have taught him aristocratic etiquette. Even though the prince family had fallen from grace, it was still an old family, and Eileen must have received a noble education as a child. 
watching Severus calmly cut his lamb chop, he engaged in conversation with a high-year Slytherin with striking platinum blonde hair. Severus showed appropriate respect without being servile. It seemed he adapted well to life in Slytherin. While observing them, that platinum blonde head Lucius Malfoy, a sixth year noticed my gaze and said something to Severus. Severus looked up and met my eyes, and I flashed him a big smile. He returned a small smile. I turned my attention to Malfoy, giving him a more reserved smile and a nod. Malfoy raised his chin haughtily, indifferent to my greeting. I wasn't surprised by his reaction. The Malfoy family was one of the wealthiest, oldest pure-blood families and likely looked down on a muggle-born like me. We soon returned to our routine of nesting in the base, deciding to have our meals in the Great Hall again and only staying in the base all day on weekends. After self-studying medical spells for a while, I decided to practice on small animals. There should be plenty of mice in the castle, right? Though disgusting, they were perfect for experiments. I communicated my new needs to the room of requirement, and the practice room was soon outfitted with some mouse traps, but no captured mice. As expected, even the most versatile room couldn't provide living creatures. Catching mice was a bit tricky. I hadn't seen any scurrying around the castle. Perhaps the house elves took care of them during their cleaning. Of course, house elves. I was proud of my clever shortcut and a bit ashamed of my growing laziness. I tried calling for Bobo again. This time, he appeared almost instantly. Miss Sawyer called for Bobo again. Bobo was waiting for your summons. He squeaked. Thank you for coming, Bobo. I need your help oh, you said you were waiting for my call. Why? I was curious. Last time, Miss Sawyer wanted Chinese food. Bobo found a recipe, and Tito helped me. Tito is better at cooking than Bobo. He explained, his bat-like ears quivering with excitement. Wow you really learned to cook Chinese food. That's wonderful. I didn't expect you to go through such trouble. Thank you, and thank Tito for me. Could you make Chinese food for dinner tonight? Of course. Tito will be thrilled. His ears wiggled with joy. You said you needed Bobo's help. Yes excited, I nearly forgot my purpose. I need some mice for experiments. Do you know where to catch them in the castle? Yes, miss. Those nasty creatures like to hide in the castle's secluded spots. We drive them to these places during our cleaning. Bobo can catch many for you. That's great, thank you. You've been a huge help. I was relieved not to have to catch those disgusting things myself house elves were truly angels. Bobo bowed excitedly and disappeared. I gleefully headed to the potions lab to bother Severus. Did someone visit? I heard voices, Severus asked, still focused on the potion in his hand. It was a house elf. They've been a huge help again. I really like them. I peered into the potion bottle emitting a blue glow. A calming draft? Used to ease and soothe anxiety. But if the proportions of moonstone powder and syrup of hellebore are incorrect, it can induce a lethargic, sometimes irreversible sleep state. Right? Recognizing the potion, I recited its properties. It was difficult and tedious to make. Severus gave me an approving look. Correct, this one is perfect. He picked up another bottle, holding it up to me. And this one? I carefully examined the potion, lightly shaking the bottle. This is also a calming draft, but the color is slightly off. Maybe it's a less successful batch. This one is my modified version, with a better effect than the standard recipe. Severus shook the bottle, jokingly asking, want to try it? I grabbed the bottle and drank half of it, smacking my lips. Not bad, doesn't taste too awful. Then I finished the rest. Severus, not expecting me to actually drink it, was stunned for a few seconds. When he recovered, I had already finished it. He scowled, I didn't mean for you to drink it. What if there was a problem with the potion? It's an experimental recipe. I trust you, I interrupted. You wouldn't give me anything unsafe. Severus hesitated for a few seconds, then sighed, accepting my reasoning. Plus, your modified recipe needs testing. 
Let's record the results. Chapter 18. Dinner time. I announced, carrying a large tray into the base's living room. Tonight's dinner was special, courtesy of the kind house elf Tito, who had prepared a Chinese meal for us. Come and try Thizit's Chinese food. Lily quickly emerged from the practice room, drawn by the delicious aroma filling the air. It smells amazing. Chinese food, huh? I don't know why you love it so much. Maybe I should give it a proper try it certainly smells good. Yeah, it's just something I've always loved. And it's not just the smell everything about it is perfect. Tito is really talented he just learned the recipe and already makes it so well. I set the dishes on the table provided by the room of requirement and arranged forks and spoons for everyone. I didn't expect them to use chopsticks. Lily, can you fetch Severus? If he doesn't come, tell him I'll vanish his potions. No need to vanish my potions, Severus interrupted, emerging from the potions lab. I made a face at Lily. Come on, forget about your potions and eat. I pushed Severus into a seat while Lily had already settled down. After giving them a brief introduction to each dish, I eagerly watched them take their first bites. Well? Hmm Lily nodded as she chewed. Chinese food is pretty good. It's different from what we usually have where did you first try it, Sawyer? Severus seemed particularly interested in a plate of spicy tofu. I had no idea where Tito got the ingredients. You seem to know a lot about Chinese food. Have you been to China? Did you go before you were five? Severus asked, puzzled. After all, we'd known each other since we were five, and we were in frequent contact. These things are something I just know, I said mysteriously, winking. Severus gave me a look like I was an idiot. Are you trying to imitate Headmaster Dumbledore? He shook his head. You're not cunning enough. Lily, a Dumbledore enthusiast, started to argue. The headmaster isn't cunning he's wise. Yes, Lady Lily, the headmaster is a wise bee, not a cunning fox I teased. Ha, precise, Severus smirked. The conversation drifted to other topics. The next day, Bobo delivered a cage full of mice, about ten in total. I carried the cage into a newly designated room in the practice area, meant specifically for medical spell experiments. Shutting the door, I faced the cage of squeaking mice and let out an eerie laugh, feeling like an evil scientist. Shaking off the odd thoughts, I used magic to pull out a mouse, not wanting to touch it with my hands just the thought gave me goosebumps. Faced with the unconscious mouse on the experiment table, I hesitated. To heal, there must first be a wound, so I needed to cut the mouse and draw blood before practicing the hemostatic spell. Although it was just a mouse, and unconscious at that, it was still a living creature. I had never done anything like this before, never even killed a chicken. Where to start? After hesitating with the sharp knife for a while, I decided to make a decisive cut to the neck. Thus began the blood-soaked experiment session. After dealing with two dead mice and one barely alive one, I let out a sigh of relief. It wasn't as difficult as I imagined. Initially, I was nervous, startled by the sudden spray of blood. In my flustered state, I botched the spell, and mouse number one almost bled out. After a few tries, I adjusted and got used to controlling my magic during the spellcasting, becoming proficient. The healing spell, based on the hemostatic spell, was easy to master. The remaining mice, now just a bit short on blood, were placed in another cage and were soon as lively as ever once the binding spells were removed. The morning passed quickly. I had successfully learned the two spells, at least on animals. The afternoon would be for further practice. After lunch, I returned to the lab. Prepared with a new set of tools, I rolled up my left sleeve and picked up the silver knife with my right hand. I made a deliberate, calm cut along the inside of my left forearm. As the blade pierced my skin, my composed expression broke, and I winced in pain. My previously steady right hand now trembled slightly. Persisting, I completed the cut, tears welling up from the pain. It hurt terribly I was not good with pain. Blood began to drip from the wound onto the experiment table. I put down the knife and took a moment. It didn't hurt as much now as it did when I made the cut. Picking up my wand, 
I prepared to cast the spell. Just then, Severus walked in, holding a letter. Sawyer, you've got mail. What are you doing? He quickly strode over, his black robes billowing dramatically, and grabbed my bleeding arm. What do you think you're doing? Ah, uh, I gasped, the sudden tugging making the wound sting sharply. Realizing this, Severus loosened his grip but didn't let go. Wait I motioned for him to calm down, focusing my attention as I pointed my wand at the wound and murmured the incantation. The bleeding stopped, revealing the open flesh. Then, I cast another spell, and the wound began to heal rapidly. It wasn't deep, and it soon closed completely. After cleaning the blood, my arm was smooth without any trace of the cut. I proudly showed Severus my work, but he still held my arm. See, I'm fine now. I healed myself. I learned the hemostatic and healing spells. You saw it it was successful, not even a scar. But you still lost blood. His expression didn't soften. Just a little. I was careful with the cut seeing his expression darken further, I quickly changed my tone. Alright, I did lose some blood. But Severus, you can brew blood replenishing potion, right? This tactic was sure to work. Sure enough, Severus let go, huffed, and tossed the letter from my family onto the table before turning away. I heard him mutter. Gryffindor. Huh, was he calling me a brainless Gryffindor? No matter, there were plenty of brainless Gryffinders one more wouldn't make a difference. I wondered if Severus was really going to brew the potion. It wasn't easy to make, at least a fifth year level. But if it's Severus, he'd manage. That evening, long past dinner time, Severus finally emerged from the closed potions lab. Without a word, he handed me a potion bottle and took the dinner I'd saved for him. Looking at his expressionless face, I stifled a laugh. What a stubborn person. Chapter 19 I didn't expect to use my newly learned medical spells so soon. But it didn't take long. Two Saturdays later, I went to the kitchen to fetch lunch. As I descended the stairs, I heard an argument below. When I reached the first floor turn, I heard a loud thud, as if someone had fallen down the stairs. Two boys in Gryffindor robes came running up from below, heading towards the great hall with furious expressions. Continuing downstairs to the basement, I saw a figure struggling to stand. It looked like he had fallen down the stairs. I hurried over to help him up he seemed to be in bad shape. Are you alright? His robe bore the Slytherin crest and the name Andrew Kent, likely a first year. He stood up, turned his head, and I saw his brown short hair and pale face. His gaze shifted to the Gryffindor crest on my chest, and he immediately shook off my supporting hand, hissing, I don't need help from a Gryffindor. Was it those two boys just now? I'm sorry they hurt you. I noticed his head was bleeding, probably from hitting it during the fall. You're bleeding. Let me take you to the hospital wing. Get away from me. I don't need your fake Gryffindor kindness. He turned to leave but almost stumbled again. I stepped forward and grabbed his arm with a firm voice, you need treatment. He looked a bit dizzy, supporting himself against the wall. Seeing the wound on his forehead, I frowned. I pulled out my wand and pointed it at his forehead. His eyes widened in fear, but he couldn't escape in time, so he closed his eyes, bracing himself. When he didn't feel the expected pain, he cautiously opened his eyes and saw me smiling at him. I nodded towards his forehead. Hesitantly, he raised his hand to touch the wound, finding it gone, his face filled with disbelief. Come on, to the hospital wing, I said, climbing the stairs. Unless you want me to petrify you and float you there. He obediently followed. As a Slytherin, he probably understood the situation and chose the option that benefited him most. My firm attitude and evident skill, with no malice, likely convinced him. In the hospital wing, Madame Pomfrey emerged from her office. After I explained what happened, she began examining him. A few magical scans later, her expression turned a bit strange but quickly returned to normal. Mr. Kent, you have a minor concussion. Don't worry, I'll give you a potion, and you'll be fine after some rest here. She turned to me. Miss Hill, could you come to my office? I have a few questions. Of course, Madam Pomfrey. 
In her office, Madame Pomfrey got straight to the point. Before Mr. Kent came to the hospital wing, someone had cast a healing spell on him. Do you know who that was? Yes, I do. Is there something wrong with the spell? I hesitated. No, the spell was perfect. I wondered if a senior student cast it and wanted to know their post-graduation plans, perhaps considering a career as a healer. I recall no seventh-year student aiming for that this year, so I thought it might be someone from another year. If so, I'd like to help them. She seemed surprised. Oh, Madame Pomfrey, it was me who cast the healing spell on Kent. I admitted, a bit embarrassed. Actually, I've only learned the hemostatic and healing spells. Madame Pomfrey's eyes widened. Where did you learn these spells? From books. Her expression darkened. Did you practice these self-taught spells on Mr. Kent? Of course not. I first experimented on mice and then tested them on myself once I was confident. My voice trailed off as her expression grew more severe. You experimented on yourself without adult supervision. You injured yourself to test an uncertain spell. I looked down, silent. Miss Hill, you should be grateful to Merlin that you're sitting here healthy. You should know that you're at Hogwarts to learn to control and use your magic properly. We don't just give you books to study alone because you're still children who need adult guidance to understand and apply magic safely. That's why we have professors. She sighed, her tone softening. Miss Hill, if you're interested in medical magic, you're welcome to come to me. I don't want to see you experimenting on yourself again. No matter how talented, you're still a second-year student, and medical spells require precise control of magic, which is unsafe without adult guidance. I nodded vigorously. Leaving the hospital wing, I walked to the lakeside, feeling a bit dejected as I gazed at the calm water. When did I become so arrogant and reckless? Was this truly the essence of being a Gryffindor? I thought my adult mind made schoolwork seem like child's play, and I always learned on my own. I forgot that in this magical world, I was a newborn, starting from scratch. Since I got my wand, I'd been constantly learning new spells. Fortunately, I had an adult's understanding and control, and so far, I hadn't learned anything too complex or faced any accidents. Staring at the lake, a giant squid slowly surfaced, lazily basking in the sun by the shore. I felt a bit disappointed in myself. Since my rebirth, I'd been endlessly grateful for this second chance, eager to live a fulfilling life. So, I laughed loudly, pursued every interest, tried every idea, cherished family and friends, and loved intensely, not wanting any regrets. Maybe my approach was wrong. I cherished every breath, fearing it might be my last. Perhaps I should protect what I have instead of passively enjoying every moment. What a foolish, troll-brained Gryffindor I was. Watching the giant squid wave its tentacles as it drifted away, I laughed heartily. Sawyer, I've seen you buried in these heavy books lately. Researching new spells. Lily emerged from the potions lab, curious about my reading material. No, just trying to learn more about the magical world. This book is The Rise and Fall of Ancient Wizarding Families. Here, the Prince family. I pointed out a passage to Lily. The Prince family has been renowned for generations for their potions mastery. Many potion masters have emerged from this ancient lineage, Severus will undoubtedly be a great potion master someday. I absolutely believe that, Lily nodded firmly. I think I'm good at potions, but compared to Severus, there's no comparison. I believe that too. But consider this, I gestured to myself, there are certainly people whose potion skills make yours look exceptional. Your potions would fetch a good price in a shop. Ha, thanks for the compliment. Oh, by the way, I just read a wizarding fairy tale book, The Tales of Beetle the Bard. It's fascinating, like our Grimm's fairy tales. I handed her a nearby book. Though I don't read fairy tales much anymore, this looks interesting. Every wizard child must have read it. But I bet they haven't read Grimm's fairy tales. No doubt. I began learning more about wizards and delving deeper into magic. Only ignorance breeds fearlessness. Now, reflecting on my past actions, I saw them as risky. 
I decided I wouldn't rashly self-study new spells until I was confident in my knowledge and abilities. Maybe I should ask Madame Pomfrey to teach me medical spells. It would undoubtedly be safer than experimenting alone. Chapter 20 The days passed quietly after that, and every week, I diligently went to Madame Pomfrey to learn medical spells. I had to admit, learning with a mentor was far more efficient. By the end of the term, I had mastered many basic medical spells and could handle minor injuries on my own. I might even qualify as a junior nurse. After the busy exam period, my grades came out, and I did quite well, ranking in the top 20 in my year. Lily, as usual, was among the top few. Even the Slytherins couldn't deny her excellence, aside from her blood status. She was kind, enthusiastic, outstanding, and beautiful our acknowledged Gryffindor princess. Unlike someone who styled himself as the Gryffindor knight, our classmate Potter originally claimed to be the Gryffindor prince, perfect for the princess. I had retorted that a prince and princess from the same family would be siblings, not a couple. So, he changed his title to knight. This knight was arrogant and often lost points for Gryffindor without realizing it. In my opinion, he didn't deserve our lily. This term, Potter had plenty of show-off moments. He was selected for the Gryffindor Quidditch team as the seeker. Flying was his strong suit his small, agile frame made him a good fit for the position. However, I wondered how he could excel in catching the tiny golden snitch despite his poor eyesight and glasses. After watching one of his matches, I thought I had the answer flew around the pitch more chaotically than the snitch itself. My flying class grades were also excellent. I loved flying, the sensation of soaring high and fast. Such thrills were a luxury in my previous life. However, I didn't dare to seek such thrills on the school's shoddy brooms. At the start of the term, someone advised me to try out for the Quidditch team, but after learning the rules in detail, I chose to prioritize my safety. However, I was always excited for Quidditch matches, as they brought many injured players to the hospital wing. Initially, I watched Madame Pomfrey treat them, but eventually, I assisted under her guidance, with Dumbledore's permission, of course. Thus, during every match, I'd eagerly anticipate the practice opportunities while muttering, I'm not cursing you to get hurt. As a result, I became familiar with Quidditch players from all houses, including Slytherin. You can't give attitude to the person treating you. No matter who you are, pain levels everyone out in the hospital wing. Even the aristocrats would grimace in pain. Plus, being Madame Pomfrey's apprentice meant I had adopted her stern approach to making patients drink their potions. Madame Pomfrey appreciated my responsibility, though I simply enjoyed their varied expressions of reluctance. I discussed potion taste with Severus. He said it would be challenging to adjust the flavor without affecting the efficacy, but it was possible. However, if potions tasted better, people might become more careless, leading to more injuries. Still, I could consider persuading Severus to make some palatable potions. Potter and his friends were frequent visitors to the hospital wing. Sirius Black, the beater, often heroically shielded Potter from attacks, both from players and bludgers. This frequent interaction gradually softened our previously tense relationship, thanks to Severus. We started using first names, though I still called Potter Potter since James reminded me of my more adorable owl. Before the break, the school gave us permission slips for our parents to sign, allowing us to visit Hogsmeade from the next term when we'd be in third year. On the Hogwarts Express, the three of us occupied a compartment as usual. Locking the door and casting silencing spells had become our routine. Severus, I think Sawyer's idea is feasible. We can meet people who want to consign their potions at Hogsmeade on weekends, Lily suggested eagerly once the door was secured. That way, Severus can inspect the potions in person. But we'll only be third years next term, it might be hard to convince people. Aging potion, Severus replied succinctly. Exactly. Though it has a time limit, it'll suffice for potion inspections. Lily and I can handle the transactions. We were quite sharp. I mentioned the potion shop to my mother in my letter. She said we could take over if we solved the consignment issue. I'll discuss it further with her when I get home. I think this plan could work. Of course it will. 
As a Chinese proverb says, three cobblers with their wits combined equal Zhuge Liang, I said, striking a heroic pose and laughing heartily. With the three of us working together, no problem is too big. Ha ha ha. Are you calling me a cobbler? Severus raised an eyebrow, making Lily and me burst into laughter. Meeting people to consign potions every weekend. Eileen considered, while we looked at her with hopeful eyes. It's a good idea. Plan it out thoroughly, and if I approve, you can take over the shop. Yay! Lily and I cheered, while Severus's restrained expression still showed excitement. Eileen watched us high-fiving and laughing, then patted our heads. All right, discuss your plans and present them to me when you're ready. For the next week, we met whenever possible to discuss our plans. We avoided Petunia, as our discussions would make her feel out of place and uncomfortable. After our discussions, Lily compiled a plan and presented it to Eileen. Unsurprisingly, she approved and praised it. We began preparing to take over the potion shop. Eileen planned to leave after we returned to school, so we had to fully take over and organize everything during this break. We were happily busy. At Christmas, Eileen and Severus had moved. Eileen sold their house at the end of the alley and bought the house next to mine at 22 Spinner's End. The previous occupants seemed to have bought a better place and moved out. Spinner's End wasn't in the best condition the area was declining, with the nearby mill on the brink of bankruptcy. Eileen easily bought the house and moved in. Living so close, Severus would have some company during the holidays. Severus's new home quickly became our gathering spot. The previous owner had made a basement, likely for storage. Now, Severus had set it up as a potion lab, where we also discussed the potion shop, practically making it our office. When we finished our tasks, we still had half a month before the term started. Frequent trips between home and Diagon Alley had us ready for the new term. I suddenly remembered the Christmas gifts from Eileen over the past two years I'd intended to check them out over the summer but had completely forgotten in the midst of our busyness. With half a month left, I still had time I hoped. I quickly found the books on my bookshelf, How to Manage Your Hair and Beauty Secrets. I spent the night reading them. The next day, in Severus's basement, I declared, I'm going for a makeover. I need your help. Their expressions asked why, so I held up the books. These were Eileen's Christmas gifts I twisted a strand of my short hair, looking troubled. But it seems my hairstyle isn't destined forth beauty. Severus, could you make me a potion to grow my hair quickly? Severus looked at my hair, then seriously said, you look good with short hair. I was momentarily stunned but then laughed. If Severus says so, it must be true. But I still want to grow it out. I've had short hair all my life it's time for a change. I think short hair suits you, but long hair is more feminine, Lily commented sagely. After all, you'll get married someday. Pfft, I laughed. Hearing a thirteen-year-old girl talk about my future marriage felt so odd. Yes, unlike you, our Gryffindor princess will never have trouble finding a suitor. I laughed heartily. Sawyer. Lily blushed, making me laugh even more. Even Severus couldn't keep a straight face. Severus did make me a hair-growing potion, a modified version. The original was for hair loss, which could cause excessive hair growth in my case. His version suited my needs, growing my hair to waist length in five minutes. My new hair was shiny and slightly wavy. I used a simple beautifying charm from the book to give it big, loose waves. Lily exclaimed, saying it looked beautiful and completely transformed me. I flirtatiously batted my eyelashes at her. Of course, I've got a good foundation. Striking what I thought was a graceful pose, I asked Severus how I looked. He seemed momentarily dazed, his eyes darting away as he muttered that it was fine. His face looked normal, but I almost missed the redness at the tips of his ears. Hee <laughs> hee, looks like my charm is quite effective. My elegant pose crumbled into a mischievous grin. At home, my new look was enthusiastically welcomed by Isaiah. Sawyer, you've finally come to your senses. Try on that dress we bought last year I hope it still fits. I thought I'd never see you wear it and so, I was plunged into a gentle but relentless makeover session. Chapter 21 
I didn't expect Sawyer to navigate the challenges within Gryffindor so easily. Should I say the Gryffinders are too naive? I was a bit worried about her, but she handled it well. All along, it seemed like nothing could defeat Sawyer. Despite being in a completely unfamiliar world, she adapted seamlessly, without a hint of fear. Even though she was just a child, a girl who should have been on the receiving end of protection, she naturally took on the role of our protector. Despite having no prior contact with magic and having only experienced one instance of magical outburst, she quickly became familiar with her magic, controlling it better than many children from wizarding families. I'd always known that Sawyer was more talented than both Lily and me. If she put her mind to it, she could excel at anything. But she always followed her interests, not caring much about exams or grades. This time, she put in a bit of effort and earned Gryffindor's recognition. Except for one thing she seemed hopeless at potion making. I couldn't deny that a part of me felt a bit pleased about this. It was my pride. Extinguishing the flame beneath the cauldron, I carefully bottled the perfect potion. Each time I completed a batch, there was an indescribable joy. I knew Sawyer was nearby. Was she still reading her muggle books? Ah, she had fallen asleep. She was sprawled on the table, one side of her face buried in her arm, her mouth puckered from the pressure. Her gentle breathing and peaceful expression made her look utterly serene. I sat next to her with my book, feeling an unparalleled sense of calm. From finding the base to suggesting taking over the potion shop, Sawyer never ceased to surprise us. The idea of running a potion shop together, solely relying on ourselves, filled me with excitement. I trusted my abilities, and I had faith in Sawyer and Lily. I knew we would succeed. My performance in potions class earned Professor Slughorn's praise, making life in Slytherin much easier. Although I didn't have many friends in the house, no one bothered me anymore, and I enjoyed the peace. When Lucius Malfoy sought me out, I was a bit surprised. I didn't expect the heir of the Malfoy family to approach me. It was likely due to my talent in potions. Everyone knew the Malfoy family's reputation they valued benefits above all, and perhaps I was seen as someone useful. However, this was also an opportunity for me. Only a fool would reject a Malfoy's overture. It was clear, though, that Lucius disapproved of my friendship with Sawyer and Lily. That was expected it would have been strange if he had approved. I remained silent, knowing that arguing wasn't wise, and I couldn't agree with him either. I was grateful that Lucius, being a noble, wouldn't trouble a lady. His behavior, at worst, would be limited to a cold demeanor and a few sarcastic remarks. This so-called house division would never make me abandon them. Nothing could. I thought my resolve couldn't be stronger. Sawyer's complete trust in me, even testing potions on herself, filled me with overwhelming gratitude. Was Sawyer intent on embedding herself in my heart? What could be more fulfilling than a friend's unwavering trust? I knew Sawyer was practicing healing spells but hadn't realized she was using herself as the subject. Seeing her bleeding arm made my heart clench, and I yelled at her in anger. In that moment, my emotions were a mix of rage and fear, and I was shocked by my intense reaction. As I calmed down, watching her heal her wound with a grin, I accepted that my response had been too extreme. Had Sawyer already embedded herself deeply in my heart, affecting me profoundly? This wasn't just a reaction towards a friend. Muttering about cunning Gryffinders, I went off to brew a blood replenishing potion. She was indeed cunning, conquering territory while I was unprepared. I could hide it well. I continued to speak little, show few expressions, and focus seriously on potion making. I might never be as excellent as you, but I will achieve something and stand at a height where I can look you in the eye. Chapter 22 On the first day of school, every Gryffindor who knew me greeted me with a surprised expression on the school bus. Okay, the change was quite dramatic, but could they please close their mouths? I could see their cavities. Shutting the compartment door, I started to complain, is it that shocking? Their reactions are so exaggerated. Sure, I've changed, but I look perfectly normal now. I glanced at my light blue dress, which I thought was quite suitable. Lily, who had been holding back her laughter since we got on the bus, finally burst out laughing, uh. Maybe the contrast is just too stark, hmm, they need time to digest it. 
ha ha ha. Severe is smirk, seeing others go through the same shock makes me feel balanced. Don't thank me, Lily, I just voiced your thoughts. Rarely did Severus tease me, making Lily laugh even harder. I lunged at her, hooking my arm around her neck, laughing and threatening, no laughing. We ended up in a playful tussle. After the scuffle, I sat back down, tidying my slightly messy hair. Remembering the earlier conversation, I felt a bit embarrassed. Maybe I was a bit too unkempt before. Actually, it wasn't that bad, Lily said, still catching her breath. Just not very girlish. She started giggling again. Severus watched us with a pleased expression. Lily, did you take a cheerfulness potion or drink some elixir of euphoria? You've been laughing non-stop, I muttered. The sorting ceremony this year was much like the previous ones, except for a small incident. Professor McGonagall called out the names of the new students as usual. Regulus Black. A small, black-haired boy timidly walked onto the stage. Sirius, at the Gryffindor table, shouted excitedly, Regulus. Come to Gryffindor. So, he was Sirius's younger brother. The hat finally called out, Slytherin. Regulus Black set down the hat and walked towards the Slytherin table. Sirius stood up angrily and shouted at his brother, another Slytherin. Did those nasty old relics force you? I knew it. Rebel, Regulus. I couldn't help but frown. Publicly saying such things about his family, without considering what Regulus would do if he was disowned. As the eldest son meant to inherit the family, Sirius had already rebelled and joined Gryffindor, and despite not being disowned yet, the black family had been lenient. Yet, he still urged his brother to follow his path. I suppressed the urge to speak out this was a family matter. Regulus, now sitting at the Slytherin table, didn't look back at us once. Back in the dormitory that night, while washing up, the mirror spoke, Merlin, you finally decided not to murder my eyes. Is this beautiful young lady really the same person as before? Its voice was almost floating with excitement. Yes, it's me, I said through a mouthful of toothpaste. This annoying mirror had been nagging me since my first year about wrinkled robes, crooked collars, messy hair. Especially critical of my hairstyle. As a result, I had sped up my washing routine to escape the mirror as quickly as possible. Sometimes, magical items could be really annoying. I told you, long hair suits you better. You should have given up that old look earlier. I shut the bathroom door before it could continue. The next morning, I got up relatively early, my long hair a tangled mess, even worse than when it was short. Stepping into the bathroom, the mirror screeched, Dear, your sleeping posture must be terrible to make such a mess of your hair. I sprinkled water at the mirror. Oh, shut up. Morning grumpiness isn't a crime, so don't provoke me. It took five minutes to get my hair back to a presentable state. Maintaining my image was quite a hassle. I had to wake up at least five minutes earlier every day to deal with my hair, just to make it to breakfast on time. It didn't take long for my true nature to emerge. By the first Friday morning, dragging my tangled hair in a fit of morning grumpiness, I cursed under my breath, I hate long hair. I love to sleep in, often not getting up until the last minute. Every day, I barely made it to breakfast and sometimes skipped it to go straight to class. Now, having to get up five minutes earlier, cutting down my precious time in bed, was extremely cruel. In my continual self-persuasion, I eventually opted to braid my hair instead of using a series of beautifying charms to keep it smooth and tidy. It was quick and convenient, perfect for me. After breakfast, on the way to class, Lily and I encountered a small group in the midst of a dispute. It was Sirius and his three friends facing off against Regulus Black, his younger brother. It seemed Sirius had led the charge, cornering young Black, who was outnumbered. Regulus looked both defiant and stubborn, standing off against his brother. Sirius was trying to convince him, don't be afraid of those Slytherin snakes. If they bully you, I'll show them. It's because of you that anyone dares to look down on me and the Black family. Regulus interrupted coldly. The disgrace you brought upon the Black family is why people dare to scorn its honor. You don't care what the family loses because of you, or what father and mother have to endure. 
since you abandoned your responsibility, I will bear it. You're a coward. He turned and left, maintaining his noble dignity, despite Sirius's flushed face. I couldn't help but silently applaud his stance. This seemingly small and timid boy displayed a powerful spirit for his family, making him more suited to inherit than Sirius, who was talented but rebellious. The group dispersed, still in a rage. Let it go, Sirius. The more you act like this, the harder it will be for him in Slytherin. If you really care about him, the best way to help him now is to keep your distance, I couldn't help but advise. Sirius looked dissatisfied but didn't say anything, his expression gloomy as he headed to class. The other three greeted us before following him. Pure-blood families are nothing but trouble, Lily muttered. Exactly. So, Lily, be careful when choosing who to marry in the future, I diverted the topic, then quickly ran towards the classroom. Ha, huh, let's go. Class is starting. Sawyer. Stop making fun of me. Lily complained, chasing after me. Chapter 23 The next day was our first Hogsmeade weekend. After handing in our parental consent forms, we followed old caretaker Pringle to the school gate leading to Hogsmeade Village. Hogsmeade is the only all-wizarding village in Britain. Walking along its main street, I felt a bit underwhelmed. It seemed quite run down, with shops interspersed among cottages that looked like they hadn't been renovated in a century. On this Saturday morning, Lily, Severus, and I wandered around, trying to familiarize ourselves with the area to find a suitable place for our meeting with the potion consignment contact. Despite our intentions, we were still children, eager to explore. Lily entered every shop we passed. Severus and I followed, with Severus pretending to scoff at Lily's excitement while secretly examining everything curiously in each shop, all while maintaining an air of indifference. I couldn't help but smiley no matter how mature he tried to be, he was still just a kid at heart. We bought some sweets and chocolates from Honey Dukes, and Lily picked up a new quill from Scrivenshafts. After browsing, we returned to a small pub located at a crossroads off the main road called the Hog's Head. Compared to the bustling three broomsticks, this place was more suitable for us. The Hog's Head was a dark, small, and very dirty room with an unpleasant smell, but it was less likely we'd encounter anyone we knew. Most patrons were peculiar and often concealed their faces with hoods or masks. It would be easier to use aging potion and hide our identities here. We sat at a table near the bar, observing our surroundings. The barkeep, a grumpy-looking old man, approached us gruffly. What do you want? Uh, do you have any juice? I hesitated, thinking it wasn't the right time to drink alcohol. Third-year brats, this isn't a place for your games. Go somewhere else. The grey-bearded old man waved his arms to shoo us away. Get lost. Annoying little brats. Kicked out, we walked down the road. Good thing we didn't drink anything there. Did you see those cups? Gross. I grimaced. We should bring our own cups next time, Lily wisely suggested. We'll come back in the afternoon after we've aged up. I brought the aging potion, Severa said, pulling out a few small bottles from his pocket. All right, let's have lunch at the three broomsticks first. The food there is more likely to pass a hygiene inspection. This place could win an award for being the dirtiest. Don't wizarding establishments need health certificates? I'm used. Madame Rosmerda, the proprietor of the three broomsticks, was a young and beautiful woman, friendly and warm. The food was decent, too. After lunch, we went to Gladrag's Wizard Wear and bought some adult-sized robes in the most ordinary styles Lily chose deep red, I picked dark gray, and Severus opted for black. We returned to the three broomsticks, changed in the bathroom when no one was looking, and drank the aging potion. Emerging, we retreated to a secluded corner, marveling at each other's grown-up appearances. We had all grown significantly. Lily looked more mature, quite the beauty, with her deep red robe complementing her hair. I had let my hair down and styled it in large curls to appear more mature. Severus's features had become more defined, especially his prominent nose and sharp facial lines. His thin lips pressed into a stern expression, he looked like a severe scholar. Perfect, no one could doubt your age now. 
You look like a fastidious potions master, I said, looking up to meet Sabiris's Gazi was now a head taller than me. Exactly. Oh, Sawyer, you look great. Very womanly, Lily evaluated my future appearance, her hand on her chin. Of course, I said, drawing out the words dramatically, before bursting into laughter. Ha! Let's go to the hog's head. Wait, pull up your hoods first. I can't guarantee we won't be recognized. We still look like ourselves, Severus reminded us. We pulled our hoods over our heads and headed towards the hog's head. On the way, we ran into Mary and Rebecca, who were giggling and carrying heaps of Honeyduke's candies to their next destination. Thankfully, we had our hoods up they had been our doormates for two years and might have recognized me and Lily. At the hog's head, we sought out the old man to view and possibly reserve an upstairs room suitable for meetings, not overnight stays. Climbing the creaky stairs, we found room number four, as the old man had indicated. Inside, it looked slightly better than downstairs still shabby but at least clean. The room had a desk, a heavily faded sofa, a relatively intact coffee table, and a few armchairs. This place is pretty good and affordable, I concluded after inspecting the room. Lily nodded. We can reserve it every Saturday morning, and if needed, extend it into the afternoon. We can post a notice at the potion shop saying we'll accept potion consignments here every Saturday morning. I'll write to my mother tonight. She can inform the regular consignees before posting the notice, Severus agreed, satisfied with the room. We went downstairs to negotiate the price with the old man. The old man, who introduced himself as Aberforth, didn't question our intentions for the room or fear trouble. Then again, the hogs had attracted all sorts of people, making it easy to hide one's identity and conduct discreet business without interference, though it didn't guarantee safety privacy relied on one's own ability. We paid the deposit and booked the room for every Saturday morning until Christmas. According to the plan, Eileen would leave next week, and from then on, we'd handle all the potion shop's affairs. Kaka would look after the Diagon Alley store while we managed everything via Owl Post. Only basic potions would be sold directly in the store, as they had low costs and prices, even allowing for customer self-service, with Kaka merely overseeing transactions on the shop's behalf. More advanced potions would be listed in a catalog for customers to choose from, paying a deposit and filling out order forms. Kaka would organize these daily, handing them over to Severus when summoned, and we dispatched the potions via OWL. Special requests requiring immediate preparation would be noted on the orders. Although more cumbersome, this method afforded us maximum independence, and Eileen had approved our plan, likely seeing it as a chance to train us. Leaving the hog's head, we strolled down the main street. The aging potion would wear off soon, but we weren't planning to use the antidote walking around Hogsmeade as adults was fun. It would have been even better without the hoods. I heard that house over there is haunted. People have heard terrifying screams and noises coming from it for years. Let's go check it out. Lily, both frightened and curious, tried to drag us along to bolster her courage. I wasn't too scared. Having lived twice, I was pretty calm about most things. Besides, after entering the magical world, I'd encountered plenty of ghosts. What are we waiting for? Let's go on an adventure. Lily cheered softly, linking her arm with mine as we headed towards our destination. Watching adult Lily act like a child was quite amusing. I could hear Severus's faint snort behind us he must have felt the same. As we neared the shrieking shack, the surroundings grew desolate. We lowered our hoods. Up close, the house looked abandoned, with its doors and windows sealed shut. Sawyer, it doesn't seem that special. Maybe we came at the wrong time. Is it scarier at night? Lily, initially fearful, now seemed disappointed, proving her adventurous Gryffindor spirit. Yes I leaned close to her ear, speaking in a creepy, slow, hissing voice, at night, a refined vampire gentleman awaits your visit. Lily shivered, ugh, that's creepy, Sawyer. That's not scary at all. She tilted her chin, mimicking a noble lady's tone, if he's a handsome vampire, it might be worth it. Severus chuckled. Lily had indeed grown. Before I could respond, we heard a soft pop nearby. 
Severus, Lily, and I immediately drew our wands, pointing them in the direction of the sound. Nothing happened. No one was there, nor any non-human creature. It was as if the sound had been an illusion. Lily moved closer to me, with Severus on her other side, all of us still on high alert. Ah! Lily suddenly exclaimed, startling Severus and me. Uh, sorry for scaring you. I just wanted to say we're starting to revert. The potion's effect has worn off, Lily said innocently. Severus sighed, and I looked skyward. Lily, you did that on purpose. I was wrong Lily was becoming a sly little Gryffindor. Chapter 24 The potion wore off, and we shrank back to our normal sizes. Wearing oversized clothes that dragged on the ground, we made our way awkwardly back to the school. Fortunately, it was only around three in the afternoon, and most students were still in Hogsmeade or already back at school, so we didn't encounter anyone. Once inside the castle, we hurried to the nearest restroom to change into our school robes. We went straight to our base to discuss the potion shop. Severus began writing a letter to Eileen. Our division of labor was roughly established, Severus would handle the critical potion brewing, Lily would manage the finances, and I would organize orders and customer information. Whoever was available would handle shipping, adjusting based on our schedules. That evening, while assisting Madame Pomfrey in the hospital wing, I encountered James Potter. Well, our brave knight managed to land himself in the hospital wing in the first week of term. I handed Potter the potion Madame Pomfrey had prepared for him. He was sitting on a bed, clearly already treated. Got into a scrape with a few Slytherins in Hogsmeade this afternoon. Just a few minor injuries, Potter said with a hint of pride. It seemed that even getting into a fight was something to be proud of. If you're so tough, why are you the one sitting here? I taunted him. Uh, well, Potter looked a bit embarrassed, anyway, I chased them off. And it's just a few minor injuries. Yeah, yeah, keep making excuses. If you're so tough, stop ending up in the hospital wing, I scolded, hands on hips, laughing. All right, drink the potion and get out. And no sweets afterward it'll affect the potion. Potter had nothing to say to that. He grimaced and downed the potion in one gulp, sticking out his tongue. Serves him right I should have made the potion taste even worse. Handing back the empty bottle, Potter suddenly asked, Did you go to the Shrieking Shack this afternoon? Yes, why? I was puzzled by his question. I thought I saw you, Lily, and Snivellus. Don't call him that. Okay, okay, Snapey near the Shrieking Shack. But you were wearing these weird oversized robes. I was about to come over, but then you disappeared. Oh, so that sound was you. I realized the strange noise we heard might have been Potter. What sound? Potter looked genuinely confused. Never mind. I remembered that when we heard the noise, the aging potion hadn't worn off yet. If it was Potter, he would have seen us in our adult forms. After hearing the eerie noise, we left immediately. We were playing around at the Shrieking Shack this afternoon and heard a strange noise. We got scared and left because we thought it was haunted. There's no danger there. You were just scared. Probably imagined it, Potter mocked. How do you know it's not dangerous? You've never been inside, I retorted, skeptical of his bravado. Who says I haven't? We go there every month he abruptly cut off his sentence, clearly hiding something. Every month? Is there something special about that place? I asked casually, probing his response. Nothing, nothing special. It's not fun at all. Potter turned away, looking uncomfortable. Suddenly standing up, he said, Oh, I forgot. Sirius is waiting for me in the dormitory. Gotta go. Bye, Sawyer. He left hastily. I shook my head, amused. Something was definitely up. But I decided not to pry into their secrets. The strange noise from this afternoon remained a mystery. It felt familiar, but I couldn't place it. Whatever it was, it didn't seem threatening, but it was probably best to avoid the shrieking shack in the future. When I returned to the dormitory, Lily was already back. The other two girls were still in the common room, buzzing with excitement from their Hogsmeade trip. 
I told Lily how we almost got caught by Potter in our aged-up forms and mentioned that Potter and his friends seemed to have a secret related to the Shrieking Shack. As expected, Lily was intrigued and determined to uncover the mystery. Potter, beware. Our Princess Lily is on the case, and you'll spill your secrets soon enough. I thought mischievously. I wasn't keen on uncovering their secrets, but I was definitely curious. Lily was a woman of action. Another weekend passed, and on Monday at breakfast, Lily naturally approached Potter and his friends. Usually, it was Potter chasing after Lily, but now that Lily was approaching him, Potter seemed thrilled. Lily casually brought up the shrieking shack, and I noticed the boys became uneasy. Remus stiffened in his seat, and Peter's head nearly disappeared into his plate. Perhaps this secret wasn't a happy one. My interest waned, and I focused on my breakfast instead. A week later, it was another Hogsmeade day. This week, we had arranged to meet Eileen in Hogsmeade. She would oversee our first day on the job and make sure everything was in order before leaving. As before, we drank the aging potion and disguised ourselves at the three broomsticks, where it was crowded and less likely to attract attention. Eileen met us there, and we headed to the Hog's Head together, officially beginning our first day as Eileen Prince's associates. Eileen had arranged for a few familiar potion masters to visit the Hog's Head, and they arrived at our appointed room 4. The morning went splendidly. Severus's expertise in potion identification earned their trust. Using the name Silent Prince and bearing a resemblance to Eileen, they likely thought Severus was her brother. The Prince family's reputation in potion making was well known, and they might have wondered about a young heir from the supposedly declining family. There wasn't much to do during the Saturday sessions. We only had a few potions to check, and a few hours were enough. We timed the potion's effects to finish our work before it wore off, returning to the three broomsticks. We had lunch at the three broomsticks with Eileen. Before the food arrived, Eileen winked at us. Well done, my little adults. She patted Severus's head. Especially you, my little prince. You were amazing. Severus blushed and looked away, utterly adorable. My maternal instincts nearly kicked in. Seeing how well you've handled things, I can leave the shop to you with peace of mind. I'm leaving next week and plan to head to France first. I'll write to you once I'm there. If owls can't deliver internationally, I'll use Muggle Post to Sawyer's home, and your parents can forward the letters to you. Yes, Aunt Eileen, will take good care of the shop. Safe travels. Lily said dutifully. Find someone special if you meet the right person abroad, Eileen. I added. Severus wouldn't mind a stepfather, right, Severus? Severus nodded. We had talked about this privately, believing Eileen deserved happiness. Eileen laughed, tousling my hair. What are you kids thinking? We'll see about that. A month later, I received a letter from my parents forwarded from Eileen. It seemed Muggle Post was slower. Eileen said she was well and enjoying her travels in France. She didn't plan to settle there, so we didn't need to reply. Every now and then, we received letters from her in new countries. After touring Europe, she planned to head east. In one letter from Eastern Europe, she mentioned our suggestion about finding someone special, hinting she might consider it. We were thrilled, hoping Eileen would find her happiness. But that's a story for another time. Chapter 25 The weather was turning colder, and Christmas break was just a few days away. This Christmas, the three of us decided to stay at school. Even if Severus went home, he'd be alone, and staying at school would allow him to work on his potion research. Hughes had recently been promoted, and he and his wife decided to go skiing in Scotland for the holidays. I didn't want to leave Severus alone for Christmas, so I stayed at school. Seeing that we were staying, Lily decided to stay too. Petunia wrote a resentful letter, complaining about being bored since none of us were coming home. With Lily staying, James Potter also decided not to go home, and Sirius followed suit. Remus usually stayed at school, and Peter always stuck with the other three. As a result, Hogwarts was lively this Christmas. I was in the hospital wing's office, helping Madame Pomfrey organize potions, when a student came in. I heard Madame Pomfrey exclaim, Oh! Dear, 
Are you all right? What happened? Lie down quickly. I rushed out of the office and saw a thin black-haired boy limping towards a bed. As I got closer, I realized it was Regulus Black, and his face was covered with strange red rashes that spread from his neck down into his clothes. The boy had already taken off his shoes and was half leaning on the headboard. Child, can you tell me what happened? Madame Pomfrey asked while raising her wand and casting a diagnostic spell. A pale blue light swept over the boy's swollen ankle. Your ankle is just a bit swollen, not dislocated. Sawyer, can you help him? Sure, madam. I stepped forward and used a spell to reduce the swelling in the boy's ankle, which still looked red. It was an accident, the boy muttered, not offering any further explanation. Madame Pomfrey examined the red rashes on his face and instructed him to change his clothes before pulling the curtains and heading to the office with me. Mr. Black's rashes are likely caused by a failed spell, a magical injury that will take some time to heal, Madame Pomfrey noted in the medical register. After a thorough examination, I'll need to consult with Professor Slughorn about brewing the right potion for him. Can you watch over him for a while? She asked. No problem, madam. Watching over him wouldn't require much just being there in case he needed anything. When I returned to the bedside, Regulus had changed into hospital robes. Madame Pomfrey lifted his shirt to check the rashes on his body. Regulus squirmed uncomfortably, likely due to my presence. I stifled a laugh. After finishing the examination, Madame Pomfrey gave a few instructions and left through the fireplace. I pulled up a chair and sat by the window, chatting with him. Are you all right? Do you need some water? I asked the frail boy with concern. No, I'm fine. These rashes don't hurt or itch, they just look scary, Regulus shrugged. Who did this? Griffinders or Slytherins? I guessed it could only be students from those two houses. There's no evidence. They wouldn't leave any trace. So, Slytherins then? I concluded. Such meticulousness couldn't come from Griffinders, who preferred open confrontation. He didn't confirm my guess explicitly. Seems you know Slytherins well. Yes, I've come to understand them a bit, thanks to my best friend being a Slytherin, I said, thinking of Severus with a smile. You mean Snape, right? I admire him, but he's always been cold towards me, Regulus said, a bit regretfully. It's Severus who showed me many admirable Slytherin qualities, but I've also seen their tactics. In our first year, Severus dealt with many troublemakers, I said proudly. He's not friendly to anyone, so don't take it personally. But your brother constantly bothering him probably didn't help. I noticed Regulus's expression darken at the mention of Sirius. Is it because of Sirius? I guessed. After a moment of silence, he sighed. He came to the dungeons a few days ago, asking if I was going home for Christmas, wanting me to stay with them. A lot of people overheard. If he wasn't serious, your brother, I'd suspect he did it on purpose. Regulus gave a bitter smile. Having such a brother was certainly troublesome. Are you going home for Christmas? The rashes will take some time to heal, and resting at home would be better. No, he shook his head. I don't want my family to know. He didn't want them to worry and didn't want them to know he was being troubled because of Sirius. He still cared about his brother. I didn't press further. Don't think too much. Have a good Christmas. Severus and I are also staying at school, so it'll just be you two Slytherin staying. For now, rest in the hospital wing. I'll bring you dinner later. Thank you, Hill. Call me Sawyer, Regulus. All right, Sawyer. Regulus stayed in the hospital wing for a few days before returning to his dormitory for the holiday. The rashes on his face had faded a bit, at least not looking as scary. Over these days, we became quite familiar. On Christmas Eve morning, Severus and I ran into Regulus in the hallway. He greeted us, Good day, Snape, Sawyer. Severus nodded curtly, while I smiled back. Good day, Regulus. Feeling better today? Remember to get more potion from Madame Pomfrey if you've run out. I will. Goodbye. He waved and walked away. Severus glanced at Regulus's departing figure. 
Regulus? Sawyer, I didn't know you two were so close, Severus remarked, almost too casually. Regulus spent several days in the hospital wing, thanks to his wonderful brother. We got along well. You should try talking to him. He's not bad. Severus's expression stiffened slightly, and he huffed, not saying anything. After that, Severus was even colder to Regulus than before. Regulus privately complained to me, wondering what he had done to offend Severus. He blamed it on Sirius. On Christmas morning, I woke up naturally, feeling well rested. The dormitory was empty Lily had already gone out. She had plans with James and his friends. Stretching and yawning, I opened my eyes to find a pair of large eyes staring at me. I gasped, barely suppressing a scream. Why did I have to be startled like this on Christmas morning? Tito. What are you doing here? I recognized the house elf, even though they all looked similar. Yes. Miss Sawyer recognizes Tito. Tito found Miss Sawyer. Oh Master Sia will praise Tito for sure. Oh, poor Master Sia the elf cried, its high-pitched voice echoing. Was this a Christmas surprise? A wailing house elf. I endured the shrill noise, silently complaining. Tito, calm down. Quiet. I had to shout to get it to stop. It quieted down, only sniffling. Can you tell me what's going on? Why are you here? Oh Miss Sawyer doesn't know poor Miss Sawyer, growing up in a muggle family, must have suffered. Tito is a bad elf bad elf. Seeing it about to bash its head against the bedpost, I quickly stopped it. Explain first. I don't understand I vaguely sensed that I was about to learn something significant. Tito should tell Miss Sawyer everything the elf started recounting a tragic love story from fifteen years ago, tears streaming down its face. Chapter 26 Fifteen years ago, a naive young daughter from a pure-blood family, Sia, fell head over heels for a muggle youth. Sia kept her romance hidden from her muggle-hating family and secretly met with her lover, sharing countless joyful memories. When Sia discovered she was pregnant, she was elated and planned to reveal her identity as a witch to her lover and elope with him, choosing to live a happy life as a muggle with him. However, her father discovered her secret and, in a fit of rage, ordered the muggle youth to be killed. The poor young man died without ever knowing the reason. Sia's father demanded that she abort the filthy muggle spawn, but with the help of a house elf, a determined Sia managed to escape into the muggle world. She remained in hiding until her child was born, using magic to ensure the child's safe delivery. Unable to escape further, the elf had no choice but to leave the newborn at a muggle orphanage, hoping that at least the child would survive. In less than a day, Sia's father's men found her and brought her back to the family estate, where she was confined to her room. The family regarded her as a disgrace, and her father told everyone she was too ill to see visitors. He was only concerned with the family's reputation and interests, showing nothing but disdain and coldness toward his fallen daughter. Sia, depressed and desolate, passed away less than six months later, joining her lover in death. Before she died, she freed the elf who had helped her, asking it to find and protect her child. Heartbroken, the elf left and searched for the child, only to discover that the baby who had been left at the orphanage had died shortly after arrival. Devastated, the elf encountered Headmaster Dumbledore, who persuaded it to come and work at Hogwarts. Listening to the house elf's tearful recount, I pieced together the tragic story. Is this really how melodramatic it is? My biological parents were star-crossed lovers, my grandfather was a villain of epic proportions, and I was the catalyst for this tragedy. Could it get any more cliched? After a moment of silence, I cleared my throat and asked, how can you be sure that I am the child you've been looking for all these years? Tito wiped his tears and nose, hiccuping as he spoke, on the first Saturday of this term, Tito saw Miss Sawyer and her friends at the Shrieking Shack in Hogsmeade. They looked so grown up that Tito thought he saw Miss Sia. Tito was afraid of making a mistake, so he went to the records room to check Miss Sawyer's information. She was born on September 22, the same day Tito's little miss was born. But Miss Sawyer has muggle parents, so Tito was unsure. Tito wanted to find out, and while preparing for the Christmas dinner, Tito got the task of buying ingredients and went to the orphanage. 
he found the record of the hills adopting Miss Sawyer. Oh, it's Tito's fault for not finding out sooner and making Miss Sawyer suffer. Tito is a bad elf, a bad elf. It needs to punish itself. Tito began banging his head against the bedpost again. Stop. I massaged my temples, exasperated. House elves were wonderful in many ways, but they were far too excitable. Now that Tito mentioned it, I recalled hearing strange noises when Bobo disappeared in front of me those few times. That must have been Tito. Calm down, I tried to soothe him. Since you verified it, I am indeed your Mrs. Child. You don't need to blame yourself. You haven't made me suffer I've had a good life. My adoptive parents love me as their own. I'm happy. You don't need to punish yourself, really. Tito, with tear-filled eyes, trembled as he took a breath. Miss Sawyer is so kind. Just like Miss Sia. Finally, he seemed to calm down a bit. I sighed in relief. All right, you haven't told me about my mother's family yet. You only mentioned that they are the ancient pure-blood Rosier family. I'm not familiar with these ancient pure-blood families, only knowing of the Malfoys, Blacks, and Potters. The Rosier family is indeed an old pure-blood family. The former head, Miss Sawyer's grandfather, passed away two years ago due to an illness. Miss Sia had an older sister, Druella, who married into the Black family. The Black family? How is she related to Sirius and Regulus? I wondered if we were somehow related. Miss Druella is the aunt of the two Black young masters. She has three daughters, Bellatrix and Andromeda Black, who have graduated, and Narcissa Black, who is in her seventh year and about to graduate. They are your cousins, Tito answered with wide eyes. So, I had blood relatives in this world. What are they like? I hesitated to ask. Miss Druella was very fond of Miss Sia. Even after marrying into the Black family, she often visited her sister. Though she was disappointed when Miss Sia fell in love with a muggle, she still cared deeply for her. When Miss Sia was confined at home, only Druella and four-year-old Sissy visited her. Oh, kind Miss Druella, she has always missed Miss Sia. The elf's large ears drooped. All these titles and names were making my head spin. Oh, my Aunt Druella she still loves my mother. Someone in this world still remembers my mother I felt a dull ache in my chest. I had speculated about my origins, guessing they might be linked to wizards, assuming I was an abandoned illegitimate child. I never imagined my grandfather killed my father and drove my mother to death. Since being adopted by Isaiah and Hughes, I regarded them as my true parents, loving me as much as any parents would love their biological child. Thus, I rarely thought about my birth parents, and when I did, I only wondered why they abandoned me. How is Aunt Druella now? Does she also hate muggles? My grandfather couldn't bear the thought of my mother being with a muggle and killed my father. The Black family was notorious for hating muggles. I wondered if my aunt despised me for tainting the family bloodline. Oh Miss Sawyer, Tito looked despondent. Miss Druella and her husband follow that man. Because of Miss Sia's affair, Miss Druella grew to despise muggles even more. But she would surely love you, Miss Sawyer. Tito's spirits lifted. You are beautiful and kind like your mother. I rubbed my forehead. To Tito, his little mistress was perfect, including her daughter. I decided not to dwell on his adjectives. So, my aunt was a death eater. She might not trouble me too much out of respect for my mother. But I was also a Gryffindor. Even Sirius, a pure blood Gryffindor from his own family, was called a blood traitor. Would my aunt accept me, a niece who suddenly appeared, just because of a faint memory of my mother? Ridiculous. Only a fool would seek out such a relative. You mentioned I have three cousins. How are they doing now? My thoughts wandered as I asked casually. Miss Bellatrix idolizes that man. I heard from other elves that she got engaged to the Lestrange heir right after graduation, and they swore to follow the Dark Lord forever. My heart sank further. So, this was the infamous Death Eater family. Miss Druella's second daughter, Andromeda, fell in love with a muggle like Miss Sia and was disowned by the Black family. She is luckier than poor Miss Sia though. 
Tito started to sob again. I was already used to Tito's tears whenever he mentioned my mother. Andromeda was indeed luckier, only being disowned. Maybe the black family had a bit of humanity, not going after the muggle to the bitter end. Perhaps Aunt Druella remembered my mother's fate and didn't want her daughter to meet the same end. I felt a kinship with this unseen cousin. Once Tito calmed down again, he continued, the youngest, Miss Narcissa, is engaged to the heir of the Malfoy family. That, I knew. The Platinum Blonde Prince of Slytherin and His Girlfriend. Chapter 27 The Malfoy family if I'm not mistaken, they support the Dark Lord. Tito, if you had to choose between me and Aunt Druella as your new master, who would you choose? I asked cautiously. I wasn't sure if I could fully trust Tito yet. Despite being my mother's house elf, he might be more loyal to his previous master's sister or daughter. There were things I wasn't comfortable sharing with him yet. Why does Miss Sawyer ask? Master Xia ordered Tito to find Miss Sawyer and protect her before he passed away. Tito is a bad elf for taking 14 years to find Miss Sawyer. Tito will always stay with Miss Sawyer. Miss Sawyer is Tito's master. The elf's bat like ears stood up excitedly, and his big eyes filled with tears, eagerly waiting for my response. I'm glad, Tito. I'd be happy to be your master. But you are currently a Hogwarts house elf. Doesn't that mean Headmaster Dumbledore is your master? Can you change masters so easily? I don't want Dumbledore to know about me. My intuition told me to avoid drawing Dumbledore's attention. Tito has a way to make Headmaster Dumbledore dismiss Tito. It can be done today. The elf puffed out his chest, his voice rising in excitement. Uh, there's no rush. What I mean is, don't tell anyone about my connection to the Rosier family. No one, not even Aunt Druella or my cousins. I don't want anyone to know. Can you do that, Tito? Though Tito doesn't understand why Miss Sawyer asks this, if Miss Sawyer says so, there must be a reason. Tito won't tell anyone, not even other house elves. Great, thank you, Tito. This is very important to me. I didn't want anything to disrupt my peaceful life or drag me into any disputes. Tito understands. Tito will go to the kitchen now to prepare Miss Sawyer's favorite Chinese food. Hee <laughs> hee, Tito, you're so considerate. A smile spread across my face. Was I exploiting the school's resources? Well, I just gained a culinary advantage. Oh, by the way, you mentioned seeing me at the Shrieking Shack. Why were you there? Can Hogwarts house elves leave the school freely? Without a master's order or a summons, house elves can't leave on their own. Otherwise, they must punish themselves. Tito was working that day under Headmaster Dumbledore's orders. We were to scare away anyone approaching the Shrieking Shack. Why? Has it always been like that? What a strange order. Tito doesn't know. It started two years ago. Headmaster Dumbledore ordered Tito and a few other elves to scare people away from the Shrieking Shack whenever we could, not every day. Well, we were indeed scared away. Could this be Dumbledore's twisted sense of humor? Or was it to keep people away from the Shrieking Shack? But Potter mentioned they go there every month. Is Dumbledore helping them keep a secret? What kind of secret would require the headmaster's involvement? Oh, Tito, you go to the kitchen now. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, Miss Sawyer. The elf bowed and disappeared with a snap. I flopped back onto the bed, exhaling deeply. Receiving so much information early in the morning left me a bit overwhelmed. Rubbing my eyes, I got up and started opening my gifts. I wouldn't let anything spoil my Christmas cheer. After a slightly late breakfast, I wandered up to the eighth floor, where Lily was about to enter the room of requirement. Lily. I jogged over. She seemed distracted, like she was worried about something. What's wrong? Did something happen with Potter and the others? Oh no, nothing, Lily shook her head. I'm just worried about Remus, you know how his health isn't great. We entered the room. How is he? He looked awful at the Christmas feast last night and left early. How is he today? Maybe I should have gone with you this morning. I was getting worried about him. 
Remus was a good friend. He's better, just a bit weak. Madame Pomfrey can help him. He'll be fine, Lily forced a smile, indicating she didn't want to dwell on the topic. She threw herself into an armchair in the living room. Where's Severus? In the potion room? I opened the tightly closed door to the potion room and peeked in. Severus was bottling potions. Severus, come out when you're done. I have something to tell you both. Severus didn't look back but nodded slightly to show he heard me. I returned to the living room and collapsed on the sofa, frowning. It felt like the good mood of Christmas was already tarnished. Lily was curious but didn't ask what I wanted to say. A few minutes later, Severus joined us, sitting in the armchair next to Lily's. I sat up and cleared my throat. I want to tell you about my background. I'm adopted by Isaiah and Hughes. Hear me out first I stopped Lily from interrupting and ignored their shocked expressions as I recounted the events of the morning. Despite trying to be brief, my throat was dry by the end. I gulped down a glass of water and saw Lily and Severus staring at me in silence. What's wrong? I'm finished. It's such an important thing, and you only tell us now. Lily's voice carried obvious reproach, and Severus's expression showed he agreed. I only found out this morning. I mean the fact that you're adopted. You clearly knew that before but didn't tell us. Don't you trust us? Her tone shifted from reproach to hurt. I quickly reassured her, you know it's not like that. I just thought it didn't make a difference. Whether I'm adopted or not doesn't change anything for us, right? Besides, my parents didn't tell me until I got the Hogwarts letter. Not exactly a lie, just omitting some facts. I had known all along. I didn't want to bring it up, and I never imagined my birth mother was a witch. And a pure blood witch who fell in love with a muggle, no less. I sighed. Seeing my low spirits, Lily sighed too and didn't say more. So, what do you plan to do? Are you going to meet your aunt? Severus frowned. Of course not. Imagine a muggle-raised Gryffindor entering a Death Eater's home I might be brainwashed into joining the Death Eaters if my aunt doesn't despise my half-muggle blood. I gloomily munched on snacks we had brought from the dining hall. All I can do now is ensure no one else finds out. For a moment, the only sound was my chewing. All right, enough of that. It's depressing. Today is Christmas. Let's be happy, I tried to lift the mood. At least we get to enjoy a feast of Tito's Chinese cuisine today. That night, Lily and I lay in our beds, chatting. The day had been exhausting. Oh, Lily, Tito said it was Dumbledore who sent it to scare people away from the Shrieking Shack. No wonder there are so many ghost stories about that place. What do you think it's for? I opened the curtain on Lily's side, propping my head on my hand. Maybe it has something to do with Potter's secret. Is Dumbledore helping them keep a secret, or did they discover something about the shrieking shack that Dumbledore is hiding? Lily was silent for a few seconds. In the darkness, I couldn't see her expression. She sighed. Sawyer, I don't want to lie to you, but I know their secret. Remus asked me not to tell anyone even you and Severus. It's very important to him, and I didn't know how to refuse. Was Lily hinting that this secret was about Remus and wanted me to figure it out myself? It seemed like a secret not meant to be known, one even Dumbledore helped to hide. The room fell silent again. After a moment, I spoke lightly, whatever it is, Remus must have his reasons. If he thinks I need to know, he'll tell me, right? I turned and buried my head in my pillow, groaning. Oh, this Christmas has been full of revelations. Let's just forget about Remus's secret. Lily chuckled. Sleep well good night, Sawyer. Good night. Chapter 28 During the holiday break, I had a lot of free time. There wasn't much to do in the hospital wing, and Madame Pomfrey told me to come back after the term started so I could fully enjoy the break. I spent my time in our base, watching Severus brew potions and learning to identify them. Our potion shop didn't receive many orders during this period, maybe three or four a week, so Severus wasn't too busy. While he worked on potions, I watched closely. He explained each step to me, why it was necessary, 
and what effect it would have he was very meticulous and patient. I was a good student, always asking questions, even if they seemed foolish to me. Severus patiently explained everything. Perhaps Severus would make a good potions professor. I imagined an adult Severus calmly teaching a group of students, but then reality hit me. Severus was often cold and sarcastic to others. Teaching a class of students with varying skill levels might turn potions class into a nightmare for Hogwarts students. I shared my thoughts with Severus. As expected, he didn't miss a beat and snorted, me, a potions professor for a bunch of brainless Gryffindor trolls. I deduct all their house points. Not surprised, I chose to ignore his habitual Gryffindor insults. Just don't deduct only Gryffindor points, if that day ever comes. Now look at this, Severa said, holding up a vial of the finished elixir to induce euphoria. A successful batch should be this clear orange color with spiraling shimmers. Some potion shops sell elixirs that look like expired orange juice. I don't know how they dare to sell them. He looked disdainful as he recalled the other potion shops in Diagon Alley. I leaned in, fascinated by the vibrant potion and its mesmerizing shimmer. It's beautiful, isn't it? Yes. Severus's voice was right next to my ear, still pleasant and not yet broken like some boys' voices. It was soothing. I turned to find myself face to face with his dark eyes, glinting with an emotion I couldn't decipher. We were barely five inches apart, close enough to feel each other's breath. I lost my words, captivated by the pure blackness and seeing my reflection in his eyes. Time seemed to stand still, though it was only a few seconds. Severus turned away, breaking the moment, and handed me the potion vial. Who ordered this elixir to induce euphoria? Oh, let me check I walked over to the desk and picked up the order log. Something had just slipped past my mind too quickly to grasp. It's for Mrs. Mag. She requested it by January 10th. I'll mail it later. James brought back some letters yesterday and has free time. I labeled the vial and packed it with the order information and customer details. Turning around, I saw Severus had already bottled the remaining potion, cleaned the cauldron, and started preparing ingredients for the next potion. Take a break. It's almost dinner time. I'll have Tito bring dinner over. I nudged Severus aside and took over organizing the workbench. By the way, your birthday is the day after tomorrow. How do you want to celebrate? Uncharacteristically, Severus didn't protest my bossiness. He replied absent-mindedly, there's nothing to celebrate. Let's just keep it as it always is. Curious, I glanced at him, but he was staring at a bookshelf. I shrugged internally and focused on tidying up. Then I heard voices outside the door. That should be Lily. Severus, you go to the living room. I'll finish here. He paused for a few seconds, then turned and left. I heard Lily's voice as he opened the door. Before leaving the potion room, I called Tito to arrange dinner. A few days ago, Tito had suddenly appeared while I was reading, holding what looked like a thick woolen sock. He said he received it from Headmaster Dumbledore, which freed him. I facepalmed. His way turned out to be this loophole. Wouldn't Dumbledore find this suspicious? He knew about my mother and the child who had died back then when he met Tito. Tito suddenly choosing to end his employment with Hogwarts in this manner would clearly signal he found someone new to serve. House elves are incredibly loyal beings, often serving a family or person for life. Tito's original master was from the Rosier family, who supported the Dark Lord. This alone would catch Dumbledore's attention. I sighed. I couldn't blame Tito. There was no reasonable excuse for Dumbledore to fire him without raising suspicion. No matter what, it would draw attention. Whatever happens, happens. But before dinner, Tito came to ask what I wanted to eat. I wondered, wasn't he freed from Hogwarts duties? Tito explained that house elf magic allowed him to come and go freely from Hogwarts. Some picky noble children even brought their family elves to school, but it was rare since parents preferred their children to learn independence. Now, Tito was bound to me by a contract. Typically, house elves contract with families, but since my parents were muggles and couldn't bind an elf as masters, and Tito only wanted to serve me, he was bound to me and my future family. 
Well, since it was already done, I decided not to be shy about it and enjoy the food. I told Tito to keep dinner simple but to include Tito's signature pudding for dessert. Entering the living room, I saw Lily and Severus chatting happily. I heard Lily say, Haha, that was so silly. What was silly? I asked, sitting next to Lily to join the conversation. Oh, I was talking about James not yours, James Potter. I was coming from the library, and it seemed like he was trying to follow me, probably curious about where I keep disappearing to. I deliberately led him around the castle until we reached caretaker Pringle, who has been itching to catch him. With all his antics during the holiday, Pringle gave him detention for the first week of term. James deserves more detentions to keep him busy. Lily's tone had a hint of schadenfreude. I laughed, amused by Lily's playful behavior. Severus's expression softened as he listened intently to Lily. My gaze lingered on his eyes, recalling the intense look I'd seen in the potion room. Sensing my stare, Severus turned his eyes to meet mine. That familiar emotion flashed again. Before I could figure it out, he looked away, uncomfortable. I snapped out of my thoughts as Lily asked, what's wrong? Oh, nothing I shook my head, pushing the thoughts aside. Just then, Tito brought in our dinner, shifting our attention. On January 9th, Severus's birthday, we went about our usual routines. By dinner, Tito had prepared a special birthday meal, and we played music on the phonograph. Lily and I gave Severus his presents, making for a joyful birthday dinner. Several times during the evening, I found myself glancing at Severus. Whenever our eyes met, he would stiffly look away. Was my gaze that unsettling? I was just trying to understand the feeling. Lying in my four-poster bed that night, I thought about the unfamiliar emotion. It was something I had never felt before. Chapter 29 After the holiday ended, the students returned to Hogwarts with renewed energy and a lingering hint of winter in the air. During the first week back, I received an unexpected invitation. It was for a dinner hosted by Professor Slughorn on Saturday evening in his office in the dungeons. To my surprise, Lily and Severus had also been invited. The Slug Club. What a dreadful name. Why would Professor Slughorn call it that? Lily wrinkled her nose in distaste. This gathering was just a dinner, inviting many people, not exactly a slug club meeting. Perhaps Professor Slughorn planned to scout for talented students to join his club at the dinner. Who knows, maybe it's a peculiar hobby. I shrugged, jokingly, we all got invitations, which means we must be good enough to catch Professor Slughorn's eye. Lily giggled, believe me, you're definitely good enough. Madame Pomfrey's anonymous disciple, the new queen of Hogwarts Hospital Wing. People are wondering if you'll stay at Hogwarts after graduation or head to ST. Mungos. I was astonished, my eyes widening. Was I really that well known? I laughed exaggeratedly, touching my chin, hmm, it's something to consider. The hospital wing only has Madame Pomfrey, and it can get pretty busy sometimes, uh, but isn't it too early to think about this? I ruffled Lily's hair playfully. Come on, it's time for class. I'm partnering with Severus for potions. Lily, will you be okay on your own? Or maybe Potter would love to partner with you. I grinned mischievously. Oh no. Partnering with him would definitely mean a blown-up cauldron. I'd rather work alone. Lily made a face of mock suffering. Exactly, if he partners with you, he'd be so excited his hands would shake, and of course, the cauldron would explode, Severus added dryly. He loves making a fuss, not at all steady, Lily shook her head, rolling her eyes inelegantly. Sawyer, why are you partnering with Severus? He usually works alone. I want to watch Severus brew potions it's a great way to learn. I made a lot of progress during the break, I stated confidently. If I brew potions myself, it's a mess. I've learned to let those good at something do it. Isn't that right, Severus? I winked at Severus, remembering his advice when I struggled with potion-making principles and couldn't remember the steps. He had told me this then. Severus seemed to remember that moment too, giving me a faint smile. I found it hard to look away. I suddenly realized that Severus, who seldom smiled, looked quite handsome when he did. As we chatted, 
we arrived at the potions classroom. Professor Slughorn was already there. We thanked him for the invitation and expressed our eagerness to attend the dinner. The cheerful, plump old man nodded kindly, and we took our seats, ready for class. At eight o'clock on Saturday evening, the three of us descended from the eighth floor and ran into Potter and Sirius in the entrance hall. They had been invited too. It wasn't surprising both came from prestigious families. Despite Sirius being labeled a pure-blood traitor, he was still the eldest son of the Black family. Both were talented, young, vibrant, and promising qualities Professor Slughorn admired. Seeing the two of them, I had to admit they looked quite decent dressed up. Their clothes were well-tailored, simple yet elegant, exuding an old family aura with impeccable manners. No wonder many girls in school liked them I'd overheard several discussing them. But Lily seemed immune to his charms. I'd never heard her praise Potter she often called him immature, arrogant, and rowdy. I felt Lily was more frustrated by his behavior than genuinely disliking him. Lily, would you go to the dinner with me? Potter asked hopefully. I don't think so. My outfit doesn't match your dress robes, Lily pointed out the most obvious discrepancy. We were all in school uniforms and hadn't bothered to dress up for the dinner since we didn't have any family honor to uphold. It doesn't matter. Sirius is going with his new girlfriend, and I'm alone. Potter managed to sound both pitiful and urgent as he shot Sirius a pleading, almost demanding look. I noticed Sirius receiving the hint, discreetly signaling back. Potter's expression briefly showed disgust before he reluctantly nodded. Sirius turned around with a victorious smile and offered a charming smile and gentlemanly gesture to a passing fourth-year Gryffindor girl. Lovely lady, would you do me the honor of joining me at Professor Slughorn's dinner? Ignoring them, I turned to Severus, laughing behind my hand. So that's how friends are used. I took Severus's arm and continued walking. As we passed Potter, I teased, if that's the case, Lily, have mercy, and accept. After all, it's just a dinner. I raised my eyebrows at Lily. So, Severus is mine for tonight. We're off. Enjoy the dinner. I heard Lily's complaints behind me, making me laugh even more. Enjoying yourself? Severus asked, his tone neutral. Realizing I was still holding his arm, I quickly let go, making a face. It was fun. Potter's only bearable when he's with Lily. I tried to sound cheerful, ignoring the slight disappointment I felt when I let go. Severus didn't respond. I turned to look at him, unable to read his expression in the dimly lit dungeon corridor. We were almost at the potion's master's office, where the sounds of chatter and music were escaping. Inside, it was crowded and stuffy. We were the youngest there most attendees were older students. I spotted the unmistakable blonde head of Malfoy and his elegant companion. That must be Narcissa Black, my cousin by blood. I thought bitterly about my complicated family background, shaking it off. Severus and I walked along the edge of the crowd, sipping our drinks. Professor Slughorn, with his beer belly, mingled with various groups, chatting here and there. I saw him speaking with Lily, his face full of praise, occasionally turning to say something to Potter, making them both laugh. Lily spotted us in the corner, said something to Slughorn, who then looked our way and waved us over warmly. Resigned, Severus and I made our way through the crowd. Sawyer and Severus, why are you standing in the corner? Come join us. Slughorn, in his kindly elder manner, patted our shoulders. Oh, Sawyer, you're the most talented healer I've ever seen, already Madame Pomfrey's trusted assistant at just fourteen. Even Pomfrey only began delving into medical magic after her O. You know, she was one of my early students, and I always had high hopes for her. I put on a genuine smile, responding with polite compliments. It was a harmonious scene. Out of Slughorn's sight, I cast a resentful look at Lily, I was wrong, but you didn't have to drag me into this Lily's return gaze was unapologetic, shared joy is double joy. Then Slughorn brought someone over. Let me introduce Damocles Belby, a soon-to-graduate Ravenclaw with remarkable talent in potions. Severus, you two should have a fascinating, scholarly discussion. The plump potions master toasted us before moving to another group. 
mentioning potions, Severus's eyes lit up. They exchanged greetings and began discussing their shared interest. I listened at first, but soon their conversation delved into topics I couldn't follow. Nearby, Lily was chatting with Potter, who seemed to be trying hard to amuse her. Left with no choice, I stood beside Severus, maintaining a polite smile while my mind wandered. My thoughts drifted back to Severus. I turned to observe him his focused expression, his dark eyes glinting, his lips moving confidently. I realized I was once again drawn to him. This was unusual. I started to confront my strange feelings. That afternoon, we had just finished our final exams. That evening, after the other girls had fallen asleep, I sneaked out of Gryffindor Tower. After wandering aimlessly around the castle for a while, I climbed up to the Astronomy Tower. I lay down in my usual spot from Astronomy class, basking in the moonlight and lost in thought. Half a semester had passed since my initial attraction, which led to secret observations and eventually an irresistible pull. Okay, I finally admitted to myself I had fallen for Severus Snape. The boy who used to wear ill-fitting clothes and hide in the shadows while watching other kids play, the boy I always considered a little brother, had transformed into a tall, confident young man. His focused attention while brewing potions, his patient explanations, his occasional smirks, his rare blushes, the genuine smiles he reserved for Lily and me. I closed my eyes. This was my first time liking someone, and the unfamiliar feeling left me at a loss. What should I do next? Tell him. The thought made me nervous. Maybe we're too young, and it's not the right time. I tried to convince myself. Thinking of Severus again, was this infatuation. Covering my face with my hands, I finally acknowledged ITI had indeed fallen for Severus Snape. Chapter 30 The following days were a time for relaxation, waiting for our grades to come out and then leaving school for the holidays. With no classes and no homework, people had plenty of free time, which led to the hospital wing getting busier. In just a few days, several groups had already come through. I set my emotions aside and focused on my work, deciding not to dwell on my feelings. Severus and I were only fourteen and had been friends for so many years. Confessing my feelings might make things awkward. It was better to maintain our current friendship and subtly make him like me over time, than confess. That was my hopeful plan. For now, I'd naturally leave a mark in his heart. I believed in the saying love grows over time. My time in the hospital wing was always fulfilling. When there were no patients, Madame Pomfrijo let me call her poppy in private taught me various diagnostic spells. Different injuries required different diagnostic methods, and judgment came with experience. Madame Pomfrey, in her early forties, had been in medical work for about twenty years and was extremely experienced. She had me review old case files and analyze them, and she would let me observe and try diagnosing patients during her rounds, helping me gain valuable experience. As I became more proficient in diagnosing injuries and illnesses, I noticed something odd. I often found scratch and bite marks on Remus, not the kind from playful scuffles, but more like those from fighting with a wild animal. Though he concealed them well, my practice I caught them. I tried to find Remus's records in the hospital wing's logs but found only common ailments like colds. This was unusual. However, I soon realized that Madame Pomfrey was aware of his condition she would never ignore injuries even I could see, yet she showed no special concern. This was likely related to Remus's secret, and since both the headmaster and Madame Pomfrey chose to keep it hidden, I decided to feign ignorance too. After the holidays began, our weekly work in Hogsmeade became less convenient. If we changed locations abruptly, the timing and our connection to Hogwarts would be too obvious. So, we had to use flu powder to travel from the leaky cauldron to the three broomsticks in Hogsmeade every week. It cost a few sickles each time, but it was the best solution for now. Severus now lived alone at home, undoubtedly buried in his potion lab in the basement. Knowing this, I got a key to his house and started visiting daily, dragging him out for meals. Tito insisted I stay at Severus's house, as taking him home would mean explaining things to my parents, which I didn't want. The wizarding world was too complex for them, and the less they knew, the better. My frequent trips between home and Severus's house made Isaiah give me increasingly peculiar looks. 
One evening, Isaiah came to my room before bed, holding my hand as she sat on the edge of my bed. She looked like she wanted to say something, so I waited quietly. Isaiah stroked my hair, smiling, my little Sawyer is growing up. Pfft. I couldn't help but laugh, sorry, dear mother, but I'm not used to such an opening line. All right, all right, Isaiah sighed dramatically, I'll get straight to the point. Do you like someone? Though phrased as a question, her tone was certain. Straight to the point indeed. Yes, I do, I nodded. It's Severus, isn't it? Again, her tone was assured. I blushed slightly but nodded again, no need to hide it. Yes, but he doesn't know yet, and I'm not planning to tell him now. Isaiah's face softened with affection, since you've confirmed your feelings and have a plan, just follow your heart. Just remember, we love you. It wasn't the first time I'd heard such sweet words, but my nose still tingled. Burying my head in Isaiah's embrace, I hid my moist eyes. I smelled a faint, familiar scent the clean smell of laundry, my mother's scent. I blinked away a few tears and wiped my eyes on Isaiah's clothes. I thanked Merlin, God, Buddha, whoever, for giving me this family. After calming down, I sat up. Isaiah tactfully pretended not to notice my red face. Well, thinking about it, Severus is a good boy, Isaiah teased me, you've been childhood friends, playing together since you were five. Good luck, Sawyer, I have high hopes for you too. Joking around made me feel more at ease. Then I'll work hard to make Severus like me. Isaiah, you and Dad have to support me emotionally. Of course, I wish you success soon. We laughed together. Severus, it's lunchtime I called out to the basement. Tito had prepared a delicious meal, but food wasn't as appealing to Severus as it was to me. I often had to go down to his potion lab and drag him up. After only two steps down the stairs, Severus emerged. You're quick today, I turned back to the dining table, come, sit. Just finished, came Severus's usual concise reply, which I was used to by now. Oh, try this new dish Tito made, I half stood, helping him to a serving. Severus took a bite and nodded, not bad. We ate in peaceful silence. I occasionally made small talk, and Severus responded, making for a harmonious meal. His facial expression softened, and he seemed to enjoy the calmness. I had a fleeting thought that we looked like an old married couple, content and happy. The thought startled me, making my face flush, so I buried it and tried to hide my embarrassment. Ahem, Lily is coming over this afternoon, right? We should review the progress of our potion shop this term. I put down my napkin and started clearing the table. I wasn't used to letting Tito handle everything, so I often helped out. Tito had protested tearfully a few times, but I persuaded him otherwise. Yes, she should be here soon. Severus remained in the living room reading rather than returning to the basement. I brought out some freshly brewed tea, placing a cup on the low table beside Severus and holding another cup as I picked up a book to read. Our reading was interrupted by the doorbell Lily had arrived. Hi, Sawyer, Severus. Lily raised a basket, I brought some snacks Petunia made. You're adorable, I said, taking the basket, let's do our review in the living room. Tea. No milk, thanks. I went to the kitchen and brought out the tea Tito had prepared. We spread our papers and records across the carpet, checking each item one by one. The afternoon flew by as we went through every transaction since taking over the potion shop. After deducting the cost of materials and rent, we had a net income of 482 galleons and 11 sickles. Not a lot, but we hadn't received any high-end potion orders, like Felix Felicis or Veritasrum, which were expensive to make but sold for high prices. After the holidays started, Severus visited Nocturne Alley, finding materials we couldn't order by mail. They were pricey, but we all invested our savings into the potion shop for these rare ingredients. Though we weren't earning much yet, business was picking up, and the shop was a valuable experience for Severus, who was becoming a skilled potion maker. The shop held significant meaning for all three of us, beyond just making money. Not bad, right? Lily waved the ledger, visibly excited. Definitely. We're just students, after all. It's great. 
I collected the scattered papers, feeling satisfied. Severa stood, straightening his clothes, and headed for the basement stairs. I need to redo the morning's potion. His voice had a note of excitement. I was planning to go to Diagon Alley to pick a gift for Petunia to celebrate the potion shop's success. Looks like it's just me and Lily then. See you at dinner. I called after him. Severus responded without turning around. Severus is immersed in his potions again, Lily said, smiling and shaking her head. Let's go. Lily and I ended up choosing a small magical orb as a gift for Petunia. It contained a bit of magic, allowing non-magical people to cast a few simple spells. I remembered how Petunia and I used to admire magic before I received my acceptance letter. We envied Lily and Severus and lamented not being able to join their magical conversations. I always felt guilty for leaving her behind when I entered the magical world. I hoped this magical orb would make up for some of that. It turned out I made the right choice. Petunia was thrilled when she received the gift. In Severus's living room, we taught her the spells and gestures using my spare wand. She cast her first spell, Lumos. When the wand tip emitted a faint glow, Petunia's expression was beyond excited. The orb had enough magic for one more spell. We listed a few easy spells, and Petunia chose the levitation charm. To avoid wasting magic, she practiced the pronunciation and wand movements before using the orb. The quill on the table floated up, hovered around the room, and fell back to the table as the magic depleted. Petunia looked like she might cry. Petunia, you did great. Many of our classmates had to try several times before succeeding. I said cheerfully. Lily hugged her sister, exclaiming, Dear Petunia, I'm so happy. See, you can do magic too, right? Petunia took a deep breath, looking much better. She released her red-haired sister, sniffing, Thank you both, I love your gift so much. I'll remember this magical moment forever. Petunia looked at us sincerely. Severus smirked, looks like Sawyer's gift choice was spot on. At least it didn't make Petunia cry. Remembering how she almost cried earlier, Petunia's face turned red. We all burst into laughter. Chapter 31 I recall meeting Sawyer for the first time when we were five. Her radiant smile lit up the gray memories of my life, and from that moment on, her smile became a constant companion. She was my first cherished friend, and it felt only natural to develop feelings for her. When I realized my budding emotions, I felt a sense of relief. But Sawyer didn't need to know this. She didn't need to know that her best friend labeled by the Griffinders as a cunning and devious Slytherin had a secret crush on her. It was a bittersweet thought. I wasn't as innocent as she believed. I had a fascination with dark things, like dark magic evil and powerful dark magic. Hogwarts' defensive stance against dark magic was clear from the defense against the dark arts class. At school, I couldn't access any substantial dark magic books. However, the Prince Manor provided more than just a wealth of potions knowledge it also had many books on dark magic. The first time I saw those dark tomes, I couldn't hide my longing for the shadowy power they promised. My mother gave me a knowing look and said I could study them because only by mastering power could I protect myself and what I cherished. I knew my mother was a true Slytherin. If not for the years spent trapped between my father and me in that home, she wouldn't have lived so. Unfulfilled. My mother connected our new home to the manor via the Flu network, allowing me to study those books at night with her guidance. When the Christmas holidays ended, I returned to school with a few of those books hidden in the most inconspicuous corner of my luggage. I had no intention of telling Sawyer and Lily about them. They were noble Griffinders. I still remembered Lily's vehement response to a subtle mention of dark magic. Sawyer didn't outright condemn the darkness, but her neutral stance showed no support either. I wasn't surprised but couldn't help feeling disappointed. This was the distance between us. So, I sought times when I could study dark magic without arousing their suspicion. Night was the best time. After leaving the room of requirement with them, I would return alone, creating a separate space for studying dark magic. I stayed there until midnight before heading back to the dungeons. Having Slytherin roommates meant no one pried into your privacy, 
allowing me to maintain this secret nightly routine. After taking over the potion shop, I became busier with potions during the day, but I continued my dark magic studies at night. Throughout this process, I often felt guilty for hiding things from them, especially while working together for the potion shop. Yet, I persisted. I knew I was a true Slytherin, a snake with venomous fangs. For the sake of my cherished friendships, I would keep my fangs hidden and reveal them only to deliver a lethal strike to any threat against them. Facing my feelings for Sawyer left me melancholic. I decided to bury them she didn't need a boyfriend with a dark side. However, my heart rebelled when Sawyer greeted that idiot Black's younger brother warmly. I couldn't stop myself from asking in a dry voice, Regulus. Sawyer, I didn't know you were so familiar with him. Part of me screamed at myself for speaking out, this is none of your business you're just friends. Another part argued, Sawyer is my best friend, I care about her. And if I can't have her, why should another Slytherin? Caught in this internal struggle, I heard Sawyer say he was nice enough. Nice enough? Are you sure you're talking about a black? All right, maybe I shouldn't generalize, but. I suppressed my retort and said nothing more. I was overreacting. Somehow, it was all Black's fault, both the elder and the younger were jerks. Sawyer always managed to surprise. All this time, I thought she and Lily were muggle-born witches, but it turned out she was a half-blood. She seemed to have known she was adopted for a while but never mentioned it. I understood that being abandoned at an orphanage wasn't a pleasant memory. Still, I felt a bit hurt did she not trust us. Lily voiced my thoughts. Seeing Sawyer's downcast mood, I couldn't bring myself to press the issue. Her background was indeed complicated. Sawyer clearly wanted nothing to do with it. The Dark Lord, the Death Eaters, their brutal and dark powers Sawyer disliked them because of their cruelty. If she knew about my darkness, would she hate me too? My heart sank. Sawyer's strange behavior began after a particular incident. She gazed at my potion with such fascination that I found myself staring at her profile. Her sudden turn caught me off guard. Silence fell, and I barely noticed I was staring rudely. Regaining composure, I diverted her attention, refusing to let my gaze return to her. After that, I occasionally felt her blatant scrutiny, which almost made me panic. Did she discover I was a brooding admirer? Then came her secret of observation, thinking I hadn't noticed. Months of hidden scrutiny left me resigned, waiting for her to confront me. Yet, as the term ended, her focus shifted away from me. Was I disappointed? I must have caught Gryffindor syndrome. Afterward, Sawyer seemed normal again, though something felt different. At least I thought I passed this test, whatever it was. Chapter 32 My birthday was on September 22nd, which always fell during the school term. Since starting at Hogwarts, my parents had taken to celebrating my birthday the day before I left for school. Of course, Severus always joined us. This year, I turned 15, and time seemed to fly by so quickly. After a lavish dinner, Isaiah nudged Hugh towards the kitchen, claiming that washing dishes together was more fun. I noticed Isaiah sneaking a wink at me, creating an opportunity for some alone time with Severus. I chuckled to myself. Severus and I cozied up on the living room sofa, chatting. He handed me a small glass bottle me early birthday present. As usual, it was a potion. I examined it closely, wondering what surprise it held this year. Oh I covered my mouth, unable to suppress my exclamation. This is Felix Felicis. Even with my limited potion-making skills, I knew how rare and complex this potion was. The ingredients were hard to come by, and the brewing process was intricate and tedious. It was so valuable that it was nearly impossible to find on the market, no matter how much gold one offered. Severus, you already know how to make Felix Felicis. He was only fourteen, about to start his fourth year, yet he was already such a genius. My awe must have been too apparent because Severus looked a bit uncomfortable and turned away. Yes, I failed a few times. This is the first successful batch, and I divided it into five doses. I'll keep one, and we can add the remaining three to the potion shop's inventory. He mentioned his failures so casually, but I could imagine how many times he must have tried. 
holding the small glass bottle with reverence, I felt a surge of admiration for Severus. Clutching the bottle tightly, I exclaimed, Severus, you are truly the best potion genius. This must have been so hard. We need to make a good profit from those doses. Oh, I need to store this in the safest box to keep it as a memento but will it expire if I never use it? That would be such a waste. I started rambling, and Severus looked at me with an exasperated expression. The next day, on the Hogwarts Express, I told Lily that our potion shop could now take orders for Felix Felicis. Instinctively, I didn't mention that Severus had given me a dose as a birthday gift, and he didn't bring it up either, as if there had always been only four doses. It seemed Severus hadn't prepared a dose for Lily, and I felt a sense of having a special secret between us. Did this mean I was special to Severus? But then, I reminded myself that it was my birthday gift, so it was naturally special. Severus probably didn't think much of it. I tried to control my facial expressions to keep these inexplicable emotions from showing. Severus brought up the potion shop. During a recent visit to the Hog's Head, a customer subtly inquired about Severus's connection to the Prince family, hinting at something. It wasn't the first time someone asked about it. Severus's usual response was that he was a friend of Eileen Prince and had accepted her help in the past, so he was taking care of her potion shop temporarily after she left. His alias, Cyril Prince, represented a title rather than a family name, which at least outwardly satisfied the inquirers. This time, the customer had brought potions for sale three times before. Each time, the quality was mediocre, and he didn't haggle over the price, making him seem unlike typical potion sellers or enthusiasts. In previous encounters, he had shown no special intentions, but this time, he revealed his true purpose. After hearing our explanation about the surname, he didn't seem skeptical but casually mentioned the Dark Lord and Death Eaters, then asked Severus's opinion on the Dark Lord. This was a clear probe from the Death Eaters. Severus must have anticipated this and handled it smoothly. He gave a neutral opinion on the Dark Lord, neither idolizing nor condemning him. He also subtly hinted that he might not stay in Britain permanently and might travel to other countries, indicating a neutral stance and a reluctance to get involved in the war. We weren't sure if this probe was directly from the Dark Lord or just his followers seeking allies. If it was the latter, it would be simpler, but if it had already caught the Dark Lord's attention, it could spell big trouble. We discussed the issue, both feeling a bit anxious. Reflecting on our tenure, the potion shop hadn't sold any highly advanced potions yet. Some of the advanced potions we had were made by Eileen before she left, so there shouldn't be anything particularly suspicious. The most likely point of interest was Severus potentially being an heir of the prince family, but our explanation didn't reveal much detail. Unless they could find Eileen to verify, it wouldn't be easily debunked. We shouldn't worry too much. Still, there wasn't much we could do while at school. Fortunately, we had used aging potions and some disguises initially. We altered our eye colors with potions and spells to avoid detection. Lily's green eyes turned brown, and Severus's and mine turned blue, with Severus's being a deeper shade. Eyes leave a strong impression even if facial features were similar, changing eye color could make someone seem entirely different. Severus's dark eyes, now blue, made him look softer, though I still preferred his original black eyes. Severus mentioned that last term, Lucius Malfoy had talked to him about the Dark Lord and the Death Eaters, explicitly asking if Severus intended to join after graduation. Predictably, Lily got agitated. Severus quickly reassured her that he had refused. To calm her further, he promised never to join the Death Eaters, even for our sake. I knew Lucius Malfoy was one of Severus's few friends in Slytherin, so Severus would value his opinion. If Severus hadn't had two Gryffindor friends, he might have pursued power and joined the Death Eaters, given his Slytherin background. Now, Severus had to consider us. It was unclear whether we were a burden to him or had helped him. Severus, are you still friends with Lucius? I asked, noticing Lily's puzzled look. We were the last time we met, and he didn't mention cutting ties, Severus replied, raising an eyebrow. In fact, he said he would help ensure my refusal wouldn't cause trouble. I pursed my lips. That's pretty slick and smart. Now Severus owes him a favor. Yes, Lily mused. 
If we were Dumbledore's supporters, given Severus's relationship with us, he might join Dumbledore's side. This favor is his safety net. If Severus remains neutral, I added, keeping a friend is much better than gaining an enemy. And as long as they're recognized as true friends by us, they'll be loyal. That's Slytherin for you, Severus said with a wry smile. Aha, I like that, I mimicked his smile. Lily laughed at our expressions. At that moment, there was a knock on the compartment door. Lily, closest to the door, got up to open it, and I quickly lifted the silencing charm. It was Potter, with only Sirius accompanying him. Potter seemed to have made an effort, his school robes impeccably neat, his hair combed, not its usual messy state. He looked quite formal. Standing at the door, Potter cleared his throat. Lily, may I have the honor of inviting you to my compartment for a game of wizard chess? Was he trying to ask Lily out? I grinned mischievously, curious about her response. Oh, I'm not very fond of wizard chess it's a bit too rough for my taste, Lily replied evasively. Well, we could do something else, Potter said hurriedly. I mean, like exploding snap, or just chatting. Lily glanced back at us. I quickly looked away, staring at the ceiling, the window, Severus anywhere but at her. This was her decision to make. Though Severus's expression darkened, he said nothing. Lily turned back to the door, hesitated for a few seconds, then said, All right, lead the way. Potter's face lit up, and he gallantly stepped aside, gesturing for her to go first. As Lily left, she caught my mischievous grin and shot me a reproachful look before closing the door. I burst into laughter. Looks like Potter is making his move. I glanced at Severus, who still wore a scowl. Hesitantly, I asked, Severus, does it bother you that Potter is pursuing Lily? Anyone but that arrogant, self-important jerk. How could he possibly be good enough for Lily? Severus's disdainful tone deepened his frown. Was it just dislike for Potter? For a moment, I feared Severus might like Lily, causing my heart to tighten. If that were the case, because it was Lily, I wouldn't know if I could let go. Suddenly, I wasn't in the mood for jokes, so I curled up in my seat, fidgeting with my wand. The rest of the journey was spent quietly reading. Before we arrived, Lily returned to our compartment and playfully pinched my cheek several times in retaliation. I asked her about Potter, and she shrugged. As long as he doesn't act like a fool sometimes, he's not that bad. Severus snorted disdainfully. I patted Lily's shoulder. You shouldn't accept him too quickly. Make him work for it, and wait until he matures. Yeah, right, Lily nodded absently, then realized, no, wait, I never said I'd accept him, Sawyer. She lunged at me, pretending to strangle me. Just then, the train stopped, and I sighed in relief. Saved by the bell. Severus got up to pack his book, and I swore I saw him smirk with amusement. Chapter 33 By fourth year, the curriculum had reached a level of moderate difficulty, no longer the child's play of the earlier years. Especially in defense against the dark arts, where in previous years, we mainly learned basic defensive spells and how to deal with dark magical creatures. The constant change of teachers had made the content disjointed. This year, however, our textbook included some basic attack spells. This year's defense against the dark arts professor was a retired aura. The previous year's professor had suffered a magical accident and ended up in ST. Mungos, just like many before him who never taught a second year, confirming the rumored curse Voldemort placed on the position. It was said that this year's professor, Macaulay, had only applied for a one-year tenure, wisely avoiding the risk of testing the curse's validity. After a few weeks of classes, we began learning obstacle spells. Lily and I did quite well in class, and back at our base, the practice room thoughtfully provided some dummies, roughly the size of adult humans, for us to practice on. While Lily and I could practice on each other, getting hit by spells always meant falling down, and even with protective mats, it still hurt. We practiced spell strength on stationary dummies and precision by having one of us use a precise levitation charm to move the dummy while the other practiced their spells. If we mastered advanced transfiguration, we could even make the dummies move autonomously, but that was a high-level application of transfiguration. Sometimes, Severus would join us, 
and I realized just how skilled he was in defense against the dark arts. He must have practiced privately. When learning these attack spells, Professor Macaulay often emphasized their practical applications. The word practical made me think of the reports of attacks, Death Eaters, the Order of the Phoenix, and the war. It felt as if the ivory tower we'd been in since we started school was drawing closer to reality. My studies in healing magic were still focused on treating physical injuries. Madame Pomfrey said this required a process of experience, and I was progressing quite quickly. I no longer rushed healing magic required precision and careful practice. In the second month of the semester, we encountered a familiar face in the reception room of the hog's head, or rather, a familiar face to Severus. The young man with short brown hair in a drab traveling cloak was Damocles Belby, a recent Ravenclaw graduate whom we'd met at Professor Slughorn's dinner party last year. Severus must have recognized him too they had talked for a long time about potions, becoming kindred spirits of sorts. He didn't notice our recognition. After greetings and introductions, he explained his purpose and took out a package from his cloak, containing several bottles of potions. While Severus examined the potions, I chatted with Belby. He seemed not to recognize Severus. From our conversation, I learned that he had just graduated and had no intention of finding a fixed job but wanted to research potions independently, funding his research by selling potions. Severus judged his potions to be of high quality, and Lily and I recorded and prepaid for some of the potions, with the rest to be paid upon their sale. After he left, it was already noon. We left the hog's head and, familiar with the routine, changed back into our school robes and returned to our base on the eighth floor. Severa sat in an armchair and said, I have an idea. Is it about Belby? I had a hunch. Yes, I want to partner with him for the potion shop, he confirmed. Cyril Prince cannot stay in the UK indefinitely eventually, he will have to leave the country. The potion shop needs someone to manage it. Belby and I are friends, and he has great insights into potions. Today's potions were of high quality he's definitely qualified. Well, if you say so, Severus, it must be suitable. But we don't know his stance yet. Maybe we should observe a bit more. Lily suggested cautiously, and we all agreed. Over the next month, Belby brought potions weekly. We chatted with him, carefully probing his stance. He was cautious, only vaguely revealing his neutrality. Eventually, we happily reached an agreement, he was only interested in his potion research, and we were only concerned with the potion shop, with no desire to get involved in the conflict between dark and light wizards. Belby agreed to our cooperation proposal, likely because he and Severus got along so well, just like at last year's dinner party. Once the topic turned to potions, they began an engrossing discussion. He even commented to Severus, you're the second person I've met who matches me so well. Your ideas are extremely valuable for research. I began to imagine his reaction when he discovered Severus' true identity. We arranged to meet him at noon the next day at the Three Broomsticks to discuss the details and hinted that there were some things we needed to tell him, hoping he wouldn't be too surprised. On the weekend at noon, we arrived early at the Three Broomsticks and chose a private room. Lily and Severus waited inside while I waited outside for Belby. When I saw Belby enter the Three Broomsticks in his familiar grey cloak, I approached him and politely nodded, Hello, Mr. Belby. Please follow me Mr. Prince is waiting for you in the private room. He seemed surprised to see a student like me receiving him and gave me a scrutinizing look. He probably had no impression of me from his school days. Noticing my eye color, his eyes filled with obvious confusion. I had deliberately styled my hair like I did yesterday when he saw me, with light makeup to make myself more recognizable, except for the height and eye color. Belby gave me a questioning look, but I smiled mysteriously, indicating that he would know soon enough. As we entered the private room, I immediately cast an anti-disruption charm and a silencing charm. The next second, we heard Belby's exclamation, Oh, Merlin. It's really you. I thought I was imagining things. Severus replied with a sardonic smile, Mr. Belby, pleased to meet you again. I'm Severus Snape, also known as Cyril Prince. We met yesterday morning. Lily and I couldn't help but stifle our laughter. Oh, come on, Severus, call me Damocles. 
We weren't this formal last year. I can't believe I didn't recognize you. Belby said, making a funny face as he sat across from Severus. All right, what do you want? Since you've revealed such an important secret to me, you must expect me to agree to something. Lily straightened her expression, you can certainly refuse, but you must keep our secret. And how do you plan to ensure I keep it? Belby seemed genuinely interested. How about a Fidelius charm? I suggested half-jokingly, or maybe an Obliviate. He looked a bit surprised, you've already learned such advanced spells. Who says it's impossible? But maybe I'm just bluffing, I said playfully. Of course, we were bluffing we were only fourth years. All right, all right, I'm scared. Shall we discuss the details of our cooperation? Belby said cheerfully, showing no signs of being frightened. Then let me reintroduce myself, Mr. Belby, Lily stood up from her seat next to Severus and extended her hand to Belby. Lily Evans, fourth year Gryffindor. Damocles, Belby stood up and shook her hand, I know you. Professor Slughorn mentioned you, said you saved his dignity while teaching potions to Gryffinders. Well, you probably don't remember me, even though we met at the professor's dinner, I joked, Sawyer Hill, also a fourth-year Gryffindor. Uh, I think I know you now, he said, turning to shake my hand politely. Yes, I'd rather you not remember me for my terrible potions, I laughed nonchalantly. So, let's have a great cooperation. Lying on the sofa in our base, I flipped through the contract in my hand. After repeatedly reviewing books like The Power of Contracts and The Constraints of Magical Agreements, we had drafted a contract. Now, it had all four of our signatures and was confirmed to be magically effective. The contract ensured mutual responsibilities and benefits, binding us together. Of course, Damocles was obligated to keep our secret. After Christmas, Cyril Prince would leave the UK, and Damocles would officially take over Severus' work. Closing the document, I stretched, it's time for dinner. Let's head to the Great Hall. I miss Tito at times like this. This term, I hadn't brought Tito to Hogwarts. I had left him at Severus' house to occasionally clean up. He could go anywhere, learn new recipes, and visit Aunt Druella without her knowing. I also asked Tito to find Cousin Andromeda and see how she was doing since house elves could move unseen by wizards if they wanted to. Letting the room of requirement open a door on an empty fourth-floor corridor, we headed to the Great Hall on the first floor. Severus, do you have any plans with Damocles? The contract mentioned joint research, I remembered it specified that the potion shop would fund the research, with a portion of the benefits from the results going to the shop and the honor belonging to the researchers. We want to research ancient potion formulas or new potions, with several directions in mind. We'll discuss them when the time comes. Severus' demeanor was particularly strong when talking about potions. Can I join the research too? Lily interjected, I think I could be of some help. Of course, Severus raised an eyebrow, the contract includes all four of us. As long as your potion skills don't blow up the cauldron and hinder our progress, you're welcome to join us. He glanced at me when saying the last part. I felt deflated it was true. I can't help with potions, but maybe I could help test them, I weakly suggested. Severus glared at me, we wouldn't let you test potions. That's dangerous. All right, I raised my hands in surrender, I was joking. Chapter 34 Severus and his team needed a suitable place for their research. Since Damocles couldn't enter Hogwarts and we could only go to Hogsmeade on weekends, we had to find a place there. Damocles mentioned that he didn't get along well with his brother and had moved out after coming of age. Having just graduated, he was renting a place in Diagon Alley but was now looking to buy a house. After about a week, Damocles finally chose a house to buy, located a bit off the main street in Hogsmeade. The house had a good structure, with two floors and a basement. However, it was quite bare, with minimal furniture and no significant renovations. Damocles spent a few more days setting up, and on Saturday, we went straight to his new home after leaving the hog's head. Seeing Damocles' so-called settled home, Lily and I could only comfort each other, we shouldn't expect a single man devoted to potions to have a well-kept home. After a chaotic afternoon, we returned to school exhausted but satisfied. After dinner, 
We stayed in the common room until curfew, reading. I closed the book I had just finished, Irreversible Magical Damage, and rubbed my eyes. Are you going to Damocles' place tomorrow? Lily looked up from her book, yes, are you coming? I won't I yawned. I need to return this book to Madame Pomfrey and borrow a new one. I waved the book in my hand. If you're tired, go back to the dormitory and sleep, Severa said without looking up. Was he concerned about me? I wasn't sure and tried to find clues in his expression but found none. Yes, Sawyer, you look tired. I'll walk with you, Lily said, adding a bookmark and packing her bag. All right. Severus, aren't you coming? I'll leave in a bit. You two go ahead. Okay, good night. The next morning, I woke up early and couldn't go back to sleep. Since lying in bed was boring, I decided to return the book to the hospital wing. I got up quietly, washed, left a note for Lily, and left the Gryffindor Tower with the book. I'd never gone to the hospital wing this early, and when I reached the door, I realized Madame Pomfrey might not be up yet. It felt intrusive, but since I was already there, I decided to wait inside. I sneaked in and prepared to sit on a bed when I heard voices from the special ward inside. It was Madame Pomfrey's voice. The door was ajar, and my curiosity peaked, but eavesdropping wasn't polite. I knocked, pushing the door open a bit more. Poppy, are you there? I immediately saw a weak-looking Remus lying on the bed and Madame Pomfrey, who seemed to have just finished a healing spell, her wand still raised. Sorry to interrupt, Madame. I came to return the book I borrowed. I raised the book. But, may I ask what happened to Mr. Lupin? He doesn't look well. Madame Pomfrey sighed, not answering me directly. She put away her wand and said to Remus, it's up to you whether you want to tell her. If she's a friend and truly cares for you she trailed off and turned to leave Mr. Lupin needs more blood replenishing potion. I'll go see Professor Slughorn. Sawyer, can you handle his wounds? There's one on his chest and another on his arm. No problem, madam. I watched her leave and close the door. Walking over to Remus, I saw him pulling his clothes together to hide his wounds. I sighed inwardly and said in a healer's impartial tone, let me see the chest wound. Please open your shirt, Mr. Lupin. Hearing my firm tone, Remus resignedly opened his shirt. The gory wound, running from his left shoulder to his second rib, made me frown. It was a beast's claw mark. Madame Pomfrey had already stopped the bleeding. I skillfully drew my wand and murmured the healing spell, watching the wound slowly close, leaving a pink scar. Such forceful tears in a skin rarely healed perfectly without expensive and complex skin regenerating potions, which were usually only used by wealthy families. The school infirmary didn't stock such potions. Silently, I treated the wound on Remus' arm and then sat down with a stern expression, waiting for him to speak. He looked conflicted, still hesitating whether to tell me the truth. If you're debating whether to tell me you're a werewolf, I already know, I said, confirming the uneasy truth. Seeing his shocked and somewhat vulnerable expression, my attitude softened. I had suspected something was off about him last semester but didn't investigate. After all, I trusted Dumbledore and Madame Pomfrey's responsibility toward Hogwarts students. Last semester's defense against the dark arts textbook had a final chapter on werewolves, though we didn't cover it in class due to the professor's hospitalization, I read it myself and consulted related books. The signs were clear, and with yesterday's full moon. I had pieced it together. Examining him closely confirmed the werewolf traits in Remus. I figured it out myself. Lily didn't tell me, I added, shrugging. I didn't intend to uncover your secret. But I have a habit of self-study and didn't miss the werewolf chapter. And then, oops I nodded at his wounds. I stumbled upon the evidence, and the truth became evident. I spread my hands in a detective's manner. I tried to lighten the atmosphere, and Remus seemed to relax a bit. I didn't dare tell you. I know how dangerous werewolves are. If people knew, I wouldn't be allowed to stay at Hogwarts I don't want to lose this. Since being bitten as a child, I never expected to attend Hogwarts, let alone have friends. I understood, but, even if Dumbledore has made safety arrangements, you could still hurt your friends. 
You know that, I said, catching the hurt in his expression. Werewolves lose control after transforming. You're dangerous, Remus. I know I hate that. He said with frustration and helplessness. I guess Dumbledore's arrangement is the Shrieking Shack. Remus nodded, I transform there every month. There's a secret passage leading from the Whomping Willow to the Shack. The haunted rumors are spread intentionally to keep people away. We had encountered that and managed to involve Tito in a bit of trouble. I thought sarcastically. Given that, as long as you're cautious, you can avoid hurting others. Who else knows this besides the professors? James, Sirius, Peter, and Lily. James and I share a dormitory, and they found out in second year. I thought I'd lose them then but they remain my friends, calling it my furry little problem. Speaking of his close friends, his tone was filled with warmth and gratitude. Last semester, Lily got curious about the Shrieking Shack, which you probably know. Of course, I knew I had prompted it. I made a face inwardly but said nothing. James let slip a few things under Lily's pestering, and she, being smart and self-taught like you, figured it out. She rushed to confront me, upset that I didn't trust her. Remus smiled wryly. Should I be upset you didn't trust me? If I hadn't stumbled upon this today, you wouldn't have told me, would you? I pretended to be annoyed. It's not about trust. Remus sat up anxiously. I'm afraid of losing you all. I value my friends. But Lily is still your friend, and do I seem like I'm about to cut ties with you? I raised an eyebrow with a mock smile. Realizing I was joking, Remus relaxed back onto his pillow, Phew, Sawyer, you look so much like Snape right now. I realized I was subconsciously mimicking Severus. Thinking of his raised eyebrow and sardonic smile, I smiled too. Aha Remus laughed, looks like someone's in love. I must have been smiling too dreamily earlier, making Remus laugh at me. Embarrassed, I blushed and glared at him. Stop it. We're discussing your issue. Oh, someone's getting defensive all right, Remus held up his hands in mock surrender as I looked ready to explode, where were we? We were talking about cutting ties. Maybe I should seriously consider it I feigned hesitation. Oh, I shouldn't have joked about you and Snape, Remus said, his gentle smile tinged with vulnerability. Are you serious? Now I regretted joking about this he was too sensitive. I put on my most serious expression. I'm serious now. We're still friends. You can trust me, and I'll help you find ways to lessen the pain. I gestured to his wounds. A thought suddenly crossed my mind, but I held back, not wanting to give false hope. You've already eased my pain. Your healing skills are excellent. Remus' voice was soft and filled with gratitude. His experiences must have made him easily content and grateful. My resolve to help him strengthened. I'll do everything I can. That's what friends do. Now, Madame Pomfrey should be back by now. Look at your pale face you need that blood replenishing potion. I stood up to leave I'll go get her. As I opened the door to the special ward, I heard his voice behind me, thank you. Chapter 35 I spent the entire afternoon in the library, poring over every case involving werewolves throughout history. I discovered that werewolves held a very low status due to their dangerous nature, leading to widespread rejection and disdain. Most werewolves lived in poverty, often leading a nomadic existence, while the more bloodthirsty and violent ones were outright reviled. Historically, some renowned wizards and potion masters had attempted to develop spells or potions to suppress the lycanthropic poison within werewolves, but none of these efforts yielded publicly acknowledged results. Severus and Lily returned before dinner. I went to the kitchen to get some food from Bobo, and we had dinner in the room of requirement. After the meal, I casually played with my napkin and cautiously asked, Severus, do you know of any potions that can suppress a werewolf's transformation? Lily looked up at me, surprised and questioning. I knew what she wanted to ask mentioning werewolves would make her think of Remus. I confirmed her suspicion with a look, and she understood. Werewolves? Severus frowned slightly, as if recalling something, not noticing our silent exchange. No such potion has been discovered, at least none publicly. 
However, I did come across related research in the potion notes from the manor. It was conducted by one of my great-great-grandfathers but was interrupted and left unfinished. That still gave us some hope, building on previous research might increase our chances. If you were to research this, do you think you could succeed? It's uncertain, but it's worth a try, Severus replied, his gaze turning towards me. I met his black eyes. Are you interested in this? Feeling inexplicably guilty, I didn't want to hide Remus's situation from him, but I also had to respect Remus's privacy. Maybe I should ask for his consent before telling Severus. Smiling casually, I said, a bit. I just happened to read a book about werewolves today. How did your research go today? Have you decided on a project? No, Lily answered, taking over the conversation. Today, we organized the potion shop's previous records for Damocles to understand our situation better and filled a few out-of-stock orders. We didn't have time to discuss research directions. Maybe researching a potion to suppress lycanthropy would be a good idea, Severus said, rubbing his temples, looking a bit tired. I felt a pang of concern and resisted the urge to go over and massage his temples. I think so too. Since no one has succeeded yet, and Severus has ancestral research notes, it should be advantageous, Lily agreed. She and I both wanted this research to start smoothly. If there was hope on this end, convincing Remus should be easy. But researching a lycanthropy suppressant would definitely require the cooperation of a trustworthy werewolf. That's not easy to find, Severus frowned again. Lily and I exchanged a look, understanding each other. Let's put this on hold for now. Maybe we'll have an opportunity later, I suggested cautiously. Back in the dormitory that evening, the other two girls hadn't returned yet. They both seemed to be dating fervently. You know about Remus, don't you? Lily asked with certainty. I had a feeling when I saw your note this morning. You must have seen him in the hospital wing, considering yesterday was a full moon, and he'd definitely be there today. Yes, everything happened just as you said, and now I know, I shrugged. Remus should agree to help with the research. This could be his chance to escape the pain. Let's find a chance to ask him tomorrow. Once we have his consent, the research can start smoothly, Lily said, hopeful. He wants to be rid of this more than anyone. He'll cooperate with any experiments if there's hope. Though the process might be unpleasant, it's worth a try. The next morning, after transfiguration class, Lily and I found Remus to talk privately. We shook off James, Sirius, and Peter and took Remus to an empty classroom, locking the door and casting a silencing charm. We got straight to the point about the potion research, interrupting Remus's excited questions. We explained that the potions would be researched by Severus and another colleague and that his cooperation would be necessary, possibly for experiments or blood extraction. I solemnly told him, if you trust us, you can agree to cooperate, but that means letting Severus know your situation. Although we trust him implicitly, you can choose to refuse. Remus calmed down and thought for a moment before looking at us with determined eyes. I accept. I trust you. Despite expecting this answer, Lily and I still felt relieved. We'll discuss it with Severus and then get back to you. Some things need his approval first, I said, surprising Lily a bit. Also, don't tell anyone else until everything is settled. I was referring to James and the others. Without explaining further, we said goodbye to Remus. On the way to the Great Hall, I explained to Lily, if we're going to work with Remus, he'll need to know some things about the potion shop, which involves Severus. We can't decide that on our own. But I thought Remus was trustworthy, given how he trusts us, Lily questioned, still so innocent. It's not about him being untrustworthy. We just need to be cautious. Trust is something Severus won't extend lightly, especially to a Gryffindor, just like you wouldn't easily trust a Slytherin, except Severus. This was natural, an inherited enmity. Slytherins, even among themselves, were cautious about whom they trusted. Lily seemed thoughtful. As a pure Gryffindor, she sometimes didn't understand my reservations about our housemates, especially my wariness towards Dumbledore. My caution wasn't out of mistrust but to avoid drawing his attention. I felt that being noticed by him would inevitably drag us into troublesome and dangerous situations from which we couldn't escape. 
I didn't want the three of us entangled in such matters. Justice and evil were relative evil could never be completely eradicated. Or maybe I didn't care about these things because they were too far removed from me. Although I believe Remus wouldn't harm us, since you suggest it, we should ask Severus's opinion, Lily conceded, not dwelling on it. We reached the first floor as lunch began. We sat down to eat and, after a while, saw Remus and the others enter the hall, taking seats not far from us. James seemed eager to come over, curiosity evident on his face perhaps to find out what we had discussed earlier. But Lily's glare sent him back. Remus gave us a helpless look he must have been questioned extensively. Having such energetic and curious friends made keeping secrets exhausting. That evening in the Room of Requirement, we told Severus about Remus. Lupin is a werewolf. Severus frowned. Dumbledore actually lets a werewolf stay among us students. Remus doesn't want to be a werewolf. Lily retorted, unhappy. He suffers greatly. Every transformation, he loses his mind, with no one to bite but himself. He's always covered in wounds, which is why he's so weak. He doesn't want to hurt anyone kind-hearted Lily had seen Remus's post-transformation state many times. Though he insisted on seeing them only after treatment, the weakness and scars were still evident. Lily understood and sympathized with Remus's feelings. Severus seemed to hold back a caustic remark. He might not care about Remus's plight they weren't friends, though not as hostile as with James. But he cared about Lily's feelings. I quickly intervened, many werewolves, like Remus, don't want to live that way. Researching a lycanthropy suppressant could ease their suffering and make us safer. If successful, it would be a great achievement. Mentioning potions softened Severus's expression, and he didn't say anything more about Remus being a werewolf. I continued, you said such research needs the cooperation of a trustworthy werewolf. Remus has agreed. As for trust, he's our classmate, better than any unknown werewolf. Plus, we can have Damocles handle it, keeping our involvement with the potion shop a secret from Remus. Severus's thoughtful expression showed he was considering it. Finally, he nodded. If we're going to do this, we should do it well. Let's bring Lupin to Hogsmeade this weekend. Lily visibly relaxed, her mood lifting. Thank you, Severus. It's nothing, Severus said indifferently. I'm doing it for the potion research. Lily made a face at me, and I couldn't help but smile. I didn't miss the slight curve of Severus's lips. Must you be so subtle? Such a stubborn child. That Saturday, we had Damocles take over at the Hog's Head early, with me assisting him. Near the end, Severus and Lily brought Remus over, and we all went to Damocles's new house. We had discussed the lycanthropy suppressant potion via Owl Post before, and I had told Damocles that our cooperating werewolf would be joining us. Even so, he seemed a bit surprised to see Remus. Later, Damocles told me he hadn't expected such a gentle boy, thinking a werewolf might be more rebellious. Starting with the serious business, Damocles explained to Remus that cooperation would require testing the potion on him and extracting blood, which could be painful. I saw a rare look of determination on Remus's usually gentle face. I don't mind. If it helps me escape this condition and become safe, any hardship is worth it. They began planning the potion research. I sincerely hoped the research would go smoothly. This project held not only Severus and Lily's dreams of potion research but also Remus's desperate hope for relief. Chapter 36 Once the potion research was underway, I was able to put Remus's situation out of my mind. On another full moon night, Damocles waited near the shrieking shack. The following morning, after Remus reverted to human form, Damocles extracted blood and saliva from his wounds before escorting him through the secret passage to the exit near the Whomping Willow, where Madame Pomfrey awaited. I didn't have classes that morning, so I took over Remus's treatment at the hospital wing. Despite Remus's reluctance to show us his battered state, he couldn't refuse medical care, so I treated his injuries. Damocles informed us that Dumbledore had spoken with him. It was a casual conversation with a few symbolic questions, indicating that Dumbledore was already aware of our plan to research the lycanthropy potion. Remus must have told him, as we left the decision up to him. 
even if Remus hadn't said anything, Dumbledore would have found out. He mainly offered his support and helped modify the Shrieking Shack slightly. For safety, it had previously been sealed, but now an inconspicuous entrance that could only be opened from the outside was added to facilitate Damocles's access. Enhanced security measures were also implemented. As Christmas break approached, Tito returned to Hogwarts to find me while we were studying in the base's common room. He told me he had located cousin Andromeda. She and her husband were living in a shabby house with a few-month-old daughter. Tito was agitated, finding the house's condition unbearable. I was curious about just how bad it was. Tito stayed there for two days, watching Miss Andromeda clean the house. Tito couldn't help because Miss Sawyer instructed Tito not to be seen, Tito said, looking forlorn before becoming agitated again. But that muggle wizard always messes up the house right after it's cleaned. Poor Miss Andromeda has to do all the housework and care for the baby by herself. Tito couldn't help. Bad Tito. Despite my repeated assurances, Tito still had the habit of scolding himself when upset. I gave Lily a helpless look and subtly moved back to avoid the shrill voice. Tito, it's not your fault. It's not time for her to know about me yet, I soothed. What's the baby's name? Is she cute? Tito calmed down, his large eyes sparkling as he spoke about the baby. Her name is Nymphadora Tonks. She's very cute. Her hair changes color, pink when she giggles and gray when she cries, and many other colors. So magical. I remembered reading about Metamorph Magi in a book on Transfiguration. They have the innate ability to change their appearance at will, including their hair color, which can also change with their emotions. Little Nymphadora might be a metamorphmagus, a rare talent indeed. Tito, did you come to tell me something? I hadn't expected him to report back so soon I thought he'd wait until the holidays. Tito's head drooped. Miss Sawyer said Tito could visit Miss Druella, so Tito went to the black house. Miss Druella is ill. Tito is very worried, so he visited her when no one was around. She remembered Tito. Tito's eyes were teary as he looked at me. Miss Druella said she misses Miss Sia very much. She's very unwell, always in bed, and thinking about Miss Sia makes her even sadder. Tito wants to ask Miss Sawyer to visit Miss Druella. I was taken aback. Visit my Aunt Druella? I'd never considered it. I looked at Lily and Severus, who had been listening. Severus's expression indicated disapproval. I turned back to Tito, intending to refuse, but those large, tear-filled eyes made me falter. Mumbling something noncommittal, I tried to find a gentle way to refuse, but Tito, sensing my intent, began crying and hitting the ground, wailing about how he failed Miss Sia and Miss Druella. Exasperated, I pulled him up. All right, all right, stop that. I'll go see Aunt Druella, but it has to be on my terms. I felt Severus's disapproving gaze. Oh. Tito knew Miss Sawyer is kind. What are your instructions? Tito will do them immediately. Tito straightened up, looking ready for action. This is going to be troublesome, I muttered, then instructed Tito to inform Aunt Druella that I was the child from years ago and arrange a private meeting. Tito received the orders and disappeared. I turned to Lily and Severus with a frustrated look. Severus frowned. This goes against your initial intent. You didn't want any connections with them. Indeed, I didn't. I agreed to visit my aunt for my mother's sake. Though I'd never met her, she had given me life. My aunt truly cared for and loved her sister. Regardless of the circumstances, visiting her on behalf of my mother to thank her was the least I could do. As for getting entangled in these matters, I didn't know what would happen, but as long as my aunt valued her sister's memory, I should be safe. My behavior during the visit would be crucial if I could convince her of my neutrality, I might avoid further trouble. I sighed, hoping this decision wasn't a mistake. But since I've already agreed, let's take it one step at a time. Tito returned after a while with an invitation from Aunt Druella, asking me to visit a black family estate on the second day after Christmas. It seemed to be a private invitation, which would minimize complications. I asked Tito to accept the invitation, giving me time to prepare for the meeting over the holidays. 
Seated in a luxurious, comfortable armchair, I looked at the refined tea set and the cold-toned decor of the room, predominantly silver and green, showcasing the grandeur of the ancient Slytherin black family. Despite being just an estate, it was impressive. I glanced at the elegant woman opposite me. Her face was well-maintained, showing no signs of illness, likely due to a beautifying charm before our meeting. She was observing me with a gentle expression and a hint of nostalgia in her eyes. Your name is Sawyer, isn't it? You look so much like your mother, except for the eyes. She had beautiful grey-blue eyes. Her tone held the aristocratic pride but tried to sound kind and friendly. I gave a shy smile, speaking with a tone of regret and confusion. Unfortunately, I've never met her and didn't know who my biological mother was. I thought I was abandoned. I looked down at my clasped hands. Tito suddenly came to me, saying I was his little mistress and that my mother sent me away to protect me. He said I had an aunt, I looked up at her, which is you, Mrs. Black. I didn't know I had any blood relatives. Oh, my poor child, and my poor sister she said with pity. Have you been raised by muggles all this time? She spoke the word muggles with disdain. My adoptive parents are muggles, but they treated me well. Without them, I might have died. I'm very grateful to them. I forced some tears to well up in my eyes. She sighed, you are just as kind as your mother. Mrs. Black, what was my mother like? I asked with curiosity, which house was she in at Hogwarts? Call me Aunt Druella, she said warmly. Sia graduated from Ravenclaw. She was very smart and loved to read. Though I was much older, we were always close. I heard from Tito that you took care of my mother before she passed. You were very good to her. This was heartfelt. Mentioning my mother's death brought a look of sorrow to Aunt Druella's face, and there was a flash of guilt in her eyes. Why would she feel guilty about my mother? Was it related to her death? Whatever the reason, her lingering guilt after all these years showed her deep care for her sister. Aunt Druella, Tito said you were ill. How are you now? I asked, steering the conversation back to my reason for visiting. It's nothing serious, just an old ailment that's been worse lately. She brushed it off lightly, her expression returning to a noble smile. Suddenly, she seemed to remember something. I heard you're in Gryffindor. She asked without revealing her thoughts. Yes, I answered, unsure of her opinion. My nephew Sirius is as well. The sorting hat must have malfunctioned that year to make such a judgment. The Black family has never had a witch or wizard in any house but Slytherin. At the very least, you should have been in Ravenclaw, never Gryffindor. Her tone was matter-of-fact. The Black family likely believed that Sirius's placement in Gryffindor corrupted him with Gryffindor traits. They were fiercely protective of their family. Sirius was indeed stubborn. I didn't know how to respond, but fortunately, she didn't seem to expect an answer. However, it doesn't matter if Sawyer is in Gryffindor. Ant can help you find a good job after graduation, following the Dark Lord. As long as you achieve merit, the Dark Lord won't care about your half-blood status. The conversation took a sudden turn, leaving me momentarily flustered. Steadying myself, I responded with a troubled expression, but Aunt Druella, I'm a Gryffindor. Following the Dark Lord would make me a traitor and a target in Gryffindor. I don't want to get involved in these dangerous conflicts. I just want to become a healer at a tea. Mungo's after graduation and avoid these battles. Seeing her displeased expression, I added sadly, if mother were still alive, she would want me to be safe. That last line seemed to work. Aunt Druella hesitated, her conflicted expression settling on a reluctant look. If that's what you wish, so be it. Take care of yourself. Don't get too close to Dumbledore's people it won't be good for you. Yes, I will be careful. Thank you, Aunt Druella. I felt a sense of relief. This should minimize complications. As long as I didn't show any inclination towards Dumbledore, Aunt Druella wouldn't trouble me. And if Dumbledore learned of my heritage, he wouldn't trust me, but I didn't need his trust. All right, it's nearly dinner time. Stay for dinner, Sawyer. Your two cousins will join us, and you can meet them. 
Her tone broke no refusal. Don't worry about the school curfew we can ask the caretaker to open the door. I'd rather return via the shrieking shack, just past the full moon, with Tito's help. I thought sarcastically. I didn't want Dumbledore to know I'd just come from a black family estate, though he probably already knew. Chapter 37 My two cousins arrived one after the other, and we introduced ourselves, maintaining a polite distance. Narcissa seemed more mature than when I last saw her at school, exuding the grace of a noble lady in every gesture. Aunt Druella mentioned that she was engaged to a Malfoy, but avoided any talk of wedding invitations or dates, perhaps to sidestep awkwardness. Narcissa smiled at me elegantly, with a courteous but distant demeanor that I found reassuring. On the other hand, Bellatrix no Lestrange was more domineering, her noble facade only thinly veiling her disdain. When Aunt Druella mentioned I was Sia's daughter, a flicker of contempt and loathing crossed Bellatrix's eyes before she masked it. She must have been around eight or nine when my mother's incident occurred and knew I was a half-blood. Feeling her hostility directed at me made me shrink back knowing that Death Eaters hated muggles was one thing, but experiencing it firsthand was another. Dinner was a tense affair. I meticulously remembered everything I crammed from basic table manners, cautiously cutting my lamb chops and chewing in small bites. Apart from an initial mishap where the fork scraped the plate noisily, earning unified frowns from the three women, I managed to avoid further mistakes by maintaining a facade of calm. While having dessert, Aunt Druella steered the conversation, and I adhered to my principle of saying less to avoid mistakes, smiling genuinely and listening attentively. When I did speak, I chose neutral and vague comments. I wasn't worried about drawing their ire, given that Aunt Druella had already agreed to my neutrality. Overall, the atmosphere remained outwardly cordial. Bellatrix subtly inquired about my views on Dumbledore after learning I was in Gryffindor. I responded that he was too biased, spoiling Gryffinders, who were already too rowdy and now constantly cause trouble, often ending up in the hospital wing, much to Madame Pomfrey's frustration. However, it gave me plenty of practice opportunities, steering the topic towards my studies in healing magic. Returning to school left me exhausted. Before curfew, I headed to the room of requirement, where Lily and Severus were waiting. As soon as I entered, Lily rushed to me, checking me over for injuries. Are you alright, Sawyer? She seemed relieved upon seeing I was intact. Then she tightened her grip on my arm. Did they do anything to you? No curses, right? I winced and patted her hand. No, but you could squeeze harder. If it breaks, I can heal myself. Lily gave a nervous laugh and released me, switching to linking arms. If you hadn't returned by curfew, we were going to Dumbledore. I couldn't help but laugh. I wasn't in a den of wolves. After all, they're my relatives. Aunt Druella wouldn't harm me. Seeing the concern in Severus's eyes warmed my heart. I'm fine. I was just kept for dinner, which is why I'm late. I'm sorry for worrying you. I was really worried. Your aunt is a death eater, and they are dark wizards. Even if she's your relative, I was still worried about you, Lily said, relieved, pulling me to sit on the couch. I didn't argue about the dark wizard label ten years in Gryffindor had solidified her black and white worldview. I briefly recounted the day's events and my conversation with Aunt Druella. They were both surprised. Severus was astonished that Aunt Druella easily agreed to my neutrality, while Lily was taken aback that I didn't intend to side with Dumbledore. Sawyer, you were just saying that to appease her, right? Lily asked, puzzled. I had always been reluctant to engage with Dumbledore, which Lily likely chalked up to my preference for staying low-key or protecting Severus and the potion shop from attention. How could I explain to this Gryffindor lion that I, a supposed champion of justice, didn't want to get involved in the war, or that I, a supposedly brave Gryffindor, was simply afraid of dying. I don't want to take sides, Lily. I just hope we all stay safe. Our parents are muggles. I know you think joining Dumbledore offers protection, but it also makes us enemies of the Death Eaters, who would gladly harm muggles to strike at their enemies. Remember the muggle attacks reported in the papers? Joining Dumbledore might put our parents in more danger. I don't think Dumbledore and the Order can protect every Muggleborn's family. 
Lily seemed confused, not wanting her parents and Petunia in danger. But even if I don't join the order, my family is still muggles and could still be hurt. We're different. You don't have a Death Eater aunt who could help, nor do you have to worry about upsetting her by supporting the order. I joked lightly. Aunt Druella, for the sake of my mother, accepts my neutrality and leaves my adoptive parents alone. This is my best option. Also, as a healer, I'll be respected and better positioned to protect my family. Lily seemed to understand, lowering her head in thought. I looked at Severus. Besides, Severus can't easily join the order either. As a Slytherin, he wouldn't be trusted. Look at the usual Gryffindor-Slytherin camaraderie. What do you think, Severus? Severus, who had been silent, spoke up. I've said I won't join the Death Eaters, but that doesn't mean I want to fight alongside a bunch of impulsive Gryffinders. He chose his words carefully, avoiding harsh criticism. I just want to focus on my research. After a moment, Lily lifted her head, determined. If everyone thinks like that, who will fight? I don't care about the risks. I'll protect my family, even if it means distancing myself from them for their safety. At least I'll fight for justice. I'm a Gryffindor warrior. I once again questioned how I ended up in Gryffindor. Lily's words might have made me feel ashamed but not swayed. I'm not stopping you from fighting. Though our views differ, we can still be friends. I won't fight alongside you, but we can study together and strengthen ourselves. You and Severus are like family to me, and I want you safe. I know, Lily softened, you two mean a lot to me, too. Then let's work hard. We have much to learn and are too weak now. To protect what we hold dear, we must become stronger. I wrapped an arm around Lily's shoulder, encouraging her. Indeed, being good in class doesn't equate to strength, Severus said seriously. Compared to the Death Eater's dark magic, our current level of white magic is like child's play. We can't fight with Aguamenti. His last comment was clearly a jest. Lily chuckled. We also know disarming charms and obstacle charms. We're only fourth years and have over three years to learn more powerful spells. Who says Aguamenti can't be used in a fight? I thought of high pressure water jets. With increased pressure and precision, it could be troublesome for enemies. It was an interesting idea worth trying. Lily and Severus thought I was joking and paid no heed. I want to learn some protective spells to set up defenses at home, in case Death Eaters come. It might not be much against them, but it's better than nothing, Lily said, voicing my fears. The uncertainty of such an event was terrifying. Family meant everything to me I couldn't afford any risks. You could ask Professor Flittick. He loves enthusiastic students and would be happy to help, Severa suggested. Seeing our inquiring looks, he added, as for me, I have other things to learn, so I won't join you. Other things? If you mean potions. Lily nodded. Oh, James said he saw you with Avery and Mulciber, suspecting you were learning dark magic. I told him it was slander you have normal social interactions in your house. They are dark magic pranksters, but you're not like that. Are they your friends in Slytherin, Severus? Severus was silent for a few seconds before muttering, no. Then I'm relieved. I knew James was just gossiping, always badmouthing you, Lily complained. Why do you two dislike each other so much? Severus wouldn't be friendly to someone who provokes him. As for James, he dislikes any boy close to you. I teased her. Don't you know why? Lily blushed, managing to say, that arrogant jerk. He is quite conceited. So, Lily, you should keep him in check and not let him succeed easily. Who said I'd let him succeed, Lily retorted, annoyed. Because of him, no boys dare approach me besides the marauders. Who can stand their constant pranks? Except Severus. Our friendship is really solid. She sighed. Absolutely, Severus said dryly. Should I say I'm making a big sacrifice? I stifled a laugh. Chapter 38 The school felt particularly deserted during the holiday, with few students around. James, Sirius, and Peter had all gone home for Christmas, leaving Remus behind. 
Lily had also planned to go home but decided to stay because she was worried about me and my aunt. We spent the rest of the holiday in the library and Professor Flittick's office. He stayed at the school during the break and was thrilled to hear that we wanted to learn protective spells to safeguard our families. He praised us enthusiastically, nearly moved to tears. I was surprised at how someone as small as Professor Flittick could contain such strong emotions he seemed to get excited very easily. Professor Flittick agreed to teach us a house protection spell that creates a protective barrier around a house, preventing malicious people from approaching. However, the spell's effectiveness depends on the caster's ability. At our current level, if Death Eaters were to come, the spell would likely be easily broken. But combined with warning spells and magical items like sneakoscopes, it could at least alert those inside the house to danger, allowing them to seek help. My original idea was to connect the fireplace at home to a safe place using the flu network, allowing a quick escape if necessary. However, Professor Flittick explained that muggles couldn't use the flu network independently, as it required both flu powder and magical support. I could connect my home's fireplace, but it would only facilitate my quick return home. For a magical escape, I would need to be present. The same applied to port keys while I could use a port key with my parents, the person directly using it without magical support could be injured or even torn apart by spatial pressure. Professor Flittick suggested keeping constant contact with home, ideally through a pair of two-way mirrors, which muggles could also use. However, two-way mirrors were expensive. While the potion shop had started making money, we didn't want to dip into those funds. Finally, Professor Flittick decided to teach us a spell that could link to the protective spell at home, alerting us immediately if the protection spell was attacked. This solution was also acceptable, providing basic protection. For the rest of the term, we scheduled lessons with Professor Flittick every Thursday evening in the Charms classroom. It felt like special tutoring, and Professor Flittick seemed happy to provide it, welcoming any eager students from all houses, not just his own Ravenclaws. After a few sessions, Professor Flittick was pleased with our progress. Both Lily and I were doing well, and he believed we could master the spells by the end of the term. Learning alongside Lily, I found her understanding and control on par with mine, even though I had the advantage of an adult's mindset. Lily was truly talented. I scrutinized Lily from head to toe, her beautiful deep red hair, bright green eyes looking back at me curiously, and her well-developed figure. Feeling my gaze, Lily defensively crossed her arms over her chest. Sawyer, what are you plotting now? She looked at me like I was some sort of monster. I held up my hands innocently. Nothing. I was just thinking about the truth behind Potter's obsession and concluded that he has excellent taste. I nodded at her skeptical look. Yes, I'm complimenting you. Ugh, you always leave me speechless. Lily had grown used to my teasing about Potter chasing her. She lifted her chin. I'll accept your compliment. Yesterday afternoon, I felt like someone was following us. They were quite good at hiding. Do you think it was Potter? Probably. Who else would have nothing better to do but wander around? Lily sounded exasperated. He used disillusionment well, and he silenced his steps. If it weren't for the intense feeling of being watched, I wouldn't have noticed. My revealing spell didn't work. If it weren't for the footprints by the bathroom, I would have thought it was my imagination. But without proof, we can't confront him. Do we have to go to the girl's bathroom every time to shake him off? It would be troublesome if he discovered our base, even if he couldn't enter. What else can we do? Lily sighed, looking frustrated. We'll just have to be careful. Let's make a bathroom stop before heading to the base. Seeing Lily so troubled, I decided to be kind and not tease her anymore, smiling quietly instead. I thought we could avoid trouble by being careful, but Potter still found out about our base. Although we managed to evade his stalking, he then followed Severus after class, straight to the room of requirement. After Severus entered, the door disappeared, and Potter, finding it suspicious but unable to enter, kept watch nearby. Not long after, he saw Lily go in alone, which meant that by the time I was inside. To Potter, it looked like Severus and Lily were alone together in the room all night. We had actually left through another exit before curfew, but Potter, unable to find a way in, 
grew more frustrated and waited outside all night. The next morning, with dark circles under his eyes, he confronted Severus in the Great Hall, demanding a duel. Although few students were there for breakfast, those present were eager to watch the spectacle. The Slytherins wore grim expressions, seeing it as a challenge to their house. I nudged the still-stunned Lily, and we, along with the groper dyed Potter, his three half-asleep friends, a very annoyed Severus, and a mortified Lily headed to an empty classroom. I locked the door and cast anti-eavesdropping and anti-spying spells. Settle whatever issue you have now. We have classes soon, I said, stifling a yawn. Severus Snape, I challenge you to a duel. The loser must stay away from Lily forever. Potter declared, eyes bloodshot, pointing his wand at Severus. Lily, hearing this unreasonable challenge, immediately bristled. Why should something involving me be decided by a duel? What's gotten into you? Why do you suddenly want to duel? What happened? Potter looked hurt by Lily's scolding but quickly masked it with determination. He continued addressing Severus, Snape, do you accept my challenge? Severus sneered, his lips curling. For what reason? He then tilted his head, almost pitying Potter. I don't expect someone with a troll-sized brain to come up with a suitable reason to expend your clearly excessive energy. Severus's tone and words infuriated Potter. Practically bouncing with rage, he took a deep breath, glared at Severus, then glanced at Lily and me before dramatically raising his wand again. For Lily and Sawyer, to avenge their hearts that you toyed with. Oh, how dramatic. Take up your wand, Snape. Today, truth is on my side, you deceitful, two-timing scoundrel. Dropping my playful demeanor, I realized things had escalated unexpectedly. What on earth was Potter thinking? I saw Severus's eyes narrow, clearly provoked. Potter continued his rant, scared, are you? Ah, typical Slytherin cowardice. He laughed with his friends, though Remus tried to intervene, only to be held back by Sirius. Enough. Severus growled, drawing his wand swiftly and pointing it at Potter's throat. I refuse your foolish challenge, but you will pay for your insults. Severus's wand tip began to glow, and a curse shot towards Potter, who barely dodged it by raising his wand just in time. Lily and I exchanged glances and rushed to separate them. Calm down, Severus. It's not worth causing trouble over this nonsense. I tried to soothe him, turning to glare at Potter. Explain yourself. What do you mean by, toying with hearts? What's this about two-timing? Are you trying to provoke Severus on purpose? Lily also demanded answers, hands on her hips, while the other three boys hurried to back up Potter. I'm doing this for your own good. Potter retorted. You've both been deceived by him. He's Sawyer's boyfriend, yet last night he glared at Severus. He was alone with Lily in the same room all night. Hearing Potter call Severus my boyfriend made me momentarily breathless, feeling inexplicably guilty. But his next words left us all gaping. So that's what happened. He must have followed Severus to the room of requirement and then seen Lily go in too but never saw us leave this must have driven him mad with jealousy. The three of us exchanged understanding looks, while Sirius and Remus shot disapproving glances at Severus. If you're talking about the room on the eighth floor yesterday afternoon, I was there the whole time. I went in before Severus and left with him before curfew through another exit, I explained. What other exit? We've been there, and there's only one small room. We hid from Filch there. Are you still covering for him, Sawyer? Potter looked at me like I was a deluded fool. I felt utterly drained. This is Hogwarts, full of mysteries. We don't have a complicated love triangle. It's a misunderstanding. And I am not Sawyer's boyfriend. Stop making baseless assumptions, Severus said flatly, his voice devoid of emotion. For some reason, I felt a pang of disappointment. Was he so eager to dissociate himself from me? Right, we're just friends. Who told you otherwise? Potter looked surprised, glancing at Remus, who accepted my reproachful gaze with an apologetic expression. All right, everything's cleared up. It was all a misunderstanding. James, you should apologize to Severus for your accusations, Lily said. 
Potter's pride wouldn't let him apologize to Severus. Predictably, he retorted, he started it by attacking me, not accepting a fair challenge, just sneak attacking. He sneered at Severus. Hiding behind girls when his attack fails. I see you're used to being protected by Sawyer. I was stunned by the harshness of his words. Looking back, I realized I had instinctively shielded Severus during the confrontation, perfectly fitting Potter's accusation. Severus's face turned even darker, and I quickly stepped aside, snapping at Potter, you're crossing the line. It's not like that at all. Before I could finish, Severus abruptly turned and stormed out, his robe billowing dramatically behind him. Chapter 39 With a bang, I watched Severus's back disappear behind the door he had slammed shut. My anger surged uncontrollably. I spun around and, while Potter was distracted by Lily's furious reprimand, I cast a spell at him. The force of the spell made Potter stagger. He turned back to me, eyes wide with disbelief. Yes, I ambushed you. I couldn't contain my rage. I wanted to curse him again. You. I'm sorry. Potter stammered, looking shocked at his own words. He tried again, damn it. Sorry. He seemed unable to control his tongue. You. Sorry. For what? Sorry. The apologies poured out of his mouth uncontrollably. He clamped his hands over his mouth in horror. Making you apologize all day is really too lenient, I said coldly. Throwing a quick, Lily, he's all yours, over my shoulder, I rushed out the door after Severus, ignoring the mix of curses and apologies behind me in Lily's muttered, amused comments. I ran through the corridor, but Severus was nowhere in sight. With class starting soon, I had no idea where he might go. After a few moments of hesitation, I dashed towards the eighth floor. Panting, I stopped in front of the room of requirement and began pacing, concentrating hard. After three passes, the wall remained unchanged. The door did not appear. Someone was inside. Was it Severus? Had he created a room I couldn't enter? Or was he deliberately keeping me out? Dejected, I leaned against the wall and sank to the floor. Severus was such a proud person how could he endure such disdain? He probably thought I looked down on him too. I fumed, blaming Potter for everything. After a few minutes, I remembered class was about to start and hurried downstairs. I arrived at the fourth greenhouse just in time. Sitting beside Lily, who had saved me a seat, I shook my head at her questioning look. She handed me my bag, and I realized I had left my things behind in my haste. Grateful to Lily for bringing them, I glared at Potter, who was trying hard not to speak, his face red with the effort. Lily joined me in glaring at him, and he shrank under our combined gaze. Serves him right. Since childhood, Severus and I had never fought. We rarely argued, and he'd never ignored me before. At that moment, all I could think of was how good Severus had always been to me. I scolded myself for always treating him like the wounded child I first met, always wanting to protect him. Severus was never weak he didn't need my protection. Sensitive as he was, he must have felt deeply hurt. Lost in thought, I made a mess of my herbology notes. Lily, after watching me struggle for a while, slid her neat notes on Flutterby bushes over to me. During the practical session, I was so distracted that I tied several knots in the branches I was supposed to prune. The trembling Flutterby bush shook violently, attracting Professor Sprout's attention. She hurried over to rescue the poor plant from my clutches. I remained unfocused for the rest of the class, not noticing Lily's concerned glances. With about ten minutes left, I approached Professor Sprout, who was helping a Hufflepuff student. Professor, I don't feel well. I've completed the work for today. May I leave early? I asked weakly. Seeing my genuinely pale face, Professor Sprout patted my head gently. Oh, you poor thing, you do look unwell. Of course, you can leave early. Get some rest and don't worry about here. She was always so kind. I wasn't lying I truly felt awful and couldn't bear to stay any longer. Ignoring a pang of guilt, I waved to Lily and left, clutching my bag. Once outside the greenhouse, I broke into a run, 
heading for the fifth floor where the history of magic class was held. The fourth-year Slytherins and Ravenclaws were in there with Professor Binns. Concealed by a disillusionment charm, I stood quietly by the door, peeking in to find Severus. There he was, sitting alone in the last row, surrounded by dozing students. He was hunched over a book, which was clearly not the history of magic textbook probably something on potions, typical of Severus. Before leaving, I watched his face, usually expressionless, now staring blankly at the book. I realized with a start that he was daydreaming. Severus, daydreaming in class what was he thinking about? Was he still upset about this morning? My smile faded. I quietly withdrew and continued to wait, still concealed. When class ended, the students began filing out. Severus slipped out before the room emptied, heading towards my hiding spot. He wasn't going to the room of requirement was he avoiding us? My anger flared. As he passed, I grabbed his arm and pulled him into the dark passage behind me. Severus, startled, began to resist, but I quickly spoke up. Severus, it's me. This way. I felt him relax, recognizing my voice, but he still resisted subtly, trying to pull away. Where are you taking me? His voice was cold. Fueled by my own anger, I didn't answer, leading him through the passage. I had discovered it last year it led to the astronomy tower, and today it seemed perfect. We walked in silence. Finally, a light appeared ahead. I pushed aside the curtain at the end of the passage, emerging near the astronomy tower. I continued pulling the reluctant Severus along. Severus, I'm sorry about this morning. You know Potter was just trying to provoke you, to cause a rift between us. You don't need to apologize. As you said, it was Potter provoking me. You just habitually protect the weak. Like a mother hen. Or a saint. Severus's voice was flat, but his words were sharp. I didn't know Griffinders had this trait. Thank you for your care, but I'll manage on my own. I was stunned. I had often heard Severus's cutting remarks aimed at others, but experiencing his verbal assault firsthand was a shock. My mouth opened and closed, unable to form a response. Stop gaping like a fish. If there's nothing else, I'll leave. With that, he turned and walked away. I stood there, frozen. His attitude left me feeling helpless. He was clearly angry, but the coldness in his voice hurt. I felt both wronged and deeply worried for him. When he mentioned weak, his eyes were hollow, but I sensed the bitterness behind them. Rubbing my dry eyes, I sighed and trudged towards the eighth floor. When I entered the room of requirement, Lily rushed over. Did you find Severus? Did you talk? Yes, I found him, at the classroom door. But the conversation didn't go well, I said, forcing a smile. Lily pouted in disappointment, gently touching my face. Sawyer, you. What? I asked, still feeling down. Nothing. I just think, once Severus calms down, things will get better. This morning was tough for him, but he won't end our friendship over it. Besides, this room is our place. He'll come back, Lily said, trying to comfort me. Her words were a revelation. Of course, Severus would come back. I was being too dramatic, acting like the world was ending because he was mad. Even Severus had the right to say hurtful things when he was upset. I was overreacting. If seeking him out didn't help, I'd wait for him to come back to us. Feeling suddenly lightened, I grinned and patted Lily's back hard. Thanks for the reminder. Lily, almost knocked over, coughed. Seeing my improved mood, she smiled wryly. Sawyer. Sorry. I said, rubbing her back. Let's practice some defense against the dark arts. Unable to refuse, Lily followed me into the practice room, where we dueled vigorously. I ended up using a modified Aguamenti charm, sending a jet of water at Lily. Caught off guard by my dramatic shout, she got soaked. She glared at me, water dripping from her hair. That worked well, but I can tweak it. In a real duel, it could knock someone down. I said, laughing. Seems simple enough, Lily said, twirling her wand. Let me try. 
Aguamenti. Chapter 40. The practice duel turned into a water fight. Lily and I had a great time, drenching each other thoroughly. Thank goodness we're in the room of requirement, I said, wringing out my soaked braid. If this were anywhere else, the place wouldn't stand a chance against our antics. My shield charm got washed away, too. If you hadn't called it off in time. Exactly. It's surprisingly effective this way, Lily agreed, completely ignoring the puddles around us. Though it doesn't cause much harm and isn't lethal, it doesn't take much magic to use, making it easy to catch someone off guard. I knew you'd like it, I said, sitting cross-legged. Remember when I came up with it? What do you think? Lily playfully pushed my head away. Yes, yes, you're amazing. Tell Severus about it, and he'll praise you too. I reveled in the moment, but my thoughts quickly returned to Severus. I wonder how long it will take for him to get over this awkward phase. I don't know. Lily glanced at me thoughtfully. Sawyer, do you? Like Severus? I was taken aback by Lily's directness. My face heated up, but I didn't hesitate. Yes, I do. I knew it. Lily's face lit up with a triumphant smile. When did this happen? I coughed lightly, trying to appear nonchalant. I'm not sure. I only realized it myself last term. Last term? Lily's eyes widened in mock anger. You've kept this from me for that long. Are we even best friends? How long were you planning to keep this secret? Didn't you figure it out on your own? I said, struggling to maintain my composure. Even though I knew it was just the two of us, I felt exposed, as if my secret was out in the open. Well, with how weird you've been acting today, even a fool would notice, Lily retorted. Ever since Severus stormed out of the classroom, you haven't been yourself. You're smitten with him. I focused on the vine pattern on my wand, trying to ignore my burning face. Severus doesn't know, does he? Lily asked, giving me a sidelong glance. When are you planning to tell him? Uh, I hadn't really thought about it. I admit it. Lily's eyes widened even more. How can you not? Severus is unlikely to realize your feelings unless you tell him. And I think he has feelings for you too. My heart skipped a beat. How do you know? Women's intuition. Lily declared confidently. I'm a woman too, and I don't have this intuition, I grumbled. You're too caught up in it. Love has blinded you. You need a wake-up call. Get a grip. Aguamenti. I didn't notice Lily moving to the side and getting ready to stand up. A controlled jet of water hit me square in the face before I could react. I scrambled to my feet, trying to defend myself, but it was too late. I let out a reflexive scream as the water hit me. Drenched from head to toe, I was about to retaliate when the door to the practice room burst open. Severus rushed in, looking alarmed. Sawyer, what happened? Seeing me and Lily standing there, soaking wet, he stopped short. He glanced at me, drenched, and Lily, half dry, and his face registered confusion. I heard a scream and thought there was a spell mishap. What happened? Lily and I exchanged glances, and I awkwardly explained, nothing serious. Lily and I were testing a modified spell, and she caught me off guard and soaked me. My ears burned as I recalled the reason behind the ambush, and my voice grew quieter. I accidentally screamed. Feeling nervous, I wondered if Severus had come in earlier, would he have noticed? Yet, a part of me was disappointed that he didn't come in sooner. Surveying the soaked room, Severus's mouth twitched. A modified spell. Summoning a flood. Lily burst into laughter, and I couldn't help but smile. This familiar, sarcastic Severus was a relief, despite his biting remarks. It was Sawyer's idea, an evolution of Aguamenti, Lily explained, demonstrating with a wooden practice dummy. Severus raised an eyebrow, watching Lily's demonstration in silence. I observed him quietly, noticing his interest and slight amusement. Was the spell really that funny? I wondered. He didn't seem to hold any grudges from our earlier confrontation, which made me curious about his quick recovery. It was for the best. I smiled at him. 
Just as Lily finished her explanation, Severus turned and caught me grinning at him. He looked startled, then quickly stiffened and left the practice room, throwing over his shoulder, I'll be in the potions lab. Did my silly grin scare him off? I thought, touching my nose and coughing awkwardly. Lily came over and pinched my arm, signaling me to follow him. Realizing she was encouraging me to confess, I felt my heart race. Nervously, I let Lily push me out the door. Severus. Wait. I called out as he reached the potions lab door. Hmm. He paused, hand on the doorknob, and looked back at me. Taking a deep breath, I walked over, my mind screaming that I was crazy for doing this without any preparation. Uh, I. I wanted to tell you. My throat felt dry, and I struggled to get the words out. Um. What is it? Severus prompted, seeing my hesitation. For the second time that day, I mimicked a goldfish, unable to speak. Under Severus's slightly impatient gaze, I finally blurted out, I wanted to ask if you'd join us for lunch in the Great Hall. Seeing his raised eyebrow, I added, it's lunchtime, and you should eat before working on potions. Yes, join us. Lily chimed in, wrapping an arm around my neck. You can't work on an empty stomach. Severus considered for a moment and then nodded. We walked out together, with Lily giving me a supportive squeeze and a sigh of exasperation. I could practically hear her saying, why didn't you confess? I grimaced silently. Who knew confessing would be so hard? I thought everything would return to normal, and that I'd find another opportunity to confess. But as the days passed, something felt off. Severus's attitude towards us was the same, yet I sensed a distance between us. He spent less time with us at school, often finding excuses to stay in the room of requirement. When we ate in the Great Hall, he would either miss meals or avoid us altogether. In Potions class, he paired up with another Slytherin boy, claiming Professor Slughorn had asked him to help the boy improve his grades. This left me paired with Lily. I found it hard to get him alone. When he was in the room of requirement, he mostly stayed in the Potions lab. When Lily tried to give us some alone time, Severus always seemed to have a conveniently timed potion step to attend to. Maybe I was overthinking, but it felt like Severus was subtly avoiding me, and it left me confused. After observing this for a month, Lily and I concluded that Severus was still upset. Does Severus hate me now? I asked Lily, staring at the closed door of the potions lab. No, he doesn't. He's just. Awkward, Lily said, though she didn't sound entirely convinced. I wondered if I should just tell him outright and get it over with. This slow torture felt like a death sentence. But now I had even less courage to approach him. As the semester dragged on, I became more frustrated. Lily prepared for finals in a frenzy, while I stewed over my romantic woes. He can't still be upset, can he? Isn't he tired of it? I muttered, flipping through my revision notes absent-mindedly in the corner of the Gryffindor common room. Ask him yourself, Lily said without looking up. I only know why goblins are tricky. I mean, why goblins rebelled. Oh, we're supposed to be studying. But how do I ask? He avoids me and doesn't give me a chance, I lamented. If he doesn't give you a chance, make one. How did you corner him last time? You're a Gryffindor. No Gryffindor would hesitate for this long. Now, study. Lily snapped, slamming my notes down before diving back into her own. Her words jolted me. I realized I had been acting unlike myself, hesitating like a shy schoolgirl. I might not be as bold and brash as some Gryffinders, but I still had Gryffindor courage. Love had indeed made me lose my sense. I lunged at Lily and kissed her cheek. She jumped, staring at me wide-eyed. Lily, you're my lucky star. I couldn't love you more. I exclaimed. Lily shuddered, rubbing her arm. I know you love me, just not as much as severe as she teased, then returned to her books. Revitalized, I gathered my things and headed to the dormitory, leaving my revision behind to plan my confession. The next day, I couldn't wait any longer. Finals were approaching, and Severus was busy studying, sometimes in the common room, sometimes in the potions lab. 
taking a precious vial of Felix Felicis, I felt a pang of guilt for using it. But desperate times called for desperate measures. Feeling increasingly confident, I headed to the eighth floor. Lily, supporting me, didn't go to the room of requirement. As soon as I entered, Severus got up to head to the potions lab to practice for the exam. Keeping my expression neutral, I grabbed my potions book and followed him. Severus glanced at me at the potions lab door, ready to ask me something. I quickly spoke up. I need to practice too. Can you help me, Severus? I'll never pass without your guidance. I pleaded, looking at him pitifully. Remembering my poor potions grades, Severus's mouth twitched. He stepped inside, leaving the door open. Once inside, I followed my instincts and quietly locked the door. Severus, already at the workbench, arranging equipment, didn't notice. Standing behind him, I felt everything falling into place. Severus, I have something to tell you. He turned, seeing my serious expression, and faced me fully. I don't know why you've been avoiding me, I began. Seeing him about to speak, I continued, don't deny it. I can tell. Severus's face stiffened. I pressed on, no matter what you're thinking, I need to tell you how I feel. Looking sincerely into his eyes, I said, I love you, not just as a friend, but romantically. Severus's eyes widened in disbelief. I knew he thought I was joking, mocking him. I'm serious. I realized my feelings last year, but I was too scared, I admitted, though the last words were weak. Severus, I'm in love with you. He was still shocked. Searching his eyes, I found a hint of joy and smiled, knowing he had feelings for me too. My smile made Severus blink, and he averted his gaze. Thank you for your affection, but we're too different, a Slytherin and a Gryffindor. You're saying this after being friends for four years? I mimicked his raised eyebrow. Is that really your excuse? He looked flustered for a moment, then regained composure, his tone resolute. What if I told you I've been studying dark arts? I'm the typical evil Slytherin they talk about, he said bitterly. Would you, the righteous Gryffindor, still want to be my friend? Why not? It's surprising, but you're still Severus. I frowned. And what does this have to do with my confession? Don't change the subject. Severus was at a loss for words. I softened my tone. I understand what you mean. But dark arts or not, what matters is the user's heart. If it's to protect loved ones, I wouldn't reject dark arts. Though Lily might not understand, I'm confident I can convince her. Severus seemed anxious, glancing at the door. I need to think. He started towards the door, but my instincts took over. I grabbed his arm, the momentum pulling me into his chest. Chapter 41 I accidentally collided with Severus, and he instinctively reached out to steady me by holding my back. The intimate position left us both momentarily stunned. Severus seemed a bit flustered, standing rigidly as I lay against his chest. Looking into Severus's deep, dark eyes, an idea suddenly popped into my head. Today, I was going to make a move. It wasn't my fault it was the moment's fault. This thought gave me courage. I lifted my head and kissed him. He stiffened but didn't push me away. Encouraged, I wrapped my arms around his neck. Having no experience, I tentatively licked his soft but slightly chapped lips. Severus kept his lips shut. I could hear him swallowing nervously. At this close distance, his eyes were filled with my reflection. How long was I supposed to kiss him without a response? I began to feel a bit resentful. Maybe my feelings transmitted to him because I saw a smile in Severus's eyes, and he slightly curled his lips before gently parting them and taking control of the kiss. Soft and slow, our lips and tongues danced together. I finally understood why couples like to kiss so passionately. I felt like I was melting. Just then, a knock came from the door, followed by Lily's voice. Severus? Sawyer? Are you in there? I'm coming in. Severus's body tensed, and he tried to push me away. I tightened my hold around his neck and murmured against his lips, it's locked. Despite knowing this, Severus remained tense. 
I just rested my lips against his, waiting. The sound of the doorknob turning, and Lily's puzzled mumbling, came from outside. Locked? Strange, where did they go? Her footsteps faded away. Severus relaxed, and I kissed the tip of his nose. I really had foresight. Seeing him smirk, I grinned even wider. Annoyed by my laughter, Severus leaned in and kissed me hard, abandoning the previous gentleness for a more dominant and aggressive approach. I was forced to arch backward, relying solely on Severus's arm around my waist to keep me from falling. When the kiss ended, I lay against his shoulder, breathless and grinning like a cat who got the cream. Got what you wanted. Severus's voice was husky, his tone casual yet teasing, his breath tickling my ear. I rubbed my cheek against his skin, feeling completely satisfied. Yes, my dear. We stood there for a moment before straightening up and opening the door. We found Lily sitting on the carpet, leaning over a low table with her study materials. Hearing the door, she looked up, surprised to see us. How did you get out of there? Have you been in there all this time? Why didn't you answer when I knocked? She trailed off, glancing between Severus and me. Ah she drew out the word, her voice rising, Sawyer, did it work? Severus walked over to the sofa and sat down, clearing his throat, and picked up a book from the low table, burying his face in it. I joined him, sitting down without getting too close, and casually picked up Lily's transfiguration textbook. What do you think? Lily didn't bother reclaiming her book. She propped her head on her hand, studying us. Something's different. Definitely different. Different how? We always studied like this. Lily was just being melodramatic. I rolled my eyes inwardly. The atmosphere, the unspoken understanding between a couple. You two just sitting there already exude a sweet and warm vibe. That's love. Lily exclaimed theatrically. I burst out laughing, shoving the book in her face. Just study. Yes, ma'am, Lily teased, her eyes sparkling. Sawyer, you need to act more ladylike. She gave me a playful wink, earning a glare from me. With that hurdle cleared, my relationship with Severus became more open. We didn't hide it, occasionally holding hands on campus. However, neither of us were overly affectionate in public, so it didn't seem much different from before, aside from the atmosphere Lily mentioned. Remus just smiled knowingly when he saw us together. Potter, surprisingly, didn't make any snide comments he even seemed relieved. I suspected he had considered Severus' arrival and now was grateful to me. Soon, exams were over, and we boarded the Hogwarts Express. In our usual compartment near the back, it was just the three of us me, Lily, and Severus. We had gotten into the habit of discussing secrets in the train compartments, casting privacy charms effortlessly. I read recently that the petrification curse is an ancient form of dark magic. This suggests that the definition of dark magic is quite contentious, I remarked casually. I think dark magic is useful. Otherwise, why would so many powerful wizards pursue it? Severus glanced at me, clearly recalling our previous conversation about convincing Lily to accept dark magic. Lily frowned. But those wizards are labeled as dark wizards. They study dark magic and become more sinister. Dark magic corrupts people. What good is power if everyone despises you? It's subjective. Everyone has a dark side. If you let it grow, you'll fall even without dark magic. It's like a gun in a criminal's hands, it's a weapon, but in a policeman's hands, it's a tool for protection. Do we blame the gun for the criminal's actions? I argued, trying to be as fair as possible. Severus listened quietly, familiar with the muggle terms like gun and policeman. I still don't like dark magic. Remember when Avery and Mulsiber tried to use dark magic on Mary? If they'd succeeded, she might have lost a leg. And they called it a joke. Lily's anger flared. Severus muttered, they're idiots. Only a few Slytherins are that reckless. I chuckled, turning back to Lily. You don't have to like it, just understand it. Magic is interconnected. For every curse, there's a counter-curse. Only by understanding dark magic can we combat it. 
many curses don't have known counter curses because we haven't studied them enough. And you might not know this, but Madame Pomfrey is an expert in dark magic. Lily looked surprised and skeptical but soon nodded in realization. Yes, healing spell damage requires understanding the harmful spells and their effects. Dark magic injuries are particularly tricky. You can't handle them without expertise in dark magic. Madame Pomfrey is neither dark nor evil. Though she's ruthless when making patients take potions, she's not malicious. I joked, noticing Lily's expression softening. I plan to start studying dark magic to lay the groundwork for treating dark magic injuries. Severus, the prince family is an old pure blood family. They must have some texts on dark magic, right? I continued. Yes, there are some. My mother organized a collection of the less sinister ones for me. They might be helpful. We can study them together. My mother taught me a bit before she left, and I've done some research since. No Slytherin would forsake this source of power, Severus replied. We had discussed this before, and now he repeated it for Lily's benefit. That's great. Lily, would you like to join us? Having more people would be more efficient. I'll pass for now. You two go ahead. I think I need some time to process this, Lily declined, shaking her head. As expected, Lily needed time to digest this idea, which contradicted her Gryffindor teachings. But she at least accepted that Severus and I were studying dark magic. That was a good start. We then shifted the conversation away from dark magic, making the rest of the journey pleasant. At King's Cross Station, Mr. Evans came to pick us up, giving us a ride home. He dropped Severus and me off at our house on the way. When we arrived, Isaiah had already prepared dinner. I had informed her via letter that Severus would be joining us for dinner the day we returned. As we sat down, I cleared my throat to get my parents' attention. I have an announcement to make. I glanced at Severus, who guessed what I was about to say. Usually calm and aloof, he now looked embarrassed, staring at the tablecloth. I almost laughed but managed to contain myself with another clearing of my throat. Severus and I are officially dating. I thought you should know. Despite trying to maintain a serious expression, I couldn't stop grinning, feeling like I'd taken a joy potion. Isaiah's eyes widened in delight before she winked at me, her smile mischievous good job, Sawyer. Blushing, I looked away. Hughes, confused by our exchange, noticed Severus's unease and laughed. Severus, good choice. Just don't hurt our Sawyer she's our treasure. Severus responded seriously, of course, sir. You can trust me. Isaiah and Hughes exchanged satisfied looks. They had seen Severus grow up and trusted him completely. The dinner was warm and joyful, and I felt happiness bubbling up inside me. Chapter 42 Sawyer gave me a quick kiss at the door, smiling mischievously. See you tomorrow. She said, her eyes twinkling. Before that day, I never would have imagined Sawyer would confess to me. She said, Severus, and then kissed me. I thought that moment was the best of my life, though I didn't know it would be surpassed many times over in the future. I could hear my own heartbeat, feeling the pulse behind my ears. It seemed all the obstacles I had worried about vanished, and Sawyer's few words dissolved everything so easily. Letting my emotions be controlled by one person was irrational, but a little relaxation was okay. Yes, that's right. Returning home, I went to my potion lab, which had stayed nearly unchanged since I left almost a year ago. There was no dust. There were no potion ingredients here most were stored in the Prince Manor storeroom, which had good preservation conditions and house elves accustomed to taking care of the materials. It seemed I couldn't research potions at home today. I pondered briefly and decided to go to the manor. Practicing dark magic there would be good, too. As I turned to leave, I remembered that Sawyer and I had talked on the Hogwarts Express about studying dark magic together. But I couldn't take her to the manor right now. Mother had strengthened the defenses there. Although it looked abandoned on the outside, it was set to prevent anyone from entering without the owner's consent. Currently, the owner was my mother, and even I couldn't bring anyone in without permission. 
researching dark magic was dangerous, and this place wasn't as carefully arranged as the manor's practice room. Nor could it provide the needs as the room of requirement did at school. It seemed this summer, we couldn't study together. I walked to the fireplace, grabbed a pinch of flu powder, and thought about writing a letter to mother about bringing Sawyer to the manor. Prince Manor. Mother was planning to settle in Romania for a while. From her letters, it seemed she had a boyfriend. I didn't oppose her starting a new relationship, but it made me a bit uncomfortable. I had to convince her to bring that man back so I could check him out. I couldn't let mother be deceived. Before going to the practice room, I prepared some stationery and ink in the study, deliberating for a moment before starting to write. The rest of the holiday felt like it always did. I spent my days in the potion lab, with Sawyer making sure I had my meals to prevent me from starving myself. Occasionally, Lily and Petunia would visit, with Sawyer or Creature preparing our tea. It was a familiar routine. I suddenly realized that Sawyer was like the lady of the house. I had grown used to her presence. Watching her laugh and joke with Lily, her smile was the same as always. I once thought Sawyer's smile was as dazzling as the sun, warm yet dangerous. Now, I saw it more like a light, a lamp she had lit for me. If this was to be my future reality, I would do anything to keep it. Severus, Sawyer isn't going to disappear. You don't need to keep staring at her, Lily teased. I realized I had been staring too long. Feeling a bit embarrassed, I cleared my throat and looked away. Sawyer faced Lily's teasing boldly. It shows Severus cares about me. If you're jealous, you could get a boyfriend too. She winked at Lily. Potter likes you. If you just. Lily's face turned red, probably from anger. Sawyer. You know I. She trailed off, unable to find the words. Defeated, she sighed. Fine. I give up, Sawyer. I can't win against you. Sawyer hummed triumphantly, sipping her tea. Petunia hugged Lily and patted her shoulder. Lily, they're just like a married couple now. Don't be sad you still have your sister. The word married made me catch my breath. I looked at Sawyer. She was mid-sip when she sputtered and choked on her tea. Annoyed, I glared at Petunia and quickly used my wand to help Sawyer breathe. As she regained her composure, I felt anxious. How would she react? Angry, shy, or disgusted? Probably not the same as me. Hoping. Sawyer caught her breath and, seeing the laughing sisters, forced a smile. Thanks for the well wishes. We'll be sure to invite you to the wedding. When you say, we, when would this hypothetical wedding be? Petunia asked, still giggling. Definitely before any of you. Sawyer said confidently, though her face was still red. I guessed she was bluffing, but I was happy. Maybe we would have a wedding someday, create a family. Although thinking about it now seemed too early, we were only fifteen. Fine, let's make a bet. Lily said, not letting Sawyer off the hook. Bet that you and Severus will be the first to marry among us. If not, the bet is void. What do I get if I win? Sawyer challenged. Isn't the reward enough? A deeper relationship and a happy marriage with Severus. Unless you lack confidence in your relationship, you can refuse. Lily's expression was one of smug triumph. Sawyer was cornered. If she refused, it showed doubt in our relationship. If she accepted, it could turn into a cruel joke if things went wrong. I tried to ignore the discomfort of thinking about Sawyer marrying someone else. She probably wouldn't accept such a bet we had just started dating. Maybe after some time, she would find me unsuitable, and then. I closed my eyes to hide my rising emotions. Sawyer was silent, her face unreadable. Then she mumbled, marriage isn't something I can decide alone. So you agree, Petunia said decisively, turning to me. Now, Severus, do you accept? Why was the pressure on me now? Speechless, I looked at Lily and Petunia. They were relentless. I hesitated, unsure if I should play along. I turned to Sawyer. She looked at me with a hopeful expression. My heart softened, and I nodded, then forced a smile. 
It's just a harmless bet, right? Why refuse? Maybe this bet wouldn't be so hard to win. The sisters exchanged sly smiles. Sawyer saw and pouted, then looked at me apologetically. Did she think I was at a loss? I squeezed her hand to reassure her. I silently thought, I actually gained something here. Chapter 43 I couldn't believe it. I had let my guard down. So used to winning these bets, I had gotten careless. I was a bit annoyed with myself. It was so embarrassing. Talking about marriage at this stage was too early. I didn't even like gambling he was just accommodating me. Fine, since Severus liked me, I supposed it involved me. There were still three years until graduation, and I'd only be eighteen by then. I just let things take their natural course. After struggling for a while, I calmed down. A few days later, Severus told me it would be best to study dark magic in the room of requirement or the study room at school to avoid any uncontrollable situations at my estate. The defenses there still didn't recognize me, and this issue could be addressed after contacting Eileen. Honestly, I wasn't in a rush to delve into dark magic. Madame Pomfrey would start teaching me how to treat magical injuries after the term began, and if I focused on healing spells, I wouldn't have much energy to spare for dark magic research. Whenever I had free time, Severus could teach me some basics. He'd been studying dark magic for a few years already, and I couldn't catch up to his progress in a short time. I'd have to take it slow. During this holiday, Lily and I had another important task, securing the house. Lily's family lived in a residential area separated from Spinner's End by a small river. It was a standalone house, which made it easier to surround it with protective spells. Spinner's End wasn't exactly a high-end neighborhood it was full of old houses with poor lighting and somewhat gloomy streets. The nearby mill had gone bankrupt a few years ago, making the area even more desolate, and the crime rate had been increasing. My parents had considered moving, but after watching me grow up in this house with all its wonderful memories, they couldn't bear to leave besides. With Severus now living next door and our relationship just established, it was a good time to bond, so moving wasn't an option. Since we didn't want to move, I'd ensure our safety through magical means. The protective charms Professor Flittick had taught us were more than sufficient to deter muggle thieves. Anyone with ill intentions would feel an overwhelming fear that prevented them from approaching the house. For malicious wizards, the charms would at least keep them from entering, though they'd need to break through the protections to get close. There was no need to fear burglars and robbers. Street robberies were more common in the darker, more secluded alleys, which my parents always avoided, preferring to take longer routes. Plus, Isaiah once chased a thief down the street with a newly bought kitchen knife, which reassured me a bit. When I explained the spell to my parents, Isaiah exclaimed, so our house will be like a haunted house. Hughes laughed, Sawyer said it only scares off those with bad intentions. He seemed a bit skeptical, though. Uh, what about the people who deliver newspapers, milk, and mail? I chuckled. As long as they're doing their job properly, they won't be affected. But salespeople might be too scared to come. Salespeople often aim to sell more items and make a profit, which counted as ill intentions. That's even better. Hughes laughed, pulling Isaiah close, and they gazed at each other affectionately. Now our home will be safe. I discreetly rubbed the goosebumps on my arms. Even after all these years, they were still so lovey-dovey. Well, thirty-something wasn't old. Despite the mushiness, the happiness in the air was almost tangible. I couldn't help but aspire to such a life, setting a quiet goal to be so happy that I'd make my own daughter feel the same way. Returning to Hogwarts, we entered a crucial year our fifth year, the one with O. S, the ordinary wizarding levels. Similar to Muggle World exams, these tests put students on edge, and we all faced a busy year ahead. Lily became a Gryffindor prefect, with Remus as the male prefect, which was expected. From the moment she boarded the train, Lily was busy with prefect meetings and patrolling the train to maintain order. As she left our compartment in her uniform, she winked at us. Enjoy your time together. I wasn't annoyed. Instead, I leisurely walked over to Severus and sat beside him. Thanks, we will. I nodded, signaling her to close the door. 
Lily pulled a face and quietly closed the door behind her. Severus chuckled softly, and I couldn't help but laugh too. How childish we were becoming. As the train slowly started moving, we silently took out our books. Our shoulders and arms lightly brushed against each other, occasionally swaying with the train's motion. Soon, I got tired of reading. We had celebrated my birthday the night before, and I hadn't slept enough. I noticed Severus seemed wide awake, without any signs of fatigue, which puzzled me. He glanced at me. I'm used to it. Seeing my confused look, he added, when do you think I practice dark magic? I was amazed. It seemed Severus had a busy nighttime schedule, including dark magic practice. No wonder I never saw him in the estate during the day. Do you also practice in the room of requirement at school? Seeing Severus nod, I got a bit upset. How many hours do you sleep each night? Learning dark magic isn't something you can do in just a few minutes. He seemed amused by my concern. I don't feel overly tired. My sleep is sufficient. Severus didn't seem to mind the issue. But it's still a heavy burden on your body. And, I hesitated, and lack of sleep can stunt your growth. Seeing his raised eyebrows, I firmly said, you're still growing. You need enough sleep, or it will affect your development. Something I said must have amused him because Severus chuckled, coughing a bit. Well, I seem to be growing fine. I should reach six feet. You don't need to worry. Oh. I had nothing more to say. Severus, though slender, was not shorter than his peers and even seemed to be growing taller. I guessed that Potter's irritation towards Severus might be partly because Severus would eventually surpass him in height. But I began but stopped. Would it be too nagging? I bit my lip and stayed silent. Seeing my dejected expression, Severus good-naturedly turned, pressing my head to his shoulder. Aren't you tired? Rest on me for a while. He wrapped one arm around me, holding his book with the other. He was too thin, his bony shoulder hurting my head. I lifted my face and said seriously, you should put on some weight. Severus, slightly annoyed, pressed my head back down. Sleep. Satisfied, I nuzzled into the most comfortable spot and started to doze off. Severus sat quietly, occasionally turning a page. I drifted off amid the train's rocking, vaguely hearing the door open a few times and perhaps Lily's voice. When I woke up, I felt refreshed. It was already past 2 p.m., and I realized I had slept for over three hours. Noticing Severus's subtle shoulder movements, I apologized and started massaging him. You should have woken me up earlier. We haven't had lunch yet. Aren't you hungry? I can manage, Severus replied indifferently. He seemed to enjoy the massage. Turns out I had a knack for it. I worriedly tackled a pile of homework waiting for me. Every teacher relentlessly assigned work to remind us of the importance of the fifth year. I remembered my senior year in high school, though the endless parchment replaced stacks of test papers. The assignments weren't difficult, but their sheer volume was daunting. I wasn't too worried about the exams. With enough revision over the school year, we'd be fine. Keeping calm was most important. I was more interested in learning healing spells than in the exams. Madame Pomfrey hesitated about adding to my workload, doubting if I could handle extra studies while preparing for exams. But I insisted, and we started the lessons on treating magical injuries as planned. With my time divided between homework and learning in the hospital wing four days a week, I still had a few days and weekends free for revision and to learn dark magic from Severus. Lily still refused to study dark magic, and as a prefect, she was busy patrolling with Remus every night and helping first years navigate Hogwarts' as ever-changing staircases. Especially around the full moon, Lily was even busier. The three of us had less time together than before. I also noticed that Potter and his group appeared less often around us. At first, I thought it was because of Lily, but even she found it odd. I didn't believe they were avoiding us to study for exams they must have found some new adventure. Lily didn't mind the peace and quiet, though it was short-lived, as more significant troubles awaited us later. Chapter 44 After our common room added a dark magic study area as requested, Severus finally began discussing dark magic more freely. 
he seemed quite anxious about the exams, though I had no doubt he'd excel. Severa spent more time studying now, balancing his potion experiments as well. I couldn't understand how he managed it all, but he seemed to plan his time down to the minute. To help me learn dark magic, he lent me a notebook filled with his notes. It was densely packed, and the edges were worn, showing it had been well used for years. As I touched the silver embossed logo on the lower right corner of the cover, it felt familiar. When I flipped to the front page, I saw a string of familiar handwriting. To dear Severus, heading to Hogwarts January 9, 1970, with envy, Sawyer. I laughed, remembering that this was the birthday gift I gave Severus for his eleventh birthday, five years ago. At the time, I didn't know I was a witch and thought I wouldn't see him for a long time. I gave him a notebook to remind him not to forget me, his good friend, when he went to school. After we both ended up at Hogwarts, I never saw him use it, and I forgot about it. Now I realized he'd been using it secretly, wearing it down significantly. Did he see my handwriting every time he took notes on dark magic? I even noticed he had added protective magic to preserve the ink. I stole a glance at Severus, who was frowning over a thick hardcover book. A warm feeling spread through me. Did he really value me that much? He hadn't added protective magic to the cover but kept my somewhat messy handwriting intact. Allow me a moment of self-indulgence. Severus's notes were concise but packed with crucial information. Judging by the dates, this thin notebook contained over a year's worth of dark magic study and insights. I read the notes with admiration, soaking in the high-value content. Magical theory was interconnected the primary difference between dark magic and other magic lay in their forms and the emotions driving them. Understanding it wasn't hard, especially with Severus's thorough summaries. I absorbed his notes quickly. Unlike when studying charms and transfiguration, I didn't rush to practice spells. Instead, I focused on understanding the theoretical aspects of dark magic first, believing it would help with my healing study as my original intent for learning dark magic. I didn't intend to abandon spell practice entirely, though. Mastering them would be a form of strength. I'd find time to practice slowly. Given my previous record, it wouldn't be difficult. Over the next three months, I read through a third of Severus's notes, with him continually adding more. Among the entries, I found something particularly interesting, a record of Severus creating his own spell, which seemed like a prank spell. Severus was truly talented. Creating a spell wasn't easy. Most existing spells were ancient, with few new ones recorded in magical history. Though Severus based his spell on existing ones, it was still his invention, even if it was just a prank spell. Yet, I had never seen him use it. I brought the notebook to him, pointing at the entry. He was stirring a cauldron filled with a strangely murky blue liquid. After adding some powder, the liquid turned clear. Severus put down the stirring rod, glancing at the page I indicated. I used that once to stick someone's tongue to the roof of their mouth. If you remember, in third year, when Black suddenly couldn't speak. It clicked for me. That was you. I giggled. Madame Pomfrey diagnosed Sirius with an unknown curse and scolded him, assuming he was experimenting with prank spells. Poor Sirius couldn't explain himself and spent a day in the hospital wing before the curse wore off. Severus adjusted the fire under the cauldron. Yes, it was me. He nodded, clearly pleased. How did you do it? I remember you were next to me at the time. I didn't hear you cast a spell I realized, was it a nonverbal spell? Yes, a simple spell like this is easy with a nonverbal incantation, as long as you focus. Severus turned to a page. This one requires nonverbal casting. Try it it should help with learning nonverbal spells. He pointed to a spell labeled Levi Corpus, meant to be silently cast with an upward flick of the wand. Looking around, I pointed my wand at the chair I had just been sitting in and silently cast the spell. A flash of light, and the chair was hanging upside down in the air. That easy? I asked, puzzled. Did I do something wrong? This spell seems like an upside-down levitation charm. Severus chuckled. No, it's meant for humans. It hooks the ankle and suspends the person upside down. 
It also immobilizes them until the counter curse is used. With a flick of his wand, he released the spell, and the chair fell to the floor. Others have learned this spell. I used it on a Slytherin who ambushed me. The next day, he tried to befriend me to learn the spell. Soon after, it spread among some boys, though no one knew I created it. Really? I had no idea I was surprised. Boys and their games weren't my interest since I was seven. I laughed suddenly. I can imagine Potter and his friends using this spell, admiring the creator. Severus paused, then laughed, mischief sparkling in his eyes. I'd love to see their faces if they found out. Oh, you're wicked. I pretended to be shocked. That's too cruel. I couldn't help but laugh. But it suits them. Severus shook his head with a hint of regret, eyes on the bubbling liquid. It's too conspicuous. True, you prefer being subtle. I righted the fallen chair and sat down, continuing to flip through the pages. Severus began adding more ingredients to the cauldron. Severus, you seem to create mostly prank spells, I observed after noting a few examples. I thought you'd prefer more powerful ones. Prank spells are easier and less harmful for school use, he said, turning off the fire and washing his hands. But check the recent pages I'm working on a new spell with significant impact. I found the pages, filled with notes on slicing, severing, and splitting curses. Wow, you're combining them. This could be deadly. Could it cut someone in half? I asked in awe, almost cradling the notebook. Severus chuckled, no, I aim for broad but shallow wounds. He pointed to an entry. It's explained here. Relieved, I said, good, because cutting someone in half would be brutal. Without immediate treatment, they'd die. The intestines would spill out, and there'd be half-digested food. Gross I wrinkled my nose. Severus turned green, imagining the scene. He coughed, that would be worse than the killing curse. I couldn't handle that. Even if it could cut, it could be reattached if treated quickly, like with splinching. The ministry has specialists for that, but it requires powerful wizards to heal, I explained, realizing the impracticality. But by the time they respond, the victim would bleed out. Basically, anyone hit by such a curse would die unless they were incredibly lucky. Severus looked at me dryly. Even if I could create such a curse, I couldn't stand the sight of intestines. I laughed, seeing I'd grossed him out. Okay, enough of that. Tell me about your new spell. You said it causes wide wounds. Have you considered the healing? Quick healing charms should work, but we'd need to test it to be sure, Severus said, cleaning his workspace. I helped. Even with fast healing, the blood loss and muscle spasms would incapacitate the victim. I was impressed. Anyone knowing about this would want the spell and its creator. You're a walking time bomb. Severus, would you ever tell anyone about this spell? He saw my concern and assured me, no, I wouldn't. Apart from you, no one will know. Even if we join the war, this remains our secret weapon. He said we, implying we'd face everything together like a family. It was the sweetest thing I'd ever heard. Severus looked puzzled as I stared at him. Just as he was about to speak, I threw my arms around him. Severus, how can I love you so much? I was satisfied to see his ears turn red, feeling his awkward embrace. He stammered, unable to speak. The next moment, I pressed my lips to his in a deep kiss. Chapter 45 I stood up and organized the materials after analyzing the cases and coming up with more than two solutions. Just as I was thinking of taking a break, the door outside creaked open, and I heard, lie down on this bed over here. All right, time to get to work. I stepped out of the office. Hey. Sawyer, greeted the patient with a bit too much enthusiasm, wincing in pain. Madame Pomfrey pressed him back down. Stay still and don't move. As I walked closer, I recognized the person on the bed. Roddy Ibo. I didn't expect to see you here. You really need to be more careful. What happened this time? Roddy Ibo, a sixth-year Hufflepuff and a chaser on the Quidditch team, was a frequent visitor to the hospital wing this term. 
It seemed like he got a minor injury almost every time he trained, even once spraining his ankle while getting off his broom. Oh, thanks for your concern. Just some minor scrapes, nothing serious. Ibo said with a sheepish smile, trying to scratch his head but wincing from the pain in his shoulder. Sawyer, you treat him. Madame Pomfrey stepped back after a quick examination, leaving the patient to me, and returned to her office. Got it. I immediately switched into work mode. Using a spell to examine the injury, I found a severe bruise on his right shoulder with some abrasions but no bone damage. I healed the external wounds with a spell and went to the potion cupboard to find some bruise healing paste. The oral potion was out of stock, so I applied the ointment to the bruised area instead. You'll need to drink a potion later. I'll get it for you. Just rest for now. After instructing Ibo, I washed my hands and prepared to go to Professor Slughorn's office for more potions. On my way out of the ward, I noticed a familiar figure in the shadows. Severus? What are you doing here? I said excitedly, stepping closer. I thought I wouldn't see you until dinner. He stepped out of the shadows, looking a bit uncomfortable. I brought potions for Madame Pomfrey. She said the hospital wing needed them. Perfect timing, I was just about to make a trip. I found the bruise healing potion among the bottles Severus was holding. Take the rest to Madame Pomfrey's office. I smiled at Severus and returned to the ward. After making Ibo drink the potion, I told him he could leave after resting for a while. When I entered the office, Severus was nowhere to be seen. He left. I told him to wait outside for you, Madame Pomfrey said, noticing my searching look and teasing me. You're done for today. Young people need time for dates. I shamelessly curtsied, thank you, beautiful and understanding Madame Pomfrey. Gathering my things, I dashed out of the hospital wing amid her teasing. I found Severa standing by a tree on the lawn, looking out at the black lake. He turned as he heard me approaching. So soon. Madame Pomfrey let me off early. We walked slowly towards the lakeside together. Sawyer, about that boy in the hospital wing Severus began hesitantly. Roddy Ibo. Do you know him? I asked, unsure of what Severus was getting at. No, I just I think he likes you, Severus said slowly, watching my reaction. I hadn't noticed. Really? I was just focused on treating his bruises. How could you tell? Severus looked for the right words. The way he looked at you. I think he has feelings for you. It took me a moment to process. You mean, he likes me? Severus, are you jealous? I teased, linking my arm with his. Severus coughed lightly, trying to remain composed. As your boyfriend, I think I have the right to be jealous when other men look at you like that. Ignoring his attempt at seriousness, I nodded happily. Of course, you do. I love it when you're jealous. Severus's pale face turned a shade of pink, and he awkwardly avoided my gaze. I don't know what Iboa's intentions are, but for me, it's just work. I leaned closer to whisper in his ear, I only have eyes for you. Everyone else is just passing by. Severus trembled slightly and turned to look at me, his eyes like deep, dark whirlpools. A gentle smile appeared on his face. I understand. I didn't dwell on what Severus said about Ibo liking me. Maybe Severus was overthinking it. I forgot about it after a few days. On Friday evening, I was heading to the Great Hall for dinner when a figure suddenly appeared in front of me. I was startled and took a step back. Sorry, Sawyer, I didn't mean to scare you. It's me, Roddy Ibo. The boy from the hospital wing stood before me. Roddy, what's up? Are you injured again or feeling unwell? Come on in. I turned, thinking I could eat later. If dinner was over, I could always go to the kitchen. Wait, Sawyer. I'm not injured or sick he looked nervous and hesitant. I had a bad feeling about this. I came to see you because I wanted to ask if you're free tomorrow morning to go to Hogsmeade. I have something to tell you. Severus was right. This was exactly what he predicted. I tried to hide my emotions and smiled gently. Actually, I'm going to Hogsmeade tomorrow morning, 
but I'm going with someone. We could go together. Ibo looked visibly disappointed. You have company. Will it be all right if I join? It won't be a problem. I'm going with my my boyfriend to buy some things. It's not a date. We can all go together. Iboa's eyes widened in surprise. You have a boyfriend? He quickly apologized. Sorry, I didn't know. Of course, you can have a boyfriend. You're so kind and wonderful. Any guy would be lucky to have you. I interrupted his flustered rambling. Thank you for the compliment. I thought you knew. He was just at the hospital wing the other day bringing potions although he didn't enter the ward. You've probably seen us around school. He's severe as Snape, a Slytherin. We've been friends since childhood. Ibo looked even more surprised. I thought you two were just friends. We were, until last term when he confessed to me before exams. I made a playful face. I didn't want to lose him to someone else, so I made my move first. Ibo looked deflated, realizing the truth. All right, I'll see you tomorrow at 9 a.m. at the entrance to Hogsmeade. I was about to leave when he suddenly changed his mind. Actually, I just remembered I have something important to do tomorrow. I'll have to cancel. Didn't you have something to tell me? Should we reschedule? I feigned ignorance. No, it's nothing. Forget about it. I'll be going now. He turned and left, looking somewhat defeated. I sighed in relief. Fortunately, he was an honest Hufflepuff. If he had been as persistent as a Gryffindor like Potter, it wouldn't have been this easy. I jogged back to the common room, forgetting to stop by the kitchen. Severus and Lily were doing homework, and there was food on a small table next to them. Lily looked up as I entered. Why so late? Haven't eaten yet, right? She gestured to the food. Your dear Severus got it for you from the kitchen. Severus coughed lightly, continuing to write. I bent down and kissed Severus on the cheek before grabbing some food, ignoring Lily's teasing noises. I knew Severus was the best. This is my favorite corn chowder. After eating, I joined them in tackling the mountain of homework. Severus, let's go to Hogsmeade together tomorrow, I suggested while working on my Muggle Studies essay. Didn't you get tired of that place already? Severus asked. This time is different. We're not just wandering around it's a date. I punctuated my sentence with a dot, glaring at him. And don't tell me a walk from the castle to the lake counts as a date. Lily laughed loudly and quickly covered her mouth, looking at us apologetically. All right, we'll go to Hogsmeade for our date tomorrow, Severus concluded, as if assigning us homework. Good. I accept your invitation, I replied, satisfied. Walking to Hogsmeade, everything felt the same as usual. There wasn't any sense of romance. Why doesn't it feel like a date? I wondered. Maybe it was because we grew up together and were used to it. Why the sudden desire to go on a date? I thought our usual way of spending time together was fine, Severus questioned. We're fine, but others don't know that. I felt a bit down. Roddy Ibo asked me out yesterday, not knowing you're my boyfriend. I bet hardly anyone at Hogwarts knows about us. Severus's temperature dropped, and he let out a cold snort. That Ibo has ulterior motives. He gets minor injuries frequently. I bet it's on purpose. I was speechless. It did seem odd that he was so frequently injured. If he's injuring himself to visit the hospital wing, that's a stupid strategy. I rolled my eyes. And quite a naive one. Plus, he got lucky I was there most of the time. I linked arms with Severus. No matter what, we're going on a date. Severus, cheer up. Smile a bit. Severus awkwardly tugged at his lips and let me drag him towards our destination. We visited almost every store, buying parchment, ink, and some candy. Severus wasn't enthusiastic about shopping unless it involved potion ingredients. But gradually, my excitement rubbed off on him, and he softened, sometimes looking at me with a tender expression. Whatever the reason, this trip was worth it. Later, Lily ran over to us, sharing gossip from her patrol. 
They say that gloomy, dark bat Severus Snape has fallen in love. Someone swears they saw him holding hands with a Gryffindor girl, looking at her with such deep affection. I laughed. It seemed people were observant after all. Rumors spread among the girls that Severus's deep, restrained love was the most profound, and whoever he loved must be the happiest. Wherever Severus went, shy and curious girls watched him. I felt a mix of pride and jealousy. Knowing Severus loved me, I couldn't help but be possessive. Eventually, Lily confronted Severus about my feelings, and he looked at me with a knowing smile, as if to say, who's jealous now? Under Severus's intense presence, the girls finally backed off. I felt a bit smug. Anyone wanting to get close to Severus had to endure his cold and intimidating demeanor. Chapter 46 In mid-February, the first snow of the winter fell, covering everything in a bright white blanket. The kids ran out of the castle after class to play in it, while I cozied up in our warm base, with the fireplace blazing. Hey Sawyer, have you thought about what you want to do after graduation? Lily pushed her homework aside, looking thoughtful. I've already decided. I want to be a healer, I said, tossing my essay aside as well. I didn't want it ruining my good mood. I know you want to be a healer. I mean, have you thought about whether you want to work at ST? Mungos or try to stay at Hogwarts? Some wealthy families hire personal healers, though I don't think you'd like that job much. But the pay is apparently quite good. Purebloods are really afraid of dying, Lily teased. Being afraid of death isn't a bad thing. I'm afraid of dying because I'd lose all of you Isaiah, Hughes, you, and Severus. If I died, you'd all be devastated. I joked about death lightly, but it was how I truly felt. Of course, we'd be devastated. We can't live without you. Lily said in an exaggeratedly sweet voice, then burst into laughter. The one who leaves first will have regrets, and the one who stays behind will suffer. Lily, if you had to choose, which would you prefer? I suddenly wondered. Hmm, I'd choose to leave first. Regret is better than suffering, Lily said, laughing. But ideally, I'd go with my love, so we could be together in life and death. I rolled my eyes at her. You silly girl, always taking the easy way out. If it were me, I'd rather bear the pain and live on. But yes, with my love by my side. Lily laughed, climbed over to shake my hand, and then lay back down. Weren't we talking about work? I noticed the conversation had taken a strange turn. You were the one who changed the subject, Lily said, rolling her eyes. All right, back to the topic. You mentioned ST. Mungos and Hogwarts. I'd probably choose ST. Mungos. The hospital wing doesn't have many positions, and Madame Pomfrey isn't retiring anytime soon. Plus, the headmaster would need to create a new position for me, I said. True. ST. Mungos would have higher requirements, and they definitely need good potion grades. Lily sat up suddenly. Your potion grades have always been just passable, right? That's not nearly enough. I groaned and buried my head in a pile of books, my voice muffled. Don't bring up potions, Lily. You're ruining my afternoon. Lily seemed to get even more excited. We have to talk about it. Let Severus tutor you. You could study together and have romantic dates at the same time. I looked at Lily's excited expression, finding the teasing and schadenfreude in it. Lily, you're jealous. You're doing this on purpose. I accused. Well, you two have been ignoring me for ages, Lily complained, her green eyes wide. You've left me to deal with prefect duties alone. I laughed at her childish behavior. But she had a point. Over the past few months, the three of us had spent less time together. Besides being busy, Severus and I enjoyed our alone time, sometimes avoiding Lily. Maybe she felt left out. It's tough being the third wheel when two friends become a couple. I'm sorry, Lily. We didn't consider your feelings, I said softly. But we haven't abandoned you. You're our best friend. This is still our base, isn't it? Lily looked a bit uncomfortable with my tone, squirming slightly before lifting her chin. All right, I forgive you. 
I exaggerated a sigh of relief, then we both burst out laughing. We laughed freely and heartily, letting go of any past grievances. At that moment, the door to the potion's room opened, and Severus's tired voice called out, What's so funny? Lily and I exchanged a knowing glance and giggled. Nothing important, just some silly stuff, I said casually. Severus, you look tired. Are you okay? I'm fine, just a bit tired, Severus said, rubbing his eyes. I patted the spot beside me on the sofa. Lie down, I'll give you a massage. Severus obediently rested his head on my lap, letting me gently massage his temples. I looked up to see Lily watching us with a smile. I stuck my tongue out at her playfully. We were just talking about post-graduation plans. St. Mungo's requires good potion grades. Severus, I need your help with potions, I grumbled. Severus chuckled softly. Of course, you do. I pouted. It was true, after all. Lily, what about you? What do you want to do after graduation? Lily lazily used her wand to organize the rolls of parchment on the table. I'm not sure yet. I'd like to join the Ministry of Magic, maybe become an Auror. Being a female cop is cool, and a female Auror would be even cooler, I said, watching my essay role fight with Lily's for space on the table. Her role was slightly winning. But being an Auror is dangerous. You should think it through. Lily shrugged. I have time. I'll prepare for both, and then I'll have options. Good plan. Severus, what about you? Potions master, Severus murmured, looking like he was about to fall asleep. Figures, Lily said, as if she'd known all along. Looks like you two can work at ST. Mungo's together as a couple. That would be perfect. I imagined us working together, sometimes staying late, living a simple and happy life. Suddenly, a large bird flew in through the window, breaking my reverie. The bird flew over to the sofa and landed on the backrest, raising one leg toward Severus. After he took the scroll from its leg, the bird immediately flew out the window, as if it couldn't wait to leave. Quite a character, that bird, I remarked, looking out the window, but it was already gone. Severus quickly read the scroll, then handed it to me with a smile. Eileen is coming home for Christmas, he said, pausing awkwardly before adding, with her boyfriend. Christmas at home. When we arrived home, Eileen was already waiting outside with my parents, standing next to a serious-looking man with bronze skin. This must be her boyfriend. These were my first impressions of the man, serious and bronze-skinned. Later, I occasionally saw him looking at Eileen with tender eyes and feeding that big bird, which turned out to be his pet. My opinion of him improved. He was a man who loved Eileen and birds. His name was Murta MacArthur, originally from Scotland and a graduate of Durmstrang Institute. Eileen mentioned they met in a bird-filled forest in Romania, where he was studying birds as an ornithologist. It sounded like the beginning of a romantic love story. I was curious and tried to get more details from Eileen, but she just smiled and stayed quiet. I didn't dare ask Murta. He seemed like a stern man, except when he was with Eileen or his beloved birds. From the moment Severus met Murta, he scrutinized him closely. Murta returned his gaze calmly. By the next day, Severus seemed to have accepted Murta as his stepfather. Curious, I asked Severus about it. He simply replied, Murta is a man I can respect. I trust him with Eileen. I was even more impressed with Murta for winning Severus over in a day. We had separate family dinners on Christmas Eve. Severus's family was now complete, and we each enjoyed our family time. The next day, Eileen took me to Prince Manor via apparition, giving me a taste of being compressed into a tin can. It wasn't pleasant. We arrived at what looked like a ruin, with overgrown weeds and a rusty old iron gate. Eileen led me through the dilapidated gate into what seemed like a courtyard. She waved her wand a few times, probably adjusting some defensive spells. After a few twists and turns, we reached a fairly large house. It looked a bit run down but still showed traces of its former grandeur. Instead of going through what appeared to be the main entrance, Eileen led me to a side door. Entering through the side door, 
I felt like it was actually the main entrance. The hallway was clean and tidy, with minimal decoration, giving it a simple and elegant feel. A house elf appeared, offering its services eagerly. Eileen introduced me to various parts of the house, except for the potion-related areas like the storage room, lab, and small library, and the dark arts practice room. The rest of the place seemed more like a display. I was speechless looking at the spotless kitchen. The house elves kept the place in excellent condition, ready for someone to move in and even restore the whole estate to its former glory. However, Eileen didn't have such plans. The overgrown exterior was partly her doing, creating the illusion of neglect. This place was more of a secret lab for potion and dark arts research. Before we left the manor, Eileen took my hand and said, you can come here freely, just like Severus. You can use the fireplace in our home to get here. The manor's defenses recognize you now. She then summoned three house elves and told them, this is Miss Sawyer Hill. She is your future mistress. Even I, who was usually thick-skinned, blushed. Especially when the three house elves bowed respectfully, calling me mistress with their big eyes wide open. Chapter 47 Durmstrang was known as a school of magic specializing in the dark arts, so Murtaugh should be quite proficient in dark magic. When Severus and I arrived at the dark arts practice room at Prince Manor, I wasn't surprised to see Murtaugh already there. Perhaps this could be called special training by Murtaugh? Just as I had guessed, Murtaugh was a very strict teacher. With a distinctly British accent, he pointed out our mistakes and flaws, repeatedly emphasizing that dark magic was dangerous and forbidden, leaving no room for levity. During our training sessions, Severus benefited greatly from every point Murta made, always staying sharp and attentive. As for me, I was still a novice in dark magic at this stage. Understanding my situation, Murta took the time to guide me through each spell meticulously. My progress was swift, given that I had been studying Severus' notes for the past four months. In addition to the dark arts training at Prince Manor, I began addressing my abysmal potions skills this holiday. In the Snape family's cellar, Severus and Lily took turns teaching me. One would instruct me on the practical step starting from the simplest potions in the textbook, while the other would organize the essential theoretical knowledge I had to memorize. Initially, I had resigned myself to being hopeless at potions, ready to give up. However, seeing the effort Severus and Lily were putting in, I couldn't justify slacking off. For the first time, I truly dedicated myself to learning potions, not just to complete assignments but to genuinely understand the subject. My memory wasn't bad, so memorizing the materials Lily prepared for me wasn't difficult. Understanding the properties and functions of various potions was crucial for patient treatment, a task that demanded precision. Regarding the practical side, I simply practiced diligently without aiming to become a potions master. I figured that as long as I could pass the N. S exams, I could finally put away cauldrons and stirring rods forever. The potions exam included both written and practical sections. If I could maximize my written scores, it would offset any practical mistakes. While achieving an outstanding seemed unlikely, a good was within reach. Christmas break was just the beginning. Returning to school meant the exams were approaching rapidly. Under Severus gentle guidance and Lily's strict supervision, I persevered through this significant challenge. Fortunately, Severus never gave up on me, and having him by my side made each practice session less daunting. School days were busy with classes and revisions, making time fly. As the Easter holidays in March drew to a close, the fifth-year career counseling notices were posted in the common room. Sawyer, look at us tea. Mungo's flyer. Lily handed me a dark green leaflet, prominently displaying this tea. Mungo's hospital crest, crossed bones, and wands. For the N. S. exams, you need at least a good in potions, herbology, transfiguration, charms, and defense against the dark arts. I shrugged. At least it's good. If it required outstanding, I'd go crazy. Don't be so pessimistic, Sawyer, Lily patted my back. You've improved a lot, haven't you? Severus and I will help you all the way. I made a face. It's not pessimism, just facts. I'm aiming for, good, hoping Professor Slughorn accepts O. S, good. 
He will. The upperclassman said his usual requirement is, good. Professor Slughorn is quite lenient with students, Lily reassured me. That's great. As for the N. S. Good, with two more years, I can definitely manage it. I clenched my fist to encourage myself. My career counseling was scheduled for this morning before classes, so I got up early to have a relaxed breakfast. The morning owl post had just arrived when Lily, reading the Daily Prophet, frowned at the front page. There was a large-scale conflict between the Order of the Phoenix and the Death Eaters yesterday. Many casualties on both sides, Lily told me after reading the article. My good mood vanished as I glared at the newspaper, as if it were the culprit. There's a list of the deceased, including the Death Eaters, Lily handed me the newspaper glumly. I quickly scanned the names. There are a few familiar Gryffindor surnames. Could be relatives of our classmates. As I put down the newspaper, I saw a few distraught faces at the long table. The hall's atmosphere turned heavy and oppressive after the Daily Prophet's arrival. Looking over at the Slytherin table, everything seemed as quiet as usual, with no one showing extra emotion, making it hard to read their feelings. Bloody war. Lily cursed softly, leaving a piece of uneaten toast on her plate. Yeah, bloody war, I muttered, poking at my scrambled eggs, affected by the pervasive gloom. Gradually, students left the hall, losing their appetite in the tense atmosphere. I pushed my plate away. It's about time. I'm going to see Professor McGonagall. All right, see you later, Lily said absentmindedly. I wandered near the second floor, lost in thought. The war was drawing closer to us. In two years, after leaving Hogwarts, the protective ivory tower would be gone, and we might be forced to make choices. Being powerless, we would struggle to survive in the cracks, possibly offending both sides. Staying neutral meant finding new protection, NST. Mungo's was the best choice. I was more determined to master potions, this near-chemical subject. The career counseling session was straightforward. Professor McGonagall emphasized the importance of potions, while other related subjects I had consistently kept at good or outstanding levels. Her words carried a note of approval, and her rare smile was quite encouraging. A few days later, the school's atmosphere slightly improved. Carefree younger students continued their antics, alleviating the worries of the older students. I wasn't much affected, focusing on my potion studies. While memorizing the effects of an antidote, a familiar sound I hadn't heard in a long time suddenly appeared a loud pop and a tearful Tito stood on my desk. I never restricted Tito, often letting it help another house elf, Kaka, at the apothecary in Diagon Alley. It had the freedom to visit Aunt Druella whenever it wanted. Compared to other house elves, it was quite free. What's wrong, Tito? I asked, concerned as it collapsed on my desk, crying. Miss Druella is hurt, very ill. You said Tito could visit her, so Tito often went. But today, Tito saw many people around Miss Druella's bed, saying she was dying. Tito's tear-streaked, snotty face looked up at me, letting out a loud sob before collapsing back into tears. I was stunned. How could this happen suddenly? Tito wouldn't falsely claim that its beloved Aunt Druella was dying it must be true. I remembered the recent conflict and wondered if it was related. Wait, Tito, explain clearly. What exactly happened? Tito pounded the desk. Tito doesn't know. Tito only heard people inside saying Miss Druella was severely injured and had old wounds. They said surviving till today was a miracle. Tito couldn't help, bad Tito. It began to hit the desk with its head. I had to pick it up to prevent further damage to the desk and itself. The commotion drew Severus from the potions room. Seeing Tito, he was momentarily surprised but quickly resumed his usual calm, returning to the potions room, probably because he had a potion brewing. After Tito calmed down a bit, I set it on the floor and knelt to its level, speaking gently. Tell me, when was the last time you saw Aunt Druella? Last month. Miss Druella was healthy then. Oh. Poor Miss. Seeing it about to start crying again, I quickly interjected, and when you left, how was she? Did you see her? Tito nodded. Tito saw her. 
a wizard was treating her with spells, and others were praying. Tito felt she was dying, just like when Miss Sia died. Tito could only watch. I muttered a spell, effectively a calming draft. Tito gradually relaxed, only sniffling weakly. I rubbed my temples, as unexpected crises always seemed to arise. Aunt Druella must have been involved in that battle a few days ago, sustaining severe injuries that aggravated old ailments, and now she might have passed away. It was a casualty of war. I felt a sense of regret but not sorrow. She wasn't truly close to me. To me, she was just my mother's sister, a blood relative connecting me to the Rosier family. When we last met, she was a kind aunt, hoping for my safety, likely out of affection for my mother. But she was also a death eater, ruthless to her enemies. Though I hadn't seen her kill, I could imagine she showed no mercy in battle. Instinctively, I had avoided her since our last encounter. Now that she had passed, I felt oddly relieved no more ties to death eaters or pure blood families. Seeing Tito's sorrow, I felt a pang of guilt. Was I too heartless? She was my blood relative after all. Severus emerged from the potion's room again, holding a sealed vial. Sawyer, can you give this to Lupin? He'll pass it to Dan. Sure. I gestured for him to wait and turn to Tito. Can you stand? When Tito wobbled to its feet, I gently said, Tito, I'm sorry about Aunt Druella, but it's not anyone's fault. You need to rest and go back to the apothecary. Kaka will take care of you. I need you to be in good spirits tomorrow morning. Tito hoarsely agreed, bowed, and disappeared with a pop. I turned to Severus, hugging him tightly. Aunt Druella is dead. Severus hesitated before patting my back. Don't be too sad. The thing is, I'm not sad. Seeing Tito cry, I don't feel anything for a deceased relative, I said, looking up at him with a troubled expression. Am I too cold-hearted? He raised an eyebrow, surprised. That's what you're worried about? I nodded, burying my face in his shoulder. Hearing his amused snort, I nudged him with my head. Oh. All right, there's nothing to worry about. You're not cold-hearted. She was just a random ant who suddenly appeared, a Death Eater hostile to muggles and Griffinders. It's normal not to see her as family. Tito is different house elves are loyal. Though you're its master now, it was originally loyal to your mother, Sia, and extended that loyalty to your aunt. Tito frequently visited her out of fondness for your mother. Now that she's gone, it's naturally heartbroken. Listening to Severus' lengthy explanation to comfort me, I realized how trivial my worries were. I buried my head in his chest to hide my silly smile. Chapter 48 Aunt Druella passed away, and I decided to bring Tito back to Hogwarts. Despite the freedom I'd given it, Tito wasn't happy being far away with little work. House elves thrive on tasks and being near their masters. Being close to my mother's memory might comfort Tito. Initially, I didn't want Tito at Hogwarts because I didn't want others knowing about my background. However, now that my mother's branch of the Rosier family was gone and my cousins either distanced themselves or looked down on me, my ties to the Rosier family were effectively severed. The headmaster shouldn't have any reason to question my loyalties. Deciding to keep Tito at Hogwarts, I took it to the headmaster's office. Standing before the gargoyle statue, I respectfully asked, Is Headmaster Dumbledore in? The statue ignored me. Not knowing how to get in without a password, I considered knocking on the gargoyle's head. Just as I was about to do so, I heard the headmaster's voice, laced with amusement, come in, Miss Hill. The gargoyle moved aside, revealing a spiral staircase. I stepped onto it, experiencing the magical elevator sensation. At the top, I pushed open a wooden door to find the white-bearded headmaster smiling kindly at me from behind his half-moon glasses. Welcome, Miss Hill. Please, take a seat. With a wave of his wand, an old-fashioned armchair appeared beside his desk. I thanked him and sat down. Try this, freshly baked chocolate chip cookies. The sweet aroma filled the room as a basket of golden cookies appeared. They looked delicious, and I took one. Thank you, Headmaster. I love chocolate chip. 
the cookie tasted as good as it smelled, making me smile. These are excellent. May I have another? Of course. Help yourself. Dumbledore seemed pleased with my appreciation. As I munched on another cookie, I wondered if I could ask for a takeaway when I left. I assume you have a reason for visiting me? Dumbledore's bright blue eyes twinkled warmly, making him seem approachable, though I knew he was incredibly astute. Despite my wariness, his friendliness eased my tension. It's about a house elf, I began, summoning Tito and explaining its history in recent sorrow. I omitted some details, like having Tito hide its severance from the Rosiers or my meetings with Aunt Druella. I simply said Tito often visited my kind Aunt Druella until her recent death, and now I wanted to keep it at Hogwarts to help it cope. The headmaster listened with a gentle smile, then looked at Tito. Ah, Tito. Do you still have that sock? His eyes twinkled mischievously, glancing at Tito's feet. Tito trembled, its small body shaking. Bad Tito. Bad Tito took the headmaster's sock. Seeing Dumbledore's growing amusement, I realized he was teasing. I gave him a disapproving look, which he noticed. Offering a half-apology with his eyes, he then reassured Tito. Don't worry about the sock, Tito. I forgive you for your eagerness to return to your master. Please, return to the kitchens. I miss your puddings. Evidently, Dumbledore had enjoyed Tito's cooking before. Tito perked up, puffing out its chest. Tito will make pudding for the headmaster. But first, Tito will serve Miss Sawyer. Of course, Dumbledore agreed cheerfully. She is your master. Go to the kitchens and join the others. With my permission, Tito bowed and vanished. Thank you, headmaster. Mrs. Black's death reminded Tito of my mother's passing. I think staying busy in the kitchens will help it cope with its grief. While I doubted he'd lose anything by keeping Tito, I still felt the need to express my gratitude. House elves are loyal and sentimental creatures. They remember kindness deeply and repay it with immense loyalty. They are also very nostalgic and reluctant to change their allegiance. Tito's loyalty to you is an extension of its loyalty to your mother. Dumbledore's smile was kind. Now, if I'm not mistaken, Gryffindor fifth years have a history of magic class this morning. You wouldn't want to be late, would you? I stood up promptly. No, I wouldn't. Thank you for the cookies and the help, headmaster. Goodbye. Leaving the office, I realized I'd forgotten to ask for some cookies to take away. With Tito back at Hogwarts for just two days, I was already reaping the benefits. Since the headmaster knew, I openly let Tito cook for me. I no longer had to wake up early for breakfast in the Great Hall Tito brought a meal for four to my dormitory. The other two girls were astonished. I explained it was a perk of befriending a house elf and asked them to keep it secret. They were amazed but happy to enjoy the breakfast service. I also had Tito prepare meals for Severus, though I asked it to deliver his meals discreetly. Being too conspicuous wouldn't be good. I occasionally went to the Great Hall for lunch and dinner to maintain appearances, but our hideout always had our favorite foods waiting for us. As I reviewed my notes on charms, I wondered if my life was becoming a bit too indulgent. In April, I focused on various subjects for my exams, without neglecting potions. I also continued my regular visits to the hospital wing, which made me busier than ever. We adjusted our study schedules to coincide and kept up our chats to maintain our friendships. However, the peaceful routine was disrupted when the marauders resumed their antics. For nearly a month, the professors were surprised at their apparent good behavior. If old caretaker Pringle had known, he would have been moved to tears by their reformation. Unfortunately, he had retired, and the new caretaker, Filch, hadn't yet experienced their full mischief and still found the school relatively easy to manage. The marauders' pranks returned with a vengeance. James Potter, in particular, persistently pursued Lily, appearing everywhere she went. In our hideout, Lily vented her frustrations. Why can't I avoid him even by using the girl's bathroom? He's always there, messing with his hair. I snickered. He's trying to look cool. Lily rolled her eyes unladylike. I don't care what he's doing he's seriously disrupting my peace. 
How does he always find me? I don't have a tracking spell on me. Maybe I should try Polyjuice Potion next time. Lily was baffled by Potter's sudden ability to track her down. I don't know. I shrugged, but whatever it is, they must have gained a lot during that quiet period. We once asked Remus about it, but seeing his gentle, apologetic look, we couldn't pressure him to betray his friends. Lily, determined, headed to the potions room, likely to ask Severus for Polyjuice Potion. The next day, Lily and I drank Polyjuice Potion mixed with each other's hair for a brief morning. It was a Saturday with no classes, so I relocated my study to the library. Watching the time, about half an hour passed with no expected interference, just greetings from a few Gryffindor friends. Another familiar face greeted me, a Hufflepuff girl. Hi, Lily. So you're here. Hello, what's up? I smiled, forgetting her name. Fortunately, she didn't notice. Did you finally reject James Potter for good? Is he heartbroken and moving on? What? I was confused until I remembered she was speaking to Lily. She looked surprised at my reaction. You didn't know. Then she launched into gossip. I just saw him chasing after Sawyer Hill. Has he moved on? Huh, you might finally be rid of him. But Sawyer's boyfriend is Severus Snape. Do you think they'll fight? I wonder who'd win. Slytherins are good at dark magic, right? If Snape uses dark magic, Potter might lose. I stood there, stunned by her rapid-fire gossip. Laughing awkwardly, I interrupted, really? I didn't know. Oh, I just remembered I have an appointment with Sawyer. Gotta go. She looked disappointed but said goodbye as I fled. In the bathroom, I waited for the potion to wear off, then headed to the eighth floor. From a distance, I saw Potter pacing outside the room of requirement, staring at something in his hand. I tried to quietly retreat, planning to return later. Potter seemed to sense something and looked up, spotting me. I sighed, resuming my approach. Sawyer. You're just in time. You know how to get in, right? This is the room of requirement, isn't it? Why can't I get in? We asked it to let only the three of us in, I replied. If you come when none of us are inside, it might work. Then open the door and let me in. Sorry, I can't. We agreed the room would be exclusive. Why should I open it just because you demand it? Realizing his rudeness, Potter awkwardly scratched his head. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Lily won't see me, and I'm frustrated. At least he showed some manners. Go back, I waved him off. Lily's annoyed with you. If I were you, I'd reflect on why you're annoying and try to change. Potter looked displeased but restrained himself, muttering a goodbye before leaving. I breathed a sigh of relief, entering the hideout. Severus and Lily were there, Lily flipping through notes listlessly, and Severus looking sullen. Seeing me, Lily gave a helpless smile. I glanced at Severus, silently asking Lily what was wrong. She mouthed, jealous. I felt elated, sitting beside Severus and smiling at him until he turned away, embarrassed. Lily and I laughed at his reaction. At that moment, a sturdy owl flew in through the open window, dropping a letter in Severus' lap before flying away. That's the Malfoy family owl, Severus said, puzzled by the plain envelope. A letter from Lucius? Why the change in style? Isn't their family into lavish things? I asked curiously. Severus opened the letter and began reading. Suddenly, his expression changed. He handed the letter to me, looking serious. Sawyer, it's a letter from Lucius and your cousin Narcissa. It's about you. Chapter 49 The letter from Lucius Malfoy and my cousin Narcissa involved me. I glanced at Severus, whose expression was severe, then back at the letter. After reading just a few lines, my heart sank. I gripped the letter tightly, glancing at Lily beside me who had also gasped in shock. Believe it. They wouldn't lie about this they're our allies, Severus said rationally, though with a hint of coldness. Ignoring the aristocratic rhetoric and pleasantries, the letter clearly stated that Bellatrix and her husband planned to capture my parents to force me to act as their spy. 
I gripped Severus's hand so tightly that my knuckles turned white. The letter says the plan is for today. Today is Saturday, and both mom and dad are home. There are no other wizards nearby. Eileen and Myrta left long ago the defenses I set up won't hold against Death Eaters. Could they already be captured? Sawyer, calm down. Relax your grip you'd know if your defenses were broken. If they're at home right now, they're still within the safety of the wards. Lily pried my fingers off Severus's arm, making me realize how tightly I had been holding him. His arm bore several red marks from my grip. Sorry. I can't calm down. I have to go home. I deflated almost immediately. But what good will it do if I go back? I'll just be captured too. If they can find Spinner's End, where could we possibly escape to? You've thought it through, Severus finally spoke up. Now we have to decide. You can either submit to them to save your parents or seek Dumbledore's help. Did I have to choose now? I had hoped to escape this cursed situation and not be controlled by anyone. Though Aunt Druella had promised I could remain neutral, I never trusted her completely, always fearing she would betray me. Now, despite believing the threat was gone, I found myself coerced, with my innocent parents involved. I knew Bellatrix didn't value me but realized she saw some use in me. I suddenly felt Bellatrix had only made her move now because Aunt Druella had protected me. With Aunt Druella gone, Bellatrix had no reason to hold back. Stealing myself, I made a decision. I'm going to find the headmaster. I ran all the way to the headmaster's office, fortunately not far from the room of requirement. But no matter how much I called or knocked, there was no response. The gargoyle, growing impatient with my incessant knocking, finally spoke. No password, no entry. The headmaster isn't here. I felt a surge of anxiety. Of all times, he had to be absent. Severus and Lily arrived just then, with Lily pulling me towards the stairs. Let's find Professor McGonagall. Luckily, she was in her office. Seeing us standing breathless at the door, she looked surprised. Before she could ask, I stepped forward. Professor McGonagall, I need help. My parents are in danger. Death Eaters planned to kidnap them to force me into spying for them. McGonagall was visibly shocked, clearly skeptical. How can this be? How did you find out? Someone wrote to tell me. I'm certain it's not a joke the information is real. Please believe me. I pleaded. McGonagall, without further hesitation, led us into her office. She waved her wand, and a silver cat emerged, her Patronus. She whispered to it, and it nodded before leaping out the window. The headmaster isn't at the school right now, but he should contact us soon, McGonagall explained, conjuring armchairs for us. You'll need to wait a bit, but it shouldn't be long. I breathed a slight sigh of relief and sank into the armchair, elbows on knees, staring at my clenched hands. I tried to calculate when the letter might have been sent. It must have been this morning it said the plan was for today but didn't specify when. Since I hadn't felt the wards being breached, there was still hope. A steaming cup appeared before me. I looked up to see McGonagall offering it. You look pale. A hot cocoa might help. The stern professor's concerned gaze and the sweet smell of the cocoa revived my spirits. I thanked her softly. McGonagall gently patted my head. Her usual stern demeanor softened, replaced by motherly warmth. Turning to my left, I saw Lily watching me with worry. Severus was on my right, his emotions typically hidden. But I could read his expression concern and pain. Feeling warmth in my heart, I lowered my head to drink the cocoa, the warmth soothing my anxiety. Minutes felt like hours until a blazing phoenix appeared, dropping a note before vanishing. That was Fox, Dumbledore's phoenix. The note says he'll be here in five minutes, McGonagall's voice was strangely calming. I finished the cocoa in one gulp, anxiously awaiting Dumbledore's arrival. With a burst of green flames in the fireplace, the white-bearded headmaster appeared. At that moment, I found his whimsical appearance oddly reassuring. Sawyer, Professor McGonagall briefed me. I need more details, Dumbledore said, getting straight to the point. I told him about the letter, 
its timing, and contents, omitting the sender. Given Lucius and Narcissa's discreet approach, I believe they wanted to keep it secret. I need your help, Headmaster. They want to force me to join the Order as a spy. My adoptive parents are muggles if they fall into Death Eater's hands, they'll be tortured. The thought made me shudder. The Daily Prophet had often reported muggle families being attacked, the victims tortured to death. Even if the Death Eaters didn't kill my parents outright, they would undoubtedly suffer torture. Perhaps the Cruciatus Curse. A hand gripped my trembling one Severus. An arm wrapped around my shoulders Lily. Drawing strength from them, I looked at my only hope with pleading eyes. Dumbledore's expression was grave we will do everything to prevent this. What's your home address? 23 Spinners End After a brief conversation with McGonagall, both sent their patronus likely alerting members of the Order. Though I should have felt reassured, an uneasy feeling persisted. As if confirming my fears, the magical link to my home's defenses was suddenly yanked. I jumped up. They're here. The defenses are under attack. I felt it. Everyone was startled. Dumbledore's expression grew even more serious. The Order members have been notified and will get there as quickly as possible. Let's hope your defenses hold a bit longer. Ironically, the link was yanked a second time, then vanished. I felt a cold wave wash over me. It's broken. I felt a deep sense of failure. Dumbledore immediately summoned Fox. Minerva, use the fluid to contact Caradoc and Marlene. I'll get the Pruitt brothers. Stay here with them. With a nod, Fox grabbed him, and they vanished. McGonagall quickly used the flu network. She soon returned and sat beside me. I couldn't focus on anything, my mind filled with fear. Poor child, it'll be all right. She held me gently. The Order's best members, Marlene McKinnon, Caradoc Dearborn, the Pruitt brothers steel bring your parents back. Her soothing words were like a mantra, but I couldn't stop the pessimistic thoughts. Once the defenses fell, the Death Eaters could subdue my parents in less than a minute and disapparate away. How could the Order find them? Even if they did, how much would my parents suffer in the meantime? Would there be accidental injuries during the rescue? I couldn't bear to think about it. After about ten minutes though it felt like hours the Silver Phoenix Patronus brought Dumbledore's message, my parents were safe as tea. Mungos. I collapsed into Severus's arms, sobbing uncontrollably. I hadn't cried like this since I was reborn. It was embarrassing. Years later, when Severus and I occasionally talked about this, I would cover my face in shame. Severus would gently pull my hands away and hold me. That was the first time you cried in front of me. I realized you had a vulnerable side. Did you think I was invincible? I'd pretend to be annoyed, trying to push him away, only for him to hold me tighter, his muffled laughter vibrating through his chest. All I knew was I never wanted to see you cry like that again. Chapter 50 My parents were safe at ST. Mungos, but there was no mention of whether they were injured or how severe their injuries might be. I was still worried, though not as anxious. Severus and Lily insisted on coming with me to ST. Mungos the hospital was a large room with several fireplaces along the walls. As we followed Professor McGonagall out, others were operating or using the fireplaces to travel, and a few people walked with us toward the exit. Outside, the area resembled a waiting room, crowded and noisy with a variety of patients waiting. Despite the chaos, some of the scenes reminded me of the bizarre symptoms seen at ST. Mungos. Professor McGonagall went straight to the desk on the far left, where a witch in a dark green robe sat, similar to the witches and wizards walking around with notepads, all bearing the emblem of crossed wands and bones on their chests. Hello, I'm here to visit the Hill family. They're muggles. Can you tell me which ward they're in? Muggles? The witch didn't even bother to check the directory in front of her. Yes, fifth floor, sixth door on the left, Wade last ward. Thank you. Professor McGonagall turned to signal us to follow. As we made our way to the fifth floor, I grew increasingly anxious. I didn't think to familiarize myself with the hospital layout, despite it being a place I aspired to work at. 
On the fifth floor corridor, I saw Headmaster Dumbledore and a tall wizard standing together. Seeing our arrival, the headmaster, likely considering my urgent state, took me into the ward first. Inside, only two people lay on beds, motionless and quiet, seemingly asleep. What's wrong with them? I asked softly, afraid to disturb their slumber. Dreamless sleep potion, the headmaster indicated we step outside to talk. Back in the corridor, nearly at the end with little foot traffic, the headmaster introduced me to the tall wizard waiting outside. Let me introduce you to Caradoc Dearborn. He participated in the rescue of your parents and can tell you what happened. Thank you so much for saving my parents. I bowed sincerely, deeply grateful to him and immensely thankful to Headmaster Dumbledore for establishing the Order of the Phoenix, which allowed such timely rescue. It was a team effort from other Order members, Dearborn said earnestly. When I arrived, the Death Eaters were already inside your home and had captured your parents. But they didn't leave immediately. Some enjoy torturing muggles. My heart sank. They stayed to torture my parents, which delayed them, allowing you to rescue them. That's essentially correct, Dearborn said seriously. The hills endured over five minutes of the Cruciatus curse. This curse causes more harm to muggles than to wizards. They're very weak now and will need time to recover fully. Cruciatus curse. I clenched my teeth and fists to suppress the urge to scream. Don't worry too much the chief healer will give you a detailed report, he reassured. I forced a smile and thanked him again. After seeing off Dearborn and Dumbledore, I found the chief healer, Burns Capello. He confirmed what Dearborn had said and added a bit more. In addition to physical damage, the Cruciatus curse also causes significant mental harm. During treatment, it was difficult to calm them down, requiring extra doses of calming draft. The dreamless sleep potion will keep them under until tomorrow morning, by which time their physical condition will mostly recover. However, they will need more time to regain their pre-injury health. When they wake up, they might experience mental distress, and you'll need to help them adjust. I sat in the ward quietly for a while before leaving. Back at Hogwarts, the three of us quickly settled into the room of requirement. Sawyer, it's good that your parents are safe. They'll be okay, Lily said, sitting beside me as I silently flipped through a book. I'm fine. If it weren't for you two being by my side, I might have broken down. I squeezed Lily's hand and glanced at Severus sitting in a single armchair, conveying my gratitude without words. Don't be silly. We were always going to be here for you, Severus said, annoyed, glaring at me. Lily pinched my cheek. All right, cheer up. We have our O. S in a month. Have you finished revising your potions? Your calming draft hasn't been perfected, has it? If you get tested on that, you're doomed. I exhaled deeply. Sometimes, a nightmare is best defeated by another, and thinking about potions was a good distraction from my gloom. It was already past one in the afternoon, and I hadn't had lunch. Despite the short duration of the morning, so much had happened, and now that I was relaxing, I felt exhausted. I asked Tito to prepare some food and stayed in the hideout to eat and rest. After lunch and a short nap, too lazy to return to my dormitory, I asked the room of requirement to add two bedrooms, one single and one double. Lily peeked into the double room, rolled her eyes, and then darted into the single room ahead of Severus. You two need to talk. I won't get in the way. She made a face and shut the door. Severus and I exchanged amused looks. I walked into the double room, turned to see Severus still standing there, and went back to pull him in. I'll just stay on the couch, he said awkwardly, trying to back away. Don't bother. There are two beds inside, and it's just a nap, I said, dragging him into the room. Unless you're afraid I might eat you. Severus glared at me, both embarrassed and annoyed, which only amused me further. Pushing him to sit on the bed by the window, I closed the door, casually took off my outer robe, and lay on the other bed. Good afternoon. I turned to see Severus still sitting there. Realizing he wasn't comfortable undressing in front of someone, I turned my back to him. A moment later, I heard rustling behind me and the quiet creak of the bed as he lay down. I turned to see him lying on his back, eyes closed, 
the blanket pulled up to his chest, his prominent nose quite striking from the side. Severus? I called softly. Hmm. He turned his head slightly, looking at me questioningly. I was really scared today, I said, my eyes unfocused on his bed's edge. If anything had happened to my parents I can't even think about it it makes me feel cold all over. Severus was silent for a few seconds, then spoke in a calming tone. It's over now. They're safe. You know how important they are to me, right? If they hadn't adopted me, I would have grown up in an orphanage, perhaps living a difficult life. When I first arrived in this strange world as a helpless baby, unable to understand English, the anxiety and fear were overwhelming. Isaiah and Hughes treated me as their own, ensuring I had enough to eat and wear, loving me as their own. Despite not being affluent, they gave me a home and the love of a family, allowing me to grow up healthy and happy. In the early years, I often dreamt of my past life's parents and brother, waking up crying at night. As a small child, I could cry as much as I wanted. Isaiah and Hughes, not knowing what I had experienced, took turns holding and comforting me until I fell asleep again. It wasn't until I was about three years old that I truly integrated into this family, accepting this new world and deciding to enjoy my new life. Isaiah and Hughes are the most important people to me. I understand. Just like Eileen is important to me, Severus murmured. Though his situation was different from mine, I didn't need to explain he understood the importance of family. Severus? Hmm. Can I sleep next to you? Ah. Uh. I'm feeling very fragile right now. I need your hug for comfort. Then I'm coming over. I jumped to his bed barefoot, looking at him expectantly. After a moment of hesitation, he sighed and lifted the blanket. Satisfied, I snuggled into his arm, laying a hand on his chest. I kissed his prominent nose. Good afternoon, Severus. Not knowing how long had passed, I slowly woke up, feeling a gaze on me. I looked up to meet Severus's deep black eyes. Leaning closer, our lips met in a gentle kiss. It was a warm, dry kiss, without any tongue, just a quiet closeness, sharing warmth. After a long time, we separated, smiling at each other, stretching as we got up. When I left the room, Lily was already on the sofa reading. She quickly put her book aside, looking at me from head to toe with a mischievous glint before shaking her head in disappointment, muttering, such a wasted opportunity. Realizing what she meant, I blushed and cleared my throat loudly in warning. Fortunately, she didn't pursue the topic, just hiding her laughter behind her book. It was already past three in the afternoon. A good hour-long nap had refreshed me. We settled down to study quietly, the room filled with the soft murmurs of recitation. I closed my potions notes and was about to grab my transfiguration book when I found a few letters tucked inside. They were the ones I had received in the morning. In my rush to find Dumbledore, I had slipped them into the book. I reread the letters, wondering why the Malfoys had informed me. Sawyer, get back to studying what are you reading? Oh, that letter from the Malfoys. Lily peered over to join me. Why did they tell you this? I still don't get it, Lily said, puzzled. They mentioned that Narcissa likes her cute little cousin is that it? Didn't you say she usually ignored you? I smiled wryly. Compared to Bellatrix's hostility, Narcissa's indifference seems almost kind. Maybe I don't understand what, like, means to the aristocracy. They mentioned your Severus's girlfriend, Lily pointed out. Could it be because of his friendship with the Malfoys? Maybe. Or Malfoy guessed I wouldn't comply. Either way, I would end up opposing the Death Eaters and joining the Order. So, he saw an opportunity to gain favor by helping me. Now, both Severus and I owe him. How did he know you wouldn't comply? What if you agreed to be a spy to save your parents? Wouldn't that be a loss for the Death Eaters? Lily quickly added, I know you wouldn't. I might have, but I would make sure the Death Eaters suffered. I would seek Dumbledore's help and, even as a double agent, cause them as much trouble as possible for endangering my parents. Even if I became their spy, it would be Bellatrix's doing, not the Malfoys. What benefit would there be for them? Remember, one is a Lestrange, the other a Malfoy. 
Plus, this information came from Narcissa, benefiting you and involving the four of us. It ties Narcissa to your network, Severus added. Slytherins are protective of their own, and Malfoy values family highly. Given his friendship with me, he'd prepare a fallback plan for Narcissa. Isn't Malfoy all about self-interest? Lily asked, puzzled. That's what friends can discover, Severus replied, raising an eyebrow. I don't mind showing my good side to friends. Slytherins do like their twisted logic, Lily sighed. I laughed. Which is why you're a Gryffindor, straightforward to the end. And proud of it. There's nothing wrong with being direct, Lily insisted. Exactly. That's why I love I pounced on Lily, ruffling her hair. You so much. Severus watched us with a faint smile, shaking his head as he returned to his book. Looking at Severus's calm demeanor and Lily's flustered face, I felt a deep sense of contentment. You two are the most important people in my life. Chapter 51 The second time I went ST. Mungo's, I refused Severus and Lily's company. I needed to handle things alone life had been too smooth for the past decade, and I still saw myself as a grown-up kid who didn't know how to manage crises. In the ward, I saw Dearborn again. He was in the corner, reading the Daily Prophet, probably ensuring our safety. When he noticed me, he gave a warm smile of gratitude. Hughes was awake. Dad I saw Hughes lift his head, looking anxiously at the still-sleeping Isaiah. Tears welled up in my eyes. Sawyer is here. Quickly, come over. He reached out to me. Dad, how are you feeling? I asked, sitting by Hugh's bedside and holding his hand, my heart heavy with guilt. This disaster was my fault, and the feeling was overwhelming. The doctor in green asked me that just now. I'm feeling much better, no need to worry. Hughes pinched my nose playfully. Why do wizard doctors wear green? I'm more used to white coats. I stifled a laugh, replying with a thick nasal tone, they're called healers, not doctors. As for the green robes, it's probably just their uniform. Maybe the founder liked dark green. Hughes chuckled, as if there had never been any kidnapping. I couldn't tell if he was genuinely okay or just pretending for my sake. Are you really okay, Dad? The healer said you'd need a long time to fully recover, and there might be some mental discomfort. I stubbornly repeated the healer's words, seriously asking Hughes, how do you really feel? Hughes sighed, I'm really fine. Just a bit sore all over, which the doctor said is normal. Then, his eyes widened, and besides, I'm the head of this family. I have to be able to handle these little setbacks, right? Without a word, I leaned into Hugh's embrace, and he gently patted my back. I heard what those maniacs said while they were torturing us with spells. Why didn't you tell us you had found your blood relatives? Hughes casually mentioned the torment of the Cruciatus curse. I didn't want to get involved with them. Most of my close relatives are dead, except for three cousins, I said glumly. The madwoman from yesterday was one of them. Other than my birth mother, the rest wanted to eliminate muggle ordinary people like you. So, your birth father was a muggle? Yesterday, they used some pretty nasty words to describe your bloodline. Must have been filthy, half-blood, or something similar. I pursed my lips, feeling numb. He was a muggle and didn't even know I existed before he was killed by members of my bloodline. I've been avoiding that family ever since. I sat up, speaking earnestly, you and Isaiah are my real family. Hugh's eyes were warm as he hugged me tightly and kissed the top of my head. Sawyer, our good daughter. I noticed a stir beside me Isaiah was waking up. Hughes and I watched her closely. I leaned over and held her hand, sensing her unease. Isaiah slowly opened her eyes, staring blankly at the ceiling, tears spilling from the corners. Mom! What's wrong? Are you in pain? Seeing Isaiah's tears, I panicked. Hughes struggled out of bed, and I hurried to support him. Hughes sat on Isaiah's bed, caressing her face and hair, murmuring, Darling, it's okay now, the pain is gone. Isaiah's eyes remained unfocused, her mouth forming broken words, Hughes. The baby. This wasn't right. 
I quickly went to find the healer. When I returned, Isaiah's tears were still flowing, with occasional sobs. Hugh's comfort didn't seem to help much. Healer Capello waved his wand for a checkup. From the few diagnostic spells I recognized, her physical functions seemed normal. I was somewhat relieved. Physically, she's fine. This reaction is likely due to mental trauma, Capello said with a frown, turning to Hughes. Did Mrs. Hill have any painful experiences that might have triggered such a reaction? Hughes' expression was pained, but he quickly composed himself, holding Isaiah's hand tightly. He spoke in a flat tone, yes, seventeen years ago, Isaiah was taken hostage during a bank robbery. She was thrown from a speeding car by the robbers. Although she protected her head and survived, she lost our baby, who was three months along, and she can never conceive again. I covered my mouth in disbelief. Isaiah had gone through such a harrowing ordeal. No wonder they had adopted me instead of having their own children. No wonder Isaiah, despite being capable, stayed home as a housewife, hiding her scarred elbow even in summer, always saying it was an old injury from a fall. I leaned over Isaiah's bed, gripping her other hand tightly, my heart aching. Due to the trauma from being kidnapped again and the torture of the Cruciatus curse, her mental state is very fragile, causing her to relive those painful memories, Capello mused. Mrs. Hill's current state isn't conducive to her recovery. We can't rely solely on calming potions and dreamless sleep potion. You'll need to help her wake up from her fear and sadness. He instructed the apothecary to prepare a dreamless sleep potion. If it didn't work, they would have to keep her sedated for her own safety. After much comforting from Hughes and me, Isaiah finally stopped crying but remained silent. Her eyes stared blankly at the ceiling, occasionally glancing at Hughes and me, as if all her emotions were drained, leaving only emptiness. Hughes, despite his condition, insisted on squeezing into Isaiah's bed, holding her tightly. He said it would make her feel secure. Watching the two of them cuddle, I had an idea and left the ward with an excuse. I found Capello and shared my proposal. A memory charm. Capello stroked his smooth chin. In theory, it's possible, but rarely suggested due to potential memory loss and some uncontrollable factors. It could erase more than intended and slightly impact memory. However, given Mrs. Hill's current condition, this might be the best option. He concluded, but we need your father's consent. Naturally, I returned to the ward and told Hughes. Surprisingly, he was pleased at the thought of erasing Isaiah's painful memories. Darling, you'll soon be free from those nightmares, Hughes whispered in her ear. She stared blankly at Hughes but eventually nodded. The new treatment plan was quickly set in motion. St. Mungos had specialists in memory charms, and they cast a spell that afternoon to erase parts of Isaiah's memory, including the recent trauma and the incident seventeen years ago. Given the time lapse, the memories were blurred rather than precisely erased, as if they had faded naturally. After the spell, Isaiah's dazed expression didn't change immediately. It took a few seconds before clarity returned to her eyes. She looked around, seeing Hughes and me, and asked, What happened, Hughes? Her dry voice startled her. You've been ill and slept for almost two days. We're in a wizard hospital, Hughes explained gently. Why am I sick? Why are we in a wizard hospital? Oh, shouldn't Sawyer be at school? She seemed confused and questioned me, probably wondering if I had skipped class. I couldn't help but smile. Everything seems normal, the healer who cast the spell nodded and left. Capello performed another check, satisfied with the results, and left us to communicate. Wow, that person used magic on me just now. The purple light was warm, Isaiah marveled, touching her face where she had been scanned. Maybe it was my imagination, but she seemed livelier. Perhaps losing those heavy memories had lightened her heart. I felt relieved. Watching Hughes coax Isaiah, explaining everything in a mysterious way, I finally felt at ease. This was the comfortable and happy family I knew. Back at school that night, I told Lily and Severus about the day's events. Lily was relieved that everything turned out fine, considering it a blessing in disguise for Isaiah to forget her trauma. I sighed. One Obliviate could protect Isaiah's happiness. 
In reality, Hughes bore the burden of those painful memories alone, willing to shoulder them for the sake of simple happiness, claiming he was the head of our family. That night, I climbed to the astronomy tower, leaning on the railing to watch the dark school grounds. The moon hid behind clouds, casting no light. I heard familiar footsteps behind me. It's almost curfew. Why aren't you back in the dorm with Lily? Severus stood beside me, his voice cool but concerned. I'm contemplating life. Seriously, I emphasized. Even in the dark, I could imagine Severus raising an eyebrow. I'm too weak to protect my own family, I said, feeling dejected. And now I've made enemies with Bellatrix and her husband. They won't let me go. Unless I move my parents to the other side of the world, we'll never be safe. Are you planning to leave? Severus's voice was dangerous. I thought about it, I admitted quietly, but I don't know what you think, and I can't leave Lily. You're not leaving alone. Severus gripped my shoulders, his voice low and angry. I'm not leaving alone. I'll take my parents too. And you, I thought. If I run, I'll take you with me. You know what I mean. He turned me to face him, the moonlight casting shadows over his face, but his eyes blazed with anger. I was stunned by his intense reaction. I'm not planning to leave, and I won't run away that's cowardly, I said, meeting his gaze. But I need Dumbledore's protection for my parents. What about you? A Slytherin joining the Order of the Phoenix. His position would be even more difficult. I thought I made my stance clear. Severus let go of me, speaking dryly, though working with a bunch of Griffinders will be a nightmare and trust will be hard to earn, I thought we were in this together. Damn, how could he be so moving? I sniffled, taking a step forward to hug his waist, whispering into his shoulder. Yes, we're in this together. Chapter 52 I waited in the empty common room, thinking about Sawyer. That girl. Even though I waited for her, I could guess where she was now happily with him. All right, Sawyer and Severus are my best friends. Even though we ended up in different houses, our friendship never wavered. When I started to suspect that Sawyer liked Severus, she openly admitted it. I was a bit surprised but not shocked it seemed natural for something to happen between them. After confirming my suspicion about Sawyer, I began to observe Severus. Was he avoiding Sawyer? It seemed that way, but I noticed something different. He often watched her when she wasn't looking, his gaze deep and intense. I couldn't understand his eyes, but I was certain there was deep emotion there. He must like Sawyer too. So why were things like this now? What was Severa struggling with? What was Sawyer hesitating about? Sometimes I wanted to kick them. But some things they had to resolve on their own, or it would always be a sore spot. I guess I'm not that easygoing. Watching them drag things out until the end of term, I buried myself in studying, letting them sort out their issues. Sawyer could be so frustrating she usually needed a push to move forward. Eventually, they got together before the term ended. So they became a couple, and I became a prefect. Busy with my duties, I had less time to spend with them. Often, I'd come back from meetings to find a closed door, where they were studying dark magic. I still had some aversion to dark magic. In the restricted section of the library, I saw books with terrifying images of cursed individuals. But I couldn't stop them from learning they had their reasons, and I almost felt persuaded to join them. Although I was the one who refused to join, being left out felt like abandonment. A strange discomfort. It was like that time on the Hogwarts Express at the start of the term. The prefects from all four houses were together polite, distant, each doing their own thing. I missed our old compartment. Taking a break from patrolling, I snuck back to see them and found a peaceful scene. Sawyer was dozing in Severus's arms while he read quietly. I tiptoed in. Is she asleep? I whispered. Severus nodded slightly, motioning for silence, looking apologetic. I shook my head, closed the door quietly, and sat down. Severus continued reading, turning the pages gently so as not to disturb Sawyer. I couldn't sit still for more than ten minutes, feeling like I was disrupting the balance. I wasn't trying to interfere in their relationship the loneliness just hurt. Making an excuse to patrol, 
I almost fled the compartment. I ran into Remus in the corridor, and we moved to the next carriage together. My expression must have been off because he asked what was wrong. I pulled a face, joking that my best friends no longer needed me now that they had each other. I sympathize and understand, but maybe you should consider James, Remus suggested, sounding like a salesman. I forgot you were his spokesperson don't be so dedicated. I think you're pretty great. It was a joke I'd learned from Sawyer. Remus's gentle expression froze. Oh, no. Don't let James hear that, or he'll kill me. It worked like a charm. I laughed heartily. Jokes among friends are the best medicine. After that, I often felt down. Sawyer and Severus were too perfect together their chemistry, their aura. Sawyer kept talking about Severus even when we were alone. Oh, Sawyer, you don't love me anymore. I felt so wronged. During that time, James seemed busy with something, not bothering me, leaving me with nowhere to vent. Remus was also troubled, likely due to a bottleneck in the Wolfsbane potion research. His melancholy attracted several lovestruck girls during our patrols. I couldn't help with the potion. Initially, I was involved, but later I left it to Dumbledore and Severus, the experts. So, I just accompanied him in his gloom, being a supportive friend. Eventually, I couldn't help but complain to Sawyer about being left out. She apologized softly, making me feel awkward. It wasn't something to apologize for I was just jealous and unbalanced. Being ignored felt awful. But after talking to Sawyer, I felt better. Her apology made me feel valued. Watching Severus enjoy Sawyer's massage made me happy. I was genuinely glad for their happiness. Maybe I was too lonely and needed a boyfriend. I needed to think about it. However, James Sticky Potter's resurgence shattered that idea. I don't know how he did it, but he seemed to always know my whereabouts, appearing like a ghost around every corner. Not even Polyjuice Potion could fool him. There must be some magical item involved probably their half-year project. Too bad Remus wouldn't reveal their secret. I'd had enough. Couldn't he stop these childish antics? Should I praise his persistence as a true Gryffindor? If he kept this up, my chances of finding a boyfriend were slim. Today, Sawyer returned from his tea. Mungo's. Her mother had to undergo a memory charm to overcome the trauma of the kidnapping. Though it was a blessing in disguise, the ordeal they endured was real. This incident shocked me. What if my parents faced such danger one day? Would anyone warn me in time? Would I find help in time? Lost in thought, I walked towards the Gryffindor Tower, planning to comfort Sawyer. She must be worried sick about her parents. As I was thinking, James appeared out of nowhere. Lily. What a coincidence. Are you heading to the tower too? Let's go together. James, with his messy hair, appeared before me. Suppressing my annoyance, I thought, you're in for it now. Yes, what a coincidence. But could you stop stalking me? It's really off-putting. I tried to keep my expression polite. Uh, don't call it stalking, Lily. You know I like you. I'd do anything for you his declaration was cut short by me. Oh really, anything? Does that include performing acrobatics or playing pranks on the entire school for me? I'm sorry, but I don't have the energy for games. I need to study, get stronger, and protect my muggle family. I don't have an ancient pure-blood wizard family backing me. I have to work hard not to get killed by Death Eaters. I said coldly. James looked flustered. Uh, it's not that bad. We're only in fifth year. Only fifth year. I laughed at the knave boy. By the way, did you know Sawyer's parents were almost kidnapped yesterday because some Death Eaters wanted to use them to blackmail Sawyer into being their spy? You probably haven't realized the current situation. Muggleborns and their families are in real danger. James's eyes widened in shock, unable to utter a word. So, stop these childish games. I'm leaving. Goodbye. Ignoring his silence, I walked away. He couldn't be unaware of the situation outside most attacks targeted Muggleborn's families. Living in Hogwarts's safe ivory tower made danger seem distant. 
but the reality was close. Sawyer's parents' ordeal was a wake-up call. The portrait at the common room door swung open, interrupting my thoughts as a figure slipped inside. It's well past curfew. Should I deduct points? As a prefect, I could deduct points from my house. Though I wouldn't actually do it, it was a good scare tactic especially for younger students sneaking out at night. My sudden voice startled Sawyer. She clutched her chest. Why are you still up? Scaring people. I was waiting for you. So sad, I knew you wouldn't need my friendship comfort after Severus's loving embrace. I shook my head, picking up the unfinished homework on the table, and headed for the girls' dormitory stairs. Sawyer sprang up, hugging me and rubbing her face against my hair. Oh, Lily, you're the best. I love you so much. I grinned, tilting my chin up. With a friend like me, you're truly fortunate. Chapter 53 June 1977 At the end of term feast, which also served as a farewell banquet for the graduates, the main participants didn't seem to enjoy the sumptuous spread as much as the younger students did. Is this our last meal at Hogwarts? Lily asked wistfully, as she ate a forkful of roasted potatoes. I'm really going to miss this place. Yes, this should be our last dinner here. Tomorrow morning we have breakfast before we leave on the train, I said, slicing a piece of roast beef and savoring its taste. If you're talking about the food, I'll miss it too. I meant Hogwarts, Lily replied, correcting my misunderstanding. Tomorrow we leave this place, and unless we plan to apply for teaching positions, we won't be back. Well, theoretically, if you become a member of the school board, you could visit. And if your child has a major incident at school, you'll be called here, I concluded with a nod. That would be a chance to revisit. Across the table, Remus and Sirius snickered. James who I had finally started calling by his first name grumbled, I'd rather not come back under those circumstances. It sounds like a curse. Sawyer, must you ruin the mood? Lily's lips twitched. This is our farewell dinner. Let me be sentimental. I chuckled and continued eating my last meal at Hogwarts. The atmosphere at the four house tables mirrored our first year. Gryffindor was lively, while Slytherin remained quiet and elegant. But the seventh-year Gryffinders around me had matured. Their straightforwardness and enthusiasm were still there, but they were now more composed, no longer the naive young lions they once were. What surprised me most was James's transformation over the years. It seemed to start at the end of our fifth year. He became less ostentatious, more thoughtful. Perhaps Lily had said something to him that triggered this change. Unfortunately, I never managed to pry that gossip out of her. By sixth year, James had toned down his arrogance and pranks. He earned 10 O. L.S. and took all the courses needed to become an Auror. He seemed determined to embody the Gryffindor spirit of justice. As James matured, he didn't give up on pursuing Lily. He stopped being clingy and showy, becoming more considerate and gentle. Although he didn't constantly proclaim his love, his actions spoke volumes. Even I had to admit he was doing a good job. Lily, who always found James attractive, eventually succumbed to his gentle persistence. They started dating at the end of sixth year and grew closer. When Lily began dating James, Severus became even more critical of him. It seemed like nothing James did could please him. I teased Lily, saying Severus acted like a picky father-in-law who thought no one was good enough for his daughter. Lily laughed heartily, not at all annoyed by my joke. Severus's obvious protectiveness reminded me of a stern father. When I told him this, he gave me a peculiar smile and said, if she were really my daughter, I'd be even more critical. I silently prayed for our future son-in-law. Oh no, our future son-in-law. I had to act quickly and secure such a good man as Severus. Severus and James were never on good terms, and now their interactions were even frostier. With Sirius always stirring the pot, I was grateful they didn't throw curses at each other in front of Lily and me. I sipped my soup, listening to my classmates discuss their post-graduation plans. Lily, James, and Sirius planned to join the Aura training program. The three years of rigorous training would hone their combat skills. Remus and Peter were joining the Order of the Phoenix, 
helping Dumbledore fight the Death Eaters. During our seventh year, we all joined the Order James, Sirius, Lily, Remus, Peter, Severus, and me. After our N. T.S., Severus and I approached Professor Dumbledore, expressing our desire to join the Order but requesting to keep it a secret. A Slytherin joining the Order would draw Voldemort's attention. We could be a support force for the Order. Severus's potion-making skills and my medical expertise would be invaluable. His apothecary would prioritize supplying the order, not for free but as a steady source of potions, a crucial advantage. I would also be joining ST. Mungos. Barring any surprises, I expected to get an E in potions on my N. T.S. Years of hard work had prepared me for the exams. I was confident in earning O's in charms and defense against the dark arts. With Madame Pomfrey's recommendation, if I passed the exams, I would secure an internship at ST. Mungos. After six months of training and another six months of internship, I'd be a certified healer. As a neutral institution, ST. Mungos treated everyone, from nobles to commoners, making it a valuable source of information. My first task would be to gather intel. Even seemingly trivial information could be critical. The order would need to protect me because the Bellatrix incident in fifth year left a mark. They had targeted several order members and barely escaped. I might still be on their radar. After the kidnapping incident, I convinced Hughes to change jobs and move to a busy area in London. That's when I learned about a substantial savings account, enough to buy a shop in a pricey part of town. Hughes explained that the savings were from their early career days. Both he and Isaiah had been high-ranking bank employees with good salaries. Isaiah had encountered the robbery while on a work inspection. After the incident, they both resigned and moved to a modest area in Spider's End. Hughes found a new job at a bank and bought a high-security apartment. The order helped set up the defenses. Isaiah stayed home, enjoying her peaceful life. Hiding a tree in a forest was the best strategy. In a bustling city, it's hard to find someone among the masses. For added safety, a young wizard from the Order moved into the same building. Two years passed peacefully. I was grateful to Dumbledore and the Order for protecting my parents. Joining the Order was not just for safety but also out of gratitude. Sawyer, do you and Severus have plans this weekend? Remus asked, pulling me out of my thoughts. The weekend? No special plans. Why? I'd like to invite you both to dinner at my place. I need to properly thank you, Remus said sincerely. I'd love to. But you should thank Severus and Damocles. I didn't do much to solve your little problem. I made a face. The Wolfsbane potion had shown promising results in the past month, allowing werewolves to retain their human mind during transformation. This made werewolves like Remus less dangerous. They plan to refine it further and apply for a patent as a new potion. No, if it weren't for your efforts, they wouldn't have prioritized this research. Finding a test subject isn't easy. Someday, someone would have developed it, but who knows when. So, he raised his glass of pumpkin juice, here's to you. I sighed theatrically, all right, if you insist. I raised my glass of orange juice and clinked it with his. By the way, I said after finishing my drink, leaning forward eagerly, any special celebrations with Dumbledore? Remus looked embarrassed. We, uh, nothing special. I grinned mischievously. On the day the Wolfsbane potion succeeded, we had a small celebration at Dumbledore's place. I accidentally walked in on Remus and Damocles passionately kissing in the kitchen, which led to a lot of teasing from the rest of us. So, the marauders, Lily, Severus, and I knew about their secret relationship. Sirius had dramatically shouted in surprise, interrupting their kiss and earning a scolding. Interrupting a romantic moment is punishable by being kicked by a horse. Lily and I gladly played the horse's role. Initially, I was shocked by their relationship, as same-sex love isn't widely accepted. But they looked so in love that I was happy for them. Sirius later told us that same-sex marriages among wizards were recognized by magic just like heterosexual marriages. So why did you act surprised? You ruined the moment. 
Lily and I scolded him together. But Remus kept it a secret from us. That's not being a good friend. Sirius retorted, burning another round of eye rolls from us. After dinner, Lily and I headed upstairs. Severus had already gone to our base. James invited me to spend the summer at his place. We might discuss getting married soon, Lily said casually, but I sensed a deeper meaning. Soon. How soon? This year. His parents are a bit anxious. So, well. Lily stopped and raised an eyebrow. Ahem, feeling challenged, I muttered, don't be too smug. Lily smirked, satisfied. I felt a bit flustered. Some things needed to be addressed sooner rather than later. That night, we packed our things at the base, preparing to leave we decided to spend our last night in the common room. I let Lily go ahead and stayed back with Severus. Standing at the door, I held his hand, intertwining our fingers. Severus, I need to talk to you. I looked seriously into his eyes. Severus raised an eyebrow, urging me to speak. I felt nervous, my mouth dry, heart pounding. I heard myself swallow. Let's get married. As soon as the words left my mouth, my heartbeat returned to normal, and I eagerly awaited Severus's reaction. He looked surprised, then his face darkened, showing displeasure. My heart sank, and the smile on my face started to falter. Chapter 54 I noticed Severus tense up at my suggestion, looking somewhat flustered. Was I putting him in a difficult position? Was he unwilling? I felt conflicted. Ah, if it's too sudden and you can't accept it then just forget I said anything. I tried to sound casual, making an effort to keep my tone light, but it only made me seem more awkward. Feeling dejected, I sighed internally. Severus glared at me for a moment before his expression turned resigned. He glanced to the side, muttering, it is quite sudden. You really? Planned this? I watched his reaction carefully, trying to grasp his meaning. He took a deep breath. I planned to propose to you in front of your parents after we returned home for the holidays. He looked at me with a wry smile. You beat me to it. Did you have to be in such a hurry? You were going to propose to me. In front of my parents. I wasn't sure whether to be more surprised or delighted. I had always thought Severus wouldn't like expressing his feelings publicly. Severus huffed. Yes, I finally made up my mind. You're going to regret not waiting. Oh, I'm already regretting it. I teased, quickly pecking his cheek and linking my arm with his as we walked toward the door. So, now that we're on the same page, let's discuss the wedding date. Severus, when do you think is good? You decide. How about next month? So soon. Because I'm eager to marry you. Are you sure it's not because of that bet? Well, that might be a tiny part of it. I reserve my judgment. For the last time as students, we got off the Hogwarts Express. On platform nine and three quarters, we said our goodbyes to our friends. Lily and James walked towards Mr. and Mrs. Potter, waving back at us. Goodbye, Sawyer, Severus. Don't forget to owl me. Lily winked at me. I recalled her whispered words earlier, don't forget our bet. Rubbing my forehead, I thought of my youthful folly a bet's a bet I can't back down now. Besides, I had already made up my mind. I thought happily. We operate directly from the platform to the hallway of the house on Spinner's End. After my parents moved out, they didn't sell the house but left it for me. Severus and I decided to connect the two adjacent houses. With magical support, we didn't worry about breaking load-bearing walls. We created spacious passageways or doors wherever possible. The area was becoming increasingly run down, with worsening security. Drunks, hooligans, and thieves lurked in the dark alleys. Those who could move away had left, leaving behind only the very poor or gang leaders, and no decent people could endure living here. The house was protected by muggle-repelling charms and muggle-repelling wards, so no muggles would approach. Strangers, even wizards, wouldn't think a wizarding family would live in such a muggle neighborhood. Of course, the house had warning charms and various defenses, some involving dark magic. Any unauthorized person trying to enter, 
whether friend or foe, would be automatically attacked. Injuries depended on their luck and abilities. We operate through the defenses, feeling a brief probe and withdrawal of the protective layer. Anyone else attempting this would be thrown face first out of the nearest window a creative but effective prank spell that caused minimal harm but maximum surprise. Every room in the house, including bathrooms, was equipped with alarm bells. When we set this up, Severus half-jokingly suggested tricking James and Sirius into trying it out. I had to admit, the idea was very tempting. We each took our luggage and headed to our rooms to rest a bit before using the flu network to my parents' apartment. Oh, dear, you're finally back. I missed you so much. And Severus, come in, sit down dinner is ready. As soon as we stepped out of the fireplace, Isaiah gave me a long-awaited hug, ruffling my hair and patting my face as if I were still a child, even though I was now taller than her. Isaiah also gave Severus a solid hug, and this time, he seemed much less rigid than before. He still wasn't fond of such intimate contact, but he was getting used to it. I smiled and led Severus to the table. Clearing my throat, I noticed my parents' eyes focused on me. There's something I want to tell you suddenly, this scene felt strangely familiar. Glancing at Severus, I saw the same recognition in his eyes. I giggled, and Severus smiled too. Oh, I think I know Isaiah drew out her words, studying us, are you getting engaged or breaking up? Before we could respond, she turned to Hughes, seeing their synchronicity, they must be getting engaged. She nodded knowingly, wearing a, been there, done that, expression. Neither, actually, I said innocently, we're getting married. Married? Isaiah's eyes widened in surprise and confusion. You're only eighteen. Though young marriages aren't unheard of, isn't it too soon? It's not too early. Many wizards marry young my words were cut off by Isaiah's gasp. Oh. You're not Sawyer, you're not pregnant, are you? Isaiah exclaimed, looking me up and down worriedly. Hughes, who had been smiling, shot Severus a sharp look. No. I quickly denied, waving my hands. You've got it all wrong. We're definitely not marrying because of a baby. The most intimate we had been was mutual caressing we hadn't gone all the way. Even though we were sometimes tempted, we controlled ourselves. I couldn't stop my face from heating up. Glancing at Severus, I saw he also looked embarrassed, a faint blush tinging his cheeks. Our reactions only made them more suspicious. Even Isaiah turned to glare at Severus. Really, I swear. I tried to sound convincing despite my flushed face. All right, let's eat. The food's getting cold under the scrutinizing gazes, I managed a weak smile. That night, we stayed over, with me in my room and Severus in the guest room. As soon as I lay down, Isaiah climbed into bed with me, claiming she wanted to have some girl talk. In the dim moonlight filtering through the thin curtains, I saw her bright eyes staring at me. After a moment of eerie silence, I gave in. Okay, I'll tell you the truth. There really isn't a baby and I proposed to Severus first, just yesterday. Though he was planning to do it soon, too. Why the rush to get married? Isaiah asked gently. It's not a game it's for life. And don't talk about divorce. The wizarding world is at war. We can't stay out of it. Don't worry, we'll be very careful. But if something happens, I don't want to have any regrets. I spoke softly, afraid that saying it aloud might make it true. I sigh aside, holding me close and stroking my hair. Her voice came from above my head, how could I not worry? War is such a frightening word. Feeling the warmth of her embrace, I murmured, I'm scared of the war too. Injuries can be healed, but if we die, what then? I don't want to leave you I don't want to lose Severus. Isaiah listened silently, patting my back gently, just like when I was a child. Unconsciously, I burrowed closer to the warmth, pressing my face into her chest, feeling the soft pressure. But we can't run away. Severus and I can't. There are too many important things we can't abandon. I nodded to affirm myself, and I'm a brave Gryffindor, after all. Ah, that's the house you're in. I remember you said the symbol is a lion. Yeah. Then be brave, and stay safe. 
My little lion. I'm not little anymore. Hee hee, even when you're all grown up and getting married, you'll still be our little lion. Considering that I would start at ST. Mungo's at the end of July, we set the wedding date for the first Sunday of July. I sent an invitation to Lily, and that evening, Jamie flew back with a reply. To distinguish my beloved owl from Lily's dear Potter, I nicknamed him Jamie. Fortunately, he grudgingly accepted the nickname. Lily sent a small mirror with a round, silver-backed shell engraved with an antique pattern. Sawyer. Examining the mirror in my hand, I heard Lily's voice. Turning it over, I saw her face appear in the mirror. Wow, is this a pair of two-way mirrors? I had once seen similar mirrors in Diagon Alley. The shopkeeper had explained that you could talk to someone through the mirror. Like a video call. I missed my cell phone. Unfortunately, it was a bit pricey, so I didn't buy one. Exactly. James got these for us, but I took them. He'll manage to get another pair his family is rich, after all. Lily, you're so envious of the rich I wisely kept this thought to myself. Sawyer, you guys moved quickly. You've already set a date. Lily's expression was a mix of surprise and approval. Just doing our best how are you at the Potters? Great. Mr. and Mrs. Potter are wonderful people, and even though they're an old pure-blood family, they've never said anything about my muggle heritage. I was a bit worried, but they accepted me right away. Lily beamed. I could see how happy she was. The pure-blood supremacy rhetoric still troubled her. Marrying into a pure-blood family came with its own psychological pressure. Fortunately, James's parents were open-minded. It's good that Severus and I are both half-bloods. Hey! Are you zoning out? Sawyer, you've hurt my feelings Lily wailed dramatically. Uh, hee hee, just empathize with a bride-to-be's nerves. You'll understand once your wedding date is set. I joked, trying to ease the mood. Sawyer. Who are you talking to? Severus's voice came from the other side. He must have come up from the basement potions lab. Lily sent a two-way mirror. It's really convenient. I quickly made my way through the house to what used to be Severus's dining room. He was taking care of his hands, as some potion ingredients were harmful to the skin. After much persuasion, Severus had started taking better care of his hands. Since his hands were occupied, I held the mirror up to him. They exchanged greetings before ending the call. We settled on the couch to discuss the wedding. Severus suggested keeping it simple due to the wartime, and I agreed, preferring a low-key affair with just close friends and family. Severus, what about your friends? Who should we invite? I asked, toying with the mirror. My close friend was Lily, and though Regulus Black was a Slytherin acquaintance, he wasn't close to Severus. Just Lily and Damien. They're our mutual friends. I meant from Slytherin. Only Lucius, but inviting him wouldn't be appropriate, Severus said, raising an eyebrow. Considering his affiliations, he'd be at odds with our friends. True. Inviting a Slytherin among a group of Griffinders might turn our wedding into a battlefield. Chapter 55 When I woke up the next morning, the sky was just beginning to lighten. The dull ache in my back and waist made me raise my head, coming face to face with a sleeping Severus. He was lying on his side facing me, one arm defensively wrapped around me. My movement must have disturbed him slightly as he shifted closer. I observed his relaxed face, still marked by a faint frown line between his brows, his prominent Roman nose, and thin, lightly pursed lips. The sharp lines of his face made him appear very dependable, a perception likely influenced by my own feelings. I snuggled closer this was my husband. Severus stirred. Hmm. Sawyer. His early morning voice, slightly hoarse, was very sexy. Good morning, Severus. I kissed the corner of his mouth and smiled broadly before nestling back against his chest. His open pajama collar tempted me to leave marks on his skin, so I did just that. Mm. You're on fire, Sawyer. Severus's voice, with a hint of restraint, came from above my head, but he didn't stop me. Then let it burn. I reached to unbutton his pajamas. 
With a swift movement, Severus flipped over and pinned me down, his hands joining mine in undoing the buttons. Is your body okay? He was still fighting his last bit of rationality. Just be gentle, I'll get used to it eventually. Those buttons were so annoying from now on, I decided to switch to tie front robes. We kicked off all the clothes and blankets it was just dawn. See you tonight, Severus. I kissed his cheek and stepped into the green flames in the fireplace. St. Mungo's Hospital for Magical Maladies and Injuries Stepping into St. Mungo's again, I headed straight to the fifth floor to find my training mentor. The so-called training was essentially just filling in gaps in my knowledge, with a senior healer from St. Mungo's assessing my healing spells and providing individual tutoring during free time. This ensured I was qualified as a healer, as this was more than just a job it was about others' health and lives. Today was my first report day, and my mentor was Burns Capello, the primary healer for my parents two years ago. According to Dumbledore, he was a member of the Order of the Phoenix and my protector during my time at ST. Mungo's. This arrangement couldn't be better. Capello, originally from Italy, appeared to be in his sixties, a bit plump, and very good-natured. He remembered me and cheerfully asked about my parents' recovery. We discussed my future class schedule, allocating half a day each weekday for lessons and resting on weekends. It was a relaxed pace, providing ample time to digest the material, which explained the six-month training period. By the time I returned home in the evening, Severus was in the potions lab. Tito informed me that dinner had been sent in, so I didn't disturb him. I read a book for a while and then had a somewhat boring chat with Lily for an hour. Lily and James had set their wedding date for the end of next month and had enrolled in aura training, starting in September. I couldn't help but find it amusing they seemed to plan on honeymooning during training. Lily explained that because training would be busy, they wanted to get married beforehand. Around 10, Severus finally emerged. Severus, is the potion shop really that busy? You've been working for several days now. I looked at Severus's slightly sallow face with concern. He must have been cooped up in the lab all day, possibly just grabbing quick meals if it weren't for Tito's prepared dinners. Yes, it's been quite busy. Severus rubbed his eyes. Dan took leave to relax with Remus after testing and improving the Wolfsbane potion. They've been working hard for over a month, so they deserve a good celebration. Sigh, I can't help with potions, but I can be a supportive wife. I said, stepping forward to massage his shoulders. Just take care of yourself and stay safe. Even at a ST. Mungos, don't let your guard down. If there are Order members there, the Dark Lord might have sent people in too. Yes, sir, my dear husband. Severus had a point being cautious in these turbulent times was always wise. A month had passed since my lessons with Burns began. I went to ST. Mungos every morning or afternoon, directly using the FLU network to the internal staff-only fireplace, which was very convenient. I recently learned that the room Professor McGonagall took us to via FLU in fifth year was an internal staff-only area at ST. Mungos. Staff could operate or use the FLU network for quick access, while regular visitors had to enter through the main entrance in a shopping mall in central London. After one visit, I was quite impressed by the wizard's ability to blend in. It was indeed a case of the great hiding in plain sight. On the stairs, I ran into Catherine Dolohov again, a junior healer in the potions and plant poisoning department. We had almost collided at the stairway corner a week ago, and since then, we frequently ran into each other, either in the morning or when I was leaving in the afternoon. Catherine, knowing I was undergoing training, enthusiastically shared her experiences with me. Though it was just a few minutes on the stairs each day, she always talked while I listened, her enthusiasm leaving me somewhat overwhelmed. This sudden approach from a stranger was suspicious, and I remained cautious around her. Today's lesson was on the use of potions. Burns spent over an hour testing my knowledge of potion ingredients, and the material I had memorized proved useful, leading to satisfactory results. Next, we focused on the accurate and rapid identification of potions. Burns took me to the potion storage room, selecting various potions for me to identify. The first bottle stopper had barely been removed when I smelled something akin to vomit, making my stomach churn. 
Ugh. I covered my mouth and jumped back, apologizing to the startled Burns. Sorry, that's a cell regeneration potion, commonly used for internal organ repair. Excuse me, I need to visit the restroom. Leaning over the sink, with water running, my throat made unpleasant sounds. Ugh. This was dreadful. I knew potions could smell bad, but this was extreme, almost murderous to my stomach. After soothing my stomach, I washed my face, pondering the overreaction. Oh, Merlin, could it be? I counted the days and. Yes, it was very likely. I was pregnant. I was pregnant. Seeing my shocked face in the mirror, I composed myself and decided to confirm it. Finding Burns back in his office, he looked concerned. Are you alright, Sawyer? I'm fine, but I need to confirm something. Can you help? After a professional healer's examination, I confirmed I was over six weeks pregnant. Burns cheerfully congratulated me and shared his wife's pregnancy experiences. The rest of the morning turned into a pregnancy care lesson. At the usual end of class time, I bade Burns farewell, quickly finding a secluded corner to call Severus with our matching mirrors. Sawyer, what's up? The background in the mirror showed Severus at Dam's house. They were finishing the final steps of the Felix Felici's potion. Nothing urgent. I have good news to share later. When can you come home? About half an hour. Great, I'll be waiting. Feeling elated, I walked briskly but slowed down, remembering to be cautious in the first trimester. On the first floor, I ran into Catherine, who was in casual attire and about to leave. Hi, why are you off so early today? I thought you worked afternoons. I asked, feeling unusually chatty. I took the day off. It's my wedding anniversary, and we need some private time. She smiled shyly. Oh, congratulations. I found her much more agreeable now. Such a loving couple I almost wished them a quick addition to their family. Carrying the joyous mood, I arrived at the ground floor, grinning all the way. In the room with the fireplace, no one else was present as it wasn't a peak time. Catherine rummaged through her handbag, and suddenly, something fell at my feet with a crisp ding. Ah. Sorry. That's my brooch. I picked up the silver flower-shaped brooch and handed it to her. No problem. As soon as Catherine touched the brooch, I saw a glint of triumph in her eyes, and an invisible force pulled me from my navel, lifting me off the ground. Worrying about the tiny embryo inside me, I was filled with regret. I had been careless. Chapter 56 After a rapid flight, I landed hard on my stomach. The sudden tug had made me miss the best moment to draw my wand, and I was hit with a Petrificus Totalus spell. I fell heavily to the ground, seeing Catherine's smiling face peering at me. TSK, TSK, not so impressive. I thought you'd put up a fight since you were so cautious, she said, patting my face. I felt myself being levitated, my gaze fixed on the floor, seemingly in a hallway or some such place. Unable to move, my mind raced. Catherine had targeted me to capture, but was it specifically me or just anyone who fit the bill? Now it seemed I was being taken somewhere, maybe to someone else. The situation wasn't entirely hopeless she didn't seem to want to harm me, which might mean there was room for negotiation. Once the Petrificus Totalus was lifted, I could use the port key to escape. After passing through a door, I heard Catherine speak. Brother, I brought someone. She's a Gryffindor. A man's raspy voice replied, you took a week. Why only now? Who knew a Gryffindor could be so cautious? I couldn't gain her trust, so I had to use force. Violence is quicker. Catherine complained, like a spoiled child, before I was unceremoniously dropped. This brute. So she initially planned to lure me in. Blaming my caution when it was her own fault for being obvious. I silently fumed, glaring with the only part of me that could move me eyes since her back blocked the other man's view. Caution is good. A brainless Gryffindor wouldn't make a good spy. Take her wand. The man ordered. A spy. Death Eaters always trying to poach. Catherine roughly searched me and eventually pulled my wand from my sleeve. 
I cursed silently. I loved that wand, but if it came down to it, I had to prioritize my life. Miss, we have some matters to discuss, so we brought you here. I apologize for the roughness. If you cooperate, I'll lift the spell now. A man with dark brown curls looked down at me, his superior tone infuriating. I controlled my emotions, using a clemency though not as skilled as Severus, I wasn't bad and blinked to show compliance. If they wanted a spy, there might be room to negotiate. What's her name? The man didn't move. Sawyer Snape. Snape? What is your relationship with Severus Snape? The man prepared to lift the spell. He knows Severus. If they were acquaintances, I pondered my chances of persuading him to let me go. Rodolphus, has someone arrived? A woman's voice, accompanied by approaching footsteps, sounded nearby. The voice was familiar, and the name too. I had a bad feeling, ready to use the port key once the spell was lifted. Catherine brought someone suitable from Esti. Mungos, a Gryffindor. The man stopped lifting the spell, and I sighed inwardly. Ah, Bella, here's your brooch. It helped me bring her here. Catherine's words made my heart sink. Rodolphus was Bellatrix's husband's name no wonder it sounded familiar. I was in deep trouble. As if to confirm my misfortune, a face appeared in my sight. Seeing me, Bellatrix's expression turned to a mix of cruelty and delight. Isn't this my dear little cousin? How pitiful, lying on the cold floor. She sneered, kicking my shoulder. Is she the Sawyer Hill? Rodolphus's tone also changed. You know her. She's Bella's cousin. Catherine seemed unaware of my connection to Bellatrix. Aunt's illegitimate daughter with a muggle, just a filthy half-blood. Ungrateful brat, as soon as my mother died, she turned to the order for protection of those muggle foster parents. Bellatrix spat the word muggle with contempt. She turned and smiled at me maliciously, I still have your gift. She lifted her right sleeve, revealing a long, ugly scar on her forearm. Enough talk. Crucio. To my surprise, it was Catherine who cast the spell first, sounding thrilled. Pain exploded through me, every nerve on fire. Unable to move, I felt my body convulse, every cell screaming. The pain was bearable for me alone, but. My child. I prayed the six-week-old embryo in my womb would be okay. Stop, Rodolphus ordered, and I was immensely grateful, despite him being an accomplice. She's married to Snape. Bellatrix snorted, Snape. That half-blood Slytherin, good at potions. As if he's anything special. A Slytherin not joining the Death Eaters after graduation, making the Dark Lord recruit him. He'll regret it. Crab mentioned Snape refused, struggling with how to report to the Dark Lord. The Dark Lord respects his abilities, so we shouldn't provoke him. Rodolphus considered. I saw a chance for a reprieve. But we can't just let this girl go. She might be in the order. Snape's attitude is unclear they might have joined Dumbledore already. Bellatrix argued, glaring at Catherine for taking her chance for revenge. I regretted letting my guard down for a moment of happiness. There's a saying about being happy too soon. I hadn't even told Severus the good news. I couldn't let anything happen to my baby. As the aftereffects of the Cruciatus curse faded, I gathered my strength, preparing to use the port key. I needed to act before Severus realized something was wrong and came for me. What do we do? I can't stand her. It took a week to get close to her, almost made me sick. Now my cover is blown, I can't let her go back to Esti. Mungos. Catherine whined. They wanted to recruit or control me. If that failed, they'd likely kill me. I had to adapt if they planned to negotiate, I'd have a chance to escape. They continued arguing. Bellatrix insisted that if I'd turned to Dumbledore years ago, I couldn't be persuaded now, and if controlling me failed, it was better to kill me and find someone else. Catherine wanted to torture me into submission, needing practice with the Cruciatus curse, complaining that it was ineffective on a petrified person. I vowed to remember everything she did to me and repay it double. Finally, Rodolphus decided, we'll take her to the Dark Lord, 
suggest she's a potential spy for the Order. If she can be used to leverage Snape, we'll claim the credit. He sneered, Crab can't blame us for stealing his thunder if he's incompetent. And I brought her here I want to see the Dark Lord too. Catherine's fanatical tone reminded me of crazed fans from my previous life. Worship, madness, with a bit of reverence. Let's go. No captive meets the Dark Lord without being controlled. Bellatrix seemed to agree, crouching to say sweetly, My dear cousin, you'll have the honor of meeting the Dark Lord. The Cruciatus curse is nothing compared to what he can do. Enjoy. Ha! Her manic laughter made my stomach churn, possibly from nausea. Facing her threats, I wasn't too scared. There was still hope. If I had to talk to the Dark Lord face to face, they'd have to lift the Petrificus Totalus. I'd use that moment to activate the port key. It'd take less than three seconds to place my right hand on the ring on my left hand, turn it, and mentally activate the spell. We're going to the main house. The Dark Lord is currently residing with the Lestranges. It's an honor. Today's success will elevate the Lestrange family Malfoy won't gloat for long. They levitated me, moving for about five minutes through long corridors before stopping. We can't take her in like this. Rodolphia said, and I felt myself being pulled upright. Expecting the finite incantatum, I controlled my stiff limbs to clasp my hands, ready to escape. But I underestimated the lingering effects of the Petrificus Totalus and Rodolphius's speed. Incarcerous. Ropes shot out, binding me tightly, almost cutting into my arms. Still immobile, I cursed inwardly, struggling to stand on my stiff legs, thinking of my next move. A force pushed me forward I stumbled and turned to glare. It was Bellatrix, looking at me like a lamb to the slaughter, gloating, and malicious. My poor little cousin, so helpless. Ha! Bellatrix laughed, instructing Catherine to watch me as she and Rodolphius approached a grand double door. The Dark Lord was inside. The doors opened eerily, and Bellatrix and Rodolphius entered respectfully. Catherine pushed me forward with her wand, head bowed. Rodolphius, Bellatrix, oh. And little Catherine, a seductive voice said, I assume you bring good news uninvited. May Crab report first. Of course, my lord. Rodolphius bowed deeply, stepping aside. Oh. Master. I failed to bring Severus Snape to you as ordered. I beg your punishment. The man named Crab trembled. His task was to bring Severus. The Dark Lord wanted him. Naturally, Severus refused. Crab must have tried violence and failed, likely suffering for it. The Dark Lord paused. Crab must have been petrified, the pressure radiating from the center palpable. Hmm, I'll deal with you later. The Dark Lord's displeased tone dropped the temperature. Rodolphius, who did you bring? Don't waste my time, or you'll face the consequences. She's a recent Gryffindor graduate. We suspect she's with the Order, possibly useful as a spy. Rodolphius answered respectfully. Such a person should be handled before brought to me. Still untamed. The voice sounded dangerous, hinting at imminent anger. More than that. Master, Rodolphius hurriedly added, she's Severus Snape's wife. Since Snape refused, we could use her to make him comply. OHIC. The voice drawled, interested, pleased. Gryffindor girl, come forward. I tried to move my bound arms, inching forward. All attention on me, I dared not rush. Catherine pushed me, my shaky steps barely advancing. The double-sided mirror vibrated Severus. He knew I was missing. So timid for a Gryffindor. Interesting. Lift your head. The commanding tone allowed no refusal. I suppressed my rising fear, yet it felt as if an invisible hand forced my head up, meeting red glowing eyes. A penetrating gaze shot into my mind. Legilimency. I immediately erected mental barriers, using a clemency to block the spell. Perfect acclimency made defenses invisible, showing misleading memories to deceive the caster. But against this foe, I had no confidence. The mirror still vibrated. Severus would use the port key soon. Their target was Severus. 
Please, don't come, Severus. Chapter 57 I resisted the intense mental probing, my head splitting with pain, desperately clinging to my mental defenses. Then, suddenly, all the pressure vanished. Gasping for breath, I warily watched the Dark Lord, careful to avoid his eyes. Only now did I notice the bloodshot red eyes set in a pale, waxy face twisted in a grotesque expression utterly terrifying. How did his followers worship him so blindly? Judging by the Dark Lord's attitude toward his followers, it was clear that his organization was one of absolute tyranny. Seeing Crab's reaction, perhaps they followed out of fear rather than loyalty. You are surprisingly resistant. Perhaps I forgot to use the proper curses, the Dark Lord mused with a hint of irritation. Have you ever experienced the Cruciatus Curse? It's designed to cause excruciating pain, making one scream in agony. I quite enjoy using it. He twirled his wand casually, as if discussing the weather. I shuddered, sweat trickling down my temples. My body remembered the pain from Catherine's recent Cruciatus Curse. My current state couldn't withstand another, let alone one from the Dark Lord himself. Wait. I give up I trembled, bowing my head. My bound body wavered, shivering with fear. Please don't torture me. I'll tell you everything I know just promise not to harm me or Severus. Master. Don't trust her. She's saying this to avoid the Cruciatus. Bellatrix passionately argued, her wand aimed at me, Crucio. I braced myself for the impending loss of my child but found the spell blocked. Since when do you make decisions for me, Bellatrix? The Dark Lord's tone was dangerously low. I let my tears flow freely, releasing the pent-up fear. I trembled, naturally portraying someone scared into submission. Why yes, Master Bellatrix stammered, her explanation cut short. I risked a glance, seeing the Dark Lord's eyes narrowed, his aura menacing. I prayed Bellatrix would continue to anger him, while cautiously struggling with my bound hands. The mirror had vibrated for the second time I didn't have much time left. The ring heated up, signaling the port key activation. It was too late I nervously scanned the space around me. Seconds later, a black figure materialized a few steps away, the air twisting around him. Everyone was startled. I gasped, using the distraction to stumble back a few steps. Severus, now the center of attention, appeared, and I could only move away to avoid distracting him. I moved behind Catherine's left, struggling against the ropes, gaining a small degree of freedom. Severus landed in a defensive stance, his expression turning icy upon seeing me. He quickly engaged in defense, evading and countering curses with precision. The room filled with a cacophony of flashing spells. Bellatrix, her husband, and Crab teamed up against Severus. Catherine watched me, but her attention kept shifting to the fight, underestimating me. The Dark Lord, from his throne, seemed to enjoy watching the three-on-one battle, showing no intention of intervening. Snape! Crab recognized Severus. Your wife is in our hands. Behave, or else. Everyone turned to me. In the chaos, I had retrieved a small knife hidden in my left sleeve and cut the remaining ropes, ready to act. I slashed at Catherine's wand hand, blood splattering. Her scream pierced the air as her wand fell. She tried to retrieve it, but I grabbed her hair, kicking the wand away. She clawed at my hand, screaming in pain. Petrificus totalus. Bellatrix's furious shout sent a red beam toward me. I used Catherine as a shield. Her scream abruptly stopped, her body stiff and lifeless. Taller than me, she served as an effective barrier. I quickly searched her for my wand. Thanks for the shield. I taunted, drawing Bellatrix's attention away from Severus. He fought valiantly but was clearly struggling against the three. He had been hit a few times, his condition worsening. Out of the way, Catherine. Finite incantatum. Bellatrix lifted the spell, trying to remove Catherine between us. I found my wand just as Catherine's body softened. Before I could react, I cast another Petrificus Totalus. Glancing at Severus, I saw him slow, his face pale, breathing heavily. Crab was already down, unmoving. Rodolphus's right hand hung limp and bloody, 
his left still wielding a wand. The Dark Lord watched from his throne, his fingers caressing his wand, eyes glinting with battle lust. He seemed ready to join the fray, which would leave us no chance to escape. Achio Catherine. Bellatrix screamed. I pushed Catherine toward Bellatrix, blocking her view. Bellatrix impatiently flung Catherine aside with her wand. I had been waiting for this moment. Aguamenti. A high-pressure jet of water hit Bellatrix's face, catching her off guard. The force pushed her back, disrupting her vision and breathing. She flailed, choking. I turned the jet toward Rodolphius, targeting his face. His shield charm deflected it. Severus. Go. I knew he wouldn't leave without me. Increasing the water pressure, I swept it toward Rodolphius and the Dark Lord, spinning on the spot to disapparate. In the final moment, I heard a furious voice, Crucio. Dizzy, I stood in my foyer, feeling no pain. Maybe the curse missed. Disoriented, I struggled to gather my thoughts. With a pop, Severus appeared beside me, pale and tense. He grabbed my arm, inspecting me. He saw the blood on my wrists from the ropes. Are you hurt? Where else are you injured? I'm fine I started, but Severus cut me off. But you cried. His eyes focused on my tear-streaked cheeks. I paused, forcing a smile, that was just an act. You don't look well, where are you hurt? Let me see. Severus relaxed slightly, resting a hand on my shoulder, the other against the wall, sinking with exhaustion. Help me inside first. I looked down and saw a dark stain spreading on the deep red carpet from Severus's feet. He was bleeding. Using my wand, I levitated him to avoid aggravating his wounds. The short distance from the foyer to the living room was marked by dripping blood. In the living room, I conjured a bed, placing Severus on it. He had lost too much blood and was unconscious. Removing his clothes, I saw a grievous wound on his left thigh, as if a chunk of flesh had been gouged out, blood oozing steadily. It looked like a minor splinching from a failed apparition. Severus never failed at apparition. The Cruciatus curse must have hit him, causing him to lose focus. The thought terrified me. A worse splinching could have been disastrous. I quickly cast a spell to stop the bleeding, then rushed to the potion's cabinet. A rough inspection revealed two major injuries, the thigh wound and a large bruise on his right chest and abdomen, likely a broken rib. Hopefully, no internal injuries. I brought all potentially useful potions, rushing back to Severus. After administering a blood replenishing potion, his color improved. He should wake soon. Confirming the rib fracture, I used a spell to mend it, then gave him additional potions, completing the initial treatment. I took a stabilizing potion for myself, still feeling a dull ache in my abdomen. Pushing through the pain, I used the flu network to connect to the Hogwarts hospital wing. Poppy. Are you there? Sticking my head into the spinning flames was uncomfortable. Oh, Sawyer. What happened? Madame Pomfrey appeared within view. Can you come over? Severus and I are hurt. He needs Dittany. Do you have any prenatal potions? I'm pregnant, and the baby's at risk. We only have stabilizing potions. My calm surprised even me. Merlin's beard. I'll prepare the potions and come immediately. Madame Pomfrey exclaimed. I withdrew from the flu, adjusting the house's defenses to allow her entry. Lying on the sofa, I gently touched my still flat stomach. Inside was a fragile life, already enduring a port key journey, a cruciatus curse, and an apparition. Hang in there, little one. Madame Pomfrey arrived quickly, shocked by the blood. Confirming we were not in immediate danger, she handed me a small bottle of amber liquid. Drink this. Lie down, I'll examine you. Her diagnostic spells cast a warm, purple glow over me. Take this dreamless sleep potion. You need rest. Don't worry about Severus. With me here, neither of you will be harmed. If you want to keep the baby, drink the potion and sleep. Drinking the potion, the sofa transformed into a comfortable bed. Madame Pomfrey busied herself, muttering about troublesome children. 
We were safe now. With that thought, exhaustion took over, and I fell into a deep sleep. Chapter 58 I woke up groggily, feeling the bandages on my injured leg and the dizziness from blood loss. As I opened my eyes, I saw Madame Pomfrey cleaning the bloodstains in the living room. Sawyer. I called out, accidentally pulling at my wounds and gasping in pain. Pomfrey waved her wand and rushed over, forcing me to lie back down. I scanned the room, but Sawyer wasn't there. Sawyer is upstairs. She needs plenty of rest, she said. Pulling back the blanket, she inspected my injuries. I noticed I was only wearing undergarments, and quickly grabbed my pajamas lying beside me. You're recovering well. Sawyer did an excellent job with the first aid. But how could you let Sawyer get into such danger? Do you realize that if you had been even half an hour later, you might have lost her and the baby? I can't imagine what you two went through to end up like this. Pomfrey's barrage of questions hit me hard. The mention of Sawyer's danger made my heart clench. How is she? I couldn't wait for her answer. I needed to see Sawyer with my own eyes. Lie down. Pomfrey's shout was nearly a roar. They are both fine now, but need absolute rest. You need to deal with the remaining issues. I've informed Albus, he'll be here soon. You should talk to him about what happened. They. Did I miss something while I was unconscious? Who else was there? Of course, they. She looked at me reproachfully. Though it's just an embryo, it's your child. You'd better get used to having another member in your family. Had I just heard correctly? A child? You didn't know. Pomfrey's exclamation made me realize I had spoken my thoughts out loud. She looked wide-eyed before mumbling, maybe I wrongly accused you. Why hasn't Sawyer told you? This should be something for her to tell, but you need to understand the situation in short, Sawyer is over a month pregnant. To be precise, 47 days. You're going to be a father. Pomfrey ended with a smile. I guessed my expression was stupidly blank as I stared at her. Sawyer, what's wrong? Nothing, I have good news to tell you later. When can you come home? Was this the good news she wanted to share? I recalled her excited tone. She must have been so happy she let her guard down, and got captured, along with our child. What had she endured this afternoon? When I found her, bound and tear-streaked, I loathed myself. I knew she could be targeted by maniacs, I knew there were dangers everywhere, yet I let her go to ST. Mungo's alone. If I had come home earlier, realized she was missing sooner. Severus. Pomfrey's voice pulled me from my thoughts. Stop blaming yourself. You did all you could under the circumstances. Now that they are both safe, you should be glad. I silently got up again. This time, Pomfrey didn't stop me. She sighed, I suppose you won't rest until you see her. Be careful, don't strain yourself. Your wounds are still fresh. She levitated me to the second floor, into our bedroom. I saw Sawyer lying on the bed, her breathing steady and calm. Gently, I kissed her forehead and left the room. I summoned Tito, who was fortunately at my in-law's house, and quickly prepared some food. Just after finishing, Dumbledore arrived. Severus, can you tell me exactly what happened? Dumbledore looked unusually serious. I nodded and recounted the events. After receiving Sawyer's mirror call, I continued with the final steps of the Felix Felici's potion as planned. It should have taken another half an hour, but I couldn't wait, so I left it to dam and hurried home. When I found Sawyer missing, I had a bad feeling. Unable to contact her, I feared the worst and activated the port key. The moment I landed, I was attacked. Bellatrix, Rodolphius, Crab, and the Dark Lord himself were there. The oppressive atmosphere made it clear who he was. Engaged in a fierce battle against three Death Eaters, I didn't have a moment to speak. Fearing they'd use Sawyer against me, I was relieved when she freed herself and took the initiative. The Dark Lord observed without intervening, seemingly intrigued. Ultimately, it was Sawyer's unexpected actions and the Dark Lord's arrogance that allowed us to escape. This undoubtedly angered him escaping right under his nose was a significant slight. 
Dumbledore was surprised at my handling of three dark wizards. Madame Pomfrey mentioned my injuries a broken rib and other minor wounds, and the splinching caused by interrupted apparition. Dumbledore nodded, understanding our disheveled state. I didn't need to mention that I'd nearly incapacitated Rodolphus's right hand permanently. I couldn't be sure why Sawyer was captured only she could explain once she awoke. When Dumbledore finished his questions, it was my turn. I angrily asked about the so-called protection, pointing out that Sawyer had been taken before returning home, as there were no signs of intrusion. The thought terrified me Sawyer enduring the Cruciatus curse, prolonged binding, and possibly other attacks such dangers for a pregnant woman. I could have lost our child, even her. I'm deeply sorry, Severus. We overlooked something. She was taken before she could use the flu from his tea. Mungos. Dumbledore's regret seemed genuine, but I wasn't ready to let this deadly oversight slide. I want to take Sawyer away from the UK until the baby is born. I demanded. The Order needs you both. The cause of light and justice needs you. Predictably, he refused to let us go. I wanted to shout that light and justice meant nothing to me. Snakes thrive in darkness. For our child, Sawyer would agree to leave no sense of justice could overpower a mother's love for her child. For potions, Damocles will suffice. I can close the shop he only needs to brew for the order, which isn't too demanding. With Remus around, there's no conflict of interest. You can hide, Severus, without leaving the UK. We'll ensure Sawyer's safety during her pregnancy. I've spoken to her mentor at Esti. Mungos. He's willing to continue her lessons at your home. I don't think Sawyer wants to give up her dreams. The great white wizard was bargaining, using Sawyer's well-being as leverage. I remain stone-faced, not responding. We can provide a secure location, protected by the Fidelius charm, with me as secret keeper. How about that? Dumbledore blinked, smiling slyly. I had to admit, the offer tempted me. Leaving the country wasn't ideal. Long travel would strain Sawyer's body port keys and apparition were risky during pregnancy. I suggested leaving only to negotiate better terms. Dumbledore's offer was perfect. Finding a secure hideout on our own wasn't too hard, but this ensured greater safety. Think it over. You'd only need to continue brewing potions and occasionally attend order meetings. Can we now disclose your allegiance? Since you've already. He gestured meaningfully. Yes, since we had openly defied the Dark Lord, we had no choice but to side with Dumbledore. The realization left me irritated but powerless to change it. Deal, Professor Dumbledore. I forced a smile. Oh, I'm no longer your professor. Call me Albus, Severus. The white-bearded wizard's warm, friendly demeanor returned. Chapter 59 I woke up feeling refreshed from the potion-induced sleep. I wasn't sure how long I had slept, but I felt much better. The injuries on my hands from the bindings were healed, and I didn't feel the post-sleep weakness proof the potion had worked. Turning my head slightly, I saw Severus sitting in an armchair beside me. He must have heard me stir. You're awake. How are you feeling? He gently helped me sit up and handed me a glass of water, which was still warm must have kept it that way for me. I'm fine. How about you? Are your injuries okay? How did we escape the Cruciatus curse? And how did you get splinched? His face was pale, and blood had been pouring out earlier, but I knew that as long as he took a blood replenishing potion in time, external injuries wouldn't be an issue. Still, I pulled up his pajama leg to check the wound. The wounds are healing well, and I've taken the potions. I'm more worried about you and the baby. Severus's voice was filled with concern, and he tightened his embrace. I fell silent, feeling guilty. My carelessness had put us in such danger, and our baby had almost luckily, the baby was fine, but I would have never forgiven myself otherwise. We sat quietly for a while, neither of us speaking. I'm sorry we both said at the same time. I straightened up and met Severus's gaze. I'm sorry. It was my fault. Before I could finish, Severus interrupted, pulling me back into his arms. No need to say more. We're all right now. 
I suddenly felt a profound sense of relief. Madame Pomfrey soon came in to check on me. Everything was fine, but she warned me to be extremely careful for the next few months as the baby was still very fragile. After the checkup, she didn't rush us out, only reminding me to rest well. She glanced at Severus before leaving, giving us some private time. I appreciated her thoughtfulness. I placed Severus's hand on my belly, which was still flat and didn't yet show any sign of pregnancy. Severus seemed hesitant to leave his hand there, but I held it in place and teased him, it's not made of glass. It won't break. Soon enough, it will grow, and you won't be able to hold my waist like this. He sighed, still looking a bit odd. Pregnancy and childbirth are the greatest magic, Sawyer. I love you. Hearing such a sudden declaration of love, I froze for a moment, then hugged him tightly. I love you too, Severus. Careful. From now on, no more dangerous moves, no running or jumping. You should stay in this room, lie down. I'll bring you some books. Severus commanded. There went my freedom did I really need to be bedridden. Before I could argue, he made the final decision. That's settled. Rest well. We're moving to a safer place soon. I'll take care of everything. Now, lie down. Such a dictatorial Severus. I felt both frustrated and sweetly content. Wow. I looked at the upscale car that seemed out of place in our surroundings. Thankfully, there was no one around to cause a scene. This is a car borrowed from Benji. He's a muggle-born, so he's more familiar with these things than we are, Dumbledore explained, introducing us to the driver, Benji Fenwick, who seemed quite cheerful. My cousin works in a government office the muggle one. Borrowing a car is no big deal. And yes, I have a driver's license, so rest assured. He smiled widely, showing all his teeth, even the molars. Suppressing my laughter, I thanked him, and we got into the shiny black car. The ride was smooth. We passed through the bustling city, then fewer and fewer houses appeared as the road narrowed, eventually stopping in an open field. After the car left, it was just Dumbledore, Severus, and me with our minimal luggage. Dumbledore handed us a piece of paper, indicating we should read it. In an ornate script, it read, The Place Where the Phoenix Lands. As we read the words, a house with a front yard appeared on the empty field. Welcome to the headquarters of the Order of the Phoenix. Dumbledore waved, smiling at us. Severus's expression was sour. This is the secure place you're providing. Indeed. I am the secret keeper here. It's perfectly safe. He smiled innocently. One person can only keep so many secrets, and I already have this big house on my mind. Adding another would be difficult. This place is secure, and I haven't broken my promise. I wasn't sure what deal they had made, but Severus didn't seem pleased. Shall we take a look inside? I suggested cautiously. Of course, let's go in, Dumbledore said, leading the way. Severus looked grumpy, but I squeezed his hand and pulled him forward. The house was spacious, simple, and quiet, with no one else around. Dumbledore showed us around the first floor, highlighting the kitchen, meeting room, and a newly set up potion lab. Then, he took us to our room on the third floor. This room has a private bathroom. It's also enchanted to be more spacious inside. If it gets too noisy downstairs, just close the door. It's your private space. No need to worry about privacy. The greatest white wizard turned into a real estate agent, giving us a detailed tour and emphasizing how perfect the place was for us. His bright blue eyes seemed to say that not moving in would be our loss. I admired his persistence. If he ever lost his job in the wizarding world, he could certainly find work in the muggle real estate market. We ended up moving in. The headquarters wasn't usually crowded, as most order members had their own homes and only gathered here for meetings. The first night we moved in, there was an order meeting. Some members looked wary of us but didn't say anything, indicating Dumbledore had prepped them. They might not trust us, but at least they wouldn't cause trouble. I didn't attend the meeting, and Severus sent me upstairs, claiming I wasn't feeling well. Food at the headquarters was usually prepared by the women attending the meetings. 
After we moved in, I brought Tito to handle the meals, proving the allure of good food. More people stayed for dinner, praising Tito's cooking, with some nostalgically comparing it to Hogwarts meals. Even their attitude towards us became much friendlier. I couldn't help but laugh, grateful for Tito's culinary skills. Life was dull while I was on bed rest. Severa spent his days in the potion lab, coming out occasionally to comfort my boredom. My severe reaction to potion fumes meant I couldn't go near the lab. Oddly, Severus carried a faint medicinal scent after coming out of the lab, but it wasn't too bothersome once he changed clothes. I might have gotten used to it, as his unique scent mixed with the faint medicinal smell was quite comforting. Lily was busy with aura training in her upcoming wedding in a few days, leaving her no time to visit. I didn't want to bother her with mirror calls. Occasionally, I'd use the flu network to talk to my parents, though leaning into the fireplace was tiring and couldn't be done too often. Burns came to teach me in the afternoons after work and left after dinner. Severus also subscribed to various magazines for me, including medical, lifestyle, and even gossip ones. It gave me something to do, but the days were still dull. Maybe my boredom was too intense, because after attending Lily's wedding, another wizard family moved in. The Weasleys were a large family with three lively boys, the oldest barely seven and the youngest just turned one. Molly had recently become pregnant again. I remembered Severus preparing a batch of prenatal potions for the shop shortly before our incident, leaving only a few for Madame Pomfrey, who had said Mrs. Weasley was expecting. Luckily, it was just enough to keep our baby safe, making me very fond of the newly pregnant Mrs. Weasley. Molly was experienced, and chatting with her became my daily routine. Her husband Arthur worked in the ministry, and though he had a humble position, he was a typical nine-to-five worker. With Severus in the potion lab all day, Molly and I, both pregnant, spent our days chatting and minding the children. The house became noisier with more children, and Severus initially left the lab door slightly open to hear any commotion outside. But eventually, he couldn't stand it and closed the door, possibly adding a silencing charm. I had to use the two-way mirror to call him. One night, I joked, what if we have half a dozen children? This house would be lively. Severus groaned, burying his head in the pillow. Oh, if that's what you really want I might get a headache. I giggled. If they take after you, they'd be much quieter. He continued trying to bury himself in the pillow. Okay, I was joking. Honestly, I think one more would be Finny a boy and a girl. What do you think? I asked seriously. Severus turned to me, thinking. That sounds reasonable. If you think it's good, then it's fine. He seemed relieved. I couldn't help but feel a surge of affection for him. Severus was just too adorable. My belly gradually started to show. At three months, Madame Pomfrey and Molly conducted a detailed checkup. We discovered Molly was expecting twin boys. She seemed momentarily disappointed they weren't girls but quickly moved on to sweet talk with Arthur. I overheard Arthur say, it's okay, the next one will be a girl. I counted on my fingers. Including the baby, they already had five children, planning for another one. I whispered to Severus, wondering if they'd keep having more kids if the next one was a boy. Severus seemed to view them with awe, perhaps admiring their endurance for so many children. During my checkup, the result made us both gasp. Two pairs of twins in one day, I'm honored, Madame Pomfrey joked. Why do you get a girl in one go? It's unfair. Arthur and Molly were visibly jealous. If you're jealous, how about a trade? You get a boy, and we get the girl I teased. No. I disagree. Both men spoke simultaneously. Arthur quickly hugged his wife, wary of my joke. Severus glared at me, clearly unwilling to trade our daughter. I couldn't help but laugh. Such adorable dads. Chapter 60 After the third month of pregnancy, my belly started to noticeably swell. My body felt heavier, and I grew lazier, often feeling lethargic, though my appetite remained strong. As winter approached, on sunny days, Molly and I would sit outside and chat, basking in the sun. Both of us were as big as balloons, and if we compared, we would find our bellies to be exceptionally large. 
Her children were quite well behaved, especially the older boys. Seeing their mother struggling with a large belly, they would take the initiative to look after five-year-old Charlie. They played with their toys and even took care of the toddler who was just learning to walk. Watching him take a few steps was one of our daily joys. During Order of the Phoenix meetings, we would take the children upstairs to avoid hearing about the harsh realities of war. Every night, my favorite routine was holding Severus's hand to feel my large belly. Together, we would enjoy the growth of our children. From the first time we felt the baby's heartbeat to the first kicks, Severus would talk to them. Even though he often didn't know what to say, I asked him to find a simple, interesting book to read aloud. He ended up reading from 1000 Magical Herbs and Fungi, which nearly put me to sleep, so I demanded a different book. He then spent quite some time researching books and ordered a few from a bookstore. When the package arrived, I opened it to find titles like Introduction to Potions, Fun Learning, Playing and Learning Potions, and the slightly more normal The Tales of Beetle the Bard. I was left speechless. Was Severus trying to groom potion masters from the womb? To avoid having a potion illiterate like me, he wanted to immerse them from an early age. Thus, I lived a life filled with both happiness and mild frustration. Each night, Severus's deep, calming voice would lull me to sleep with potion books, and I had to struggle to stay awake to support him. Such a wonderful life. Molly and I were both due in April, with her due date a week before mine. We stayed at the Order headquarters, ready for childbirth, with Madame Pomfrey available via the FLU network. If there were any delays, Molly's experience combined with my training as a healer would suffice. On April 1, about half a month early, Molly went into labor. Calmly, she lay down and asked me to notify Arthur. It happened to be a Saturday, so Arthur wasn't at work. He rushed to get Madame Pomfrey, fumbling around in a panic, unlike a man who had been through three childbirths. I was initially kicked out of the delivery room to avoid being scared into early labor myself. The birth went smoothly. Hearing the good news from the next room, I felt relieved. The successful delivery of Molly's twins calmed my nerves. The two tiny babies, wrapped in blankets embroidered with their names, were named Fred and George. Though their hair was a bit light, the fiery red marked them as Weasleys. Watching the happy family, with Arthur hugging his exhausted wife and the babies beside her, I leaned into Severus. We had our happiness too. Two weeks later, on April 16, after much pain, I gave birth to twin girls. Both had black hair, and when they opened their eyes, I was delighted to see they had inherited Severus's dark eyes. We named them Roy and Joanna. Our home now had two little angels. Though they sometimes fussed and cried, it was normal for babies. I happily overlooked my past annoyance with noisy children. Severus adored our daughters. Though he never said it, his actions showed his love coming out of the potion lab first to see them, patiently soothing them at night while I often fell asleep first. Being first-time parents of twins was chaotic. Thankfully, Molly's advice kept me from making too many mistakes. Roy, the elder by five minutes, was the more active one, often waking us at night. Joanna was usually woken by Roy's cries and would join in. During the day, Roy was livelier, while Joanna preferred to sleep. Severus enjoyed reading potion books to Joanna, as Roy couldn't sit still for long and would get fussy. Joanna, however, would sit quietly in Severus's arms, eventually falling asleep to his soothing voice. When the babies were a month old, we had a small celebration. Many Order members attended, and the twins were the stars, winning everyone's hearts. Fred, George, and Roy got along well, crawling around the carpet, creating a lively scene. Several young Order members, including James and his friends, entertained them, laughing heartily. Joanna's quiet demeanor made the women fawn over her. Lily held her, joking about making her a daughter-in-law. I sipped my tea, telling her to have a son within three years or I wouldn't agree. Watching Joanna being gently handled, her temperament reminded me of Severus but without his cold demeanor. Roy's liveliness seemed more like me, though I wasn't sure. In this second life, I had become more active to make up for lost time, and I wasn't sure which personality was truly mine. Perhaps if Severus had grown up in a normal wizarding family, without the unfair treatment, he might have been a lively child. 
but that wouldn't be the severest I knew, and we might not have met or been together. Life has no ifs. It is made up of various coincidences and choices. I spotted Severus in the distance, discussing something with Damocles, likely potions. Seeing him so spirited made me smile. Regardless of what ifs, I cherished everything I had now. We returned home after that, as it wasn't ideal to stay at headquarters indefinitely. Before leaving, we dismantled all defenses except for muggle repelling and disillusionment charms, making the house look abandoned. When we returned, the place was a mess, indicating someone had broken in and vented their frustration. Hopefully, this ruse would fool any Death Eater scouting the place. While cleaning up, Severus found a suspicious blank piece of parchment in our bedroom nightstand. Using a revealing charm, a line of text appeared. Severus, if you're reading this, I want to remind you, there's no need to leave resources for the enemy. Our great lord agrees. I assume you and your family have chosen sides. We serve different masters now. If we meet on the battlefield, I won't be surprised. Take care. Your friend. It's Lucius's handwriting. It seems the Dark Lord's men have been here. Severus burned the note, and we watched it turn to ash. Does this mean it's safe here? I asked. Great, I really don't want to move. Let's start cleaning. I cheerfully waved my wand, clearing the dust. We cleaned the house together, and Tito prepared a nursery next to our bedroom, setting up monitoring charms to alert us of any baby movements. During my months of bed rest, I had completed my ST. Mungo's training. I had another six months of internship before becoming a certified healer. With the twins, Severus and I decided I would continue the internship after they turned one. Severus would spend most of his time in the potion lab, with Tito caring for the babies and Severus checking in on them regularly. In this year, we narrowly escaped the Dark Lord once again. In October, while talking to Lily via the two-way mirror, she mentioned that she and James had just fought off Death Eaters. James was injured and couldn't move. Madame Pomfrey was busy at school, and since I was free, I offered to help. Severus insisted on coming with me, leaving his potion work behind. I told Tito to take the twins to the Order headquarters if anyone tried to break in. When we arrived at the house in Hogsmeade, we found Caradoc Dearborn and a few Order members cleaning up after the battle. The Death Eaters had attacked Caradoc's family. His parents were already sent to ST. Mungos, having suffered greatly. James lay on the couch, leaning on Lily. When he saw Severus and me, he straightened up, dropping his sickly act. I found their relationship amusing. Severus was less polite, scoffing, our brave knight is resting in the princess's arms, how touching. If you're not seriously hurt, stop pretending. What's your injury? We don't have time to waste. Lily laughed, Severus, I missed your sharp sarcasm. My pleasure, Severus replied with a fake smile. James looked annoyed, and I quickly intervened, where are you hurt? It's not exactly an injury. I got hit with a curse that merged my foot with the floor. James pointed to his foot, which was stuck to the ground as if rooted. They had moved the couch over for him to rest on, explaining its odd angle. We tried cutting around the shoe, but it caused James pain, as if cutting part of his body, Lily explained, worried and distressed. Severus and I examined it, concluding it might be a failed dark curse. Before we could find a solution, there were explosions outside, followed by Caradoc's shout, Death Eaters. Chaos ensued as curses and spells flew everywhere. An order member was forced inside, followed by several Death Eaters. We were in trouble. James couldn't move, and we couldn't escape. Damn it! Potter! If we die because of you, you'll regret it. Severus glared at James, then got ready for battle. We fought side by side, Severus attacking while I defended. James and Lily couldn't move much, but James fought fiercely from his spot, and Lily protected him. I spotted familiar faces Catherine McNair and Lucius Malfoy. Catherine's eyes were filled with hatred as she saw me. Caradoc Dearborn, you should feel honored that I'm personally dealing with you, a magnetic, menacing voice announced. It was the Dark Lord. I didn't see him, 
but he must be outside confronting Caradoc. Stay focused. Severus's shield charm blocked a curse, pulling me back into the fight. Lucius was dueling us, but he seemed to have an understanding with Severus. Their curses were showy but easy to block. Occasionally, they'd intentionally take a minor hit, making the fight manageable. I kept an eye on Lily, casting shield charms as needed. But Merlin didn't want to make it easy for us. Catherine joined Lucius, her curses fueled by rage. Lucius, let me handle this woman. She demanded, casting a Cruciatus curse at me. Lucius warned another man, McNair, control your wife. I can handle two children alone. Catherine angrily targeted me, her curses imprecise due to her emotions. I barely dodged. Outside, I heard a chilling voice, Avada Kedavra. The green light illuminated the room, and I heard a body hit the ground. My heart sank. Caradoc. Chapter 61 With ease, the woman outside was taken down. She was supposed to be one of your phoenix heavy hitters. Huh, wake up and see the situation. One of the Death Eaters shouted arrogantly, his hood up, but his voice sounded somewhat familiar. Ha! Huh. Yes, a great person indeed, such a proud achievement. James laughed angrily, sending a powerful silent curse at the target, knocking him far back into a wall and down to the ground. I noticed all this from the corner of my eye, marveling at James's strength. If not for his limited movement and his seeker's agility, dealing with him would have been difficult. Catherine attacked me, coming close to hitting me several times. Seems like we have an unexpected catch today, Voldemort's voice echoed not far away. I whipped my head around to see his predatory gaze fixed on me and Severus. Catherine, Lucius, stop. How can you be so rude to our friends? With a light glance, Lucius put away his wand and retreated respectfully. Catherine looked reluctant but dared not argue. The other Death Eaters also stopped, waiting for their master to speak. Our side backed away warily. I noticed someone near the window subtly casting a Patronus charm. Go find Dumbledore. I cursed myself for not thinking of it sooner. Dear Severus, our last unpleasant parting was due to my foolish servants. How could they think to threaten a Slytherin? I'm also surprised by your wife, Severus. It seems that Sawyer is a wise Gryffindor who knows when to bow to power. I appreciate that. Voldemort elegantly summoned three chairs. If we sit down and talk, we might reach an agreement, make a beneficial deal. Seeing Voldemort leisurely sitting, exuding immense pressure, made me shiver. Where is Dumbledore? How fast can a Patronus travel? We're quite a distance from the school I hope he gets the message soon. Severus pulled me to sit, his wand still firmly in his hand. Very well. To show my sincerity, I promise you greater power. Though you'll never surpass me, it will be enough for you to stand among the great wizards. When my kingdom is established, you will be heroes, holding esteemed positions. Your mixed blood status will no longer matter, and no one will dare look down on you. The perfect image of a devil, enticing one to tread the dark path. If not for my ties with our children, Severus would never have joined the Order of the Phoenix he might have sought power with Voldemort. But it wouldn't have been easy dealing with Voldemort's capricious nature and the punishments for failure. At least the old white wizard wouldn't harm us he'd only squeeze us dry. Severus and I had planned to stay safely in the background, and running into such a situation today was just bad luck. Indeed tempting. But what must I give in return? Making a deal with the devil usually requires one's soul as a sacrifice. What do I need to trade for what you offer? Severus spoke slowly, dragging out his aristocratic accent and buying us time. You must pledge your loyalty to me and bear my dark mark. He gestured to a hooded Death Eater, who rolled up his left sleeve to reveal a black tattoo-like Marcus skull and serpent, the snake seemingly alive. I controlled my urge to show disgust. It was ugly. I'd seen the dark mark hovering over attack sites ugly but intimidating. On an arm, it was just uglier. Severus didn't answer immediately. Voldemort, growing impatient, began toying with his wand. I, close to Severus, noticed sweat beating on his forehead. We couldn't stall much longer. Dumbledore, 
if you don't get here soon, I'll have Roy and the Weasley twins cut your beard off. Almost immediately, a burst of flames appeared in the room, and Fox, holding Dumbledore's hand, emerged. Voldemort seemed to understand instantly that Severus had been stalling for rescue, and his fierce glare at Severus made me worry. Dear Tom, why didn't you inform me of your visit to Hogsmeade? I could have invited you for tea, Dumbledore smiled benignly, his blue eyes twinkling dangerously behind his half-moon glasses. Also, I heard some unpleasant news. A loyal friend and former student of mine has fallen. She died at the hands of another who once called me professor. What do you think, Tom? As soon as Dumbledore appeared, Severus and I quickly retreated to James and Lily, seizing the moment to break James's curse. Dumbledore, I believe you're getting senile. My name is Voldemort, he hissed, the room's pressure dropping even more. Facing Dumbledore, Voldemort didn't make a move. The two of them seemed to be having a polite conversation, as if old friends catching up. Though temporarily safe, we needed to escape this situation quickly. We couldn't burden Dumbledore. Our allies stood guard in front of us, keeping an eye on the surroundings. We managed to free James's foot before the two leaders started their duel. With Dumbledore and Voldemort focused on each other, the six of us from the Order faced four Death Eaters. Despite their experience, our fresh skills and superior numbers quickly turned the tide. Voldemort's power was equal to Dumbledore's, but the old wizard's experience and composure gave him an edge. Though unable to defeat Voldemort, Dumbledore kept him in check. Frustrated, Voldemort finally let out an angry roar and disapparated with his followers, not forgetting to take the incapacitated crab with him. Though victorious, we felt no joy. We couldn't forget the one who had died at Voldemort's wand. During wartime, danger lurks constantly. A companion laughing with you today might be gone tomorrow. Dorcas's death happened right beside us, and we couldn't stop it. Benji Fenwick, who once drove us to the Order headquarters, had been missing for a week, likely dead. Frontline fighters like Lily and James were always in danger. Severus and I constantly worried about them, feeling relieved when they were merely injured, as it wasn't worse news. At least their aura training reduced their exposure to dangerous missions. Severus and I carefully avoided danger. Twice now, trouble had found us. Call it cowardice if you will we simply cherished our happiness too much. In April, I began my internship at ST. Mungos. My badge read, Trainee Healer, Sawyer Hill Snape. I was back with burns in the spell damage ward on the fifth floor. This time, I was more vigilant. After that incident, we adjusted the ring's activation method. Now, even if petrified, I could use the port key with a silent spell. I never saw Catherine at a stee. Mungo's again. Perhaps she was only there for a mission. She didn't seem suited for a healer's job, with her aggressive nature. She'd make a better warrior. Half a year of internship flew by, and I smoothly earned my certification, becoming an official healer at a stee. Mungo's in late September. Working there had regular hours, weekend shifts, holidays, and decent pay. It was a great job. One of my early patients was a man hit by a mixed curse, his head swollen like a balloon, twice its normal size. Examination, diagnosis, treatment it went smoother than I expected. After a month on the job, I discovered I was pregnant again. Severus, I bet it's a boy this time. I lay in Severus's arms, dreaming of a boy to complete our family. What if it's another girl? Severus probably recalled the Weasley's perseverance, fearing I'd say, next one will be a boy. If it's not a boy, we're done. Three kids are enough. I pouted, Severus always shattering my fantasies. He chuckled, three daughters are fine too. As long as there are children, I'll love them. Me too. I nuzzled against my human pillow, feeling sleepy. Get some rest. Remember to take leave tomorrow, Severus patted my back. Yes, sir. I don't really want to, though. I've only been working for a month. I muttered. No, you must. We can't risk another incident like before. Home is safer. I'll stay with you. Fine, nagging Severus. I made a face, just saying it for the sake of it. 
While resting at home, I contacted Lily via the two-way mirror, proudly sharing my pregnancy news. It was the weekend, and she was free, so she came over via flu. You guys are too efficient. I can't keep up. Lily complained, I'm in aura training. How will I? Finish training after having the baby. Everyone will understand. With low birth rates and high infant mortality, especially in wartime, new lives bring hope. You can't plan when you'll have a child. Maybe you're already pregnant. During such turmoil, it's even more dangerous. Unless you can protect it, don't have a child lightly. Lily pondered my words, then resolutely said, if a child chooses now to join us, James and I will protect it with our lives. War be damned no one will harm our child. I laughed at Lily's boldness. Let me check. Maybe you are pregnant, I joked, casting a detection spell on her abdomen. The results made my jaw drop. Lily, life is full of drama congratulations, you're going to be a mom. Chapter 62 Another Narrow Escape Lily and I had due dates only a week apart we joked about arranging to give birth together. This thought made us laugh, bringing back memories of when we were little girls, chatting and giggling non-stop. We also found out that Alice Longbottom was expecting, and Molly was five months along, expecting another boy. We gathered together, shared gossip, and talked about our pregnancy experiences. Being a mother again felt surreal. Last time, I was in Lily's shoes, excited and anxious, and now I was expecting my third child. At three months, we went for a checkup together and found out I was having a boy. I was content, holding little Roy, thinking she would soon have a baby brother. Roy laughed with me, flailing her arms and legs. Seeing her giggle with drool all over her face, I thought, my little angel. Life with Severus was peaceful. He occasionally went out to get supplies or visit Dumbledore's place, but I hardly left home, preferring the more stable flu travel over the dangerous apparition, especially as my belly grew. I spent my days reading, playing with the kids, and chatting with Lily through the mirror. Such tranquility felt unreal during wartime. But reality proved that Merlin wouldn't let us stay so calm. Molly's sixth son was just born, and I was planning to visit her. With my six-month pregnant belly, I put the twins down for their nap, instructed Tito to watch them, and slowly headed downstairs. Just then, the fireplace flared green, and Severus came home carrying his potion supplies. Let's visit the Weasleys. I want to wish her a daughter next time. I hung up my heavy cloak. Severus always tidied his potion supplies first to avoid exposing me to any toxic ingredients. I also suspected he didn't want me to ruin any precious materials. All right, let's rest a bit and then go. Severus helped me sit, carefully checking me and my belly. This was his routine every time he came home. I enjoyed the feeling of being cared for. The peaceful moment was shattered by several popping sounds outside someone operating. I wondered who could be visiting, knowing that only a few people from the Order knew our location. Instead of the doorbell, a loud blasting curse alerted us that something was wrong. Our defenses weren't just for show and should hold for a while, but the attackers were relentlessly trying to break through. I quickly summoned Tito to take the twins to headquarters and call for help. With wands always at hand, Severus and I readied ourselves to face the intruders. He protectively shielded me as we moved toward the fireplace, keeping our backs to the wall. I barely managed to grab some flu powder when the defenses fell, shaking the entire house. I clutched my belly, trying to stay steady. The door burst open, and several dark figures rushed in, a strong light beam aimed at us. Severus shielded me, but the fireplace behind us shattered. A flurry of spells made it hard for Severus to protect me while dodging. I held my wand in one hand, protecting my belly with the other, casting defensive spells from behind Severus. Our attackers were familiar faces Catherine and her husband, Antonin Dalahov. Another figure chilled us their leader, leisurely strolling to the center of the room, mocking our plight. Oh, your poor baby might die in your belly today. Catherine laughed sadistically. I could tell she was jealous pureblood families often had low fertility, except for the Weasleys. She cursed my child, knowing she might never have her own. What a pity. 
Babies are precious in the wizarding world. Dalahov jeered, then sneered, but hybrids like yours are just mongrels. Their deaths mean nothing. Rage flared within me, but I remained outwardly calm. I trusted Severus felt the same and would retaliate fiercely. The popping sound from outside signaled our backup. Moody, Lupin, Frank Longbottom, and Edgar Bones rushed in, seeing the chaos and the Dark Lord. Moody, Lupin, and Frank immediately engaged Voldemort, while Edgar came to our aid. A chaotic battle ensued. In the confined space, Voldemort struggled against three opponents. He was furious, fighting them while glaring at Severus and me with eyes redder than last time. He then bellowed, Avada Kedavra. As the green light streaked toward us, Severus couldn't dodge with me behind him. I tackled him to the side, casting a cushioning charm just in time, though my belly still felt uncomfortable. Brushing death left me trembling. Severus rolled us behind a toppled sofa. Go to the guest room, find a way to escape. Protect yourself. He darted out, drawing attention away from me. I needed to slip away using the guest room's fireplace. Under the disillusionment charm, I crept out, aiming to disarm Catherine. Hiding by the wall, I prepared to curse Catherine's hand when I heard Severus grunt. He'd been hit by a slashing curse on his left leg, losing his balance. Simultaneously, Avada Kedavra. Voldemort's curse aimed at Severus. How could he dodge midair? Instinctively, I cast Obstructo at Catherine, pushing her into the curse's path. Two bodies hit the floor. I froze until Severus, dragging his injured leg, stood up to fight back, and I regained my breath. Catherine. Dolohov screamed at her lifeless body. Finite incantatum. My curse had revealed my position. Voldemort's rage was palpable. You killed my loyal servant. Voldemort hissed. I trembled, unsure if I feared him or the truth in his words. Go, find Dumbledore. Edgar fought Dolohov, forcing him to redirect his attention. Edgar was strong and could handle Dolohov. The others, though injured, kept Voldemort occupied. But if he summoned more Death Eaters, we'd be doomed. As we prepared to leave, Voldemort, seething with rage, barked, Go! and disapparated. Dolohov, carrying Catherine's body, glared at me before leaving. I flinched at his malevolence. Back at headquarters, I was still in shock. The baby and I were fine, but Severus's leg was hurt. I shakily healed his wound, and he sent me to bed to rest. Severus dealt with the aftermath, talking to Dumbledore for a long time. Lying in the same room where I had once stayed during pregnancy, I couldn't sleep. Only the twins' gentle breathing and occasional murmurs filled the room. The thought that haunted may had killed someone. Death in war was common, and I was mentally prepared. But I was a healer, saving lives, not taking them. Yet, I had felt murderous intent towards Catherine and indirectly caused her death. My conscience screamed against my actions, accusing me of becoming cold-hearted. But my rational side knew I'd do it again to protect Severus and our children. In the quiet room, a soft cry broke the silence Joanna, followed by Roy. I sighed, Tito. Yes, Mistress Sawyer. Tito appeared by the crib, clearly on watch. Bring the babies to me. Holding my two soft bundles, I pressed my forehead against their cheeks, finding strength in their warmth. Severus returned, just as the girls were fussing for their father. Seeing him, they wobbled towards him, abandoning me. Daddy, Roy wants a hug. Roy reached Severus first. He picked up both girls, kissing them as they played with their toys on the bed. Sitting beside me, Severus pulled me into his arms. This position made us feel secure. It seems there's a traitor in the order. Our location was leaked. Chapter 63 There had been a spy within the Phoenix base, and in the past few months, several instances of information leaks had occurred. However, the people in the Phoenix base did not hold very high positions, and the leaked information had been relatively minor, though troublesome. Some suspected Severus, given that he was a Slytherin. When we were attacked due to our address being leaked, the suspicion naturally diminished. 
Dumbledore's members had been scrutinized, and no one seemed suspicious. If there wasn't an embedded spy, the scope wasn't small since the Phoenix base included core members, frontline fighters, and their families, totaling about 30 or 40 people. Those not counted were not necessarily good at keeping secrets. Therefore, anyone could be the traitor. This matter wasn't easy to clarify by investigating everyone one by one. Dumbledore apologized to Severus for the suspicion from others, stating he trusted Severus, who wouldn't like the Death Eaters and wouldn't be coerced. Severus conveyed this to me with an annoyed expression. I believed he disliked Dumbledore's penchant for guessing people's thoughts and always being right. Dumbledore wanted Severus to join the core team of the Phoenix base, to participate in combat secrets and decision-making. Despite his reluctance, Severus accepted. Working with the Griffinders must have been painful for him, but we all wanted to do something to end this war. Besides his personal achievements in potions, recognition and status within the Phoenix base were what Severus and our family needed. James was the only one from the group of four to enter the core team. He and Lily were both frontline fighters. I thought Dumbledore was grooming him as a young leader. He and Severus seemed to tolerate each other, maybe for official matters or for Lily and me. They could nod and smile politely, restraining from sarcastic remarks, which I found miraculous. Of course, I didn't expect them to become brotherly close. Severus roughly inspected our house in Spinner's End, which had almost become a ruin. Though magic repair was quick, we couldn't live there under the current circumstances. Dumbledore welcomed us to stay at the headquarters, but Severus refused. He didn't trust placing us in a place with a hidden traitor. Lily suggested we move to Godric's Hollow. The Potters had lived there for generations, with James being the only remaining descendant. James was born late to the elder Potter couple, who passed away within a few years after his graduation and marriage. Now, it was just him and Lily living there. Lily wanted us to move nearby for mutual care. Severus twitched his lips, though I would love to be Lily's neighbor, I can't stand having a Potter around. Occasionally meeting at the Phoenix base can be polite, but it doesn't mean we can be good neighbors. A few days later, Severus found a new residence. This time, we didn't intend to tell anyone except Dumbledore. This was to show trust and to have someone confirm we hadn't gone missing. The new place was in a muggle town not far from London. We were the only wizarding family there. It was a somewhat secluded cottage, simple, but I liked its atmosphere. The day before moving, I encountered a gloomy Sirius at the headquarters. He was unusually silent, sitting quietly aside. Curious, I pulled James aside to ask. We encountered Regulus in a conflict yesterday, their first meeting on the battlefield. Regulus's mask fell off during the fight, and Sirius recognized him. Their duel was intense, and no one could intervene. One cursed and attacked mercilessly, the other attacked silently but fiercely, showing no sign of brotherhood. James sighed, when the Death Eaters retreated, I saw Regulus look at Sirius with complicated eyes, and that look seemed to affect Sirius, making him sullen since yesterday. Sirius had left home in his fifth year, and since then, they had been estranged, ignoring each other even in school. I had always been friends with Regulus, occasionally chatting. He complained about Sirius's actions angering Mrs. Black, increasing pressure on him. But after Sirius left, Regulus never mentioned him again. We knew Regulus joined the Death Eaters after graduation. Sirius cursed a few times but never brought it up again. This was their first battlefield encounter, at least face to face as enemies. Sirius's reaction indicated he might still care about his brother, and Regulus's look conveyed some emotion that touched Sirius. What kind of emotion made the usually carefree Sirius so abnormal? I was curious and worried about Regulus. Sibling rivalry in war was cruel, and Regulus must be suffering too. After graduation, I exchanged a few letters with Regulus. Though he couldn't attend my wedding, he sent gifts and blessings. After joining the Death Eaters, we cut off contact due to different stances. But I still believed we were friends. After moving to the cottage, I hesitated for a few days before writing to Regulus, expressing concern and subtly mentioning Sirius's unusual behavior. I signed off as S. My post-marriage signature. 
A few days later, when I thought he wouldn't reply, I received a hurriedly written note. Thank you for your concern, my friend. Please protect yourself. Also, tell my brother, live well and carry on the black family line. Frowning, I felt an ominous vibe from the latter part. As the heir, why would he ask Sirius to continue the family line? Was he in danger? Though young Death Eaters valued him, and the black family was proud of him. Feeling uneasy, I quickly wrote a few words and sent the note to Sirius through James. That night, Sirius wrote back, asking for details. I told him all I knew, but it wasn't much more than he knew. Afterward, I didn't hear from Regulus, nor did Sirius find out anything. Until we heard that Regulus betrayed the Dark Lord and was killed. We were shocked, and Sirius didn't believe it, thinking the steadfast Regulus couldn't betray their highly supported Dark Lord. I believed Sirius couldn't accept his brother's death. Despite deep conflicts, they were blood relatives. Regulus's body was never found, and no one knew his true fate. On July 30th, my third child was born. We named him Evan Severus Snape. Evan, in Hebrew, means, gift of God. Hearing his healthy cries, I barely thanked Madame Pomfrey before falling asleep. Waking up in the evening, Severus was by my side, holding our son. Like his sisters, little Evan inherited Severus's black hair and eyes. His white face and gem-like black eyes were beautiful. The other two children were quietly watching from their crib. Severus must have taught them not to disturb my rest. Their eyes showed they wanted to interact with the new baby. Roy, Joanna, this is your brother Evan. Bringing them to the bed, little Evan waved his hands in the air, looking excited. The two heads crowded in front of me, staring at the smaller head in my arms. The one on the left hesitated before kissing the little guy, followed by the right one, leaving a slobbery mark on Evan's other cheek. Evan laughed, expressing his joy with a scream-like sound. After playing, Evan got tired, drank milk, and slept. The two older kids were sent to play in their room. I was starving, having eaten nothing all day, and devoured the food on my bed. Longbottom's boy was born at noon, I heard it went well, and the baby is healthy, Severus watched me eat, making me belatedly self-conscious about my ravenous eating. So, it's just Lily left. Wonder how long she'll take, I guess in the next few days. There had been many new lives recently. In June, Lucius's son was born, a boy, reported by the papers as the new heir of the Malfoy family. Severus anonymously sent the best child nutritional supplement with a note, gift to my friend Lucius. I believe they could recognize Severus's handwriting from the hidden S. S on the bottle. It didn't take long the next day, Lily gave birth. She showed me her baby boy through the two-way mirror. He had James's messy black hair and Lily's green eyes, inheriting his parents' iconic traits. I had to admit, this combination was cute, though not as adorable as my Evan. During the children's full moon celebration, we gathered at the headquarters and met the Longbottom boy. Alice's son was named Neville, chubby and cute. The three moms compared whose baby was the best, cutest. None could convince the others. Back home that night, Severus carefully placed Evan in his crib, then hugged me solemnly. Thank you, Sawyer. His breath tickled my ear. Thank me for what, giving you a son. I said lightly. Thank you for giving me a complete family. Severus released me, looking into my eyes. The deep, restrained love and tenderness in his black eyes intoxicated me. I kissed his lips gently, whispering, my pleasure. Chapter 64 Having three new lives at once was indeed something worth celebrating during such perilous times. This year's Halloween at the headquarters included a banquet, which was also a celebration. The first floor seemed to have been magically expanded to accommodate so many people. Decorated with large pumpkin lanterns and small bat-like decorations reminiscent of Hogwarts Halloween style, it made those of us who had left school feel nostalgic. Many people came, far more than the usual meetings of the Order of the Phoenix, where only a few members with tasks attended. In the center of the room was a square carpet, enchanted with protective spells, where two pairs of toddlers were playing with magical toys. I sat with a few other mothers, holding little Evan, 
chatting while keeping an eye on the situation on the carpet. I saw the big guy Hagrid approaching us. He was the gamekeeper at Hogwarts, coming from the school's banquet. Back in school, James and the others were quite familiar with him, while Severus and I usually avoided him when sneaking into the Forbidden Forest. We hadn't seen much of him since graduation. Such lovely little ones, so tiny, not even as big as my palm. Oh, look, little Harry is smiling at me. He's not afraid of me at all. What a brave little guy. Unlike Neville, who cried at the sight of Hagrid, Harry seemed happy, showing great interest in Hagrid's large, furry face, always reaching out to grab Hagrid's big beard. I thought he treated Hagrid as his new toy. Evan didn't seem to like the noisy environment, surrounded by laughing and talking people, disturbing his sleep. However, he was very well behaved and didn't cry, though his little face clearly showed, I'm not happy, I'm very unhappy, and no one could coax him. Nearby, Sirius and James were chatting, he's truly Snape's kid, just as unlikable as his father. My godson is still the most adorable. Ahem, I heard that, I glared at them, warning them not to talk badly about Severus and Evan. Sirius apologized with a laugh, without any sincerity. At this moment, the fireplace lit up with green flames, and Dumbledore stepped out, wearing his strangely aesthetic robes, having just come from the school. Let me see the children, our future hope, Dumbledore smiled, looking at the babies. Neville giggled at him, Harry joyfully tugged at his white beard, while Evan rudely kicked him in the face. Children are unpredictable, and this kick was quite impolite. Severus and I apologized profusely, while the old man just laughed. Such a lively little one, was his final comment on Evan. Severus thoughtfully handed me a glass of juice and took Evan from my arms. I really hope this ends soon, so we can have a quiet night at home. That would be much more comfortable, I whispered to Severus, leaning my head on his shoulder, Evan thinks so too, right? Evan responded with a bubble of saliva. Oh, it seems Evan has found a new game, I announced happily. Severus raised an eyebrow, a very skillful game. As if to prove this, Evan blew an even bigger bubble at his dad, which popped with a sound. Severus's face showed a mix of wanting to laugh, annoyance, pride, and fondness, making me laugh uncontrollably. An old wizard with a bow-tied beard interrupted our moment. I hope I'm not disturbing you. Severus, may I have a word with you in private? Dumbledore asked with his signature smile. Severus mumbled, as if I could refuse. The weight of little Evan returned to my arms as I watched them go upstairs, their figures disappearing around the corner. I wondered what Dumbledore wanted with Severus. Sawyer, um, can I hold little Evan? A hesitant voice said. I snapped back to reality. It was Peter, looking at me with his watery eyes, occasionally glancing at the baby in my arms. Knowing his animagus form was a rat, I felt his appearance was becoming more rodent-like. This timid Gryffindor was often overshadowed by James and the others, often overlooked. His expression showed he wanted to get close to the child but was too afraid. Of course, but be very careful, he's only three months old and very fragile, I gently encouraged him, teaching him the correct way to hold a baby, letting Evan lie in his arms. Peter was very nervous, his arms stiff. Oh. He's so soft, so light Peter stammered, overly excited. I saw Evan's face wrinkle, and predictably, he started crying the next second. Evan waved his arms and legs in protest in Peter's arms, not liking it. I quickly took the child back and comforted him, smiling apologetically at Peter, it's okay, Evan probably isn't used to being held by others. Peter, it seems it's your first time holding a baby. Haven't you held little Harry? Oh, James doesn't let me. He thinks I'm too clumsy. Peter lowered his head, looking a bit dejected. I wondered if I should comfort him, but awkwardly realized I didn't know much about him due to his weak presence. Well, maybe James is just too protective of his child. He might become the typical doting parent, I said, as Evan's soft humming brought my attention back to him. I smiled apologetically at Peter and focused on soothing my baby. When Severus and I took the children home, the twins were asleep on Severus's shoulders, and Evan was also sound asleep. We settled them in their comfortable cribs, setting spells that would detect any movements. 
As the spell covered Roy, Joanna, and then Evan, Severus's expression became serious, his brow furrowed, and he cast another detection spell on Evan. Evan has a tracking spell on him, Severus said coldly, immediately casting a spell to remove it. My heart sank. The traitor in the Order of the Phoenix must have approached Evan today. Thinking quickly, I realized I had held Evan almost all the time today, making it unlikely for anyone to leave a spell unnoticed. Except for the ten seconds Peter held him, but he didn't even take out his wand or act suspiciously. Then there was the photo session with the three babies on the sofa, surrounded by many people, possibly including the traitor. To be safe, I checked the other two children, Severus, and myself, in case anyone else had tracking spells. Someone might have already tracked us and is monitoring the house. But the alarm spells haven't been triggered, so they don't plan to alarm us yet. The tracking spell on Evan was weak and would disappear in a few hours even if I hadn't removed it. I don't know if it was a weak caster or intentional, Severus said in a low voice. His black eyes, often guarded or vacant, were now filled with worry. If we didn't find the spell within these hours, we wouldn't even know we were being tracked. If attacked unprepared. My eyes fell on the sleeping children, only Albus and Poppy know our address, making it hard to seek help. Severus, what do we do now? Should we leave immediately? No, running around is more dangerous. This house's defenses are much stronger than Spinner's End. Unless it's the Dark Lord himself, there's no need to fear. Finding a new place takes time, moving is troublesome, and someone might take advantage of the chaos. We'll adapt as needed and stay alert. Although we didn't plan to move, we needed to be ready to escape. I took out the space bags I had made recently, based on my seventh-year study notes while pregnant at home. A small backpack could hold as much as a standing wardrobe without weighing more than a regular backpack. Initially for passing the time, these now served a significant purpose. Packing several sets of clothes, essentials, Evan's temperature-controlled bottles, and auto-clean diapers, the twins' toy brooms, and dolls, everything shrank and went into the bag. Telling Tito to guard the children, I went downstairs to find Severus, eventually locating him in the potions room organizing potions. Pack these potions carefully, two types of poison and antidotes, corrosive water, be careful not to hurt yourself, Severus handed me several sealed vials with instructions. Silently, I packed the potions into the small space bag on my left arm, originally holding some medical potions, non-harmful. It seemed these would be essential from now on. Watching Severus pick out usable potions, it was a small portion of his collection. We packed as much as we could into our space bags, the rest into a potion chest, filling it to the brim. Adding another chest of Severus's precious potion ingredients, these two treasures couldn't be shrunk without affecting their properties. Fortunately, the space backpack's opening, designed with a spell, could automatically adjust to the size of the items placed inside. The two potion chests fit easily. With all important belongings packed, we could leave any time and return after shaking off any trackers. After all preparations, we finally went to bed around 2A. Severus, what did Albus want to discuss with you today? I almost forgot due to the tracking spell issue. He wants me to be the potions master at Hogwarts, Severus said flatly. Did you agree? Not yet, he asked me to think it over, I have time until September. Hogwarts is probably the safest place now. Severus, accepted, I propped myself up, searching for his eyes in the dark. Severus patted my head, sleep now, we'll discuss it tomorrow. All right, good night. Chapter 65 Good night. Sawyer seemed to want to say something more, but she obediently fell asleep. I squeezed her hand tightly, gently kissed her forehead, and watched her settle into a peaceful sleep. Sawyer's breathing gradually became steady and long, allowing me to relax as well. Enhancing the alert spell would ensure that I was immediately notified if any creature approached our house within a ten-foot radius. I could then rest and recover my energy. Reflecting on the conversation from a few minutes ago, I revisited the details, trying to find anything I might have overlooked at the time. Albus, did you bring me here just to smile foolishly at me? Of course not, Severus. I am here to extend an invitation. Would you be willing to come to Hogwarts to teach potions? 
The old wizard smiled kindly. I raised an eyebrow, feigning a smile. It seems I saw that job posting in the Daily Prophet a year ago. Is the position really that unpopular? Regrettably, we haven't found a suitable successor. Horace has been filing for retirement for three consecutive years and plans to leave directly at the end of the next academic year. Dumbledore's smile turned somewhat helpless as he conjured two armchairs. In fact, at the beginning of this year, a young person with good potion skills applied for the position. But I had reason to believe he was sent by Voldemort, so I refused him. Recently, that young man approached me again, stating that his only relative had been tortured to death by Voldemort for failing a mission. His hatred for Voldemort drove him to volunteer as a double agent for me. Although I cannot fully trust him yet, I want to give him a chance. If you accept the position of Potion's master, I will arrange for him to be your teaching assistant, and I believe the situation will be under our control. This Death Eater wanting to betray Voldemort must be a Slytherin, possibly someone I know. Allowing an untrusted Death Eater into Hogwarts. Is that really a wise decision? Seeming to take my silence as acquiescence, Dumbledore continued, the salary is negotiable. Besides that, we can provide a high standard potion laboratory, all necessary materials for teaching will be reimbursed, and a private dormitory. Oh, almost forgot, Dumbledore winked, his blue eyes full of amusement, as a professor, you can openly explore the forbidden forest without worrying about losing house points. The magical plants there will certainly enhance your personal collection. Was he implying that I used to sneak into the forbidden forest during my school days? Sawyer and I went there several times, more often alone. I thought we were discreet enough. Does this old man know everything? I thought angrily. Clearing my throat to dissolve the awkwardness of being caught, I stubbornly changed the topic. If it's a private dormitory, can I bring my family? Even with uncertainty, Hogwarts is safer than the outside. Dumbledore gave me a sympathetic but apologetic look. I'm sorry, the Board of Governors stipulates that non-school personnel are not allowed into Hogwarts without special approval. I can try to apply for an exception, but it is unlikely to be approved. In that case, Albus, you should know my answer, I said coldly. Leaving Sawyer and the children in danger while hiding in a safe fortress is something I could never do. The old wizard sighed softly. If it truly doesn't work out, I may have to let that young man take the potion's position. But don't rush to refuse. We have time until next September. Perhaps we can reach a consensus and find a perfect solution. You should know there's no place safer than Hogwarts. Indeed, Hogwarts, safer than Gringotts, home to the one person Voldemort fears the old fox standing before me. A voice in my head reminded me, it would be a pity to pass up this opportunity. Ignoring the prospect of teaching a bunch of disguised trolls, watching them destroy cauldron after cauldron of potions, if we could be under Hogwarts protection, I believe the war would only need a few more years. Defeating Voldemort and saving the world would have many people ready for the task. After much consideration, I spoke, suppose Sawyer could find a job at Hogwarts. Surely, there's space for three infants. In theory, yes. Minor children of staff members are allowed to reside at the school without other guardians. They can stay in the staff's private quarters until they receive their Hogwarts letter at age 11, Dumbledore explained gently. Currently, there is one potential teaching position that Sawyer could qualify for. Although it is currently filled, it will likely be vacant again next year. I had a premonition about what position it was. Yes, the defense against the dark arts professor. Though you may not believe it, I must dutifully say that the rumored curse does not exist. The past incidents were merely coincidental, Dumbledore stated formally, sounding unconvincing, as if he didn't believe it himself. I couldn't help but twitch my mouth. He shrugged nonchalantly. It's necessary to say this to prevent some from being scared off. Even so, some have been frightened by the rumor. I remember one year, the new professor was so stressed that he choked on his breakfast egg and passed out. Had he not isolated himself in his room, he would have received timely help. After recovering, he resigned and left with a phobia of eggs. Although it's a ridiculous rumor, I won't let Sawyer take even the slightest risk. I am, however, interested in breaking this rumor. 
I am confident in my defense against the dark arts abilities. I believe Sawyer would say the same, Dumbledore said smoothly. And you can teach defense against the dark arts, but Sawyer cannot teach potions. I was speechless. This might be worse than me teaching a bunch of disguised trolls. Are any other professors or staff planning to retire? I persisted, looking for a reason for Sawyer to stay at Hogwarts. Muggle studies, arithmancy Sawyer was good at those in school. Or library management. Madam Pants could use help managing the troublesome students. Why not hire someone to assist her? Professor Ramour is not retiring anytime soon Professor Victor, who teaches arithmancy. Just started a couple of years ago and shows no signs of leaving Madam Pants is not ready to give up her passion for disciplining noisy students and the medical wing has always had only one healer, Dumbledore's apologetic gaze met mine, blocking any further arguments. Promise me you'll consider it, my boy. Don't rush to decide. We will find a way that works for both. You know there's no safer place than Hogwarts, he said, his blue eyes twinkling, coaxing like he was talking to a child. You seem to forget to tell me about that Death Eater spy, I frowned, ignoring the strange comfort I felt. Such a fatherly gaze had never appeared in my memories. Andrew Kent, a Slytherin a year below you, if I recall correctly, once received help from Sawyer. I think Sawyer will remember her first healed patient with a spell. It seemed to be from our second year. I remember that boy, solitary and silent, not very social. Yes, somewhat like someone else, Dumbledore hinted, making me glare at him. The old wizard quickly changed his tone, Haha, he is different from you, of course. His life lacked Sawyer and Lily he only had an elder brother, Edgar Kent of Voldemort devotee. After graduation, he followed his brother into the Death Eaters. His potion skills are quite good, and Voldemort seems to value him. If he's a double agent, how can you be sure he's loyal to you? I believe in people's hearts. Perhaps I can't be certain, but I want to give him a chance to prove himself, Dumbledore smiled wearily. He also brought news that Voldemort has placed the Potter, Longbottom, and Snape families at the top of the Death Eaters hit list. Given recent events, this information seems credible. I felt a wave of helplessness and frustration. How did we get involved in this mess? What's the reason for targeting them? Sorry, I can't tell you more. It involves three boys born at the end of July. Protect young Evan. I fell silent, trying to calm my agitated emotions. After a while, I dryly changed the subject. If I am correct, fewer people knowing about a double agent is better. Indeed, what I told you today must remain confidential. If Voldemort and his followers find out, Kent will be in great danger. Even Sawyer doesn't need to know. Then why tell me? I asked defensively. Once he's at Hogwarts, you can keep him under control. He could handle the potion's position alone without needing another supervisor. Because I know you can be trusted, Severus. His gentle, unquestionable gaze held me in place. Such overwhelming trust, solid but not suffocating. Reflecting on the conversation, I realized Dumbledore had controlled my emotions throughout. Damn it, he went the fatherly route, and I was touched can I deny it? Dumbledore is undoubtedly an expert manipulator. I told Sawyer everything except for Kent's identity. As expected, she was very supportive of me accepting the potion's master position. But without ensuring the safety of Sawyer and the children, I couldn't agree to hide in Hogwarts. After much argument, we couldn't convince each other. Just then, an alarm spell alerted us to danger, and we quickly left with the children. The next period was one of constant hiding. We stayed in the Muggle world, moving across various towns and cities in Britain, erasing any possible traces at each stop. With Tito by our side, daily life wasn't too hard. It felt more like traveling than fleeing. Sawyer even bought a Muggle camera and a pile of film, taking many photos along the way. She mostly took pictures of me and the children, or selfies with me, capturing moments we couldn't escape. She said she'd develop the moving pictures once our ordeal was over. The only challenge was the children being so young. A stable home was more suitable for them. We lost contact with almost everyone, except for Sawyer occasionally using the two-way mirror to talk to Lily. 
Lily told us their situation was similar to ours, though they often had direct confrontations with pursuers because James couldn't stand provocations. Fortunately, James remembered his family and kept them from real danger. We spent that Christmas in a small Scottish town. One family seemed to have gone to a relative's for the holidays, leaving their tidy house empty. We used a few small spells and moved into the empty house. Outside, we set up wards to hide the lights and surrounded ourselves with various defensive and alarm spells. This Christmas was filled with unusual laughter. After the weather warmed, we wrote to Dumbledore, accepting his proposal and stating our intention to return to Hogwarts in July. The letter was sent via Muggle Post, knowing Dumbledore would find a way to receive it. As Dumbledore said, we found a solution that worked for both. The Fidelius charm, with me as the secret keeper, would protect Sawyer and the three children. We'd implement the plan once Hogwarts closed for summer. Then we abandoned magic, returning to London in a purely muggle way. Instead of entering the city, we rented a house in the suburbs, waiting for August. For over two months, we avoided using magic to prevent detection by magic traces. This also meant I couldn't work on potions, which was quite frustrating. Magical items weren't affected, so Sawyer and Lily kept in touch using the two-way mirror. Lily's family also planned to use the Fidelius charm, but she and James disagreed on the secret keeper. Sawyer and I suggested I be the secret keeper, adding just three more people. For Lily's sake, I could reluctantly include James. But someone wasn't appreciative. If he was willing to take this risk himself, I'd respect him more. Yet, James preferred one of his friends as the secret keeper to show their complete trust. I sneered at such great friendship. When it comes to the lives of loved ones and children, only oneself can be fully trusted. Chapter 66 In July, we moved back to the house at Spinner's End. To me, that place held special meaning. It carried so many memories a wonderful second childhood, the perfect wedding, a happy newlywed life. It was a part of our life. Under the protection of the Fidelius charm, the children and I could stay peacefully at home. Even if Voldemort himself tried to find our address, he wouldn't be able to. Only Severus, who had kept the secret in his heart, could reveal it. Severus had gone to Hogwarts before the term started to help Professor Slughorn with the preparations, as teaching was not an easy task, involving the syllabus and class preparations. Once the term began, Severus would live in his private quarters at Hogwarts and have less time to come home. He was taking on not just the role of Potion's master, but also the head of Slytherin House, which required night patrols and attending to the students' affairs at any time. Ten classes per week for first to fifth years. And one advanced potions class each for sixth and seventh years preparing the potion materials for daily classes piles of essays to grade four night patrols per week and providing the designated potions for the hospital wing although there's supposed to be a teaching assistant, he's not entirely trustworthy. I can understand why Professor Slughorn was so eager to retire, Severus grumbled, almost through gritted teeth. Maybe you could have the students do some labor to help you prepare materials. I suggested while tidying up toys scattered all over the room, making them return obediently to their boxes. From my experience with Griffinders in potions class, having them handle materials is a waste of time and resources, Severa said, rubbing his temples while sitting on the couch. Once term starts, my personal research time will be greatly reduced. Calm down and don't overexert yourself, I summoned a cup of tea. Delegate the tedious tasks to Kent. He's the only one you need to be wary of at Hogwarts. Keep him busy so he doesn't have time for any tricks. Severus sighed lightly, muttering, at least the salary is decent. I laughed, at least we've covered the baby's formula expenses. It seems Dumbledore isn't always stingy. He used to ask for big discounts on potions for the Order of the Phoenix, Severus finally looked a bit more relaxed. Now the salary comes from the school board, so there's no need to be stingy. I actually considered applying for the defense against the dark arts position back then I got an outstanding in it, I reminisced about my school days at Hogwarts. No. Stay home and take care of the children, Severus said somewhat autocratically, and I found it hard to argue. Now, the three little ones were the focus of my life, and I had to make concessions for anything that might affect them. All right, I was just saying, I said. 
Perhaps, one day, I might return to Hogwarts Maeve when Poppy retires. When Severus was at school, I sometimes found myself idle at home. The children would have their quiet and peaceful moments, and besides reading, I now had entertainment activities. When we renovated the house, we installed a television and a telephone. The house already had cable lines set up, so it was just a matter of activating them and handling the accounts. With the help of memory modification and obliviate spells, we easily managed these tasks. Severus despised these electronics and couldn't understand what was so appealing about the boring acting in TV dramas. The phone we installed was an old-fashioned rotary dial phone, reminding me that it was the early 1980s. Having a phone made it easier to contact my parents. Although we hadn't seen each other in a long time, we often talked on the phone. Some wizard families with muggle backgrounds also had phones, like those in Godric's Hollow where Lily lived. Lily's house didn't have a phone, but we had the two-way mirror. She told me they hadn't yet implemented the Fidelius charm and planned to do so next month when they returned home. As for the secret keeper, James didn't take our suggestion of Severus and me. According to Lily, James and Sirius had a brilliant plan to keep the secret so secure that even Dumbledore wouldn't know. But she secretly confided in me that the plan was to publicly name Sirius as the secret keeper, while the actual secret keeper would be Peter. No one would suspect this, ensuring Peter's safety and, by extension, their own, placing the danger on Sirius. The plan was good, and Sirius was indeed noble, but why choose the timid and cowardly Peter? I thought they'd at least choose Remus. It was Sirius's idea. He said the more unexpected, the safer, Lily's small face appeared in the mirror, looking helpless. Then, by that logic, having Severus as the secret keeper would be the most unexpected. Anyone checking would see that James and Severus were enemies at Hogwarts and never really got along. Who would believe that James would trust him? This plan would be even more perfect. I told James the same thing, but he said he didn't trust Severus. He actually told me not to tell anyone including you about our plan, but I can't see why I shouldn't trust you, so I decided to tell you anyway. Lily's emerald eyes gazed at me from the mirror, filled with deep trust, honesty, and sincerity. I wanted to fly over and hug her, my most trusted and trustworthy friend. But leaving the house would break the charm's protection, and I couldn't take that risk. Lily, you know how much we love you. So, take good care of yourself. I know you love me just a little less than you love Severus, right? Lily's eyes sparkled with amusement in the mirror. And you love me enough to make James jealous, right? I made a silly face, prompting a hearty laugh from Lily. Two moms laughing together at a mirror it was a strangely comforting scene. On Halloween, Severus skipped the school's festive dinner and came home early. Daddy! Oh Severus had just stepped out of the fireplace when Roy pounced on him, getting a face full of soot. She wrinkled her little face, pouting at her daddy. Severus pinched her nose playfully, took off his dusty cloak, handed it to me, and cast a quick cleaning spell on Roy, making her clean again. Roy flinched a bit at the spell's discomfort, made a face, then cuddled up to her daddy. Roy helped mommy feed the baby today. Roy was good, right? Roy likes mashed potatoes, and so does the baby. Roy doesn't like carrots, and neither does the baby. He's definitely Roy's little brother. Yes, Roy was good, Severus answered seriously. She threw the disliked carrots to Evan, and Evan screamed, flipping the bowl. I thought she'd be upset, but she cheerfully concluded that Evan was a good brother because he also didn't like carrots, I said, hanging a stray pumpkin decoration from the ceiling. So, does that mean Joanna, who likes carrots, isn't a good sister? Severus asked with a tolerant smile. Joanna is the best sister. Because she helps me eat the hated carrots, Roy said solemnly. Severus and I exchanged a glance and smiled. Roy, go help Joanna with the puzzle. She needs her good sister's help. I affectionately ruffled her hair. Okay. She nodded, kissed Severus's cheek, then mine, slid from Severus's arms, and hopped over to Joanna on the carpet. Severus, I said, once Roy had gone, putting on a serious face, you were home half a month ago. Although we communicate daily through the mirror, I miss you terribly. 
I must complain to Dumbledore for better arrangements for newlyweds. I spoke earnestly. I agree, Severus replied solemnly. It's been hard on you. I should have more time to help with the children. I leaned into his embrace, inhaling the familiar scent, it's not hard, but I agree you should have more time to watch the children grow. It's a joy. Wa Evans' cries grabbed our attention. I sighed exaggeratedly, sometimes it's also a trouble. We hurried to soothe the neglected Evan. Upon seeing Severus, he cooed, Papa. Forgetting to cry. Severus sat on the couch with Evan, watching the sisters play their puzzle game. The tension in his face relaxed, and I was enchanted by the warm and harmonious scene. After dinner, Roy rode her toy broomstick, hovering a few feet off the ground, flying around Evan and Joanna, making them giggle. Since our traveling escape ended, we hadn't had such carefree playtime with the children. Evan yawned repeatedly, tired from playing. Severus picked him up, and he quickly fell asleep. Severus carefully carried the sleeping Evan upstairs, while I coaxed the sleepy twins to bed. The phone rang. Maybe it's my parents. I couldn't think of anyone else who'd call at this hour. Hello, Snape residents. Sawyer. It's Gina. Oh my god. Oh. The voice on the other end was excited, almost hysterical. Gina was a young, pretty girl, unfortunately a squib, but she had loving parents. She lived near Lily in Godric's Hollow. What's wrong? What happened? Gina, calm down and tell me. I tried in vain to soothe her. Something happened at Lily's house. It must be. She was almost hysterical. My heart sank, what happened? Gina, speak clearly. I just saw flashes of light from their house, visible from afar, and it was a ghastly green. At first, I thought it was a Halloween prank, but then there was a loud bang, and half the house collapsed. I couldn't see clearly, but it was terrifying. And I heard a distant, eerie wailing. So scary. Her voice trembled, almost in tears. I felt a chill. Something had definitely happened to Lily. Severus had come downstairs by then, sensing my distress, looking at me seriously. I heard my voice, strangely calm, did you notify Dumbledore? My father contacted Dumbledore. I'm so worried about Lily. And little Harry. Gina started sobbing. The situation is unclear. You also need to stay safe. We'll be in touch. I quickly hung up and grabbed Severus's arm tightly, Lily's in trouble. It seems their house was attacked. I suddenly remembered something and frantically searched the living room. Severus accurately retrieved what I was looking for from the shelf by the fireplace the mirror linked to Lily. Lily. Lily, answer me. The mirror reflected my own anxious face, no fiery red hair, no bright emerald eyes. Severus, maybe Lily left the mirror somewhere and can't hear me. Why was my voice trembling? And weren't they protected by the Fidelius charm? Peter. My eyes widened, realizing I couldn't convince myself that Peter was reliable. Timid, always scared Peter, who would easily yield under a curse. But only the involved parties including Sirius, and I knew he was the secret keeper. Peter. What about him? Severus, confused, looked worried about Lily. Peter is the secret keeper. Sirius is just a decoy. That's their plan, and Lily told me behind James's back, I grew more desperate. One of them betrayed Lily and James. Severus's expression was terrifying, suppressing anger. He turned to the fireplace and grabbed his cloak, putting it on briskly. I'm going to Godric's Hollow now. You stay here. No. I'm coming with you. I stepped forward, firmly grabbing his arm, staring defiantly. Severus glared at me for two seconds, then frustratedly and angrily called, Tito. Yes, Master Severus. I command you to protect the twins and Evan without any harm. Tito shivered at Severus's stern tone and screamed, Tito obeys. Master. Severus grabbed my arm, pulling me into the crowded tube. Chapter 67 The ruins were shocking and horrifying. I stood outside what used to be Lily's courtyard, 
clenching my fists. The iron gate was askew, and the house had collapsed halfway, looking like it had been blown apart, the ground littered with fragments of bricks and wood. I wanted to scream and shout for Lily, but I restrained myself. There are no ambushes around, stay alert, we need to approach carefully, Severa said, his voice calm yet close. He grabbed my left hand with his right and pulled me behind him, providing some comfort and stability with his familiar touch. Hand in hand, we cautiously approached the ruins, our right hands tightly gripping our wands, ready for anything. This seemed to be the entrance hall. Not far away, a wooden plank lay on the ground, possibly a door. Moving further in, under the glow of our wand light, we saw a figure lying on the ground. Dust-covered black hair, lifeless, glasses askew on his nose, pale brown eyes with dilated pupils, and a face frozen in a look of frantic worry. His hands were limp at his sides, no wand in sight. Without his usual animated expressions or cocky laughter, James hardly looked like himself. Despite knowing it was futile, I still raised my wand to check on James. The spell revealed no fatal wounds, only the absence of life. Avada Kedavra. My throat tightened, and I took a shaky breath before moving on. This time, I took the lead. We reached the nursery, where I saw a familiar pattern on a piece of wood it was the crib lily and I had bought together. A few steps further, a flash of red appeared in the glow. Lily was there, near a toppled cabinet, her long red hair covering her face, lying still on the ground. I quietly approached her, kneeling by her side. Lily? I whispered, gently brushing the hair away from her beautiful face. She looked like she was asleep, perhaps just stunned by a spell. A simple enervate might wake her. Enervate. The light from my wand was absorbed into her body with no effect. A hand gripped my shoulder, startling me. I turned to see Severus, who pulled me up. His face was stoic, but his eyes revealed his pain and anger. He raised his wand and cast a life detection spell for me. The last thread of hope snapped. I could hear the blood rushing in my ears, my heart pounding, a sharp ringing echoing in my head. Sawyer, Sawyer. Severus's urgent voice broke through the noise. He held my arm tightly, prying my clenched hand from the nearly broken wand. I realized I was trembling all over. Severus embraced me gently, let it out, Sawyer, cry if you need to. His voice was strained and sorrowful. Tears quickly flowed, soaking Severus's robes, as the grief spread like a burning ache through my insides. First, I cried silently, then began to sob, finally screaming Lily's name like a bereaved soul. Amid my cries, a faint sound caught my attention a weak, confused whimpering. Severus heard it too and began searching the area with his wand. Harry. Clarity returned in an instant. Harry was crying. He was still alive. Severus found him under the precariously balanced cabinet. He carefully levitated the cabinet while I immediately scooped up the little boy in blue pajamas. A lightning-shaped scar marked his forehead a new injury Lily had never mentioned. His tear-streaked face and hiccuping sob suggested he had cried himself to sleep, only to be awakened by our voices. Harry's eyes, those pure green eyes like Lily's, opened gradually, filling me with a piercing pain. He cried again, muttering Papa. Mama, as large tears rolled down his cheeks. He clung to me tightly, trembling. I held him closer, burying my face in his soft, milk-scented neck, gently patting his back and rocking him, humming a shaky lullaby and kissing his tear-stained cheeks, just as I would comfort my own son. Harry's cries gradually subsided, and he eventually fell asleep on my shoulder. Taking deep breaths, I wiped away my tears and looked at Severus, who nodded back. Severus carefully levitated Lily's body outside, and I stifled another wave of despair, holding Harry tightly as we walked out. Something shiny caught my eye a familiar round mirror partly buried in the debris. Fighting back tears, I retrieved the two-way mirror and put it safely in my pocket. Severus laid Lily gently on the ground and went back for James, placing him beside her. I felt eyes on us, watching from the surrounding houses the local wizards. They must have noticed something from the start, their fear of Voldemort making them extremely vigilant. Yet no one had come forward, 
leaving Harry to cry himself to exhaustion under the cabinet. My wand showed the time, it was past 3 a.m. Hours had passed unnoticed. There were no Death Eaters, no attacks, not even the Dark Mark. I had no idea what had happened. The Fidelius charm had been broken, Lily and James were dead, but Harry survived. I suspected betrayal, whether by Sirius or Peter, revealing their location to Voldemort. Voldemort had come here, killed Lily and James, but failed to kill Harry. Severus searched for clues, but the moonless night made it difficult. He found only some shredded black robes, clearly not belonging to Lily's household. Had Voldemort been thwarted? Forced to flee, leaving behind torn clothing? I maliciously speculated. Oh Merlin! What have you done? James, Lily! My heavens! A thunderous voice roared, rushing towards us. Hagrid, towering and fast, approached us. Shoo! Be quiet! Harry's asleep. I glared at the giant, murmuring to suit the stirring Harry. Hagrid gasped at the sight of the lifeless couple and I cast a silencing charm on Harry. James. Lily. You. Oh, poor souls. What happened? Hagrid yelled. We know as much as you do. When we arrived hours ago, it was already like this. We found Harry crying under the rubble and their bodies, Severus said coldly, pausing to show some emotion. Oh. Hagrid sobbed, his beetle-black eyes glistening with tears, Dumbledore only told me something happened and to find Harry and bring him to him. We'll take Harry to Dumbledore ourselves. Where is he? I refuse to hand over Harry to the clumsy giant. The Order's headquarters. But Dumbledore instructed me to bring Harry to him safely. Hagrid insisted. I held Harry tightly, meeting Hagrid's eyes, Lily was our best friend. Her son is safest with us. Hagrid, intimidated, couldn't argue. A rumbling sound in the distance grew louder until a large flying motorcycle descended near us. Sirius, pale and trembling, rushed over. Oh no. James. Lily. Oh, no. He cried collapsing beside their bodies, his anguish perfect. Sirius. Are you okay? How did you get here? Hagrid shouted. Sirius. And you too. Oh. Is that Harry? How is he? Sirius rushed to take Harry. He's fine, just sleeping. Hagrid, Dumbledore is waiting. Why not leave now? I kept my wand ready, wary of Sirius. The traitor was either him or Peter, and a confrontation wasn't suitable for Harry. Hagrid, focused on his mission, prepared to leave with Harry. I'm Harry's godfather. I should take care of him. Give him to me, I'll look after him. Sirius pleaded. Before I could respond, Hagrid sobbed loudly, oh, poor Harry without his parents. He shook his head, no, Dumbledore wants Harry brought to him. He knows best. Wait. If it must be this way, at least take my motorcycle. It's faster. I don't need it anymore, Sirius offered sadly. Thank you, Hagrid accepted. As Hagrid and Harry flew away, Sirius's expression darkened. He turned to leave, but Severus blocked him, wand raised. Move, Snivellus. Get your big nose out of my way. Sirius hissed with hate. I need to know, in front of Lily and James, did you betray them? I stood beside Severus, surprised by my calm voice facing the possible betrayer. Chapter 68 Mind your own business. Get out of my way. Sirius angrily waved his wand. We were blocking the gate of Lily's courtyard, and this man wasn't in a hurry to leave but wanted to exit the courtyard first, whether out of respect or something else. Once again, Lily was my best friend, and Harry is almost like my son. How could the person who caused Lily's death and turned little Harry into an orphan have nothing to do with us? My voice was very soft, but I ensured every word penetrated his ears. Sirius looked deeply shocked, his eyes filled with despair and pain. His hand holding the wand dropped weakly. His lips trembled as he uttered fragmented sentences, killed them. Suddenly, 
Sirius's wand flew out of his hand. Do you understand clearly now? Did you betray them? Where is Peter? Did you give him to the Dark Lord? I suspected that he revealed Peter as the secret keeper to the Dark Lord, leading to the secret being easily extracted. Maybe Peter had already turned or been killed. Sirius's expression changed. You know Peter was the secret keeper. I thought you were accusing me of betrayal. Revealing Peter as the secret keeper to the Dark Lord is like handing over the secret. Do you think Peter could withstand multiple Cruciatus curses without giving in? Or resist powerful legitimacy? My voice was sharp and harsh. Lily told me. Only you and I knew the true secret keeper was Peter. I swear it wasn't me. Can you look into my eyes and swear you didn't betray them? Severus interrupted my emotional outburst, staring into Sirius's eyes. Sirius met Severus's gaze without hesitation, knowing Severus might use legitimacy on him. I swear I didn't betray them. I'd rather die than harm them. Sirius fell back into despair. Severus was silent for a few seconds. He's not lying. Then it's clear. Sirius, you entrusted the wrong person. Your brilliant plan failed because you trusted the wrong person. Lily and James are gone and can't be brought back. I choked on my words. Sirius buried his face in his hands, trembling all over. It's all my fault I killed them James almost convinced Lily to make you the secret keeper. But I distrusted you, blamed you for not trusting me and Peter. Idiot. Severus's eyes burned with anger. He cast a nonverbal stinging hex at the unprepared man in front of him. Sirius groaned and was knocked to the ground by the spell, coughing violently. Severus didn't stop, casting spell after spell, leaving Sirius gasping on the ground. This is the great Gryffindor friendship. Foolish. Severus's suppressed emotions erupted. He was always cold and harsh in public, gentle and caring at home. I had never seen him this angry. I held Severus's arm. Although I wanted to keep hitting Sirius to vent my anger, I couldn't tolerate someone being injured in front of me. The fact is, your prejudice indirectly caused the death of your best friends and our Lily. How do we settle this? I didn't intend to let him off easily mental torment was more punishing than physical pain. After I kill Peter, you can do whatever you want with me. Sirius struggled to his feet, his expression turning crazed, as if he no longer cared about anything but revenge. Do you know where Peter is? I asked. I don't know yet, but it shouldn't be hard to find him. May I leave now? I have a rat to catch. Sirius tried to smile, but it looked grotesque. I stepped forward and cast a pain relief spell on him, ensuring he wasn't seriously hurt. Since we share a common goal, I want my ally to be in good health and not a burden, Severus explained, tossing Sirius's wand back to him. Take us to Peter. No negotiations. Sirius opened his mouth to protest but was immediately shut down. Our goal is to capture Peter, not to murder him, I reminded Sirius as we set protective spells on James and Lily's bodies before leaving. If you kill him, no matter how guilty he is, you'll be the one accused of murder. I glanced at the unconvinced Sirius. Unless you're eager to atone for James and Lily by going to Azkaban. Sirius paused, his expression shifting. I sighed inwardly. Stubborn Sirius. Do you think they would want you to atone? Losing one trusted friend, would they want another to self-destruct in Azkaban? Do you think we can take care of Harry without his godfather? My voice softened. Or do you think we will raise Harry as our own, in your absence? Mentioning Harry clearly shook Sirius, his eyes filled with deep reluctance. Harry is only a little over a year old now. His first magical outburst, his first friend, his acceptance letter, his first spell you don't want to be there for any of it. And his every success, every failure, you don't want to share. My words pressed harder. Severus watched coldly. I know Sirius grabbed his hair in anguish, clearly torn inside. Or is it that you don't dare face Harry and want to shirk your responsibility? Brave Gryffindor indeed, Severus mocked. We might as well not tell Harry he had an irresponsible godfather. Sawyer and I will raise him as our own. 
he won't be as arrogant as his father. He'll be a proper Slytherin, just like my Ivan. In your dreams, Snivellus. James and Lily's son will be the bravest Gryffindor. Sirius jumped up, his energy renewed. Let's catch Peter and send him to Azkaban. Harry is my godson, and I have custody. Good, glad we agree on something. I gave Severus an admiring look. Let's catch Peter, no time to waste. As for Harry's custody, that would be another battle. Sirius, with renewed vigor, began using spells to locate Peter. When we arrived at the magical location, Peter had already fled. The marauders could track each other using a magical bond unless disrupted by strong magical interference or death. Sirius repeatedly tracked Peter with his wand, and we followed the directions until we finally cornered Peter on a muggle street. There were curious onlookers. Sirius and I held our wands, with Peter trembling between us. The obliviators at the ministry would have a busy day. Sawyer. Oh why are you here with Sirius chasing me? I didn't want to Peter's small eyes were teary, his expression pained, his hand holding the wand trembling, seemingly indecisive. No. We're not here to kill you. I don't want to hurt you. Sirius said you were the secret keeper. I think there must be a misunderstanding. How could you betray James and Lily? There must be a reason. I lowered my wand, putting myself at a defensive disadvantage, trusting Severus who was hidden. No. Don't believe him, the betrayer is Sirius. Peter's body tensed, turning to Sirius. Oh how could you betray our friends? As Peter cried out, waving his wand, a spell was about to be cast. A red beam from an inconspicuous angle struck him, turning Peter into a stone statue. I sighed in relief, quickly taking Peter's wand and binding him tightly with a spell. The crowd, who had been watching from a distance, had seen everything. The Obliviators would have their work cut out for them. Sirius stormed over, releasing Peter from the Petrificus Totalus spell, and roared, Why did you betray us? Why? I didn't want to. You don't know how terrifying he is he tortured me, threatened my poor mother, said he'd kill me if I didn't obey. Peter struggled, his sharp voice causing my nerves, already strained from the previous night, to throb painfully. I'd rather die than betray them. Eusirius pressed his wand against Peter's throat, looking ready to curse him to death. You could have told Dumbledore, the order would have protected you and your mother. I stopped Sirius. Remember? They protected my muggle parents when I was in my fifth year. It's useless I'm just a cowardly, useless worm tail, always following James and Sirius. In such tense times, who would care about my request? No one noticed my fear and anxiety, not even you. Bound tightly, Peter vented his long-held grievances, accusing us of not caring, not noticing his distress. Excuses, all excuses. That doesn't justify betraying James. Sirius grabbed Peter's collar. He didn't just threaten me, he offered me power, far greater than anything I learned at Hogwarts. He promised rewards for every piece of information I gave from the Order. Now, I'm not weaker than you, dear friends. Peter laughed maniacally, his eyes gleaming. Sirius, I should thank you. It was you who convinced James to make me the secret keeper. When I reported to him, I was highly praised. A wave of helplessness washed over me. How had this twisted friendship lasted so long? Lily was dead because of this scumbag. I regretted stopping Sirius from cursing him. Bastard. Sirius punched Peter, sending him flying a few meters away, drawing gasps from the crowd. Peter spat out a few bloody teeth, an eerie smile spreading across his face. I knew something was wrong. Peter's form began to change, shrinking rapidly, the binding ropes falling loose. Sirius and I simultaneously fired spells, which collided and fizzled out. The gray rat formed and darted toward the sewer grate. Damn it! Our spells were dodged one after another, the rat was frustratingly agile. We watched as he slipped through the grate. Chapter 69 Sirius wanted to blast open the sewer cover, but I hurriedly stopped this crazy, futile act. 
The underground sewage pipes extended in all directions trying to fish out the escaped rat from inside was like finding a needle in a haystack. Even with magic, without any tracking clues left on Peter, it was impossible to pull him out. It was like the police always arriving after the fact just as we were getting frustrated with the sewers, a person appeared, causing the onlookers to gasp again. I didn't pay attention to their reactions that was the Ministry of Magic's job. I squinted at the sewer drain that Peter had just disappeared into. There was something else that had disappeared with him, a trace of magic. Pressing Sirius's shoulder, I gave him a reassuring look to calm down. I didn't act. Several aurors approached us, watching us warily. Although this commotion didn't cause major casualties, too many muggles saw it, violating the statute of secrecy. Without a more reasonable and convincing explanation, we might face prosecution. Hello, did you see it? You caused big trouble, a sharp man spoke, signaling to the ministry staff questioning the onlookers under the pretense of journalist interviews. Serious, put down your wand, okay? For the sake of our partnership. Sorry, Bowen. Given Peter's escape, Sirius's restraint surprised me. We were trying to capture a Death Eater suspect who used to be our friend. You know about the Potter incident, I believe. I ignored the sympathy and regret in Bowen's eyes. That friend betrayed them to the Dark Lord. I suspect he joined the Death Eaters long ago, and we confirmed it just now. These muggles saw and heard everything they can testify for us. Well. Bowen didn't have time to say more. Sirius let out a cry of mixed hatred and joy. I turned to see a struggling rat, controlled by invisible forces, floating out of the sewer drain. A red light accurately hit the ugly rat this time, it was Sirius, maintaining his composure despite his anger. Holding the stunned rat, Sirius solemnly said to Bowen, This rat is an illegal animagus, Peter Pettigrew. He betrayed James to the Death Eaters. I request to personally escort him to the Ministry for trial. Under the blue-white beam of the anti-animagus spell, the unconscious Peter gradually returned to human form. Sirius rolled up Peter's left sleeve, and a gasp of shock surrounded us. The unmistakable dark mark, though somewhat faded, was clearly visible. The truth seems clear now. Let's head to the ministry. All right, Sirius, you can escort him. If needed, Severus and I are willing to testify. As the rat was subdued, Severus appeared quietly behind me, watching the situation develop. Sirius glanced at Severus with a complex expression, awkwardly pulling a corner of his mouth, dryly saying, Well, thanks, Snape. Bowen and another Auror, along with Sirius, took Peter. Severus and I followed. Our group headed from the Ministry Hall to the interrogation room on the tenth floor. On the way to the elevator, Bowen sighed, I'm sorry about the Potters. James was my colleague. Hearing the news saddened me too. You know, the news has spread. Little Harry defeated the Dark Lord, the one whose name can't be spoken. People are celebrating. I just hope they remember James and Lily's sacrifice. At this, the suppressed grief over Peter's capture surged, nearly suffocating me. Lily's smiling face seemed right before my eyes, along with her crisp, cheerful laughter. Those who can leave will have regrets, and those left behind will suffer. Lily, if you had to choose, which would you pick? Well, I choose to leave regret is better than pain. But no matter what, it's best to be with my loved one. How romantic, living and dying together. The idle chat in fifth grade turned into a prophecy. Lily and James became the ones who left, leaving Severus and me to grieve her departure. And little Harry, who became an orphan overnight, like my fifteen-month-old Ivan. Sawyer. Sawyer. Severus's soft call brought me back to reality. Only then did I realize the elevator had arrived, and everyone was waiting for me to enter. Sorry, I lost my composure. I lowered my head, trying to hide my distress. Severus embraced me as we entered the elevator, his hand squeezing my shoulder for support. We handed Peter over to the Dementors guarding the tenth floor interrogation room. During this period of Black Wizard Rampage, prisoners were guarded and escorted by those horrible creatures. Awake, Peter would taste endless fear and despair. 
My sympathy had long been exhausted, only watching coldly as he screamed and trembled. The Wisingamot judges arrived one by one, notified of the upcoming trial. Sirius accused Peter of betraying the Potters, becoming a Death Eater spy within the Order of the Phoenix, and intentionally leaking the Potters' address as their secret keeper, leading to their murder. The Ministry staff's testimonies from the Muggle witnesses matched ours. It only proved Peter's allegiance to the dark side but not his specific crimes. In the end, the trial panel agreed to use Veritasarum. Under the potion's influence, Peter confessed his crimes of murdering Muggle wizards as a Death Eater. A life sentence in Azkabanthet was his fate. By the time we returned to the Order of the Phoenix headquarters, it was already evening. We met Dumbledore, who already knew about Peter. His usual gentle demeanor was absent. It seems clear now that Peter has been leaking information to the Death Eaters all along. Dumbledore's long, slender fingers rested on his knees, his glasses reflecting light, obscuring his eyes. That despicable. Sirius clenched his fists. He betrayed James so easily, and I foolishly thought he was our loyal friend. Albus, I'm more concerned about Harry. James and Lily were killed by the killing curse. How did Harry survive? Why didn't the Dark Lord attack him but disappeared instead? What happened last night? Why is everyone saying Harry defeated the Dark Lord? I was exhausted but couldn't relax, still worried about Harry. After killing James and Lily, Voldemort had no reason to spare little Harry. I believe he cast the killing curse on Harry. Dumbledore ignored our gasps and continued, as things stand, Voldemort's curse left only a scar on Harry's forehead but rebounded onto himself, causing an explosion. I examined it. Harry has a powerful protective charm, an ancient magic left by Lily before she died. This magic's power comes from Lily's love for Harry. The deeper the love, the stronger the protection. This strong protection rebounded the curse, causing Voldemort great pain. Sirius choked out a sob, Lily. Is he dead? Severus coldly asked after a long silence. Voldemort disappeared. Unless his body was blown to pieces, leaving no remains, maybe he escaped severely wounded, but he will return. Dumbledore's undeniable tone made the atmosphere heavy. Where is Harry? I asked hoarsely after a long silence. Little Harry slept peacefully in his cradle. I watched his defenseless sleeping face. Harry had no idea he had become a little hero who defeated the Dark Lord, the savior of the wizarding world. What burdens will he bear because of this in the future? I lovingly kissed his forehead, the lightning-shaped scar marking him as the first person to survive the killing curse. Lily, this is your treasure, the baby you protected with your life. Now it's up to Severus and me to protect him. Why? I'm Harry's godfather I should raise him. Sirius protested, waving his arms at Dumbledore. As I said, Lily's blood relation ensures her protective magic continues. It prevents dark wizards from getting near him. Petunia Evans is Lily's last relative Harry needs to live with his aunt. Dumbledore patiently explained. But Albus, Petunia is in college, graduating next year, and planning further studies, I reminded Dumbledore of the situation he might not know. Besides, she's a single woman, not convenient for raising a baby. Well, that's a problem. Dumbledore closed his eyes, leaning back, looking very tired. Petunia. She doesn't know about Lily, right? I paused. Knowing their sisterly bond, Petunia would be heartbroken losing her dear sister. I will personally tell her and explain Harry's situation, Dumbledore opened his eyes, his usual sharpness returning. We'll find the best solution. Severus and I will go with you. Petunia is our friend. I worried about Petunia's reaction to the bad news. I also. Sirius was eager to join, but Dumbledore raised a hand to stop him. It's settled. Minerva and I will visit Miss Evans. You should go home and rest. You don't look well. You've been running non-stop since last night. You've done enough. Leave the rest to me. His bright blue eyes looked at us, gentle but firm. Only when reminded did I realize, after a night without sleep and chasing Peter, my body and mind were exhausted. 
Seeing the dark circles under Severus's eyes and his sallow complexion, I knew I was no better. Thinking of the children at home, I didn't insist. After agreeing to meet next time to discuss Harry's custody, Severus and I stepped into the fireplace. Ivan, don't be afraid. Sisters and Tito will protect you. Right, and our house is strong, with sturdy doors. Bad guys can't get in. The main room was dark, with a sliver of light from the hallway leading to the living room. Just out of the main room's fireplace, we heard childish voices and sobbing from the living room. Severus and I exchanged worried glances, quickly heading to the living room. What happened? I walked ahead, seeing three children sitting on the living room carpet. Ivan was crying, and Roy and Joanna were holding toys to comfort him. Tito stood aside, visibly relieved to see us, then became flustered. Mama! Wah! The twins dropped their toys, their faces crumpling, and tears flowing. They clung to my arms tightly as if afraid I would disappear. So scary. Bad guys. The house was shaking. Why did you come back so late? The twins' faces still had tear stains, their eyes red from crying. Their pitiful look made my heart ache. I'm sorry, darlings. I knelt on the carpet, comforting the frightened girls. Mom should have come back earlier. It's okay now. Shoo. Seeing their sisters in my arms, little Ivan quieted down, wobbling over to hug my neck tightly. Roy, Joanna, come to daddy. Let's go to your room. Severus picked up the sobbing girls, one in each arm, and headed upstairs. The children were already tired from crying, quickly falling asleep together on the magically enlarged bed. After checking on them and casting a silencing charm, I collapsed beside Ivan, his little hand still clutching my hair. Tito. Severus called softly. Tito appeared at the foot of the bed, its large eyes flashing with fear and confusion. Master Severus. Tito has been taking care of the little misses and mister, preparing their favorite food and toys, but Tito couldn't stop them from crying. Tito is useless. Tito is not a good elf. It began pulling its pointy ears. Severus interrupted Tito's rambling, you did very well. Now, tell me what happened after we left. This morning, the little masters woke up and couldn't find Master Severus and Miss Sawyer. They were very unhappy. Tito prepared their favorite sweets, but... Why are there cracks on the main room walls? The windows are broken, and there are fighting marks on the street outside, a broken street lamp. What happened during the day? Severus frowned impatiently, his face tired. A man tried to break into the house, but the defenses stopped him, so he seemed to want to blow up the whole house. Tito would never let him destroy the home Tito protects. Tito strengthened the defenses, and the man couldn't get in. Later, another man came. They fought, and finally, they took the man away. They made terrible noises, scaring the little masters. They cried all the time. Severus's frown deepened, his face dark. Tito, frightened, fell silent. I gently freed my hair from the sleeping Ivan's grasp, sitting behind Severus to massage his shoulders. I sent Tito down to prepare us some food, my stomach feeling queasy after a whole day without eating. After a few massages, Severus suddenly turned and hugged me, burying his head in my chest. This slightly vulnerable gesture made me pause, then I embraced him, my fingers gently combing through his hair. Last night, when I wept over Lily's cold body, Severus only offered his chest to lean on, losing his composure briefly when confronting Sirius. Severus's grief over Lily's death was no less than mine, suppressing it must be exhausting. The children are asleep, I whispered in Severus's ear, a random comment. Severus didn't move. After a long time, I felt warm liquid seeping through my collar, slowly spreading to my heart. Tito, bringing food, left silently at my signal, making no unnecessary noise. We stayed embracing each other until deep into the night. Lily and James's funeral was arranged for the following Sunday, a week later. We learned this from the next day's Daily Prophet. The front page featured a photo of the ruined Potter House in Godric's Hollow. The headline read Savior of the Wizarding World, followed by exaggerated words. 
Below, an obituary announced the funeral details. I suppose this was arranged by Dumbledore. I finished reading the front page and continued eating my cereal. Severus took the newspaper, flipping through the contents. Ha! Huh. Severus read aloud a piece of news, Dark Wizard Antonin Dolohov captured. Yesterday, another Death Eater was caught. The excellent Aura Laster Moody single-handedly subdued the fallen Dark Wizard Dolohov. Dolohov publicly used magic in the Muggle district of Spinner's End, attacking a Muggle vagabond, causing his death. Previously, Dolohov was involved in several cases of harming Muggle wizards, and his crimes were confirmed during yesterday afternoon's trial, sentencing him to life imprisonment in Azkaban. So that's what happened. That's what occurred outside our house yesterday. The unfortunate vagabond was probably just a random target. I realized that Dolohov attacked us on Voldemort's orders. Even if he had broken through the house's protective spells, he couldn't find the children due to the Fidelius charm. But did he know that Voldemort had already fallen? The Death Eaters would scatter without their powerful leader. If caught and convicted, they were destined for Azkaban, with no escape from the Dementor's company. Just as I was thinking this, a flash of red light appeared, and the phoenix fox left a small piece of parchment with elegant script confirming my previous suspicions. Albus says the funeral is arranged. He has moved and protected their bodies, so we need not worry. I paused, we will discuss Harry's custody tomorrow afternoon at headquarters. It seems Albus has already visited Petunia. Maybe we should meet with Petunia before tomorrow. It had been a while since we last saw Petunia. Meeting again was for Harry's custody and Lily's funeral. I had a feeling this meeting might not be pleasant. Chapter 70 Walking along the path by the Thames River, I confirmed that the building not far away was our destination. The row of apartment buildings we passed looked very nice, and with the beautiful river scenery, it was pleasing to the eye. But at the moment, I was preoccupied with worries and couldn't appreciate the view. This place was mentioned to me when Petunia moved in long ago, but I had never come here. We stood in front of a white-painted wooden door and rang the doorbell. Hello, sorry to bother you, may I speak with Miss Evans? She's here, I'll get her for you. A girl with thick glasses, looking sleepy, opened the door. Excuse me, thank you. I then noticed the girl in front of me was carrying a small bag and holding a few books, looking like she was about to go out. Oh, sorry. I stepped aside to let her pass, watching as she left with a sleepwalking-like demeanor until her figure disappeared around the corner of the stairs. Sawyer. And Severus. Came a surprised voice, slightly hoarse. I turned back to see Petunia standing at the door, her eyes red and swollen beyond recognition. Holding a steaming cup of tea, I pondered what to say to break the somewhat cold atmosphere. Petunia, we haven't met for a long time, how have you been? Unexpectedly, Severus spoke first. I'm fine. This place is close to school, making it convenient for studying and living. My roommates are also very friendly. The girl you just met at the door is Leah. Petunia sat on a single sofa, sipping her tea lightly. She looked much better, no longer as despondent as when we first met, seemingly having tidied herself up while preparing the tea. The magical world hasn't been peaceful in recent years. Over the past year, we've been hiding and constantly moving, unable to contact you to avoid bringing you any danger. I know, Petunia interrupted me, her expression calm. Lily told me that wizards are at war. She mentioned it in the last letter she wrote a year ago. I initially thought the news of Lily's death would deeply sadden her and feared mentioning Lily would touch her wounds. But now it was Petunia who brought up Lily first. Petunia, I'm so sorry for Lily's death. I couldn't say more comforting words, as Petunia's expression clearly indicated she didn't want to hear them. Your headmaster came to see me yesterday. He told me Lily is dead, and James is dead too. Some secret keeper betrayed them. I don't understand all this I only know the end result is my sister is dead Petunia's voice grew louder, her expression losing its calmness, Lily is dead. Dead in your magical world. I sensed something was wrong. Petunia's tone was full of resistance, and she practically spat out the words magical world. I'm very sorry. 
I didn't know what I was apologizing for perhaps because I felt helpless, unable to do anything but cry over Lily's body. But beyond apologizing, I didn't know what else to say. From the beginning, Lily shouldn't have gone to that damned school to learn magic, and she shouldn't have married that damned wizard. What did James Potter say at the wedding? He promised my parents and me that he would take good care of Lily, letting us trust him with her. And now. She's dead. Petunia's voice trembled, and the last few words were squeezed out through gritted teeth. Petunia. Calm down. I tried to soothe her, but it was futile Petunia ignored my voice, her eyes filled with tears, the pain in them so familiar, just like what I felt the night before. And you, weren't you Lily's best friends? Why didn't you protect her? Why is Lily dead while you're sitting here unharmed? Petunia's words cut deep. My words of comfort stopped, and as Petunia's hysterical outburst ended, the room fell into silence. Why were Severus and I unharmed despite being hunted, without even a fight, while Lily had no chance to call for help? If I had insisted more on the secret keeper issue, no. If from the beginning I hadn't cowardly avoided confrontation but stood with Lily, would everything be different? A large hand covered mine, and I came back to my senses to see Severus looking at me with concern. Forcing a smile at him, I looked up at Petunia, who had unknowingly stood up in her agitation, now sitting weakly on the sofa after her outburst. I looked at her sorrowful eyes, seeing her gradually regaining clarity, realizing what she had just done, her face turned pale. Petunia's eyes widened, her lips trembled, and she collapsed back onto the sofa. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. She buried her face in her hands, her broken apologies continuous, I didn't mean it, I didn't want to hurt you. I just am just. Petunia's vulnerable and helpless appearance made me step forward and hug her, I know, we all understand, you're just heartbroken. She was. My only. Sister. My last family. Petunia cried uncontrollably in my arms, and I sighed softly, gently patting her back to comfort her. When Petunia gradually calmed down, I released her. She smiled awkwardly, her eyes red and swollen like walnuts. Yesterday, Mr. Dumbledore mentioned Harry's custody. Harry is my nephew, and I will certainly take care of him. He's Lily's child I'll love him like my own. Petunia, who had just returned from the bathroom, still looked somewhat worn out but had perked up a bit. I believe you will, but you're still in college, graduating next year and possibly continuing your studies. Raising a baby is no easy task. Especially without magic. I've already planned to sign a contract with a magazine. My parents' house is still there this is just a rented place I share with Leah. I can move back with Harry. I have some savings left I can afford to raise Harry. Petunia thought I was worried about the expenses. It's not just about money. We have three children, and I know how difficult it is to care for a child. Trust my experience on this. Besides, a child needs a complete family to grow up in. Do you have plans to get married in the next few years? Can your boyfriend accept a sudden baby? Especially a special baby, a little wizard. I hadn't thought about that, Petunia frowned. I don't have anyone I'm seeing right now, but these will indeed be issues in the future. Sirius Black also wants to raise Harry, the usually silent Severus suddenly spoke, but Mr. Black himself is quite unreliable. As a reckless single man, he probably can't even take care of himself. Although he's Harry's godfather, leaving Harry with him would be a disaster. I couldn't help but laugh, indeed, not very reassuring. I think it's suitable and reliable for you two to care for Harry, Petunia hesitated. But Mr. Dumbledore mentioned some protective magic tied to Lily's blood, saying my blood can protect Harry. If that's the case, even if raising a child alone is difficult, I must do it. I'm Lily's only blood relative left, and if my blood can protect Harry, I must protect him. In theory, that's correct. But maybe we can find a way to have the best of both worlds, I pondered. How about we co-parent Harry? When you are busy with work and can't take care of him, let Harry stay with us, along with my children. Initially, I thought of having Petunia move in with us. Our house, designed for two families, was large enough. But on second thought, 
the neighborhood's environment and security were not great. Petunia, unlike us, couldn't travel by fireplace or apparate, making it unsafe and inconvenient. Moreover, Petunia might not want to live with us. Even if we were close, living under someone else's roof isn't ideal for an adult who values independence. We were also used to our way of living and might not be comfortable with another adult in the house. A child's presence was different we already had three and wouldn't mind another. Considering all this, co-parenting Harry seemed the best solution. Petunia's place and our home would both be Harry's home, ensuring he felt the warmth of family and had peers to grow up with. All right, that sounds good, Petunia seemed to agree, but what about the protective magic tied to my blood? You don't need to worry about that. Dumbledore will explain it all tomorrow. I just hope you can trust us. We genuinely want to take good care of Harry and give him a complete family in place of Lily. Petunia's expression softened, and she smiled slightly, I do trust you. We are good friends, aren't we? Let's discuss the details tomorrow. We might need to appease a certain godfather, I said, seeing Petunia's agreement and lightened mood, making me feel much better. Why? How can James's son be raised by Snape? As expected, the next day, Sirius lost his temper when he learned that Dumbledore also agreed to let us raise Harry. Dumbledore, sitting at one end of the table, held a cup of overly sweet honey tea, seemingly not intending to intervene. Remus and Dam were also there, sitting with Sirius and watching his outburst with sighs. Petunia, sitting beside me, rolled her eyes, probably thinking while she, the aunt, hadn't spoken, Sirius was already making a fuss. Why not? Severus sneered, if you're worried that my past disagreements with James Potter will make me mistreat Harry, you can rest assured. Harry is Lily's child I'll take good care of him for her sake. The word care was emphasized, reminding me of Severus's threat to Sirius before capturing Peter raising Harry to be a proper Slytherin. I glanced at Severus, whose expression was serious, suggesting that his words were more than just a threat. Sirius also seemed to recall this, nearly losing his composure, appearing ready to jump up and hit Severus. Severus, however, continued calmly, moreover, James and I had no deep-seated hatred, just youthful conflicts. The deceased are gone there's no point in dwelling on it. Severus's words indicated that he wouldn't mistreat Harry because of his past with James. And you're currently living in Diagon Alley, right? Renting a place, if I recall correctly. Are you sure it's suitable for Harry to live in such a busy area? I tried to sound sincere. I'll find a better place. Sirius was struggling. Do you know how to take care of a 15-month-old baby? Preparing suitable food, keeping him clean, comforting him when he cries at night, treating him when he's sick. Do you know how to do all this? Sirius was rendered speechless by my barrage of questions, so I added, if you were married and had a meticulous wife, maybe Harry would be well cared for. But as a single, reckless man, how could you possibly take care of a baby? You probably aren't even familiar with household magic. Sirius now looked like a withered eggplant, slumped in the armchair. Remus tried to console him, Sawyer and Severus are as capable as you, if not more so, in protecting Harry. Besides, their household includes a healer and a potions master, so you needn't worry about Harry's health. But Sawyer is a healer at ST. Mungo's, working every day. How will she have time to care for the children? Sirius looked at me hopefully. I smiled helplessly, that's true, but with the children being so young, and Severus at Hogwarts, I couldn't possibly leave them behind. I've decided to resign, maybe working part-time as a family healer or helping with finances at a potion shop, staying home primarily to care for the children. Seeing Sirius's resentful look, I couldn't help but smile sympathetically. Huh, that's a good arrangement. Sirius, don't be so disheartened. Even if you can't raise Harry, you can visit him often. As Harry's godfather, you have every reason to be close to him, so you don't have to worry about your bond with Harry weakening. Dumbledore tried to mediate with a cheerful tone. Also, Severus's house has three children around Harry's age, so he won't be lonely growing up. Dan spoke up, we actually wanted to adopt Harry too, given that Remus and I can't have children. We've been friends with the Potters for many years, so adopting Harry would have been ideal. But now, 
Hearing all this, it seems Severus's place is indeed better for Harry. Since the Daily Prophet reported yesterday, many wizarding families have expressed a desire to adopt Harry, but most are attracted by his fame as the savior of the wizarding world. Even those who genuinely care for Harry can't escape the influence of his title. Dumbledore sighed. If Harry grows up with such a reputation, he might become spoiled and arrogant. Just like his hero father in his youth, Severus remarked neutrally. James was indeed spoiled by his family, which led to his arrogance, Dumbledore agreed, preventing Sirius from erupting. Harry will face more challenges than ordinary children as he grows up. Arrogance and pride could bring him unforeseen dangers. So, I'd rather have him grow up with Miss Evans in the muggle world, away from the influence of fame. Sirius fell silent, and we all listened quietly. Furthermore, Lily's protective magic requires a blood bond, making Miss Evans the most suitable guardian. However, given her situation, she can't raise a baby alone, Dumbledore winked at Petunia. Considering everything, the best solution is for Severus and you to jointly care for Harry. As long as you live under the same roof often enough, and Harry considers your place home, the protective magic will remain effective until his seventeenth birthday. Petunia, who had been listening intently, now spoke seriously to Dumbledore, thank you for considering Harry's well-being. Even if I were alone, I would take good care of Harry he's my family. But this arrangement is better for Harry, so I have no objections. Everyone agreed, and Sirius grumbled a bit, for Harry. So, it was decided that night to bring Harry home. The children, being about the same age, quickly started playing together. Harry, who hadn't seen his parents for days, had cried a lot and was listless. With new playmates, he finally started to smile after a while. Watching the children play joyfully, I felt a warmth in my heart. Such a peaceful and happy life is precious. But Harry's identity as the savior of the wizarding world means his life won't be ordinary. The revenge of the Death Eaters and the possible return of the Dark Lord, the pressures and benefits of fame. So many challenges await him. Perhaps Dumbledore's idea of growing up in the Muggle world, safe under the protection of blood ties, away from the wizarding world, would allow Harry to have a carefree childhood. But I couldn't let go. Leaving Harry with Petunia and walking away was impossible for me. I only knew that until the last moment of her life, Lily was protecting Harry, her beloved child. In my heart, I decided that Severus and I would protect Harry for Lily, at least until he could handle these challenges himself. My gaze returned to Severus, who was sitting on the sofa, reading a potion journal, occasionally glancing at the children. This silent care was so typical of Severus. No sweet words, no courtship, but quietly settling into my heart. Now, the Dark Lord is gone. With the ministry's efforts, his followers can't cause much trouble. After our marriage, we finally have some peace. Maybe it's just temporary, and in a few years, there might be another storm. But as long as Severus is by my side, with the children around, I have strength. Severus, we have one more child. Severus turned a page and responded softly, yes. Now I'm practically a housewife, so you'll have to earn the money for the children's milk. He turned another page, all right. Are you going back to school tomorrow? Yes, why? I'll miss you. Finally looking at me, his obsidian eyes smiled, are you being coquettish? Blushing with embarrassment, I stubbornly glared at him, is that not allowed? Severus's eyes filled with more amusement. He didn't answer, just leaned over to kiss me. Mm. Hm. Just as things were getting intense. Wah. Harry's cry interrupted. I hurriedly pushed Severus away and went to comfort the child, hearing Severus grumble behind me. Brat, crying at the perfect time. Just as annoying as his father, Potter's brat. The End Chapter 71 Mrs. Snape, are you really deciding to resign? The head healer of ST. Mungo's, Dr. Lynch, who had gray hair like Dumbledore yet seemed energetically youthful, asked while sitting at his desk, smiling kindly at me. Yes, Dr. Lynch. I'm very sorry. But I can't leave my children. I felt a bit embarrassed. I was probably the shortest-serving healer in the history of ST. Mungo's. 
Not counting the year of training and internships, I had been officially working for less than two months before taking maternity leave to give birth to Ivan. After that, I couldn't return to work due to being targeted by Death Eaters, constantly hiding. I had expected to be dismissed long ago due to my prolonged absence, but surprisingly, Burns managed to keep my position for me. Unfortunately, with the responsibilities of my children, I've decided to stay home as a housewife. It's a pity, Mrs. Snape. Burns told me about your situation. I believe you are very capable, which is why we kept your position. But if it's for the children, I understand. Well then, if you ever want to come back to work, you are always welcome. The head healer put my resignation letter into a drawer, her kind expression very sincere. I will, thank you very much for your care during this time. I stood up and bowed sincerely. At first, when I had just graduated, Mrs. Pomfrey recommended me to her teacher, who is now the head healer, and I had been well taken care of from the beginning. In that sense, I had some familial advantages. My training mentor was a familiar face, and despite my prolonged absence albeit involuntary I was not dismissed. Of course, the exams were fair, and my skills spoke for themselves, so I wasn't ashamed of the familial connection. Until my children turn eleven and go to Hogwarts, I will be busy caring for four children. I might seek advice from Molly. But after that, when the children are all at school and Severus is also there, I can't just stay idle at home. Returning to ST. Mungo's would be the best outcome. When I returned home from ST. Mungo's, I was greeted by a chaotic living room. Shouts and screams filled my ears the toy box had been overturned, with various magical toys scattered across the carpet. A few lively toys were bouncing around, and Tito was carefully placing the toys back on the carpet. With a whoosh, a figure zoomed past me. I steadied myself and took a deep breath. Stop. The world was quiet for two seconds before the noise resumed. Mom. Look, Harry's flying so well. Roy was the first to rush over, her hair a mess, her face flushed, and her forehead sweaty. It turned out the figure that had flown by was Harry. He was now riding Roy's toy broomstick, hovering a meter above the ground, grinning happily. All right flying very well. I hung up my outer robe and cleaned off the soot. Ivan wants to fly well too, Ivan said quietly from the sofa, looking enviously at Harry in the air. Joanna, lying next to Ivan, patted his head like a little adult when she heard his words. You little rascals, I couldn't help but laugh, scooping Roy up under my arm. Harry, come down here. Watching Harry land steadily on the carpet, I sighed at the good genes he had inherited. He could fly before he could even walk steadily. Roy flew well, Joanna had no interest in brooms, and Ivan wanted to fly but wasn't good at it. It seemed I would need to lock away the toy brooms when they weren't in use. Despite their talents, they were still only a year and a half old. Even with Tito watching, I couldn't be completely at ease. Harry, tonight Sirius will pick you up and take you to Aunt Petunia's house. You'll come back on Sunday night. Be good at Auntie's house, no mischief. Harry might not understand every word I said, but he grasped the key points. His green eyes widened, and he clapped his hands happily, Sirius, big dog Sirius. Yes, big dog Sirius. I playfully pinched Harry's little nose and let him rejoin his playmates. Looking at the messy living room, I sighed. The chaotic days were just beginning. Harry. Come to your godfather, good boy. The first thing Sirius did every time he stepped out of the fireplace was eagerly look for Harry. He had finally cleaned himself up. Since the Halloween incident, Sirius had sported a disheveled look, busy every day with his Auror team, hunting down remaining Death Eaters. The last time he came to pick up Harry, his unkempt appearance had scared Harry, who refused to go with him. This time, Sirius looked well-groomed. His hair was trimmed, and his stubble was gone, looking like a young gentleman. Despite a hint of sadness in his eyes, adding a touch of melancholy to his aura, he was likely to attract many women. Serious. Harry, lifted high into the air, laughed joyfully, showing no fear. You always come at dinner time. I really suspect you come to freeload. Don't you ever wish someone would have a hot meal ready for you when you get home? 
We're about the same age my children are old enough to make soy sauce. You should find a wife. I teased him without any guilt and turned to instruct Tito to prepare an extra dinner. Sirius responded grumpily, thanks for your concern, but I'm not in the mood for romance. During dinner, Sirius mentioned that they had captured Dolohov, Molsiber, Travers, and a spy inside the ministry. I never thought the Death Eaters had infiltrated the ministry. Ludovic Bagman from the Department of Magical Games and Sports turned out to be a spy. After feeding the two younger children, I supervised the older two, making sure they ate properly, while I began to fill my own stomach. If it weren't for Karkarov's cowardice, revealing this information to save himself, we might never have discovered this. And there's still a batch of Voldemort's remnants, including my dear cousin and her husband. Sirius's exaggerated expression made me laugh, yes, they're also my cousins. Any leads on them? Leads, maybe, Sirius said with a hint of mystery. Maybe? I raised an eyebrow. Another Friday evening, Harry had just been picked up, and the three little ones were reluctant to part. With my hands on my hips, I shouted, bath time. The children immediately became excited, scampering up the stairs. The twins, being three and a half, were naturally faster than the toddling Ivan, quickly reaching the landing, while Ivan was struggling up the fourth step. Sisters, wait for Ivan. Ivan's voice was on the verge of tears. I held back a laugh, don't worry, baby, mom's coming to help. I lifted Ivan by his tiny arms and quickly carried him upstairs. After preparing the bath and adjusting the water temperature, the sisters shared a large tub while little Ivan had his own, with bubbles flying everywhere. After drying Roy and helping her dress, I sent her to the bedroom and continued the bubble battle with the slippery little ones. Just as I was almost done washing Joanna, I suddenly heard an alarm. My expression tightened. I gathered the three children together and called Tito to protect them. I clutched the object in my pocket, something I had kept with me since I received it, and today it might come in handy. Holding my wand, I headed downstairs. From the stairs, I saw the defense had been breached, and someone had broken in. My dear cousin, aren't you coming down to greet your guests? Bellatrix and her husband, Rodolphus, looked twisted yet haggard, clearly in bad shape. After Voldemort's fall, they had been on the run from Oros, living a hard life. My eyes widened in shock there were two other men behind them. Gasping, I clenched the small ball in my hand, feeling it heat up and change shape, then suddenly cool, turning icy cold. I breathed a sigh of relief. Staying alert, I walked down the remaining stairs. Lestrange, you. My voice trembled with fear and excitement, my feet unsteady, moving without purpose. Too bad. It's four against one. Rodolphus laughed maniacally, you can apparate away now, so we can enjoy tormenting the little brats. Screaming, crying, mommy, daddy, help me. The perverted man mimicked a child's cries. I gripped my wand tightly, my palms aching from the pressure. What do you want? I raised my voice, lifting my wand higher, my feet still moving. My cousin is indeed smart. We have some information we'd like to ask you about. Bellatrix approached me. At this moment, from behind them thanks to my movement, behind them, the hallway leading to the living room came sounds like gunfire, several in quick succession. The sudden noise alerted them to someone operating behind them. In shock, they turned around. I seized the opportunity to hide behind the sofa, casting a disillusionment charm on myself. Reinforcements arrived just in time. Sirius was the first to rush in. I immediately reinforced the main room's defenses with anti-apparition charms and sealed the floor network access. The rest I left to Sirius and his team capturing dark wizards was their job. The battle began. I moved to the corner of the stairs, observing the fight, dodging stray curses, and ensuring no one tried to head upstairs. My children were up there, and I couldn't let them be in danger. More horrors arrived, filling the living room with sound. Sirius and his team guarded every entrance, including the kitchen and bathroom doors. Sitting on the stairs, I pondered how many times my home had suffered such calamities. That flying coffee table was something I found in Chinatown, carved with plum blossoms, orchids, bamboo, and chrysanthemums I loved it. 
My old gramophone, though unused for ages, was a cherished decoration. Now I saw the large horn lying on the floor. The painting on the wall, drawn by Roy and Joanna, though I never understood what it depicted, was a birthday gift from them. Even such a small hanging could be hit by a curse. While I lamented the various casualties, someone fell at the foot of the stairs. It was one of the Death Eaters following the Lestranges. He seemed young, not even twenty, with a pale face full of fear, his straw-colored hair limp. He appeared inexperienced, quickly struck down by a spell, lying on the stairs. The Aura who had attacked him turned to help with Bellatrix and her husband, leaving the boy unattended. I didn't lower my guard, watching him closely. After a few minutes, he moved slightly, his eyes opening a crack to survey the chaos, glancing up the stairs with hope in his terrified eyes. My gaze sharpened. I raised my wand and silently cast a stunning spell. Regardless of his intentions whether to harm my children or escape upstairs I wouldn't let this fugitive near my kids. Even if he was just a child in another family. With the overwhelming difference in power, it was no surprise that the four remaining Death Eaters were subdued. Three days later, the Daily Prophet reported their sentencing. The Lestranges and Rabastin Lestrange were involved in multiple murders of wizards, sentenced to life imprisonment. The straw-haired boy turned out to be Barty Crouch Jr. The nineteen-year-old son of Bartimius Crouch, head of the Department of Magical Law Enforcement. Ironically, his father presided over the trial. The newspaper reported that Bartimius disowned his son in court, insisting on sending him to Azkaban for life. Due to the minor injuries from their attack and the absence of prior criminal records, Barty Jr. was sentenced to three years for following Voldemort. On Sunday night, when Sirius brought Harry back, he told me about the trial. Old Bartimius was furious. His son's actions stained his reputation, a fatal blow to his ambition to become Minister of Magic. Despite Barty Jr. S. pitiful claims of innocence, his father emotionlessly insisted on sending him to Azkaban. Are you sure Barty Jr. is a Death Eater? I couldn't imagine keeping an impartial stance if Ivan were in such a situation. At least he has the dark mark on his arm. Many Death Eaters claimed coercion or control to escape punishment, but the dark mark doesn't lie. Maybe he was a new recruit, dragged into this attack by the Lestranges. But to Crouch, anything threatening his reputation must be discarded. Sirius clearly disapproved of the head of the Department of Magical Law Enforcement. He's only 19. Even with three years in Azkaban, if he somehow remains sane, his life is still ruined. I recalled the frightened boy and felt some sympathy, mostly for having such a father. But that was all. I suddenly wondered, why did they come after me? And how did you know they might? They're searching for any leads on Voldemort. You and Severus were the first at the scene that night and are on their watch list. They think you know something. Sirius shrugged, I didn't know they'd target you. Severus warned me they might, asking me to help protect you and the kids. You've always been at odds with the Lestranges, and they might take it out on you, venting their frustration at losing their master. I couldn't monitor you 247, so I made that communication ball on short notice. High-level transfiguration it could have been fancier with more time. He looked a bit embarrassed, Severus asking for my help was a surprise. So it was Severus. Without prior warning, with three kids and a house elf against four ruthless dark wizards. I'd be cleaning up the mess by the time you Aurus arrived, my dear cousin. I handed Sirius a cup of hot tea with a sweet smile. Sirius choked at my calling him cousin but couldn't refute it. Though not blood-related, we were in-laws. I was older, so cousin wasn't an inappropriate term. After a few moments, Sirius coughed to cover his embarrassment, ignoring my cousin comment. He said, I suppose Severus isn't so bad, at least not to his wife and kids. As long as he treats Harry well and doesn't mistreat him, I reluctantly agree to him raising my godson. Still trying to save face, huh? I burst into laughter, which became uncontrollable until Sirius blushed from my teasing. Chapter 72 The boy's name was Harry Potter. You can find his name in important magical events of the 20th century, listed alongside other famous wizards who saved the world. Harry himself didn't like these titles. 
as he would say, who would want to know that a one-year-old baby defeated a Dark Lord? It's obviously not possible. The real hero is my mom. Unfortunately, many people didn't realize this and never questioned the obvious flaw in the story, choosing to believe in the hero who bore the scar. For Harry, this burden meant he could never escape the past, and for those who survived the war, living in the present required as much courage as surviving it. In the small corner of the world we were living in, we quietly supported each other, enduring the struggles and challenges of life. As the boy who saved the wizarding world, our little Harry should have had a childhood full of laughter. Instead, he often endured the weight of the world's expectations. So many people in the magical world relied on Harry. Originally, nothing special was planned, and our daily routine was very ordinary. But sometimes, unexpected elements could disrupt this, making Harry's life take a significant turn. Let us take a look at the diary of our little hero, Harry Potter. Some day, some month, 1988. My name is Harry Potter. I turned eight a little over a month ago. I have decided to start writing a diary from today and to keep it up every day to leave a very important record of my growth for my future self. All right, first of all, I should record the most important thing, my family. I am an orphan my parents died when I was 15 months old, but I am not lonely. I have my aunt, godfather, Aunt Sawyer, and Uncle Sev. I have two homes, and if I count my godfather's place which I don't visit often and is more like a kennel I have three homes. Aunt Sawyer's house is my favorite place. There, I have Roy and Joanna, who look identical but are never mistaken for each other, and Ivan, who is a day older than me. We grew up together and are very good friends. Of course, there's also my foster mother, Aunt Sawyer. Originally, I was supposed to call her mom, but Aunt Sawyer said that the term mom belongs to my birth mother and should be reserved only for her, not even borrowed. Aunt Sawyer said she was my mom's best friend. I saw in the photos that my beautiful mom and a younger Aunt Sawyer were holding hands, smiling happily. If my mom were still alive, she would love me very much because she loved me just like my aunt does. Yes, and there's also Uncle Sev. I'm a bit afraid of him because he is very strict with us, especially when checking our homework. Maybe it's because he's a professor, and if he's not strict, he wouldn't be able to manage the naughty students. He's not home much, and although he doesn't smile often and looks fierce, I've seen him be very gentle with Aunt Sawyer and the three kids. Sometimes, I'm quite envious because although Uncle Sev is nice to me, he's never that close. I respect and admire him, but I don't dare to be as affectionate with him as Ivan is. Well, I'm definitely not complaining because God has already been kind enough to me. And although I don't have a father, I have a godfather. My godfather, Sirius, is an auror, like a police officer in the muggle world. Sirius said he was my father's best friend and told me many stories about the marauders, about pranks, adventures, and bravery. He filled in many memories about my dad and compensated for the affection and love Ivan received from Uncle Sev. Sirius would lift me up and spin me around, kiss my cheek with his stubbly face, take me to amusement parks on his days off, and scream louder than me on roller coasters. He even taught me pranks, which made Roy and the others quite envious. Yes, their envy made me feel pretty good. I'll stop here for today Aunt Sawyer is urging me to go to bed. Good night, Harry. Good night, everyone I love. My family, to be continued. The next day. My other home is Aunt Petunia's house. Aunt Petunia is a very meticulous woman who works as an editor at a gossip magazine. She has a slight cleanliness obsession, and although she's very busy, she keeps the house spotless. Maybe it's because of this constant effort that she's always so thin. Every Saturday morning until after lunch on Sunday, I stay at Aunt Petunia's house. Aunt Petunia has always spoiled me, or rather, indulged me. There are no restrictions on what I eat, wear, or play with, and I never have to worry about homework at her house. Aunt Sawyer, knowing this, tells me to have fun when I'm at Aunt Petunia's and to keep up with my studies the rest of the time. Then she mutters, thank goodness it's only one and a half days a week. And every time Aunt Petunia sees me, her first words are always, good heavens. Harry, you've gotten thinner. I can't help it. Although I'm not particularly big, 
it's because I like sports. Aunt Sawyer ensures we have regular health checkups to make sure we're neither malnourished nor overnourished. But none of this convinces Aunt Petunia. She insists I'm too thin, and there's nothing I can do about it. Speaking of Aunt Petunia, I have to mention Sirius. Because soon, I might have to start calling him Uncle Sirius. Don't ask me why I don't know what happened either. I remember that before I turned six, my godfather often visited Aunt Petunia's house during his weekend breaks, and they got along quite well. But half a year later, something happened, and Aunt Petunia, in a fit of rage, screamed you murderer. And chased Sirius out with a broom. Since then, Sirius couldn't openly show his face around Aunt Petunia's house without risking her screams and any objects she could grab. Luckily, Sirius had a trick up his sleeve. Did I mention? Oh, he can transform into a handsome black dog. Since Sirius never revealed his dog form to Aunt Petunia, he could occasionally sneak around her neighborhood as a dog and be, kindly, taken in by me. At first, Aunt Petunia was terrified of the large black dog and wouldn't let him near me. But Sirius, pretending to be a gentle, obedient, and pitiful stray, won her over. After that, Sirius often spent his weekends disguised as a dog in Aunt Petunia's garden. Aunt Sawyer seemed to have noticed a few times, recognizing Sirius's dog form, but she never exposed him. Thank goodness, or Aunt Petunia would have given him an earful. I thought they were done for, with me stuck in the middle, afraid to ask. But recently, things have taken a strange turn that I don't understand. Aunt Sawyer, however, laughed and told me to get ready to call Sirius uncle. The world of adults is really complicated. Some day, some month, 1990. On the way to school today, I again met strangers waving at me from a distance. Although Aunt Sawyer told me about the Savior story and I could guess they were wizards curious about the Savior, I still find it unsettling. Being a legendary Savior is a thankless job. In the magical world, you get stared at like an alien, wherever you go. Strangers and acquaintances alike shower you with flattery, and you have to be careful of being followed by paparazzi. It's like being a celebrity on tea seemingly glamorous but with no privacy, where fame comes with pressure. Besides, there's no appearance fee or endorsement fee for being a savior. Overall, it's a tiring and thankless job, and unfortunately, it's mine to bear. Fortunately, until I turn 11, I don't have to face this. Because I've been well protected, many curious and probing wizards are kept at bay by my guardians. I vaguely remember, when I was little, strangers often came to the house, wanting to express their gratitude and admiration for the Savior. They meant no harm, but it was annoying. Later, Aunt Sawyer, Uncle Sev, Aunt Petunia, and Godfather Sirius took me to see Mr. Dumbledore. I'm not sure what they discussed, but soon after, Aunt Sawyer moved us. Aunt Petunia moved too, and both houses ended up in the same community. Since moving at age five, I've lived in a muggle neighborhood, attending a muggle kindergarten and primary school, where I'm just an ordinary boy named Harry Potter. I have another year of peace before entering the wizarding world and facing more than just friendly strangers. For now, I'd rather hide at home. The End